Uh, a recovered alcoholic name is Tony. My sobriety date's April 8, 1989. And how we're going to start this meeting, we're going to read the set aside prayer. You guys are going to need this by the time the weekend's over. If you kind of listen to what it's saying, it, it will kind of we're looking for a new experience to this thing. So. Thanks, Brady. Steve Alcoholic. Steve. When I was early in sobriety, I used to go into meetings and my head was all be buzzing from the stuff that was going on during the day and then I'd have a whole bunch of expectations about the meeting and, and I couldn't accept some of the things that were being said and then, then I was listening to a speaker and, and heard about the set-aside prayer. So it can join me. Just uh, I'll say the prayer. You guys can just think about it. And it goes like this. Dear God, please set aside anything I think I know about myself, about my disease, about the big book, 12 steps, the program, the fellowship, the people in the fellowship in all spiritual terms, especially you God, so that I may have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me see the truth. Amen. Amen. And then I can listen. I'm going to uh, give you guys the sheets. We're not going to go through them tonight. I'm going to go through the the kind of principle of it or the design of it. And when you're um, on your own time, you can go through it. When you go back and you have a rough idea on the roadmap. If you ever walk by one of those uh, travel agencies, you see pictures on the window. Kind of, wow, that looks nice, that looks nice. It gives you a rough idea where you're going you have a picture of it, but you're not there yet. That's what kind of we're going to do this weekend, right? We're going to give you pictures of what it looks like. Some of you have experienced those places. We want to enhance it, right? It's like the first time you visit the place, you don't really get an idea of everything there. But then when you meet people, say, hey, well, this is here, that's there, this is here, and it enhances your, your whole experience, right? And that's what this is really all about. It's about an experience. A lot of us have knowledge, of these things and we have ideas about these things but the experience of this thing is really different so I'm um, a bit about myself um, we're gonna go through this and one of the things we're gonna do with those sheets is tonight when you, when you go back to your room I'll give you a pen and you're gonna just do an exercise on the back of, of the first sheet so on the back of this sheet here the first one it's a blank piece of paper you're gonna write down what the problem is. What you think the problem is. How many people has relapsed here? Then you're going to ask yourself, the next question is, why? Why did you relapse the last time? And that's only personally for you. right? So when you go back over your story, you're going to write down what you think the problem is, and why you relapsed the last time. These two things here, I had no clue of. I got introduced to AA. My first meeting was in 1978. I was 16 years old. Everybody around me thought I had a problem. And I was in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. So um, it took 11 years before situations presented itself where a member of Alcoholics Anonymous 12-stepped me into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what they ended up doing was conning me into the process outlined in this manual. And this manual is my lifesaver. So if I was going to throw, if I seen people drowning, what I'd want to throw them is a lifesaver, right? I wouldn't want to get in the water with them because what happens is that we both end up drowning. So there's a process put together. So what I'm going to do is talk about my experience, talk about what made the difference in my experience and what has me standing here today, 29 years later, right? So like I said, my sobriety date is April 8, 1989. Right, and I, was, I just turned 27 years old. So, what happened there? Uh, in 80, in 85, I got a, a visited by a sergeant in the Toronto division, and they asked me kind of kindly that uh, he explained to me not everybody makes it to the station, and that maybe it would be in my best interest to leave. Well, that's how I interpreted what he was saying, and I kind of left that situation. So I came out to Vancouver in 87, and, and I'll go back over this when I talk about my experience going through the process, right? Because really making it an experience is what this is all about. So I came out here in 85, I mean 87, <clears throat> with an idea of changing my life. My life was burnt to the ground. I mean, it was beyond, I was 20, 
five years old and then uh, I was kind of puking green bile, dying of alcoholism and, and all my efforts at that time was 11, at that time it was nine years in and out of the fellowship of AA. I was at a home group, the Queensway Saturday night group, where my dry date was in pencil. Like five years at <laughs> that group trying to get sober. I was in 12 and 12 studies, like, you, like uh, I was always introduced to the 12 and 12 study. When I got sober, the big book process wasn't really a part of the fellowship as much as uh, that may be hard to believe. It was all 12 and 12 in the Valco. So what happens is um, uh, when I came out here to start a new life, my brother was living out here, and I just went to meetings. I, went to, I made six months, and I relapsed. And then I went three months, relapsed. My last relapse, I went to 360 meetings in 90 days. April 6th, I just turned 27 years old, and I went to a meeting talking about how great I was doing keeping me sober. Nobody talks like that, right? Look how great I'm doing. I'm just It's my birthday today, and I'm sober. And then I went back on Friday and talked about what a great job I kept myself sober on Thursday. Right, anybody? And then the next day it was Saturday. I got a three-month chip, and I talked like I was getting an Academy Award. I like to thank me, and I like to thank me, and I, and I like to thank me. And I like to thank my girlfriend that is here and the one that isn't. <laughs> right? like, like I'm 27. I am nuts. I left the meeting an hour later. I was drinking. And I just did 360 meetings in 90 days. I was in four 12 and 12 studies. So <laughs> kind of, and if you ask me what the problem was, I didn't have a clue. And if you asked me why I relapsed, I had an excuse to it, right? And so I had 11 years of excuses why I was relapsed. So kind of what it breaks down to, I have 11 years of good enough reasons to come to AA. You know, the consequences that get our attention, we say something's got to change. Like, so looking back, when I, when I got introduced to this thing, the first thing I got out of a meeting was there was hope here. And I, I kind of tapped into that idea, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what was being offered, but there was something with the idea that I didn't have to live the way I was living. Isn't that the idea? Like, I don't want to be living the way I'm living, feeling what I'm feeling, and my, and, and my life looking the way it was looked bleak. Like, remember my first thinking of suicide attempt was like I was 15, I was standing up on a balcony of, of a building, 18th floor, and I was on peyote, a couple of hits of microdot, drink of broiler makers, wasted, just wasted, we're moving product back then with my cousins and stuff like that, and they were all partying in the other building, and I think I was just getting, um, <clears throat> the peyote was just starting to kick in, and I was standing there looking down at the dumpster, and it was kind of like, if this is going to be my life, it's over, right? Based on my experience of this far in life and where I was, it was kind of like the idea of my life continuously looking like this, and the inability to already deal with life and what is kind of given me, it is hot in here, right? <laughs> or, or God showing up, I don't know, one or the other. <laughs> it's always different when you're in a room full of men, right? You know, it's nice to have a couple of women available, that way you can fluff it up a bit, right? <laughs> you get to, oh! <laughs> when it's all guys, you know, like everybody feels a little nervous when you're in a room full of guys, right? We can kind of see the bullshit, right? So, so it's kind of like, I was kind of standing there, Thinking about this thing, and it's kind of really real when I was kind of go through this. At this point in time, 15, I just got out of a controlled environment. And I think I already had my first skin pop because my, my cousin stuck a needle in, in my ass when I passed out. And they gave me a skin pop. They hit me up with some methamphetamine. And I, I jumped up like a cat. It was like kind of wild. And in the environment I was in, it was kind of like the guys I got uh, hooked in with, they're all left over from the 60s, right, and 70s, but they didn't know the 60s and 70s were over. I don't know if you ever partied with those guys, right? And I was like their pet project, right? So it was kind of like, uh, like this kid, right? But I didn't think, anyway, so I get out of this environment, I'm hooked in with them because I have a, a knack for finding my own people. I don't know if anybody, I could be standing there minding my own business and three people like me will show up. Hey, what's happening? Right, so he kind of they, they would take uh, pride to see how long they can keep me till I was passed out. How many shots? How many tokes? And then when I pass out on the floor, and like the party hasn't even started yet, and I'm out like a light on the floor, they'd be doing super tokes out my nose, laughing their head out, like you know, like laughing their ass off, right? And I'd come to, and everybody would be standing around with drinks and laughing at me, right? So I got a soul 
purpose was to be the last one where I'd be laughing at them. I don't know if anybody's kind of motivated by resentment here, but I didn't know that was resentment. So I got really, really good at what I was doing, but uh, I was already being driven by things that I didn't know I was being driven by. And my ability to assess situations were, was already um, working against me, but my inability to realize that. And I was making decisions based on self at that age that I didn't realize was working toward my demise. So it was kind of like the best part about this thing is, is kind of like there's a magic here beyond our ability to see, feel, and touch. And by the time you become aware of it, you kind of go, whoa, you kind of seen it was always there. And when you hear people ex experience, you kind of, if you can tap in that there's an energy or there's a life force here, there's something working beyond our understanding. It's so like I was telling my friend here, seven days sober. For us, it's pretty amazing. When you look around this room and you look at the characters that are in here, the only time we ever get together like this is usually pre-trial. <laughs> Detox and, and some hospital gathering or a car wreck, right? You kind of like, hey, what the? <laughs> you know, that's usually how we get together, right? And, and the, we're sitting here on a weekend going through this thing in the condition we're in and hope and all that. It's pretty, pretty wild. So as I, I, I kind of got through this thing, I'll get my bearings on this, but when I started seeing the magic in this, it took other members for me to see it. So that means I spent 11 years in the fellowship of AA thinking I was in the program, thinking I was doing all the do things to get me sober, but I was missing the experience that happens in AA. <clears throat> so I was like the guy, went to the airport every day, and I talked to people who've been on the plane, and I look out the window and see the plane, and after a couple days I talk like that was my experience of being on the plane. But I've never really took a flight, and that was kind of like my experience in AA. I talk about everybody else's experience, and I talked about it enough where I thought it was my experience, and then I kept on relapsing, right? So back when this magic was happening in my life before I even realized it was happening, there was always something kind of governing me or something deep down within that kind of gave me some direction without even me realizing that gave me comfort, even from a young age when all the abuse and all this, the chaos was happening. I found comfort deep down within. I was able to shut myself off from the world, the beatings and all that other stuff. It was like I found this place within, like a refuge within inside of myself, but I never acknowledged that back then, or a voice that kind of gave me comfort, right? And you know, it was kind of like when they talked about, you know, I think about the different times where I'd like hit the floor and stuff would happen, or I'd come to in situations where or I'd be blacked out and passing out, and a voice would say, I don't even know where, where I was, where I am in it, but this voice would say, don't fall asleep on your back. <laughs> <clears throat> where the hell did that come from, right? Why? Because you die of asphyxiation, you end up vomiting. So I would turn over and, and, and fall asleep on my side, right? So stuff like that, but I never realized there was something governing in my life even way back then. And so the magic that happens in here, if you kind of, when you get through here, and it's pretty amazing when you can, when this thing comes alive for you, is that, and I'll, I'll kind of go all over the place here, but the, the theme is going to be kind of like this thing working in our lives without us realizing it. When you could kind of tap into it where it makes it personal for you, your whole life will never be the same again. And that's what they talk about is the experience, not the knowledge of, but you need the knowledge to get the experience. So it's a catch-22 because if you don't know what the process is, then how can you experience the outcome of it? And how do you know you're there when you... When you get there, right? It's like when you look at those travel agency packages, you know what to expect when you get there, right? And if you didn't see those places, none of those places were there, you'd know you're at the wrong place. It's kind of, that's kind of like recovery. This talks about a process, and then when we go through it, you kind of get, yeah, I see this landmark here. I'm experiencing it. Yeah, I see this landmark here. I see this landmark here. And as a result of it, you could show somebody else that's coming behind you what you're doing to get you to where you are. Most of us don't know how to do that. And I was one of those people that talked about an experience that I never really had because I could fabricate stuff. I don't know if anybody chameleons here, no. but I could fabricate recovery and it'd work until life happened. I don't know if anybody ever noticed that. I got a great program until something happens, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's called like conditional sobriety. As long as the conditions are right, I'm, all, I'm okay, right? So when I went through Bill's story, it, it was kind of really interesting that... <coughs> When you look at the history of this thing, Bill went through treatment three times. 
right? But his second time in treatment, he had that desperateness that what he wouldn't do to change his life. And we've all been there. We're lying in the room, the room's closed by yourself, and you're thinking the incomprehensible demoralization, the pain, the existence, and the, the stuff you've done, and you can't believe you got there, and what you wouldn't do to change your life. There's got to be a different way of life. And as the voice went inside, it says, there's something different for you than what you're experiencing. Every single one of us has had that, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here. Because if that voice wasn't present, I'd still be, I'd be dead by now, but I wouldn't have pursued a different life than the one I was living. So when Bill was in that situation and he heard the doctor talking to his wife, he kind of put this thing out to the universe that, that he wanted a different experience than that, what he was having. And the wording's quite optional, but he wanted something different than he was experiencing and his inability to achieve it, right? Because it's the second time in treatment. Bill was a chronic relapser. Why? Because he didn't experience this thing that he had to experience upon his third time of treatment. But what even happens even before that, he was sitting at the kitchen table drinking, right? Dying of alcoholism. And at this, at this stage, it's about five years he's trying to get sober. And Ebby showed up in Bill's life. Bill didn't call Ebby. Ebby called Bill. Got on a plane and carried a message to Bill. Even Bill couldn't fully comprehend what was being offered. He's seen it was available to him. He's seen the miracle sitting across the table. So he's seen this thing that was, was available to him, but he didn't know how to get it. He says he's had moments with it, but he didn't know how to obtain it. His friend promised when these things were done, if he did the same thing his friend did, he would have the same experience that he had. And then his third time in treatment, he went through a process that his friend took him through. He didn't go through it alone. Most of us, if you're anything like me, we try to do this alone. Genius type sobriety, I call it you know, one ply recovery. You know how good one ply is, right? I don't know if you've ever used one ply. <laughs> I'm applying me to me and it's not turning out well. <laughs> you know, it's not working. And that's how most of my experience has been. But what's really funny is when I was in that incomprehensible demoralization, I couldn't create a change for any given period of time. And when I was 16, the phone rang. And at this time, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm blasted. I'm drinking boiler makers and a couple of hits again of LSD and then I'm smoking some Thai stick and I think got some peyote was big back then with a bit of methamphetamine to top everything off. It was like a really good time. And I'm just getting to that peak of like Yahoo and then my mom let, let us uh, have the place so I could party. And it was kind of like um, the phone rang. And when I picked up the phone, this guy goes, hey, uh, is uh, Tony Roberts there? And I said, uh, yeah, by the way, I just found out what my real name was because we're living under an alias at that time. My, my last name was something else. I don't want to get into that right now, <laughs> but, uh, seeing it's being taped or leave it alone. So what happens is, so I just found out my name because I got my social insurance number, and that was a whole different story, and I'll get into a bit about that when I go through the four and stuff like that. And this guy goes, hey, yeah, um, do you know any other Tony Roberts? I said, like, who cares? Like, what's your problem, pal? It's my birthday today. And, and you know, he says, well, this is Tony Roberts. I'm your dad. And now I'm thinking, is this really happening <laughs> or is this not happening? Because the stories I heard about my dad, he was like, ex-association, ex-association, the war stories I heard my dad about my dad, he was like this huge, unbelievable being that I always kind of thrived to be on the stories I heard about him and, and on and on and on. He says, yeah, he says, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Two things, I didn't understand what he meant by sober and I don't understand what he meant by a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, I'd like to get together with your family, you and your mom to make amends. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know anything. All I knew is that my dad's in my life. My life's going to change. And I got a drinking buddy. <laughs> That's all I heard is like, yeah, now I get to live the life I always hoped for. Now I have somebody because there was really nobody. And this was going to be my, like, the, the, my father figure, what I always strive for because I've been in and out of... Uh, uh, um, controlled environments at that time from a young age. And it was kind of like, yeah, he, he was going to be the person that made a difference in my life. And so when my mom came home, it was kind of like, told her, hey, you know, this guy phone, he says he's my dad. She says, we're moving. <laughs> That's it. We're out of here, right? Because the last time my mom seen him, he showed up in Hellebury with a gun trying to get me from my godmother that where I was living at. And they ended up, he was so loaded, they ended up giving him a, a mannequin doll in a blanket and he took off with that. And he ended up getting 
So like that, that's welcome to my life, right? I come from a good gene pool, right? And you'll see, you'll see after I'm doing really good for a guy in my mental condition. So I, I no longer, I don't only suffer from my story. I suffer from my mom's story, my dad's story, and all their associations, right? They talk about the warpless count lives of, of blameless children. I grew up with their perspective of life. So I grew up very fear-based. I grew up with the understanding of what we talked about here. You can be in a room full of people and you know nobody likes you. Nobody wants you. What are you doing here anyways? I don't know if anybody has those kind of feelings and stuff like that. So, so I met him and I thought, you know, I remember, I, I remember going to my mom. I said, I said, I don't need you anymore. I got my dad. And I didn't realize how much of a knife that was to my mom because of my disassociation with emotion, <laughs> feeling, and how it affects other people. So I met my dad. And what's really cool here at, at that time there was nobody in my life I could trust because everybody I ever got close to betrayed me in one way or another. And, and that goes right, right to my mom. Like when I was eight and a half years old, she was out doing her thing and we grew up around mafia and, and uh, ex-clubbers and stuff without getting into my mom's story because she's still alive and all that other stuff. But it, it, was, a, it was a really whacked out environment. Like I'd leave my room and the people in the rooming house that we rented out rooms to were whacking heroin back then with eye droppers and stuff like that. And, there's people coming in with fur coats and they're coming in with fridges in one area and out the other area. They're, they were kind of in between a lot of things and they help people get things, they help people get rid of things and they help people, you know, moving shakers, you know what I mean? They were like, they, they, were, like they, they were my mentors, right? And so it was kind of like, so when I told her that, I thought, now I have this, this person and I didn't realize how much emphasis I put on this person as being somebody, finally I have somebody in my life. And this is, is so I'm, I'm spending all this time going with my dad. I'm going to meetings. I start going to the church. I start trying to change my life. And I got a job. I was probably at 17 at that time. I ended up get, being the youngest I'd ever get into Douglas Aircraft before the union. And, and I was really rebuilding my life. And But I ended up getting a breach of probation because we were doing other things without getting into the long story. We were doing restaurant taverns <laughs> at that time. That's when the... The hinges were on the outside of the door. You could pop them off from the inside. Like from the outside, you pop the hinge off, take the door off, shut the alarm off, take the whiskey out, put the door back on, put the hinges on, and leave. I was doing that kind of stuff when I was 15, 16. And rolling stuff and getting rid of stuff and buying, you know, helping people move stuff and stuff like that. So I was an entrepreneur at a really young age, right? So so my my dad, who, who became my kind of hero in my first introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous, I ended up getting a breach of probation. And I didn't know how significant this was till much later in my life. And we'll talk about that when we get into six and seven, how some of this stuff is really deep and you don't know how deep it goes until life goes on. You kind of, it's like opening up an old a box that's in the closet and go, holy smokes, I didn't even realize that was there, right? So I ended up getting a breach of probation. And I had to go to court to explain to them the reason I have a breach of probation because I just met my dad and I'm hanging out with him. I'm going to church. I'm going to AA and all this other stuff. I'm recreating my life and I am doing community services. And he's going to talk about that because I'm helping him with the Christmas toy drive and I'm, I'm involved in the church. And so when I had this thing happening for trial, my dad said, don't worry about it. I'll come and represent you. Right. And, and I didn't think about it then, but he should. I showed up at trial and I had my, his life story in my hand, right? And, and I was so proud of my dad and that he was going to come finally, somebody was going to represent me, and he didn't show up. And I remember showing the judge my dad's life story. And yeah, I put it on, 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 the, on the thing and he pushed it aside because the story wasn't worth nothing because there was no representation to the story. Right, and that was most of my life. There was no representation to what I was trying to present or trying to be. I wasn't able to exhibit that when it came down to it, right? So I ended up getting three months in jail. I lost a job, I lost everything. But what really happened then was I didn't realize that a deep-seated place, I shut off all connection to all people. I couldn't depend on nobody. My mom always kind of trained us that way, is like, I might not come home. So you and your sister got to look after yourselves. We learn how to cook for ourselves. We learn how to look after ourselves because she always said you need to be self-sufficient because of the lifestyle and what was happening. She says, I might not come back one day. And that, that sets a real fear-based kind of understanding and non-disclosure not, and the secrets that weren't happening in the home back then. We couldn't discuss it. So it was a really warped kind of idea. 
and presentation to life. Like I could show up and be a worker for a little while, right? Get the job and show up and do the show and shine. But then I would show up shortly afterwards. And these conditions in my mind would always create things sober, not always drinking, right? Well, like when I got that job at Douglas Aircraft, is this guy never did nothing. He was the foreman's son. So I was resentful at him and didn't even know it. And this guy told me he was the foreman's son. And every day I seen him, I was resentful at this guy. And he's smiling and whistling. And I'm thinking, you son of a... And he's living his life. And he walked by one day and I spit on the floor in front of him. Like that's kind of mentality that create this delusion in my head that I believe was true. And then I'd act on it, causing myself problems. And other things happened there when I lost that job and I went back to make amends. It was kind of like they had on my file not to be hired under any conditions, right? <laughs> Big red seal on it, right? I didn't know to be proud of that moment or ashamed when I was kind of when they opened my file, right? So, so at that moment, I shut off again. And I didn't realize that until much later, like when I, when, I, when I got in with George and these guys. So I was trying to combat a problem I didn't understand with a solution that didn't make any sense. But I was able to be a chameleon so well that I'm a mover. Like I always learned at a young age, when something gets too hot one place, you move to another place. You just do that. I didn't make decisions. It was, what's the alternative? Stay here. I never learned how to stay anywhere. I was always leaving. So like if foster cares, all of that stuff, I learned at a young age, if, if, to, in order to, to uh, I would get the same feeling from looking at a picture than I would being with a person. I learned all my relationships were based on picture based. When I had a lonely feeling, miss my mom, miss my sister, I'd look at their picture and that would be my relationship with the idea of these people. Right? And then it got to a place where I just wouldn't even look at the picture. I, I, my story is so mixed up, I don't even know most of it. Because I just go from one situation to another situation to another situation, from one group of friends to another group of friends. And, and I didn't know, like, the disassociated nation of my life. So when I came in the AA and I was trying to get sober, I would do the surrender thing, what I thought it meant. I would do the acceptance things, what I thought it meant. I would do sobriety as I thought it meant, right? I did not understand what it meant. <laughs> and that's really important for people like us, right? So long story short, I'm trying to get sober. I keep on relapsing all the time and I'm meeting these good members, you know, think it through. Don't take the first one. If you go to a party, hang on to a ginger ale. I don't know if anybody's heard that advice. It, it works good till you forget why you're doing it. <laughs> I went to this party and I'm chatting and I think, um, this is before the army. I went to this party and, uh, and the guy says, oh, I was really concerned about going to this party. He says, well, make sure you hang on to a drink all night. I said, okay, it makes sense. And if anybody asks you if they want a drink, just say there wouldn't be enough for both of you. It makes, what a way to combat alcoholism. I said, I found a solution for alcoholism, right? So I show up at this party all night. You know how we are with a glass, right? When, <laughs> ask me what's in the glass, right? So these guys are walking, us, you know, like pointing like it was a big deal. We're not drinking. Normal people don't do that stuff, right? So people are all night. I, I kind of exhausted that saying, whatever, oh, if I started, it wouldn't be enough for both of you. It was a quarter after 11. I was sitting on the couch. I remember exactly that, that, that point in time. The guy sat down after afternoon shift. He goes, hey, what are you drinking? I said, oh, ginger ale. He says, well, why don't you have a beer? I said, oh, no, if I started, it wouldn't be enough for both of us. He says, I got six flats in the back. I kind of went, I guess there would be enough. I staggered out of that place five in the morning, right? And if you ask me why, because there were six flats, right? And it seemed like the right thing to do because I didn't understand the problem. And so when I went back to this meeting, the guy goes, how did it go? I said, it was doing great till the guy told me he had six flats and I realized there would be enough for both of us. And he, got, and he just looked at me kind of horrified, right? So... So he goes, you know what your problem is, son? Because I'm like 17 years old, 18 years old, right? He goes, you know what your problem is? You lack discipline. Which makes sense why I'm getting drunk all the time and based on my life history and, and where I come from and all this. So yeah, I lack discipline. Like I, I, I have a lot of psychological problems. I got introduced to therapy at junior kindergarten. <laughs> like, my, I have report cards. We look very interested in Tony's development, <laughs> right? With keen understanding. Like, I was getting, a, like, I mean, my first suspension was in junior kindergarten for two year, uh, two weeks for splitting a guy's chin open with a chair, right? So, I mean, right off the hop, 
like I was socially unacceptable everywhere I went, and that story goes on and on until I became a custody of the Children's Aid Ward, right, for punching the choir teacher in the head for trying to take my present. I used to black out all the time, right? So when I, you touch me, I was like, bam, I guess I hit her, and four teachers came and dragged me out of the classroom, and I'm trying to figure out what happened. That's most of my story, what happened, <laughs> right? They're dragging my, oh, I'm like upside down, and they're carrying me out, and I'm, and she's up in the class like on a thing, and she has a big shiner, and all the kids are up against the wall screaming. I'm saying, what went on here? <laughs> so anyways, uh, so, so I thought, yeah, it makes sense, discipline. So I thought, where would a guy, where would a guy get discipline? I'm drinking, of course. I mean, you know, anybody come up with the best ideas drinking here? So I'm, I'm drinking. I think, where would a guy come up with discipline? I said, the army. <coughs> I said, oh, my God, that's the perfect place for a guy like me. Grew up in the streets of Toronto, mostly custody of the Children's Aid Ward most of my life, in and out of situations, on and on and on. The people I associated with. We're, we're, let's say, different than most people. And so I joined the Army. But what's really funny is because I didn't understand the problem, I ended up meeting a lady at the recruiting office who was doing the same thing. You ever meet these wonderful ladies in these strange situations and you're like magnets for each other, anybody? And it's kind of like true love. So she looked at me, I looked at her, we bought us 26 and we went to the movie theater. <laughs> We consummated that relationship right there. <laughs> she was perfect. I can't even remember her name. <laughs> so, so we're we're hanging out a bit, and she goes, "Oh, she goes, why don't you come over for dinner?" Which is kind of interesting. So I go back to the Sagamore and the guys I'm hanging around with. I said, "This chick asked me for dinner out in the suburbs. I've never been asked for dinner anywhere." in the suburbs by the, that whole thing come out to dinner like that wasn't a part of my lifestyle so I go to my buddy and say what are you supposed to do like I'm going to, supposed to go to this dinner thing with this girl she lives out in the suburbs with her parents and all that stuff she says well you're supposed to bring a bottle of wine and present it as you go to the door I thought wow that's cool eh? so I go to the liquor store unsupervised with my own thinking and I'm thinking what's a nice bottle of wine so I start looking at the alcohol content, that's very important. You start, you start with the alcohol content, right? And, and sugar content, and then you look for sales. And convenience. So I seen this bottle of baby duck. <laughs> 1.5 liters, I kind of went, whoa. Like I had that, like that moment because I already, like you can't get the ones with the cork in it. Nothing worse than sticking the pen in it and trying to pour it out. It just doesn't work. The cap, it has the gold cap. Anybody remember the gold cap? So I, I take this because we're going to go meet our friends after. So we're just, this is just for dinner. So I, I take it down and I have a proud moment like I'm holding a baby. All right? And I'm walking to the counter like this. And then the thought cross. Like from here to there where the counter is, the cashier is the thought cross in my mind. Maybe there's other people there that want to drink. I go back and grab another 1.5 liter of wine. I got three liters of wine for dinner. Now, I'm proud of myself. I think this is awesome. I get on my bike, and I'm on my leather coat, and I got these tall gold caps sticking out of my, my and I'm going up to 400 to go visit. And I'm looking down these, at these caps, and I'm very proud of the situation I'm in. Now, the idea that they're in my coat on a motorcycle flying up the highway doesn't concern me in the least. Like, when I think about that now, it's kind of like, what? So I show up with her, I knock on her door, she opens the door, and she just goes, and I go, yeah, eh? No, no it, wasn't, she, it wasn't that kind of look. It was, she goes, you do know we're going out for dinner after. I said, yeah, this is just for dinner, right? Because I'm leaving, I'm leaving the next day on a plane to Cornwallis. Now, the funny thing is, I got a hair like this. I got an afro that's huge, yeah. right? I I'm, I'm just turned, I think, I'm, before my 19th birthday, this is just before Christmas, because they were having Christmas events, I remember that. <clears throat> so we go, we have them. I couldn't tell you what was done. I couldn't tell you what our place was. I guess I drank a lot. We went to the bar, the suburb bar. I never drank in one of those places, and they're all preps, preppies and all that other stuff, and I'm wearing a nice dress shirt. As I started drinking, my sleeve started going up. Right? Now my sleeve's up over here. I'm drinking zombies, eh? And they don't make enough 
by law they're only allowed to put three shots in it, so you got to go see another bartender, another bartender to put another shot in it. Nobody drinks like that here, right? I'm drinking these zombies are the best thing that ever happened to me. And so I don't even know what's happening in the environment I'm in. And I just finished talking. She goes, what's the matter with you? And I leaned over and I said, you know, and I get like this. She goes, what? I said, you know what I like to do? She goes, what? And she's looking straight. I said, there's two things. One of them's fighting. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> and the other one was producing kids, right? <laughs> Just my, my mentality. That's my mentality because I'm ready to go. So you, you either if you're not leaving with a woman, you're fighting. It's, I don't know if anybody's like, you got to get that adrenaline going, right? So I'm walking in and that, that song came out. We're off to the rodeo. But yeah, we're... Yeah, I don't know. I never heard that song before. Where I hung out, they weren't singing those songs. The whole bar was singing the song, and this guy walks by me and goes, uh, effing jerk, right? And I said, what did you say? Perfect, right? He goes, no, 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 no. So that was my mentality. <laughs> so there's the two conversations I remember the whole night. Three conversations. Her, how much wine you got? Me explaining my situation to her, that guy, and then I come to going down the four the 400 highway in her car and I don't know if it was kilometers or miles then but I remember her kind of screaming because I was in her car oh and by the way I'm driving <laughs> so <laughs> that's an important factor here I come to in this car and I look at the speedometer I remember it's going 120 and that was back in, in I guess 79 uh, 2000 no, so eight, eight, 1980 so I don't know if it was kilometers or who cares. But I went in the blackout again. And then I came to on the floor of her bathroom buck naked because of those tile floors. Anybody like tile floors here? <laughs> it brings your body temperature down. Anybody? <laughs> That's how I, how I look for apartments back then was tile floors check. <laughs> Never mind the view. Where's the liquor store? Where's the beer store? And how close the sink was to the toilet. Very important. It takes away all decisions then at what end goes where. <laughs> and, and I don't know if normal people get apartments like that, right? Top floor. And you're happy about this. I don't know how many times I've woken up on other people's floor, butt naked. <laughs> but I think about trying, opening the door, whack, whack, whack. And I'm trying to remember where you are. Anyways, never mind what happened. So I come to on her f in the bathroom floor, and I look at in the corner, and it's red. Like, I mean red. And I'm trying to figure what, I'm thinking, all, why I'm sick is not the amount of drink, it was the grenadine. The grenadine made me sick, not the alcohol. Then, then, so <laughs> I end up on a plane, I had a black eye, I got in a fight with somebody at a base at somewhere else on flight, whatever. I mean, they sit me up on this plane, and I, now I realize who it was. It was, it was a, a lieutenant and, and a, a captain. I'm sitting up in the center, and I'm sitting between them. I got an afro like this. I'm smelling like vomit. I got a black eye. I got biker boots on and a leather coat. They go, where are you going, son? I said, I think in boot camp. And they go, hey. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> this guy from Toronto never experienced anything like this in my life. You know, they had tell you what to do all the time, not just for eight hours. Somebody lied to me, right? So I did the 10 weeks. And then I went to Wainwright, Alberta. And, and now I'm still don't know what the problem is. But I still got this thing happening in my head. But I'm playing the role. I'm in the infantry and things are great. I passed the top of my field. I'm getting ready to go to Germany and Cyprus. Right? I'm top of my field and everything I'm doing. Right? I'm in the infantry and things are fine. But there's a problem with the people in my barracks. They're all farmers. They never grew up. And they all have a problem with me. I don't know if it's true. But I know they all have a problem with me, and they're setting me up, and they're doing things, and blah, blah, blah. Anybody have that kind of mind? And the more they're smiling at me, I'm thinking, yeah, you think it's funny, eh? <laughs> <laughs> they never did nothing to me, but I got a list of people, eh? Okay. And they, they put stuff in my, in my kit, and they, oh, yeah, I was just nuts. So I thought, okay. I went on a, I kept on going on these drunks there, but I didn't know I was going on these drunks because it was 40 cents a shot. So I spent a dollar twenty on a drink, called tequila sundowns. It was vodka, rum, and tequila in a tall glass with orange juice. I called them tequila sundowns. I drink twenty dollars worth of those and then go into town. Blackout most of the time, don't even know what's happening. So 
I, I'm starting to puke blood at this time. I don't realize I'm doing it. I'm trying to get to the bar, and, my, and I got this burning in my stomach. Like, it's really bad. Like, I'm 20, now I'm 21. Got the, been in there two years, getting ready to go to cyber. I got this burning in my stomach, and I'm puking blood, and I'm trying to think what I ate the night before that would cause that to happen. I don't know if you get the, the I don't know if you've ever had the, the gift of bile showing up with blood in it. It kind of really makes you, and especially in the snow and wing, right? <laughs> like it's just <laughs> chunky, right? And so I'm trying, I remember this one, I'm trying to get to the bar and I'm getting black dots, which I understand is a seizure now. I didn't understand that dentist. I remember this lady coming out, you okay? And eh, all blood and shit like that, right? She closed the door and locked it, right? And I'm thinking, if I could just get a couple shots, if I could just get a couple drinks, I'll be okay. So I drank those and kept on getting resentful at these people. Now, we're, we're amazing people for getting out of trouble here. Anybody have come up with stories even to amaze you? So I'm getting marched to jail quite often now, and, and, and it's your own sergeant and your own master corporal, and your own guys watch you while you're in jail, and they don't like the idea of having to watch you in jail and still do their kit and their routine the next day and all that stuff. So it's like a group punishment. What they do is try to get you in, in order. So it, it's your platoon that kind of, it's like it's a public shaming and discipline through your platoon members. So I'm getting more, uh, I'm getting more pissed off at them. So near the end, um, I ended up loading up an FNC-1 with uh, blanks because collectively I had to make them all pay, right? Because that's the way I grew up, is about getting even. So when we both think about each other, neither one of us laugh as much. I don't know if anybody, <laughs> we think, oh yeah, I was uh, there. So I'm sitting there on, on emptying an amnesty box. I don't know if you, that's where you put live rounds and blanks. I'm pissed with three of my buddies. I've been on a drunk. Right, we just came back from the war games at that time. So I'm emptying this box with live rounds and blanks in it. I can hardly see. And I take my magazine and I pass it around. No, 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 three critical thinking people helped me determine that there was no live ammunition in, in the thing. And I thank them very much for their participation. And then I had my rifle. There was no, nothing in the chamber. And then we, I took three, commit three pissed people. Yep, they're blanks. Passed them around, we all agreed they were blanks, and I loaded them into the magazine, and I'm, as I'm doing that, I'm laughing. Because <laughs> I came home early from the drinking in Wainwright before they did. And I sat on the bed with an FNC1, loaded with blanks, and they came in, all of them, two calves worth. And I said, hey, Remember what I told you? They see me with the weapon. They went, ah, and I dropped down on one knee, and I let them have it. Now, it, nobody found that nowhere as funny as I did. <laughs> nobody in the whole platoon, because it's like a Gomer Pile platoon. I didn't realize an impact like that from the inside of a building would kind of have the whole camp on alert. <laughs> you ever hear a firecracker go off in the neighborhood? Imagine from the inside of a barracks. Three live rounds from an FNC-1. It went off so loud, it scared the shit, it scared, scared me. So I had to explain my thinking to uh, the lieutenant and, and the commander of the base. How the hell am I going to get out of this? So I said, well, I've been going through a hard time, see, because the girl that I wasn't engaged to, I was engaged to now. And, and that she was pregnant, and she was going out with my best friend. None of it's true. <laughs> and I'm living it, man. I'm living this story. And my mom just ended up in the hospital. She's in bad state, and I don't know how to deal with those. But if you can give me a bit of time off, I'll go take care of all that stuff. I was out the following week. They gave me a 4C release, and I was out of there. So, so I left there trying to get sober, and, and I didn't get sober, and, and my life continued to spiral out of control. And then, um, and so I got out of there. I was twenty-two. Uh, tried to get sober. Situations happened. Situations happened. Situations happened, and, and a lot of more violence started to happen. A lot more uncontrollable situations happened. A lot more unforeseen things started happening. My sober life. I was hardly ever sober, unless even, even when I came to meetings, I was hooked on something. And then what happened was I, I got into a fight with my best friend. I nearly killed him in a fight, and, and that's the truth. He he was 
he studied martial arts for a while. He got drunk and he wanted to fight me outside of a bar and I didn't want to fight him. And then I ended up fighting. What happened is I ended up bringing his head off a parking lot and I split him open between the eye and the temple. And he fell on the ground. And I didn't think nothing of it. I just called a cab, put him in the cab, asked the cab to stop at 7-Eleven so I can get some rolling papers, get my priorities straight, right? I took him out of the cab. I left him on the driveway of the basement suite I was, I was living at on the driveway, left him there, went and made a drink, came back up and asked him what his problem was. I said, let's go. So I'm trying to help him get to my place, and I'm hanging on to a drink. And my, my brain said, well, I can't hang on to a drink and help you down the stairs. So I said, you okay? He says, yeah, and I let him go. And he fell down the stairs, right? And like, when I think about that, who does that, right? And I never thought nothing. I just grabbed him by the scuff of the collar, and I dragged him into the kitchen floor. I left him there, took what was left of the 40 ounce, or went to bed like I usually do, put the 40, what was left of the 40. And I passed out, woke up in the morning, grabbed the 40, and I started drinking it. And I was trying to put together the night before. I grabbed a gram of hash, and I rolled two joints out of it, one to go to the bathroom and one to wake up with. I used to get two, gram, two joints out of a gram of hash. I used to smoke a quarter gram of hash back then. I was moving a lot of stuff. And it was just a function, right? And then I went, oh, yeah, Louis here, right? I said, oh, no, I thought he would be as happy to see me as I was being to see him. And then because I, I didn't remember what happened the night before. And I went into the kitchen, and there's vomit on one side of him, blood on the other. And I kicked him, and I said, get up, pup, let's get going, right? Something came over me at that moment where I realized I turned into the animal that I always do was despised till I turned into my dad without even realizing. I went and spit up my own image in the mirror and tried to wash my face with the cold water. I don't know if you ever got that, the embarrassment. Machine. And I couldn't get any relief. I was spitting up my own image like I couldn't believe what I turned into. That episode kept me sober for 16 months, alcohol-free. Every time I thought about a drink, I thought about him. And no, and that kept me sober. But I was still smoking a quarter of hash a day to function because when I got sober, the ghost of yesterday would come back. I think that guy who did the Christmas Carol Christmas story was actually an alcoholic with the chains. Oh, you're going to be visited by three ghosts. If it was just three ghosts, that wouldn't be bad. For some of us, as a whole bus, right? They're getting off the bus. They're going to. And, and so I had this nightmare that I couldn't deal with when I was sober. So what happens is I was sitting in a situation. Somebody offered me a drink because I didn't understand the problem or the solution available. And someone said, hey, you want a little something for your coffee? And it was, at that time, it was 1985, right? And I said, yes. It was April 6th, 1985. I put, she put that shot in my coffee. What I understand now triggered the phenomenon of craving. And I ended up in Vancouver in 87. By the time I ended up in Vancouver at that time, had federal provincial charges. The, the people who were vetting me at the time told me not to come around anymore. They told me there was something psychologically wrong with me. Maybe I should go back to AA. And I got to a place where I'm vomiting green bile and I can't stay sober. And I'm more violent sober than I am drinking. So I end up in Vancouver and trying to get sober. And then what happens is a guy just after, he's trying to get me into a big book study workshop. And I told him it's okay. I know what not to do after my relapse. And so what he did was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He saved my life. He said, why don't you come out and help us out? <laughs> so I said, I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs> right? So I'm under the impression, this is how sick I am, right? I'm under the impression these guys really need my help because he says, you've been around a long time. I said, yeah, this time 11 years. In and out. He says, and I'm doing four 12 and 12 studies. I'm helping people go through a process I have no idea about. But they don't know I don't know, and so we all don't know together, and it sounds good. We're all sitting there going, mm -hmm, and watching, just shifting rooms on that Titanic. Anybody do that? That's what AA is without treatment. You just shift rooms in the Titanic, you get a better room, you think you're in the recovery. You're same on the same vessel, right? So they put me in a big book study workshop. They took me through this thing, and, and the rest of this thing will be talked about my experience going through the steps with my story and how I got relief from that and how I have the freedom in the life I have today, the experience that has me free from this thing. Because I've never met anybody in the last 29 years who's ever gone through this, including me, who's ever gone through this the way it's laid out and who's maintained it, who's ever relapsed. Not one person. I've met a lot of people who do versions of this, who do other people's idea of this, but never done this. Right, so by the end of the weekend, hopefully we can have some ideas, and that's what these sheets are. You can go through that on your own time. But you have some earmarks of what you're looking for and the idea of it. And if you have an open mind, 
I'll share with you what will share with me and the experience of me going through it and what my life looks like today. So I'm really thrilled about the idea of going through this. That's the beauty about this thing is we're more thrilled for you than you are for you. <laughs> right? You ever notice why we clap when, when newcomers are there? <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> you guys come in going, holy shit, that was uh, putting out the flames. Woo! <laughs> right? We go, wow, right on. Eh? Is when you come in here like this, I'm back. No, you're not. <laughs> when you come back, it's like, whoa. It's like, and, and that's it. Like, we're thrilled to see you, honest to God, because the experience that awaits you is far better than anything you could ever imagine. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be here doing this. Like, these guys who've been sober a while, their life today far outweighs anything they could ever imagine. They have a different story. We got a better story for you than you got for you. I got a better story for me than I could have ever planned. I got the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not my story. It's Alcoholics Anonymous story, what it does for a guy like me. And, like, I could be here for the next three days talking about what it was like, right? My mom gave me volumes when I was a kid to put me asleep so they can go party. The abuse, the beatings, I mean, on and on and on. None of that, like, you know, where they talk about those two who suffer from grave emotional mental disorders? One of the two is going to show up this week. <laughs> Both of us show up, right? I should say, you know, I like to, uh, we are alcoholic, <laughs> right? Because there's a whole bunch of it. But I have a freedom today that's pretty amazing. And by the end of the weekend, hopefully uh, you get as much out of this as I do. Thanks a lot. alcoholic my name's Tony everybody have a good sleep <sighs> not me oh, yeah, it's yeah, good yeah. family family kids and stuff like that right it was spready dates April 8 1989 so any um, on your sheets the second sheet if you open up the second sheet then we'll get kind of started on some ideas the biggest part about workshops like this and, and uh, is, is one staying present I don't know if anybody has a problem with staying present here because we really like to think. Anybody spend a lot of time thinking last night when they went back to their room? <coughs> it's funny how we start talking about our stories and, and, and then you just do a bit of it and then all of a sudden you got to think about the whole thing. Anybody found that? You kind of go through your whole life story. You know, you already know your story, but you're going, let's go over it again, right? You're lying there and going over all the details and stuff like that. So on the second page down at the bottom here, they talk about whose understanding are we trying to get? Well, this was a question that was asked to me, and, and I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. And then they talked about here, understanding of what? And it says the, the, and the, of. So, most people who've gone through this sheets and, and through the workbook and through the stuff like that, nobody gets that question right. Very few people get that question right. And so when we go through this, that, that would be... At the next break or whatever, you can kind of feel that in to see if you're getting an understanding what the whole point of all this thing is. So we come into Alcoholics Anonymous. Most of us come in here with our story. Anybody don't know their story? Right? We know our story. Like we're driven by this thing, right? And then they talk about the fellowship. They talk about the program. They talk. There's a lot of information when you're new. I don't know. You're probably, you hear a lot of different things when you get here by a lot of different people and a lot of different views, a lot of different understanding. So if you're trying to figure this out for yourself, you'd be pretty confused. You'd go with the, the, with the people who sound the same or who said the same thing over and over and over again thinking they're right. Most of us, we come to a meeting, hear something really good at one meeting, and we share it at the next meeting. I don't know if anybody's like that. So you hear one guy's talking about acceptance, and everybody seems to really like what he has to say. So you take his talk to the next meeting and act like it's your talk, right? It's like, yeah, I like to talk about acceptance and surrender and all that other stuff. Like, and and kind of like most people from the first meeting when they come into, including myself, first time you get the talk, you say, everybody says they're an alcoholic. You say, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. Right? You just kind of do the chameleon fit in, no, try not to draw attention to yourself and kind of go through stuff like that. Then people start talking about this thing, which I never got introduced to in my first 11 years. But they kind of talk about one. And I'll kind of go through it. We'll kind of hit on some stuff here. But as soon as you open this thing up, you hear a lot of people say, oh, we don't recover. Anybody ever hear that? 
we don't recover. We're always <coughs> recovering and stuff like that. Well, the first page of the book, it talks about the story of how many thousands of men and women who have recovered. But if you didn't understand what they meant and you heard the argument of only a few people on, no, we don't recover, you, you'd kind of be lost on, on the information. So they kind of put this manual together by those who put this thing together to give us a kind of guide or a reference to what this is all about, what the problem is, what the solution is, and the course of action that they found. And then if you want what we have, anybody over here or how it works right here? How many people really do a lot of thinking during how it works? But when you kind of it takes a while to read how, you know, actually hear how it works. They talk about, you know, rarely have we seen a person fail who has clearly followed our path. I didn't even know where that path was. Like uh, the guy who who twelve stepped me was um, George. When I kind of yesterday, I kind of top uh, got kind of oh, I'm still waking up. Kind of touched base on on what a whack job I was, right? And and. And kind of the hopeless feature of my condition and my inability to see that. I don't know if anybody had that problem. Everybody was more acutely aware about my situation than me. I was always kind of like the last one to know how, how really severely gone I was. I mean, the more I remove myself from a situation, the more I kind of go, holy smokes, I can't believe it. Like, I, I was never able to see myself clearly, but I was always being able to tap into the pain or the hopelessness of my situation. I, I was always kind of lost in those things. So when they introduced me to this thing, I didn't know I was getting introduced to it. So George would start, he was a guy who was in the fellowship that was relapsing all the time too. And he was old George, who was a German guy and he'd shake all the time. He had a big red nose and veins sticking up. And I'd look at him to feel better about myself. You ever go to me, you know, when you knew you, I always got to find someone to point at, right? So George was the guy, I was, I was looking at George, oh my God, so it was between me and him who was coming back all the time, so these guys, uh, um, Machine Gun Jerry and, and uh, a couple <laughs> other guys, Steve and Rick, 12-step George into a big book study, so they took him through this course of action, and something profound happened to, to George, but I wasn't able to see it, but I knew there was something different about him, because just the way he approached me and stuff like that, so they told him to go find the sickest guy he knew, he wasn't around, so he started working with me. Now, see, the thing about 12-step work is we got it somewhere weird where we think we got to go ask the person to 12-step us or to be our sponsor, and they're the ones who work with us. But really, there's a community of people working with us that we don't know are working with us. And usually the people who sponsor us the best, really, we have no idea they're doing it. So George started asking me some really stupid questions right off the hop. So I, I'd share at a meeting and, you know, I was pretty impressed with what I had to say when I was new because I was surrounded by a bunch of other new people that really agreed with what I had to say. Some of the old timers were wondering what the hell I was saying, but all the new people were going, wow, that was deep, man. I'd go, yeah, and we'd go for coffee and we'd start dating. So, um, <laughs> so, you, know, you know, we got the talk, right? Get it right, priorities, right? So George, uh, George started, he came up to me after one of my shares and he goes, that was profound. And I kind of like puffed up. He says, he says, what does it mean? I said, what does what mean? He says, anything you said. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of looked at him really weird. And, he, and, he'd, and he'd walk away, right? And I, and I said, wait, wait, I don't want to argue with you. No, he'd just walk away. And I think about George for a couple of days, right? <laughs> you know, anybody ever think about someone that they don't know what's that guy's problem? Like for days, I'm thinking about George, right? So I'm at another meeting and I'm sharing again, right? On my profound knowledge of this whole thing, right? So remember, I'm doing four 12 and 12 studies a week. I'm even running one at, at the Vancouver Recovery Club for, anyways, that's another whole story. So I do another share, and I think it was on, on surrender. And I walked up, and, and he walked up to me and says, uh, how do you do that? I said, do what? He says, surrender. What do you mean? What do you mean, how do you do it? Then, weren't you listening? He says, yeah, I heard what you had to say, but how do you do it? I kind of, I don't know, nobody's ever asked me that before. Right? I didn't know, and he walked away again, right? So I'm not liking George, right? So, so, so now, now, you know, time, time goes by, and I see him at the meeting. I'm careful, I'm hoping they don't ask me to share. George is in the room, right? So they asked, it was on step three. And I gave my profound knowledge on, on a topic I had no idea about, but nobody knew I had no idea about it because nobody else in the room had any idea about it. So you really get to really give her, right? 
So George walks up to me and says, that was, that was profound. And again, and I'm like, I don't know, I'm, he's not setting me up, right? I kind of went, no, 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 no. He says, how do you do step three? And, and I was able to mimic or, or, you know, spew off the stuff you hear in the meetings. He says, okay, let's start with something simple. Well, he says, uh, what's an alcoholic? Well, what do you mean, what's an alcoholic? He says, you introduce yourself at one at every meeting you go to. He says, what's an alcoholic? And I got into the jails, the institutes, the beatings, the stabbings, the, the all the consequences associated with a person that drinks too much. And he says, none of that makes you an alcoholic. He says, it makes you an a-hole, but it doesn't make you an alcoholic. And he walks away, right? And I just kind of didn't get it. And then he walked up to me again. These conversations are happening, right? And he says, what's the path that we took? And then I showed him the directory, and I said, 90 meetings in 90 days. Because that's what I thought. Because you hear people, oh, the reason I relapsed, I stopped going to meetings. So I thought the fellowship was the program of recovery. And if I just maintain meetings and I maintain the surrender and I maintain acceptance and I maintain things that I'm incapable of maintaining, I'll be able to stay sober. But my brain didn't tell me I'm incapable of being staying sober because of my track record. Every time I went to get sober, I felt this was it. I was never relapsing again. Like, this is it. I had what it took this time. So, so George asked me uh, another question. He said, what are the three pertinent ideas? And I was able to, to say them, but I, he says, no, what do they mean? And I wasn't able to tell them anything of the meaning of anything because I didn't know where, where the information originated from. All, all the information I had was catchphrase or from people or things I heard in the meeting that made sense to me. And that's what happens a lot in the fellowship of AA is we don't see if we have the same understanding. We may talk about the same words, but do you understand it the same way I'm meaning it or am I hearing it the same way they're intending it, right? So when a newcomer hears a guy say, I'm an alcoholic, he hears him say, I'm an alcoholic, but he doesn't know what he means, the person who's done the work when he makes that statement. And the person over here is uneducated about alcoholism will, will think they're meaning the same thing, So, but they're having two different conversations, right? But they think they're talking about the same thing. And that was like my recovery, the, my whole way through it, was I thought I was talking the same language as everybody around me, but they understood what they were talking about, but I didn't know what I was talking about, but I didn't understand it, that I didn't know. It was kind of may sound kind of weird, and that's why we got into the, prob uh, the thing here. So when they got into this thing, they talk about something that's the most profound part of Alcoholics Anonymous. They talk about, right in the beginning of the book, the story of how many thousand men and women who have recovered. And so if you ask alcoholics what's the most important part of that statement, they'll say recovered. 90% of them will say recovered. That's the most important part of that statement, the story of how many thousand men and women who have recovered. But that's not the important part of the statement. The important part of the statement is the story of it, right? It's the story that makes it so compelling. Like, why is this, why is this so, why was it so fantastic? It's like a guy who wins the lottery. He won the lottery. Well, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is the story around that. See, he was about to lose everything, and life looked dismal and looked unbelievable, and he took his last dollar, and he bought this ticket, and he won the lottery, and he was able to help his mama. So the, that means, like, the story behind it was more interesting than the actual event. The event, the event was important, but the story leading up to it and the story afterwards, that was just the pivoting point was, that, was the change of that money. And so when we get into this thing, it's kind of interesting when we talked about these ideas. And so we're going to visit later what exactly they mean. So when we get into, when I got into the, this, this course of action, I started getting into things that I, I really had no idea about. And if you're kind of new, you probably spend a long time and you'll never come to this stuff on your own. Like this stuff had to be taught to me after 11 years of in and out, right? Like what this actual textbook is for. Like a lot more people are educated on it today than I was back then. But I used to have one of these and try to open it up, try to read it, and none of it made sense to me. They used to say, oh, try to find yourself in it. I never found myself in it. And anybody ever get told that? Read it, try to find yourself. Well, I never found myself. I, I read a couple pages, and I couldn't get past my own thinking. I spent a lot of time thinking. I'm a thinker. Any thinkers in here? I just spend a lot of time, I come back, visit the moment for a second, just catch my breath and then be off somewhere, that, you know, but sitting in the same room, but be off somewhere else. So when they introduced me to this thing, they talk about Ford, the first edition, they talk about 
We have Alcoholics Anonymous for more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I don't know what none of that means. What I'm doing, if you kind of did a survey to that, what do they mean by recovered by a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body? I'd give you my interpretation of that, or what recovered, uh, what they meant by recovered, or I'd give you, a lot of us kind of like our idea of our own opinion. Anybody kind of, that's what we think. We read something, then it says, we think it says, what do you think what we're saying? What's your opinion on my opinion on your opinion on my opinion? So we sit around talking about our opinions or what we think something says instead of what it actually says, right? I don't know why this thing is... Oh, right on, my, my daughter, my wife. So, so what happens as we go through this thing, I had to find out what they were talking about by seemingly hopeless state of mind and body because I really didn't understand what that kind of meant or recovered or who these people was that put this thing together. <laughs> and so what was really interesting is that they said, we have a story here, right? And, and, it's, and they talk about, we have our experience to better show you what you may be suffering from or what you may be afflicted with, right? Which I never really understood. So when we talked about the problem and all that other stuff, so what most people, what you wrote down, what the problem was, where did you get your information on that? When, we, when you talk about what the problem was, how many people came up with their own idea what they thought the problem was? So if you ask me what the problem was, the problem was where I was raised, who I was raised around, the circumstances that I was in, where I, where I come from, what happened to me, and all that was the problem. It was all these things around me. Why am I not, why am I not an alcoholic? Because the consequences associated with my drinking. Right? I never knew what an alcoholic was. You hear people say, oh, I'm an alcoholic because of the impaired charges, because I went to jail, because the, the consequences associated with, with a person who drinks too much doesn't make you an alcoholic. How many people are under the impression you're an alcoholic because of the consequences? If I could drink without consequence, then I wouldn't be an alcoholic. How many people would like to drink without consequence here? How many people would be here if you could drink without consequence? Maybe that's a better question, right? So, so we see, it was, it was the consequences of what we're doing that has us here. It wasn't the idea that I drank too much. Really, that was secondary. There's got to be a way I could drink without consequence. Because if I could drink without consequence, then I wouldn't be here. What got my attention was the consequences. Or other people. Other people were more concerned with my drinking than me. Anybody here have people around you more concerned about your drinking than you are? Hey, I think there's a problem here. I think I'm talking to you too much. I think that's the problem, right? Or, or, or we punish them for trying to help us. Did anybody ever mention anything about your drinking? You punish them, get mad at them, so they don't mention nothing to you again. They just kind of go, okay, I better not say nothing to them because they're going to lose their nut again. So the best thing I could do is just not say anything, right? And then you ever have people try to help you not drink? I didn't. I didn't have those people either. So when I kind of went through this, when I kind of went through this, it became a problem for me when I thought it was a problem. And then by the time I realized it was a problem, it was too late because the problem started way over here, right? And by the time I became aware of it, I was right in the middle of it, right? So when when they talk about this seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, I didn't have no idea what they were talking about. So the guys in this big book study started taking me through the doctor's opinion. And he says, now all the other times I went through this thing, all the other times I went through a, a study or a group or a 12 and 12 studies or any kind of study where they read something and then everybody would talk about what they thought it meant. You ever been in one of those studies? You read something, some people would even make reference to what they thought it meant. Or they would talk about something that had nothing to do with what you're reading. That like, the reading was just something a filler, so we could talk about ourselves. I don't know. <laughs> and so what happens if you're new? You hear all these people talking about something. You think they're talking about this, and you're thinking about. It. So you're kind of nuts, being guided by a bunch of people who are giving their opinion on something they don't understand. And so if you don't understand the basis of this thing, what do you think your recovery is going to look like? How many people have been relapsing? Right? How many people can't get really sober based for any given period of time? So when I went through the doctor's opinion, they kind of said, my sponsor, I'd say, he says, well, what did you get out of that? And I said, I think, or he, and he said, no, read it again. Read it again. And then by the time I got to a place, I said, he's saying this. 
he's saying that. I had to get his understanding and the doctor's opinion what the problem was, what he seen was a solution and the course of action that he witnessed of these people implementing in their life that brought about recovery. So when they kind of went through the doctor's opinion, they talked about here Dr. Silkworth back in 1934. If you could kind of think about that, these people are dying of alcoholism, right? And he's watching these people come into his facility, not the way they're coming in today. I mean, if you can imagine walking down the, uh, the hospital, uh, in, down the, the hallway, there'd be people having DTs, people strapped to gurneys, there'd be wives, kids. It'd be like real mayhem, like it'd be a nut house in the alcoholism ward, right? Where people would be in such a state, there'd be Thorazine and all this medication going through. I don't know if anybody has ever seen anybody go through DTs, but it's, it's quite the event. Like when I worked the triage, I... I like I had, uh, when I kind of look at it, I had like minimal DTs, but for me, I thought there were quite a bit like the spider webs and things crawling on me or seeing things in my bed and trails and stuff like that. They were minimum compared to what I watched this one guy when I worked the triage. He came down the stairs. He, he had like a knee missing his arm and a chronic alcoholic, right? He was losing, he was starting to lose limbs because of diabetes and all that stuff. He couldn't get sober. And what he was doing, we had to restrain him because what he was doing, he was pulling his lip off. He pulled his lip and he was splitting up past his nose. And he was pulling it off and he's screaming, it's in there. Is it? He thought there was an alien thing in there trying to, to take over, right? And in his brain, it was an actual DT. So we had to restrain him from hurting himself from the hallucination that he was suffering from, from the withdrawal of alcohol. That's how a lot of people used to die as a result of that stuff. We'd be at meetings and be, people back then like would go into a seizure right into a meeting. I can't remember the last time I seen that in a meeting. But it would right, you know, and a good speaker would just keep on speaking, right? <laughs> and all we attended to him and stuff like that. So that, that when you kind of, this doctor who kind of witnessed this stuff, and, and he kind of, kind of witnessed this guy who's been in this treatment facility like three times but on his third time there, he acquired some information that he put into practice, and he watched a miracle take place in his own facility with somebody he had regarded as hopeless. So it's pretty wild when you think about that in 1934. Here's all these people dying of alcoholism. This guy comes through there, what he thought was hopeless, found a solution to his problem, but applied it and recovered, and in turn asked for the request to work with other people. It's pretty wild when you think about that. And the doctor said, yeah, he was kind of had some misgivings. He says, yeah, okay, you could start working with other people and carrying this message. And he watched this movement start to happen, which becomes Alcoholics Anonymous, where we are today. That same message that was carried back then is what makes the difference in our lives between whether we stay or not, if you're alcoholic of this type. So I never knew I was alcoholic of this type. So everything I was trying to do wasn't working because I didn't understand the problem I was trying to apply it to. So if you don't know what the problem is, then any solution makes sense, right? And it's like, I don't know if anybody's ever been on the side of the road with your car hood up. Everybody walks by, what's the problem? I don't know, okay, let's start guessing, right? Everybody starts guessing, right? <laughs> that could be it. That could, and then you're trying all this stuff, and then a guy comes by and goes, well, what's what are the... What's going on? You kind of describe what the problem is. He says, oh, yeah, I know what that is. It's this, right? And this is what you got to do to fix it. So now he knows what the problem is. Now he knows what the course of action is or the solution is to implement a change to the problem that, that he's experiencing. So now when somebody else comes by, he goes, hey, it could be. And they said, no, no, I know exactly what it is based on the symptoms, based on the problem. I know what the problem is and I know what the solution is I just got to go get a new battery or the cables connected whatever and once that's changed the problem will fix itself and that's kind of like most of us don't know what the problem is in recovery and I was one of those people for years I had no idea what the problem was right and so if you don't know what the problem is everything makes sense and so we're the only ones confused why it's not working look at everything I've been doing I've been doing this I've been doing that I've been going to meetings I've been everything one ply recovery right I've been doing, I've been doing, I've been doing, and it's not working. You'll catch on shortly. I've been doing, right? It's kind of like I've been trying to be the solution to a problem I don't understand, and it's not working, <coughs> right? And I'm in a group of people who a lot of them are doing the same thing. So when we went through the doctor's opinion, I started seeing for the first time what alcoholism was. And what, what's really weird is it's not really complicated. There's only really two symptoms in alcoholism. 
So, you know, when we read on the board off the walls of recovery, you read up on the board, it says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. There's only two things what they're admitting to that makes them powerless over alcohol. After 11 years of in and out, my sponsor asked me what they were, and I couldn't tell you what they were. I didn't have a clue what they were talking about, what they were admitting to that made them powerless over alcohol. Well, I do the catchphrases. Why are you alcoholic? Because I'm powerless. Well, what does that mean? No, I'm powerless. What does powerless mean? I'm just powerless. What are you powerless over? I'm powerless over everything. I'm just a victim to me in life. I'm powerless over everything. I just, uh, I walk around with a cloud, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, that donkey, whatever that guy's name. Oh, always me, right? <laughs> that was kind of like Wind of the Pooh episode. Uh, Eeyore, that was, I uh, had Eeyore sobriety. Oh, always me. <laughs> Nothing ever works out right. <laughs> so, and the doctor's opinion, as he went through here, he describes the first symptom in alcoholism, which was news to me. I would have never came up with that at any time with the group of people I was hanging around with or in the bar. So when I kind of went through here, he says there's only one symptom that makes us alcoholic. That's it, one. Anybody have an idea what that one symptom is? Spiritual malady. If you kind of know the answer because you've been around for 10 years, you're kind of glad you have a spiritual malady. So that makes kind of sense, right? You hear that all the time. This is what makes you alcoholic, right? I'm just going to not write it all out as a spiritual malady. How many people here? That sounds good, right? Any other ones? What else? Oh What's God. the first symptom in alcoholism? As long as I stop drinking, I can stop. Hey, how long have you been around now? I said. Wow. Okay, so that's what I said. I'll let the new guys talk here for a second. <laughs> I, I'm glad you finally got the answer after six years. But I mean, <laughs> you didn't get it the first 15 talks either. So <laughs> you say, I finally got the answer. <laughs> we know, okay, relax. So how many guys have been to meetings here? Right? So what do you hear as the problem? You, me. you. That, oh, that's a nice one too. You, me. <laughs> nothing. Oh, me. Yeah, we know that. You. <laughs> How many people agree he's the problem? <laughs> okay, so we just ask him to leave. We should all be good, right? So me, right? <coughs> me. Well, who's the problem? I'm the problem. It sounds good, right? Yeah, I'm the problem. Well, me, spirituality, you. A lot of people think the other people are the problem. What else do we hear? Born that way, yeah? Born that way. And what else do you guys hear as newcomers? What do you hear? You're coming into a fellowship of people. Him. Huh? Him. Yeah, him. So we come into a fellowship of people. We hear all this different information. <coughs> and we're sitting here getting all these different ideas. So if you think it's a spiritual malady, then right away you think all I need to do is get God. But now you don't know what the problem is and you don't know what the solution is. Right? You have an idea what the solution is, but you really don't know what the problem is. If you don't know what makes you alcoholic, right, what is the likelihood of the rest of it making sense? Zero. So what that tells me, if you're kind of new, the who's ever sponsoring you never really took you through the first part of the book, right? Because when I went through the doctor's opinion, and this is the, in the short period of time when I came back, he's saying, what is, does he say is the problem? So as we went through the doctor's opinion, what he explains that makes us alcoholic or makes these people alcoholic is the allergy. These people have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. That's what makes them powerless over alcohol. I would have never came up with that. I would have heard that in a meeting and I, it would have went right by me. I'm sure there's people talking about the allergy or the, th the, the reaction, but I would have never picked up on it because I never thought that was the problem. Right? So the first symptom that they talk about here that makes these people different than other people is the allergy. And they talk about, what the hell, how can I be allergic to alcohol? It doesn't make sense. So what's a normal reaction? If I'm having an abnormal, or these people have an abnormal reaction, what's a normal reaction? I would have never guessed that either. See, so I would have, like, the first two questions, and I'm getting them all wrong, never mind the rest of them, right? So they talked about a normal reaction is somebody who has starting to have a couple drinks because it's a toxin, right, toxin, that they start to get an out-of-control, nauseating feeling. I don't get that when I drink. I get a in-control, let's burn something to the ground, let's get partying, let's get rocking and roll feeling, 
right? And I, I, I'm the type of guy that when it comes to the bar, the band starting at 10, we need to get there at happy hour around 5.30 to get a good seat and get drinking. I don't know if anybody drinks like that here. <laughs> I'm going camping. I get all the booze I need. Two days into the camping trip, I remember I didn't bring food. <laughs> like <laughs> we're bringing empties up to the pizza parlor to get slices, right? Like, uh, like I'm I'm one of those alcoholics, right? I'm the guy the three liters of wine. Yeah, the allergy. So I ended up uh, dating this girl for a little while. I was sober. I thought she'd keep me sober because she was a normie, and and, uh, and I ended up relapsing. She's never seen me drink before. That that was a short term relationship. Once I started, I went to the bar with her at five thirty. Happy hour, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm through three shots and, and, and a couple beers, and then because the band's starting at 10 and it's getting close to 6, so I want to get my buzz on before, you know, to get things going right. And I look over, she's halfway done her first beer. And I said, come on, it's, it's happy hour. <laughs> get happy, <laughs> right? And she's going, oh, I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm looking, at this first time I look at her weird, she says, I'm trying. I said, trying, try harder. So I get more concerned with my drinking again. I got a couple more shots. I look over. She's finished her first beer, and I got her second one sitting there. And she's halfway done. She goes, I'm not feeling well. I want to go home. <laughs> so I'm walking back to our place with her. And I'm looking at her, and I'm thinking, I say, uh, I think we've got a problem here. She goes, what's that? I said, I, said, uh, I don't think this is going to work. She goes, well, I said, you got a problem with your drinking. <laughs> I've never seen anybody wow. drink like you before. And I, I don't see this working because if you think I'm going to go home every time you have a beer and a half, I said, this ain't going to happen. I said, I don't, this, this is it. I'm looking for a partner that could really appreciate what we do for a living. She says, what's that as a drink? <laughs> it's all about drinking. So anyway, she's having a normal reaction to alcohol. So that means how is my abnormal is... They talk about when these people drink, they get thirstier. They trigger this phenomena, a craving. They call it a phenomena, an unexplainable event, because they never really understood it there. So how do you explain an unexplainable event? They use that word a couple times. Is we'll give you pictures what it looks like, right? And so as they started going through this, and they explained from their own experience what this phenomena looked like in their life, it made sense to me why these people, these allergic types, could never safely use alcohol in any form whatsoever. Because when they put it into the system, something happened to them different than other people. They got thirstier. So that meant the child support wasn't as important as my next drink. That meant my rent wasn't as important as my next drink. That meant going back to work wasn't as important as my next drink. And we could add all the other stuff to that. Why did I do methamphetamine? Why did I do? Why did I do? Why not do it? Right? So, you know, like, yeah, why not do it? This is like most of my stories, that sounds like a good idea, right? And then it was, that was a real bad idea. And then I forget what the idea was and I did it again. I think we kind of, my, my story was the never ending story and it never got better and always worse, right? So the first symptom in alcoholism that makes me alcoholic or makes them alcoholic was the allergy. And I never knew that, right? So if I don't have the allergy, can I be alcoholic? No. Can I have a spiritual malady? Yes, sure. And, be an, and not be an alcoholic? Yes, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? So that then it kind of goes on to make sense of that. So what did I have first, <laughs> spiritual malady or alcoholism? alcoholism? Alcoholism. I became spiritually sick as a result of my addiction or my illness. Right? <clears throat> alcohol and drug addiction, then illness. Right? So as I became more dependent upon alcohol and my illness be increased and my inability to control the outcome of what I was doing, I became less dependent on things, human and people, places and things. I became more, more prone to finding my comfort in a drink. Right? So, so, you know, as I went through here and then they talked about, most people, they always talk about their first drink. Everybody, anybody ever heard that? When was the first time I had a drink? How many people heard that? They think, they, well, you think that's important. Oh, it must be, I need to tell you the first time I had a drink. That's not important. I'm allergic to pistachios. I wasn't allergic to pistachios the first time I ate them. As the years went on, I started having uh, adverse reactions to it. 
right? It was the first time I had an adverse reaction to it, but I didn't realize I was having a reaction to it. And then by the time I realized I was allergic to them, which I didn't fully comprehend at the time, when my throat started closing, I drove myself to the hospital, and it was a couple years ago, and they told me I'm allergic to pistachios. Now, is it the problem? Was it the first time I ate pistachios that I have a problem, or was it the first time I started seeing a symptom of it? It became a problem. The first time I seen a symptom. So when I went back over my drinking history, because a lot of people, on my family, and we were French, and, and on my mom's side, and, and, and you know, the wine and drinking all my life. I can't remember my first drink. My mom said I was still in my diapers the first time I grabbed the beer and I got drunk, and, and they all laughed because, you know, they leave in the apartment. And I knew the magic in that bottle from that age, right? So, and so what happened, so I can't remember my first drink, but I remember the first time I felt the magic in a drink. I remember the first time I felt the change, that chemical change in my thinking, my attitude, my outlook. I remember the first time I took this drink and it solved all my problems. Anybody remember that Eureka moment, that shift, that kind of something happens where you kind of have the ability to be comfortable in your own skin. You get that, this is good. And I'll have drinks before that, but I never had that effect as I did this one day. When I had a resentment, and I was probably 15, and I and I drank before that many a times, and I had a couple drinks, got drunk, and all that other. But this one pivoting moment is I took this drink, and I had a profound personality change. That the problem I had before I picked up the drink was no longer there after I had the drink, right? And what that kind of looks like, if you don't know that. When I was 15, these guys kind of came down the street and they're older than me and, and I was with my friends and they started harassing me and humiliating me in front of this girl that I liked and this guy and my friends that, that were hanging out with. And they left, uh, they were drinking <clears throat> and I was thinking what they did and I replayed the tape over and over and over again and I turned down on myself and I was trying you blah, 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 blah. And I went to my friend's place because we were doing restaurant taverns and I poured a big glass of rum and I drank the first glass of rum as I was drinking that rum, a change started coming over me, right? And then by the time I finished the second glass of rum, I left that place looking for those guys. And I intuitively knew how to handle situations that used to baffle me. I suddenly realized that my experience would be able to help me in this situation, <laughs> right? And I'm walking in, I remember I'm walking with my buddies, I said, you guys mind your own business, I'm 15, eh? You know, 15, I could just see me now walking on the afro like this. Well, I said, you guys mind your own business. I'm going to show them. And they're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got the girl there. And I said, you know, I get there, go through the front door of the place. I said, both of you is outside. And I took them on one at a time. Cleaned both of their clocks. This is good stuff. Next time I had a problem, what do you think I said? Well, Tony, why don't you sit down and try to figure it out? Go through your emotions, go through your feelings, and talk to the people around you. Where my brain said, you know what will make you feel better? Make this situation all just right size is another drink. That's what I mean by the magic. So anybody ever have a problem at a young age and kind of go, I know what will make me feel better? Drink. And then you have another drink, another drink, and all hell. So that's what they talk about in here, right, is this allergy. So if I never took a drink, would I be able to trigger the allergy? So they talk about the only solution for this problem is total abstinence. Anybody ever hear that? Just don't take the first one? Short meeting. That was the end of the weekend, so you guys should be good to go now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes sense, right? Like if I'm allergic to pistachios, what's the solution? Don't eat them. That's a normal person. Don't eat them. Perfect. So I could sit in meetings from now on talking about how I'm keeping myself from not eating pistachios and how my life's so much better as a result of me and turning it over, letting it go and surrendering to the fact that I can't eat pistachios. And as long as I don't eat them, I'll be okay. Anybody? Yeah. I feel great. I don't even think about pistachios. <laughs> it's been a while since I've thought about eating pistachios. It doesn't even come to mind. You don't obsess about controlling eating them. So you're not a pistachio holic. So, so you're not getting the idea here. So, you're not getting the idea here. So the idea is, I know I can't eat them because of the consequences associated with them. Right? I know I can't eat them because I've gotten such a severe reaction to it, there's no longer any idea that I can do this safely. Right? I know I can't. 
See, why you control, obsess about it, because you think you still can get away with it. You haven't done step one yet. Because if you're still obsessing about the idea of using, then you haven't done step one. So and then right away I got some people arguing. I could tell how your eyes lit up there a second, right? Because you have a one-sided conversation and you're the only one participating in an information that you're defending that you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I'll defend it anyways. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, buddy, I got three months and you're full of shit after 29 years. <laughs> yes, we are, but keep coming back till you find out, till you become one of us, right? So, so what happens is, is we defend positions that we really really don't understand. So when we kind of went through this, and I was the same way, I was kind of like, what the hell? So the idea is, once I understand that I have this allergy, or these people have the allergy, that's why they say, let's not make it personal. Let's look at alcoholism from somebody who's afflicted with it, and not look at you. Let's look at somebody else for a second. So if these people in this tax are allergic to it, right? What's the only solution that they can find so they don't have that reaction anymore? Not to drink. Can we all agree on that? Makes sense, right? So, but there's a problem when they don't drink. What happens is they start thinking. And they think and their thinking is okay because they're used to thinking. So they become irritable, restless, and discontent. Anybody need that explained? 29 years doing these studies and I've never had to explain that once, right? We kind of get that. No, you don't need to explain that. I'm feeling that way right now as you're talking. A little irritable, restless, and discontented, right? So, this doctor witnesses that these people are a little irritable, restless, and discontent. And they're just not quite right in their skin, right? And the way they think is a little maladjusted and full-fledged from reality and downright mental defectives. The way they look at life is a little different than most people look at life. They have a warped sense of perception, but they don't know that because they're used to the way they look at these things, right? It's like a normal person looks out that window and describes it. Alcoholic looks out this window and I can't see what you're talking about. And they'll argue that this is the right perception. They can't see that the normal person is looking through a different window. Then that's what we are. We'll argue, no, none of that, what you're describing is out this window, right? And it's kind of like, well, do you see the window I'm looking at? And that's kind of like alcoholism. We're looking at it from an obscured lens, like it's not quite right, a warped perception on reality. So what happens is we see other people drinking with impunity. You know what impunity means? Without consequence. How many people, I was under the impression if I could just drink without consequence, I'll be okay. It's all about the consequences, right? I'm an alcoholic or I'm in AA because of the consequences. I'm not here because of drinking. So these people who are irritable, restless, and this can then heat, they're witnessing other people drinking with impunity without consequence, and they think, if I could just drink without consequence, I'll be okay. But the reason, why can't they drink without consequence? They're allergic. They're allergic. That means they do stupid stuff because of the amounts of alcohol they drink. Right? Anybody who drinks that amount or uses that amount is bound to do stupid stuff here because they're impaired. Anybody do stupid stuff here? <laughs> Anybody ever go to a campsite? You know, back, back in my day, it was polyester pants. They were plastic. <laughs> right? Nylon, plastic. Not a good idea to run through a fire wearing those things. <laughs> but you would never suspect that at the beginning of the day, saying, oh, this is going to be a great weekend, and everybody, yes, we're all friends, right? And then you get drinking. At the end of the night, you think it's a great idea to run through the fire. And it's not even your fire. It's the neighbor's fire. <laughs> Hit on the wife, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nothing safe in the wilderness. <laughs> Hide the sheep. <laughs> no, anyway. So... If I could just not do that stuff, I'll be okay. I'm going to behave myself this time. They see it. They take a drink. Drinks it with, they see others taking it with impunity. They trigger the allergy. And all hell breaks loose again. Right? So, then they try to control the amounts I drink. If I could control the amounts I drink, then I won't get into trouble. Anybody have that conversation? Well, the only reason we, it doesn't work is, is it starts off good and then we forget that we're supposed to be trying to control it. I'll just watch myself. <laughs> Right? And then, so if I'm controlling it, am I enjoying it? So if I'm enjoying it, am I controlling it? So we don't like controlling and enjoy our drinking. There's nothing appealing about any one of those two things. Normal people can do that. My, my girls, 
and my wife, they, they can control and enjoy their drinking. They baffle me. They do stuff that just doesn't make sense to me. I sent a picture of Renee. And my wife puts a cellophane over her wine to save it for the next day. Oh. Like, I, I, like, we've been together 13 years, coming up married 10, and the first time I seen that in the fridge, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. She goes, what? I said, come here. I said, are you doing that to bother me? <laughs> she looks in the fridge and goes, what? I said, put the cellophane on the wine. She goes, oh, I'll save that for tomorrow. We're having steak for dinner, and I just want to, you know, it'll be able to air better, and it'll be nice chilled. And I said, why don't you just finish the house? I said, I don't know, I didn't want to drink anymore. I said, there's only that much left in the glass, an inch and a half to finish it. No, no, no. I looked at her and I thought, you got a problem. <laughs> like, like, I don't understand that, right? Because the allergy, how many people would have just drank it here? Okay, now I'm getting the right group of people. Now I'm getting, now we're, th see, we're speaking a language now, right? How many people here has poured a drink and realized, oh, I poured a little too much and start pouring it back in the bottle? <laughs> see, see, we're, we're the only group of people that make fun of those people. There's no other group of people in the world that make fun of normal drinkers. We look at them and go, ah. Ruin your life, ruin your life. <laughs> we're, we're good. Amateurs, like we take a big pride in. I walked in, in the kitchen was my wife pouring wine back in the glass, and I just turned around and I'm not saying nothing. So she still does that 13 years later. Her reaction to alcohol is way different than mine. She asked me what she goes, You think I have a problem? I said, Honey, what you drink in a month is a starter kit for me on a Friday night. Like, I just know, like, I know how much of anybody last call. You I got more than enough on the table. You know when last call is. Anybody don't know when last call is? <laughs> right? And you got it all on the table. What's the most important thing that happens when they're coming to collect it? You got to get it out of the bar. Anybody got the deep pockets? No. You think nobody notices. <laughs> 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 the girlfriend with the big purse, clink, 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 clink. <laughs> Nobody sees it. <laughs> it. You ever watch a drunk person and kind of think, oh my God, what's that mean? <laughs> so I'm trying to sneak all this booze out of there, and the foam's coming out of it, and you're ruining your jacket and all this stuff, but it doesn't matter. You got your, anybody ever fall down a flight of stairs here holding on to a drink? And you save the drink? You need six stitches, 15 stitches? Maybe a broken leg, but you saved your drink. <laughs> Which is abnormal. There's something fundamentally wrong with us when you talk to a normal person. But when you talk to us, it makes sense. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got into a fight. You're lying in the alley all full of blood. What are you looking for when you get up? Drink. Where's my drink? <laughs> Car wreck. Get the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Burning building. Where are you going? I left the bottle. What about the cat? He could fend for himself. <laughs> Get the bottle. Save the bottle. <laughs> save the kids. <laughs> no, the bottle. So we're a little abnormal when it comes to drinking. And then it happens again, and we have a firm resolution. Any firm resolutions here? Anybody remember the first time you said never again? My friend was talking about, uh, he says, yes, sir. He says, I've never relapsed. I said, no, you don't understand what we mean by relapse. Right? So it makes sense. You hear people in the fellowship talk about, well, I've relapsed continuously. Well, they don't understand that you really never experienced relapse. You explain, my sponsor said that I ex experienced abstinence. I've never experienced relapse. He says, I've confused my abstinence for recovery. Remember, I told you I didn't like George A. or Chuck. Chuck took me on. He was one of those guys that just kind of loved me in the fellowship. He was an absolutely phenomenal man. And he would explain things to me, and he's really insensitive, eh? So these, these in the doctor, they, they, anybody got somebody who's insensitive? So stick to them. They'll save your life, right? So we got to this thing here, and they, the doctor talks about, they make a firm resolution not to drink again. Like, I'm never doing that again. My, my first resolution, I was 15 years old. And when I got introduced to AA, I thought, right on. This is fantastic. I found a way of life that I don't have to go down that road. Right, because remember I told you I was standing on the 18th floor of that building wondering if this is going to be my life, this ain't happening. 
but I had no other alternative than the road I was on. So when I came along, it seemed like there was another opportunity than the one I was experiencing. I felt that hope inside, and I'm mistaken on hope for change, right? I didn't have the mechanics to deal with me when life was happening. And that's what they were talking about. As life started happening here, these people started getting irritable, restless, and discontented. They started turning on themselves. Their conversation became more direct and more personal. And it became more amped at targeting one's self, self-esteem, belief system, and the world around them. And they got to a place where they couldn't even stand themselves. And so all they could see was the escape and peace and ease that came by taking a drink, regardless of the consequences that, that beheld them afterwards. The consequences were secondary. Who cares about the consequences? I need something now because the, if I can't go on another minute feeling the way I'm feeling, nobody in this room like that? Yeah. Right? And then they come to with a firm resolution not to do it again. This is, the doctor says this is repeated over and over and over. Unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. I'm that guy. But I didn't understand that because I never understood the problem and the solution. Right? He says something happens in their brain. He calls it a desire back then because he doesn't want to freak us out with the conversation. They're doing building blocks all the way through here, right? Remember they talked about they recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. So they're just starting into a conversation. So by the time you ever, anybody ever start you in on a conversation, it starts off light. By the time they get their attention, they're really hammering you over here. That's what our book does. It starts off light. Light gets your attention, reels you in, reels you in, reels you in, gets your attention. By the time you get your attention, you go, holy shit. They go, yeah. <laughs> right? And it kind of does that, right? And then by the time you get over here, it's way more harsher than a conversation than over here. It means it's more fact-based and more actual over here, and it's got your attention. By the time you go over here, you realize the desperateness of your situation, and you realize something's got to give because over here, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to survive. I'm going to die if I stay here. And the only hope I have is to go here and move on. And so the doctor talks about the solution that's available to us. And what helps us get this solution is the fellowship, is the people that surround you. You think you're picking them, they're picking you. They see, they hear you at a meeting go, oh, oh that one's mine. <laughs> you guys are handpicked. <laughs> because you remind us of our own stories. And the hopelessness of our situation. Someone took the time out of their lives to have us live in the life that we have. The fellowship is so important. It is, it's like the, the bind that holds us together on the spiritual realm is, is kind of the energy or the magic. Without that magic, the message in itself is not enough. You real, we really need this thing, right? Because we're each other's life preservers. Because what we do is we point each other in the right direction. So I'm sitting there in like a meeting like this, wherever it is, and we talk about the same thing. They talk about hope and our inability to stay present. And just as, as probably as I was talking, your mind would take you different aspects and different as, you know, different moments in your own life and your own story, or you're arguing with what you're hearing and not agreeing with it. You know, the critic, the judge, the prosecutor, anybody have those guys in their mind? So we're in a constant state of battle. So my sponsor said this is repeated over and over, and, and at the meetings they kind of go, "Is there anybody new?" Ever hear that? And he says, put up my hand. He says, you're not new, put your hand down. He says, anybody coming back? You ever hear that? I put up my hand, he says, put your hand down. You're never really here. (laughs) (laughs) Any visitors from out of town? He says, put your hand down. I said, I'm not visiting. He says, you in a big book study? I said, no, he says, you're just visiting. (laughs) 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 And he give me these one-liners, eh? And I think about him the whole meeting, and after the meeting, I go, hey, hey. And he goes, you thought about that the whole meeting? And I go, yeah. He goes, you're welcome. I said, what do you mean you're welcome? He says, you left yourself alone for a whole hour. (laughs) So, So anyways, I love these guys, right, George and Chuck. But they were teaching me a lot of stuff about myself I was unable to see. So they talked about here. So the first part of the problem is they talk about the allergy. If I don't have the allergy, if these people don't have the allergy... The non-alcoholic. And the second thing they started talking about is there's something fundamentally wrong in the way they think. But they don't know what that is yet, and they haven't really honed in on it. But they also talked about until a change happened in their thinking, there's really little hope of their recovery. And he talks about a change that they can't bring about by themselves. Something has to come about beyond understanding. So he says, here's two examples of people when you go through the doctor's opinion. 
He says, all these people have one symptom in common, that they can't start drinking without producing the phenomenon of craving. That's the one thing they all have in common. And a big group of these people also have something that matter psychologically where they can't stop themselves from starting. He says, I noticed this in my treatment center. A lot of other people are able to do the psychological approach or behavioral modification approach, but there's a certain group of people which we'll come to find out as the real alcoholic are unable to keep themselves sober based on their experience and everything they do under their own resources and power and experience. And I kind of went, whoa, on that one because that was kind of my story without even realizing it. And he says, the only thing that will help these type of people is an entire psychic change. Until that happens, they're who? So I took away from all the stuff that, that I heard was a part of recovery. And you hear this stuff all the time is, once I do step one, I'll be okay. Anybody ever hear that? The reason I realized is because I haven't done step one. That's, is that a true or false statement? False. It's a false statement. That the reason I, I'm not getting sober is because I haven't hit bottom. Is that a true or false statement? False. It's a false statement. The reason I'm not getting sober is because I haven't surrendered. Is that a true or false statement? False. It's a false statement. Right? Because those who say true don't understand what they meant by surrender. You have your own understanding of what you think it means, and it's different than the actual meaning. And the actual meaning of surrender isn't anywhere in here as a part of our process of recovery or the solution that they offer these people who are dying of alcoholism. Those who use the word surrender understand what they're talking about, but the person that's hearing it don't understand the experience of those that are speaking it. It's two different experiences. So the person over here is talking about the surrender idea. Has probably done the steps and experienced some forward change based on the course of action they've done. The person over here hears surrender and thinks, oh, that's the solution, but they don't hear everything that this person did to get there. Because mm -hmm. that in itself will all agree, every person, that in itself, surrender wouldn't have been enough to have them experiencing the life they have. So they qualify that by, by meaning, I gave up, I surrendered. I was without hope, I was given hope, I went through a course of action, I experienced something on a deep, meaningful level that created a psychic change in my life sufficient enough to keep me sober, and I lived by these principles over here. This process was a surrender, we call it abandon or changing course, right? But to try to achieve this experience over here, over here is impossible. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And we're trying to experience it over here, and the guy over here is forgetting that he went through a process to get to here. Right? And it's all about the process. So in the doctor's opinion, he gives two examples. Hold on. He gives two examples of people who are of this type, of the hopeless variety. Right? They both got sold on the ideas contained in this book. One had grave emotional and mental disorders, and the other one was a real alcoholic, meaning beyond human aid. That means everything they did under their own resources wasn't enough to keep them sober. How many people have been relapsing here? How many people have been trying to change their life here? How many people are ending up in the same place all the time wondering how they got here? And that's the problem with... With, with the problem, right, is that nothing happens sufficient enough to have them experiencing something different. So the doctor kind of witnesses that when these types of people experience this thing that they're talking about here, that he witnessed, something profound happened in their life. And he says, I want to tell you, I've witnessed this thing, this thing that we call, he calls it a phenomenon. He says it's not really an unexplainable event, how these people went from from the, the depths of despair and dying of alcoholism to a life beyond anything I could ever imagine. He says, I've witnessed this thing. It's pretty profound. And not only did I witness it, I'll endorse it by putting a letter in, in this book in regards to my witnessing this thing that's happening back there in the 1934. That's pretty wild when you think about that, right? That he witnessed this wholesale miracle. And he's seen the guy who went to three, treatment three times, Bill. And we'll get into his story when we come back. We get into, I'll show you in part of his elements in his story the second time around, where he had all those elements of the earmarks of surrender, acceptance, willingness, and all this other stuff, and what he wouldn't do to change his life. Alcohol was his master and all that. He had to, we've had all those experiences, but what he didn't have was a solution to take him out of that place he was in. Right? And that's what they're talking about. We have a way out. We have a solution that works. If you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths again, then you're ready to take certain steps. It's not lottery sobriety. Right? It's not click your heels, Dorothy. We're off to, you know, three times. There's no place like home. There's no, it's not that kind of recovery. You need to get involved. So we're going to have a break, but what did you want to? 
yeah, I just want to around that, that, that concept. I think it's way more important that we talk in length about that, that surrender is not enough, right? <coughs> would it be correct, would it be correct, if we, you know, if we look at, and these are the things we all, these are the things we try when it comes to with and without the solemn oath, you know, which, which had the intent, you know, I'm basically, I'm quitting, I'm surrendering, I'm giving up, this is it, you know, I will never, ever do it again, right? You know, or in, in, in the other reading on page 62, we're talking about we had philosophical convictions galore, right? We just couldn't live up to that even so we wanted to. Yeah. Because so the we're, 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 being yeah. I do surrender. You know, yeah. I, yeah, I, got, I got what you're saying. Yeah. You're, we're, what page are you talking about? It was on 62. That what page 62. are we on? Early there. Yeah, where are we? Where are we in the book? In the doctor's, doctor's opinion. Doctor's opinion. So if we could stay focused where we are, <laughs> then, then then you'll find there'll be a lot less arguments as we go through here, right? <laughs> and then, so based on that, some of you is gonna need a smoke, uh, and when I come back, I'll explain what he's trying to explain afterwards. <laughs> Yes, though. Yeah. So I'm an alcoholic. My name's Tony. It hasn't changed since the last time we talked. So now here's a part of the exercise, which is going to help later. How many people found their brain kind of getting really active during the talk? Nobody admitting to it. We do. We, we, we kind of hear maybe some new information. We want to defend what we think is the correct information. And that's natural, right? When I went through this, remember I spent 11 years in and out. And then when I got introduced to this, the critic would show up, eh? And it would be like kind of, but what we're trying to, what we're doing here is when we back up, like I was telling Renee, if we could kind of remember, we're going through the doctor's opinion. We're, we're looking at his findings on this, his understanding or his synopsis or his writings on alcoholism. He's giving his observations on people who are afflicted with alcoholism. Where does he work? He works in the town's hospital specializing in alcohol and drug addiction. He's the chief physician. Alcoholics Anonymous asked him to give us a letter based on his understanding of alcoholism. The first thing he noticed about all of us or all these people who were afflicted with alcoholism was what was the first symptom he noticed about all these people? They had an allergy. And that's why he says these allergic types. So he's using language now that he's going to build on. Remember when we started this thing is they were going to show us how they recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I don't know what they're talking about. So the doctor says, here, I'm going to start explaining alcoholism. So we're going to learn certain language that we're going to follow through us. So he's talking about these allergic types, right? Can never safely use alcohol in any form whatsoever because they have an allergy to the alcohol. So the first symptom of alcoholism is the allergy. Then he talked about that there's something fundamentally different in the way they think and process things. They're not satisfied to be told they're maladjusted, full flight from reality, and downright mental defectives. We're the only ones that get offended by that statement. We go, what do you mean? You know, my sponsor would go, really? Really? Like, I would, when they read that, I'm not a defective, mental defective. My sponsor said, really? Like, how long have you been at this now? 11 years. How old are you? 27? He says, tell me all your accomplishments. Let, let's, let's write them down. <laughs> let's see all your life goals. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> so, so then he gave two examples. So then what, what's the beauty about the book is when you kind of go through this, a lot of people say, read the doctor's opinion and try to find yourself. That's not the purpose of the doctor's opinion. If you get identification in it, that's awesome. But the purpose of the doctor's opinion is to get his understanding on the views of alcoholism. So when we get to Bill's story, it starts off here as what is the point of Bill's story? The point of Bill's story is to give you an example, is, is to expand on what alcoholism looks like in somebody's life. He gave you two small synopsis or two small pictures of people who were alcoholic of the type he talked about who incorporated the solution that he talked about and had that change of the psychic change and what their life looked like afterwards. So in How It Works, it talks about what we used to be like. No, what we were like. What happened and what we're like now, not what it was like. It's two different stories, what it was like and what I was like, right? So we see that small little snapshot of what he's talking about. So Bill's story is an expansion on somebody who's afflicted with alcoholism and, and the struggles he had going through this. So if you haven't been through Bill's story, by the time we get to where he talks about going to treatment here for the third time, 
we're talking about page uh, 12 and 13. So, in the first five years, he's one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. He couldn't get sober. When you think about that, it's pretty profound. And so it, it kind of gives you the ideas. Alcoholics Anonymous is not designed for people who can stay sober. It's designed for people who can't stay sober. It's designed for relapsers. Because if you could stay sober, then you could just join the church group and change your life. Anybody here ever try to change their life? Oh, we are not good at it. <laughs> we forget what we were trying to change. <laughs> right? So Alcoholics Anonymous is designed for relapsers. Right? And we find that hard to believe. Well, Bill was a chronic relapser. But he kind of when he went through the first time, he kind of came with up the ideas. He saw he could not take so much as one drink. Because when he took a drink, something fundamentally was different than him than happened with other people. How many people are under the impression, I can't take a drink. There's no way I can do this. Because something keeps on happening to me, right? And so Bill had that understanding that that stopped him from drinking. Right? And then when he ended up in treatment, the doctor told him about his situation. I told him about the problem. Hey, you have an allergy to alcohol and there's something fundamentally wrong in your thinking. Right? That stops you from seeing the danger in what you're about to do. All you see is the ease and comfort. You seem to be suffering from this malady that we'll talk about later. It's not the spiritual malady. It's a different malady, a sickness in your mind that left to your own devices. You keep on returning to the trough. You keep on drinking. Bill goes, ah, that's it. I understand myself now. I understand step one. And he thought that knowledge would keep him sober. How many people heard it before? Though the reason you keep on drinking is because you haven't done step one. Right? Well, the people who made that statement don't understand what they're talking about. They were misinformed what step one was. And I was one of those people, and all my sponsors beforehand were one of those people, because in my 11 years of in and out, they kept on telling me that. The reason you realize is because you haven't done step one. And I'm sitting there, I've done step one. I've surrendered, I've letting go, I've hit and bottom. I, you know, I remember going to my sponsor once that says, I could get off the elevator anytime I want. You ever hear that one? Yeah, All right. my, my sponsor would say, come here. He says, you've got to go up three flights of stairs to get to the elevator. <laughs> he, says, he says, your life is the bottom, right? <laughs> I bounced along the bottom. It was like, bing, bing, bing. Where most people talk, most people's stories sober. I, I mean, uh, when, when I think about uh, most people's bottom is where I grew up. So when they talk about the horrific lifestyle that they had, that was my reality growing up. So it, wasn't, it was never external circumstances that really got me here because I just adapted. Like the worse my life got, the more, I, more used to it I got. Like I just I, I kind of adapt. adapt. I, I just adapt, change, and, and then my life, because I couldn't control my life, so my life got smaller and smaller and smaller. Because if you can't control your alcoholism, you can't control your life. So what you have to do is change your life to adapt to your alcoholism. That kind of makes sense. But now I understand with the allergy in that mind. So when you go through Bill's story, he understands what the problem is, but yet he drank again. Right? And then he ends up in treatment for the second time. And he talks about in treatment there of, of his desperateness of his situation. And the doctor and his, and the, and he's talking to his wife. He talks about the idea he's going to have wet brain. He's going to resign to alcoholic, like he's going to die of this illness. And he almost welcomed the fact. And he's sitting there or lying in his bed thinking about his situation. Anybody ever lie in your bed thinking about your situation? <laughs> we like thinking, eh? And it really helps if you're lying down when you do it. <laughs> and you got people confirming what you're thinking. I know it. <laughs> like we, we like, that's the good thing about pain and self-pity. It's ours. Nobody could take it from you. Oh, I'll pet that puppy. <laughs> right? Because they could take happiness from you, but they can't take misery from you, right? And you can cultivate it. You really, you really got to shut the phone off. You got to kind of really... Right, really, really pay attention to it. And horizontal is a really good way to get into self-pity. Anybody ever notice that? I've been thinking, it's hard to be depressed and walk. You ever notice that? So you got to get mobile. You got to sit down. And then you got to go, oh, yeah, this feels better. And then the body says, you know, if you know if you're lying down, you could really, really, really work this thing. Yeah. 
And then, and you don't shut off the phone. You leave it where you can see it. So when people phone, say, "I'm not answering that." <laughs> Nobody like that in here, right? So, anyways, so Bill's in this situation, right? And I've been in that situation. What he wouldn't do to change his life, and he leaves the hospital. And what keeps him sober for a while is fear. Anybody ever try to stay sober here on fear, right? Because he really doesn't fully comprehend what the situation is. And, and he's trying to stay sober and then he drinks again. And then he tells, he knows why he drinks again. Because he understands step one. The reason he drank again was the insidious insanity that preceded the first drink. He was able to, to label the symptom that he was suffering from. But most people, when they ask, when I ask that why, remember that on the sheet, why did you relapse the last time? How many people put the insidious insanity? Bill, after finding out and doing step one, thinking this was the answer to self-knowledge, he left the hospital for the second time, the treatment center for the second time now. What kept him sober was fear. Then came the insidious insanity and he drank again. Right? So what's Bill's story? Bill's story is the problem, no solution, drink again. The problem, no solution, drink again. The problem, no solution, drink again. So if he was in AA today, would his story be different? If he came to a meeting five years ago because he suspected he had a problem with alcoholism, would his story be different than the one that's in the book? No. Be exactly the same. Why is that? Because he hasn't found somebody to offer him a solution to the dilemma that he's suffering from. How many people has relapsed here? How many people relapsed more than a couple times? Bill's story. Interesting, right? And how many people really put a lot of effort into their sobriety? How many people thought this time is it? I've got what it takes. Time to start dating. <laughs> Time to pick up the game plan here. <laughs> oh, she looks like she wants what I got. <laughs> Any, anybody ever pray for a relationship here? And then when you're in it, you're begging God to take it back. <laughs> take it back. Take it back. I can't end it with her, but if you kind of hit her with lightning, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> what a wild thing. <laughs> I'd rather see God kill you than tell you I'd rather not be with you. <laughs> Just to take the edge off. Not that I'm scared of anything. Like, woo, woo. <laughs> Thank God when we share they don't have a board up here with our actual thinking. Eh? Could you imagine having one of those screen boards? Hi, I'm happy, joyous, and free. I thought about killing myself 15 times today <laughs> on the way here. <laughs> thought, where can I get a gun? <laughs> no. I mean, anyways, not, where was I? Squirrel. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So we go through Bill's story, and he's sitting. What's really cool is, but something happened there beyond his ability to see. But when he stepped back, and it happened to each and every one of us who are sitting in this room, to some extent, is in that situation, he kind of put something out to the universe. Something hurt him, and, and a whole bunch of things started going into effect. And what we call that is 12-step work beyond our comprehension. It set in motion the uh, trains of circumstances that were unforeseen. And what that kind of looks like is, as alcoholics, we put a cry out to the universe. The operator hears it, and then he dispatches the call, right? And then what happens is a member of alcoholics or somebody will, will show up in your life without you knowing how they did it, or somebody will be associated to, or you'll run into them. And without realizing it, the call was answered to, to something you put out a little while ago. <clears throat> so after we've gone through this, we become agents of something greater than ourselves for the purpose of helping those to pass back what was passed to us so freely given. So that kind of what happens in Bill's story. When we look at it, he's dying of alcoholism, and Ebby shows up in his life, which is his friend, right? He calls him. Bill didn't call Ebby. Ebby called Bill. And prior to that, sometime prior to that, Ebby was going to be committed for alcoholic insanity. Some members of an organization approached the judge and asked him to suspend his sentence. So what we call 12-step work could carry a message to him that he put into practice and he had a profound change, profound alteration. He kind of recovered from the condition he was suffering from. Part of his rehabilitation is he got on a plane. I think it was two months sober. Got on a plane to go help Bill. He opened the door, and what was the first thing Bill noticed about him? There was something different about his eyes. 
this guy was, there was something different. This guy didn't have to tell Bill he changed. He seen he changed. Most of us go around trying to convince people how much we change. Anybody do that? Look, I really changed. But until then, can I get another 20 from you? <laughs> so, so, like, we're we're, we're kind of weird that way, right? So Bill was able to see that, and he sat at the table, and he couldn't get past his own thinking because of the unmanageability and the confliction of the illness and the, the extent that it was in, in him. But he was sitting there drinking, and maybe we took him through his experience. Every talked about his experience with this process that was introduced to him and as a result of this process that he did he found this spiritual experience or solution to the dilemma that was killing Bill and he came by to pass on his experience. Bill couldn't get past his own thinking. Right? And that's part of our problem. We're thinkers. We can't get past our own thinking. We're the most important person in the room. Like I spent all my time thinking like, um, uh, kind of Consulting with somebody that don't like me. Like my brain has never come up with a really good idea. I've never ever kind of went, wow, that was a great exercise. I can't wait to do that again. Like there's something the matter with the way I process information. And so Bill seen that. It was only a matter of being willing to do what his friend did to get what his friend got. So based on that, we see at the kitchen table, my understanding is he does step one, two, and three while drinking. What's changed in his life? <clears throat> Nothing. But he just did steps one, two, and three. What confirmed he did step three was he went to treatment and took action on the decision he made at that kitchen table. And what confirmed that, his friend walked him through a course of action. So when they talk about this thing here on page 13, he says, at the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Why was he in the hospital? Because when he was talking to his friend prior to that, I don't know the length of time, but the, the important part, at the kitchen table, he knew what the problem was now, right? He knew that there was a solution. He understood what the solution is from his friend's experience. He had his friend's idea what the solution was, and he chose his own conception of what that was, but he understood the solution. It wasn't his solution, and it wasn't his understanding of the solution either. His friend didn't, didn't say, well... <coughs> Pick your own solution to this problem. His friend was very specific based on the experience that he had about this power that he got tapped into that created the change. He says, why don't you choose your own conception of what I'm talking about? So the first thing, in order to choose your own conception, you need to understand what the person's talking about. We took that element out of AA. Now we just say, choose your own conception of God. Everybody's working on their own conception of God. Why do you need your own conception of what? Well, see, but we, we don't understand the basis of that, where that came from. We eliminated a whole bunch of information. We eliminated all of step two. And we go to choose your own conception, choose your own understanding. And it really doesn't say choose your own understanding, right? And it doesn't say choose your own conception of the solution. It says your own, your own conception of what we're talking about on calling this creative intelligent, creative universe power, frequency, but you need to understand the solution. If you don't understand the solution, then you don't understand why I need to do this course of action. So Bill understood he had to do the course of action to build what he saw in his friend, the solution that his friend was bringing to him as the course of action he took. So Bill took that course of action, and at the bottom of it, he talked about here, my friend promised when these things were done, I'd have the elements of a new relationship with my creator that, that would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems, not just my alcoholism, but all my problems. Hold on a second. So he goes through this thing, and as we're going through this thing, we see what we talked about earlier, is that he, how you know if you're on the right track or not, you'll see certain ideas. So on the way up here from uh, Langley to here, as I, on the GPS it says, I passed this town, I passed this year, Mark, I passed these things to let me know I'm on, on the right road. And there'd be signs all the way here, saying I'm on the right road. And as I went through the Coca Hala, I was able to see all these things. I knew I was heading in the right direction. And as the result of the course of action I took, as I entered the Kelowna, it said, hey. And then as I made reference to my GPS, I got to my friend's house. GPS. GPS, yeah. What did I say? GPS. Yeah, GPS, right? So I was able to get to my right location. And so that's what this kind of thing is. So. It, his friend took him through a course of action, and his friend was able to say, yes, you're hitting all the right markers. You're doing all the right things. And so what happens is, 
what, what we see as the result of the course of actions he's taken, these things start happening that Bill's not aware of, but his friend's aware of, right? His friend promised, hey, if I'm promising you, if you do what's in here to the way they say to do it, you'll have the change that they talk about. And if you maintain this thing the way they put this thing together, you'll never relapse again. <clears throat> That's a promise, right? Well, what makes you say that? I've been in the A 40 years. I've been sober as a result of their program. It's not my program. It's not mine. My program was the first 11 years. It's called Burger King sobriety. <laughs> I had it my way. <laughs> yeah, I'll take gravy with that, <laughs> right? And, and it just it wasn't working to my betterment because I didn't understand what the hell was going on. I pick and per- cherry pick everything. Fake it till you make it. Take away what you want, leave what you want. I'm not qualified for that kind of thinking. Some of the best things I ever thought was uh, whatever happened. I thought, wow, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. It turned out to be the worst thing that ever happened to me. The worst thing that ever happened to me it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. Like, that's kind of confusing. I got bipolar recovery. <laughs> like, it's just one extreme to another, right? So, so Bill started experiencing that. And what he started to experience as he went through this was he seen it was about this power that his friend was experiencing. And as he went through this course of action, it unlocked, it was like a spiritual combination. It started unlocking these things that he got to experience for the first time. And a part of that was he entered a conscious relationship with this power that was personal to him. Right? And we get into all this stuff later. And what was really cool, he was to check his newfound thinking with this new God consciousness within. He moved from the coho section of his mind into the prized possession of his soul. He moved from this apparatus to, to this guidance system with inside of him, right? And as he lied in the hospital, he thought, man, I know other people that might really benefit from what was so freely given to me. Lying in treatment still, right? And when he carried this message to another alcoholic, right, not only did he keep himself sober, but he started what we have here today in 2019, right? 2018? <laughs> Huh? 18. 18. A lot of damage. <laughs> stay where we're at, right, Renee? Stay where we're at. <laughs> stay where we're at. <laughs> so, you, you know, like, and if you didn't know that, and when you read that, you say, like, I'm 29, I'm still excited about the story. Because it's a pretty wild story when you think about it. And you're saying this story is available for me? That if I do this thing, I could have my own experience with what you're talking about? I could have a life beyond anything I could ever imagine? That's pretty well. And then Bill goes to talk about there's certain elements that I need to maintain. It's imperative I work with other people. Right? It's an imperative when shit hits the fan, excuse me, that I go find someone to work with, that I don't go home and start writing about myself. Right? It's imperative that, that in times of rough going, what would save the day is the carrying this message of someone who's dying of alcoholism. That's why we're happy to see those who are new, right? It's, What's really interesting is that when Bill got sober, he had six months of what appeared to be failure before he ran, went in, ran into uh, Doctor Bob, who himself had who himself had a relapse, but Bill stayed sober because he carried the message. Yeah, and it was a profound enough experience that he stayed for six months, right? So, like the story, right? And when that took place, now you could trip over a newcomer everywhere you go. Right? We attract, like, every meeting, go, anybody coming back? Because why is that? And we talked about that yesterday. Sponsorship has declined. Why has sponsorship declined? Because the message has declined. You can't carry something that you don't know how to carry. You can't carry something you haven't experienced. So what happens, most of us carry an idea or, or a theological whatever, convictions, just fake it till you make it, watch out for triggers, just uh, my old behaviors. We carry treatment center. It's not, nothing wrong with treatment center, but it's treatment center. It's not our message, right? Most of us can't get sober by trying to modify our behavior. Anybody ever try to modify your behavior? <laughs> I'm being nice today, sobriety. Can I get the door for you? Like, inside is like, yeah. <laughs> Anybody got crazy going on? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we got that, but we're trying to think nobody else knows we're crazy. We all know you're crazy. Lighten up, we know. Just, whew, that's good, they know. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> because we like think coming, I got to get sober looking. I get the smile on, get a, like, your house is on fire. 
Like that's when we get here, our lives are burnt to the ground. Anybody, when Bill ended up in, in treatment for the third time, you think he was like, yeah, I'm going to go get sober. I'm so happy. <laughs> like, he was separated for, like his life was a shit show. You ever hear of oh, this thing? Oh, you're exactly where you're supposed to be? Oh, yeah. yeah. You want me to translate that for you? Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm a thinker, right? Eh? Someone told me that. You're, oh, you're exactly, they heard me share, they walk up. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. I thought, what the hell does that mean? I kept nothing with it. I came up with an answer 27 years later. They were too nice to say, where do you expect to be after all the crap you've been doing? <laughs> you're exactly where you're supposed to be based on the life you're living. Where you're supposed to be in the British properties. And <laughs> I said, look at the crap you've been doing. You're some result of all your good ideas. Where else do you expect to be? But well, we see it nicely. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. <laughs> based on all that stupid shit you've been doing. <laughs> so, so next time someone says that to you, say, I know, I know, I know. Right? So Bill goes under this experience, and it's pretty profound in that he was able to carry it. But not only was it profound for him, it was profound for everybody around him. Because he phoned his, the, the psychiatrist or the doctor he was working with. And he said about this experience, he says, you better hang on to it. Everybody around him noticed this thing. But he was still plagued with ways of depression. Of course he was depressed. Look at the life he had. He's still not making amends. He said, but he found a solution to his dilemma that he was able to apply that overrode all those places where he would have got loaded before. Right? And if you noticed in Bill's story, he didn't talk about thinking about drinking before he drank. He just drank. He didn't want to drink. So that was a part of the problem too is we give people the impression that you're going to think about it before you do it. That when you see it, you'll be able to stop it. You'll be able to phone somebody. Yeah, it's like, so we're going to understand alcoholism from their point of view. So we finished Bill's story. It's pretty profound when you want to go into it, but it's what alcoholism looks like. So it, it's what they talk about and how it works. It talks about what he was like or what we were like, what happened, what we we're like now. So we've seen what Bill was like, his inability to get sober, right? Everybody clear on that? We've seen what he was like. It's pretty clear that he was afflicted with alcoholism. That's what alcoholism looks like. His inability to get sober no matter how great the necessity or the wish or the experience with alcohol, right? Then we've seen what happened. What's the what happened part? What is the what happened part? Yeah, the spiritual awakening as what? As the result of a course of action that he took. As a result of somebody carrying this message to him. So it wasn't that he just kind of got this thing. Somebody carried this message to him, which we would call the sponsor. His sponsor guided him through a course of action that was not yet put in print. Right? So now, what the great thing about a sponsor is we're more of a guide than a sponsor because the book is actually our sponsor. Yeah. Right? This is our manual. You know, when you go to school and you got the professor up there, he's teaching, he's teaching on a manual. Right? When you go in the doctor's office, they have all these books up there that they make reference to. When you go into a Ford dealership, they have all these books they make reference to. They're all equipped with knowledge of what's in those books. And when they don't know exactly what's happening, they go to the reference manual, which is the book. This is our reference manual. This is put together as a design for manual for people who are afflicted with alcoholism and looking for a solution. So, like I used to own a 1982 shovel head. You need a manual with one of those things if you want it working well. What doesn't work too well is, I think this is about right. It works good for a little while, but if you don't got the tuning right, or if you don't understand how this works, that works, you're on. You ever see all those bikes on the side of the road? They're older bikes. It's people that don't own manuals. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here because they ignored the symptoms as they were happening. They didn't realize to go back to the manual. Kind of gives you an idea. It's like we're kind of that people. So. I rebuilt the bike. I was early in sobriety. <clears throat> I'm getting ready to go to sober riders. And, and I was using a bit of manual. My friend told me how to do it. You take some apart. You put it on the desk the way you take it apart. When you put it back together, again, you put it back together. Oh, no problem. He says, look at the manual. Follow the pages. No problem. I'm doing great. I'm getting near the end. I put the manual away. I got this. Pretty simple from here. 
right? I don't need to, I got all the big parts together. I got all the right parts together. And I look in the bucket, I'm missing this one little thing. I don't even know it's a part of the bike because I don't remember seeing it when I took it apart. But it came out of one of the mechanisms that I obviously took apart that I didn't realize it was in there. And I got it all <clears throat> together, got the lock washers in there, I got it all together, I fired it up, it started, everything's great. I haven't put it in the gear yet, I looked in the bucket. So what's the, it looked like two pennies cut in half and they were shiny, it was real shiny, copper. Little thing, look. That can't be that important. I mean, look at the size of this bike. Something like that can't be that important. That's how we go through recovery. Can't be that important. Look at the big things I'm doing. I'm staying sober. I'm going to meetings. I got a home group, sponsor, girlfriend, job, money, prestige. I'm getting my shit together, man. Look at me, how great I'm doing. Well, wow, all the promises are coming true. What did you do to get them? Nothing, but man, they're all coming true. <laughs> I like to talk about how great I am based on me. Remember 11 years in and out, that was, that's what I thought the goal was. The promises were, look what I'm getting back. That has nothing to do with the promises. The promises are all, all internal, nothing external there. I didn't know that because I've never experienced it. The promises before I was getting stuff back. Anybody? I gotta get busy, gotta get to work. Gotta get the place, gotta get the furniture, gotta get the job, gotta get the girlfriend, I gotta get back, I gotta get the stuff back. Anybody got a back problem here? <laughs> as soon as I get all this stuff back, guess who's coming back? Anyways, <coughs> so, <laughs> I like to say I'm coming back after getting everything back. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd like to really tell you why I relapsed, because her, it was her. Uh, who picked her? That's besides the point. It was her. <laughs> Sorry, where was I? Squirrel? Okay. Huh? Oh. So I look in the bucket, so I phoned somebody, my buddy, and, and, and quite familiar with these, but I said, hey, there's this thing in the bucket. He says, what does it look like? It looks, I said, it looks like two copper pennies cut in half, piled up about the same thickness, and real shiny. He says, oh, that's the key way. I said, well, how important is that? He says, well, you're not going anywhere. This is a clutch assembly. It kind of gets the gear and all that. I said, but my bike's loaded with all my camping gear. I'm going to Sober Riders. My buddies are, he says, no, you're not. <laughs> and that's like my recovery. I look at everything and say, wow, everything's fantastic. But I'm missing an element. I don't know I'm missing the element because I haven't experienced it the way these people experience. I'm not experiencing it at the same level there. I'm experiencing it over on this level, on the other side of the experience, hoping that I'm having what they have. But when I look at the evidences, I'm missing something. And in Bill's story, he gets that element. That element is you'd miss it if you didn't know what it was. It was this connection with this thing, this life force that created a change in his life that became personal to him. Right? It became personal to him. The same thing that Ebby experienced that was personal to him. He experienced it. Right? And so when they talk about here, and it confirms what Bill's story is on there is a solution. We of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were once just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. It just told us the purpose of the doctor's opinion was to see these things. We've seen the hopelessness of his condition, right? Yes, no? We've seen what he went through to bring about this change that his friend guided him through and the experience that he had. Then we've seen what his, like, his life was like afterwards. What part of the story do you want to be living in? Afterwards. Yeah, most of our story, what it used to be like, what it continues to be like, and what it's still like. Right? But what we have is abstinence from alcohol, which will make your life better. But you don't have abstinence from the illness. You're still afflicted with it, but you can't see it. Because we're under the impression we can see, feel, and touch this illness. It's an illness. You can't see, feel, and touch it. By the time it touches you, you're feeling the effects of it. It's always after the accident we see it, never before the accident we see it. But we give people the impression you can see it before it happens. And if you can see it before it happens, then you're not alcoholic of the hopeless variety. You're not the same as these people this book has written on. So I need to find out what type of alcoholic I am to see what I'm up against. You ever watch those fight, um, uh, anybody, any boxers here? Any, anybody watch fight shows or what are, uh, UFC, what do they call those things? Yeah, yeah. You know these cage fighters, what they do before they go up against their opponent? They watch videos. They see what they're up against. 
You know what we do when we go up against people? We talk to them on the phone. Doesn't sound that tough. <laughs> I don't have to worry about this guy. He has a bit of a squeaky voice. <laughs> like when I used to box, right? They would say, hey, Tony, we got this fight for you. I said, oh, yeah? Hypothetically, right? So can I talk to the guy on the phone? See where he's at? Talk to him on the phone. He goes, hi, my name's Mike. <laughs> Mike who? Mike Tyson. <laughs> Doesn't sound that tough. <laughs> got a squeaky voice. I got this. I hang down the phone, tell my buddies, I got this. That's alcoholism. Doesn't sound that tough. Hmm? Go in the rink. <coughs> Whoa. Now he's not that tough. 30 seconds, not even now. By the time he gets to one side of the ring to the other, I'm out of the ring. I'm out so far I didn't even realize I was in a fight. Anybody? That's alcoholism. I come to in the dressing room. Thinking, I should have kept my left up. <laughs> I, could, I, 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 I could have beat him if I kept my left up. I kind of have problems in that eye, right? Of trauma that I've experienced. But if you reschedule the fight, I think I could do it this time. Are you going to train? No, I'm just going to keep my left up. Get in the ring again. I don't even know what happens. So I need to get someone else to explain to me what happened so I could be better equipped the next time it happens. Yeah. So they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting to give... This. That's right, but that's not the definition of insanity. That's the definition of stupidity. <laughs> if you know you're doing it, for me to get back in the ring knowing what's happened to me the first four times, can I claim soundness of mind? Would you call that plain stupidity if I know I'm doing it? Absolutely. Yeah. But if I think it's going to be different this time, and I have an illusion about the events that are going to take place and not have taken place, is that insanity? Yes. There's a difference. See, I don't know it's going to be the same. I don't know it's not going to be different. I think there's no thinking. Something's taken over my mind that I'm under illusion that this event's going to be different. I can't see the truth in what's taking place. Right? So I'm obsessed with the idea that it is going to be different this time. So am I telling myself the truth about that situation? No. So if I'm obsessed with the idea that this time I could beat him if I just train a bit better, I'm totally out class and I go in that ring again, can I claim soundness of mind? No. So once I do step one and I say, I'm totally outclassed, there's no way I'm ever going to beat this guy, I can't get in the ring with him. Does that take care of the obsession about the idea of beating him? 100%. Based on that truth, I'm not getting back into that ring again. Right? That's step one. That's the truth. Now, if I find myself back in the ring with him, can I claim soundness of mind after already admitting over here that there's no way I should get in the ring with this guy again? I'm totally outclassed. I've conceded to my inner myself that there's no way I'm ever beating this guy. I'm resigned to the fact that I don't even, not even going to try. That's the truth, right? But if I end up in the ring with him again, there's something more going on up here than I understand. So they're saying, well, let's get into this thing about alcoholism. Let's kind of go through this thing in a way that we look at it differently. So we're going to talk, expand on these ideas, what they mean by the seemingly hopeful state of mind and body. They're going to expand on the solution. Remember, they started a conversation over here. There was only hand size. Now they're going to break it off into three different areas. What the problem is, the nature of the problem, what it looks like, and the solution to that problem, the course of action. So there's going to be three different conversations starting here. So as we get into the solution... You hear a lot of people say, oh, they only talk about step one in the first portion of the book. Actually, we've talked about the problem, the solution, and the course of action on many different levels, and we're just getting to there is a solution. And we have examples of people who were afflicted with this illness, who got an understanding of this illness, applied the solution that was presented to them, and had the results of that. Right from the first page of We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. They told us there's a problem. They understand the problem, that there's a solution, and they've experienced it. 
It's pretty wild, eh? Got to the doctor's opinion, talk about there's a problem, give you examples of people who are afflicted with the problem, the witness of the solution that he found. Now we're going to get into there is a solution. As we go through here, they're going to build up on some ideas. And they talk about, you can find this out later, it talk about page 18. We hope this volume will inform and comfort those who, who or may be afflicted. There are many. Comfort. We hope this volume will inform and comfort those of what? Inform them of what? The solution. Well, alcoholism. Most people don't understand alcoholism, so they put this together so we could understand alcoholism. Back in the old time, but when they put this manual together, they used to give you a copy of the manual, say, read it, understand the nature of alcoholism, the solution we found, and the course of action that they did. And if you want to continue with this thing, let me know. I'll take you through it. Most people in <coughs> AA haven't read the book. What makes you say that? I spent 11 years in it, and I never read this. I used to clean seeds on it, but I've never read it. <laughs> like, I, had, I remember one vision. I had this nice bronze scale sitting on, them, on my book because it kind of leveled. Anyways, moving on. So, <laughs> then page 19. We, we have concluded to publish an anonymous volume setting forth the problem as we see it, as who sees it? As they see it. It didn't ask you what you think. If anybody could show me where it says in the first three steps what you think, let me know. Because we don't care what you think. That's kind of insensitive of us. Do you understand what we're talking about? You need to get our understanding. I need them to get their understanding what we're talking about. So I need to understand what they meant by this problem. And I need to understand it from their point of view. And not to formulate an opinion on it, but to get their point of view from what the problem is. And when I understand what the problem is, then the solution will make more sense. So most people, they say they've done step three, but they don't know how to do it. Then you hear people say they're having problems with step three. You ever hear people saying that? Because they've never done step two. That's why they have a problem with step three. You know why people have a problem with step two? Because they never did step one. Building blocks. If you work in construction, if you're having a problem with one section, it's the section under it's giving you the problem. Right? It starts from the foundation up, it never starts from the rafters down. If you're alcoholic of our type, we start from the rafters down. <laughs> Have you built the house yet? No, but I'm out picking out what the sinks look like. Okay. Okay. We're moving in tomorrow. And then and, and they talk about we shall bring to task our combined experience knowledge. This should suggest a useful program for anyone concerned with a drinking problem. What should be a useful program? The information in this book. So if I don't know what this, they're saying in here, then I really don't have their program. If you can't show me what you've done in here, then you've never done this. You've never done their program. You've done a program. You've done somebody's version of the program, but you've never done this. So when somebody taught me how to read a map, you know what confirmed my knowledge of knowing how to read a map? I could show somebody else how to read it. Right? So back when they were 12-stepping people, they'd say, here, here, here's a copy of my book, read it. And if you want to go through with this thing, I have the experience of taking you through it. But if I don't have the experience of taking you through this, then I really haven't done it, have I? Like I never used to be able to read blueprints, but I worked in carpentry. But I never, I went to Conestoga College to learn how to, one of those times I was trying to get sober, you know, we were really, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm or a lot of, uh, I want to change my life, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to, a lot of, pardon? Intentions, good intentions, right? And I had a lot of good, good events in my life, but then a drink would get in the way and change it all. So... In my 11 years of all the times claiming of having done the steps, when George said to me, he says, you've done this? I said, oh, yeah, I've done the steps. That was my claim. I relapsed. I've done it. Four, 12 and 12 studies. Uh, John Barleycorn, never knew who that was. I used to think, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> because there was my understanding, and then there's your understanding, and then there's their understanding. I didn't know John Barleycorn was alcohol. But I wasn't going to let anybody else know that I didn't know. The double-edged sword, that's yeah, I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. Who cares? I could go through that whole 12 and 12 and not have a clue what they're talking about. 
And then what really topped it off was after all those years, I find out it's Bill's experience of having done the steps. So I'm talking about Bill's experience. I'm not even talking about my experience. I'm talking about Bill's experience of something I haven't done. Hoping that if I talk about it long enough that I'll have the same experience. That's like anybody ever grew up in the poster era? You know, posters? Put them on the wall? All your favorite girlfriends? Dated them all. <laughs> all right? They had no experience with me, but I had a lot of experience with them. <laughs> That's kind of like our recovery. It's all one-sided. <laughs> Anyhow, moving on. Right? Some of you got what I was talking about, but thank God they helped through puberty. Okay. So, so they, go, they, they, they kind of start going through here. And again, page 20. How many times they say, okay, we're going to tell you, just in case you missed it the first four times we told you, we're going to tell you again. It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically, not generally, specifically what questions, what the problem is, what the solution is, what the course of action is, from whose experience, from their experience. They're talking about since they put this together, now there's thousands, right? Remember they talked about when they published this, they said first 100 men and women, over 100 men and women. By the time they do this thing, they talk about, they talk about uh, we know thousands, thousands. So they're saying this is tried, tested, and true. This template seems to be our program of recovery. So we put this volume together, putting forth the problem as we understand it, the solution we understand it, and how to obtain that. So that means when I went to Conestoga College to learn more about construction, I realized my understanding of construction wouldn't allow me to get to where I wanted to go to. And I wouldn't be able to learn it on my own, so I enrolled in a class. They took me through the manual, how to read, instructed how to do calculations, what all this stuff meant, weight load, and all these different things. By the time I finished the class, I got a certificate saying I had all the knowledge, the general knowledge of what their course entitled, right? And that qualified me to go start working. And that's kind of like this. When I go through this manual, I find out what the problem is. I find out what the course of action is. I have a general knowledge of application of this thing that qualifies me to start my life as a result of the change. And now I can start helping other people. So when I finish that course, everything I learned in that course, I can teach somebody on a job site what I learned there. Does that kind of make sense? So now I know how to learn blueprints. I know what the vision was, where we're going but I knew where we were starting from to stay focused to get to that place. And that's what this is all about. And you hear people with recovery or people with experiences. Yes, we started here, but allow, what allows me to be here is this experience. And we all generally agree on the principles that get us here. The application of it is personal, but it's the same. It's the same understanding. It's not different. The problem, the solution, and the course of action is the same for all of us. How you apply it may be different. Does that kind of make sense? And so as we go through here, we're kind of seeing that. And it's really interesting. So they talk about here on page 23, 22. And you can mark this down because this is the key fact of what the doctor was talking about. He's going to expand on this desire thing. If you would have started with this conversation, in the doctor's opinion, we would have stopped reading the book. Right? You notice how they use psychic change in the book? But later they call it a spiritual experience. If they would have started as a newcomer, you're reading this alone somewhere, and they say what you suffer from is a subtle form of insanity that precedes the first drink, and the only thing that will solve that is an entire psychic change. What are you doing with that book? You're firing it out the window. But if they use comfortable language, because you know how sensitive and touchy we are, right? And we don't like entrapment. Anybody like entrapment here? I don't know if I'm going to do the fourth. Let me see the ending of it first. <laughs> I'm not making amends. Are you on amends? No, but I'm not making them. Anybody about, think about amends list they haven't made yet? Based on the four they haven't done? Based on the three they don't understand? Based on the two that they have no knowledge of? Based on the one they never did? But I'm concerned about the ninth step. Are you dying of alcoholism? Yeah, that's besides the point. I'm not making amends to those people. Are we even there yet? No. We're on page 62. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> We're just like that. Like, I want to see what the story looks like before I commit. Because we, we have that sense of entrapment all the time, don't we? Hey, anybody? I'm not agreeing to nothing. When the wife's silent, I get nervous. When she's talking, I'm, I'm comfortable. Talks. She wakes up talking. Oh, I better I forgot I was recording. I didn't mean that, honey. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so what happens? 
So we're just the mind's like that has a way of entrapping us. So they say here, let's break this down really cool. So on page 22, they're talking about more of the problem here. They talk about if our friend never took the first drink, thereby not triggering the allergy, it won't set, set in motion the trains of circumstances that happens as a result of our relapse. So if you look back over your relapses, right, even though when we talked about it, you said, I said, I never experienced relapse. I said, well, let me explain it to you in a way that makes sense to us. Have you tried to get sober before or change your life? Yes. Have you, were you able not to stay sober? Yes, that's a relapse. Anything or what we call is inability to stay sober based on my own experience. If you're able to stay sober on your own experience, you will never came to AA. People who can stay sober don't come here. They go to Al-Anon. No, just joking. I didn't mean that either. <laughs> no, so, but you know what I mean? So there's something that kind of drives us. So here on page 22, it says, if I never took that drink, I'd never trigger the allergy, and I wouldn't end up in trouble. Could we all agree on that? Have you done it more than a couple times? Yes. Okay, so then the point is, and we're talking about the pistachio. So when I found out I was allergic to pistachios, and I'm in an emergency and I have these tubes hooked up to me, it made sense the reactions I was getting all those other times. It made clear uh, all those other times I was having an allergic reaction, but I wasn't able to see it because I didn't have the severity that I had this time. So as she went through it, I kind of went, and I was watching her lips move as she explained the problem and the solution to this dilemma I was having. I'm in an emergency. I never heard nobody else. She didn't have to explain it again. I understood exactly what I was up against and the nature of my problem. I went and got two EpiPens. One that I, because I was that alarmed, one that I kept with me, and one that we keep in travel pack. So one goes in my suitcase, one goes on the airplane with me, right? Because I didn't know the severity of the allergic reaction I was having or what I was allergic. All I know was I, didn't, I couldn't afford my throat closing again. So my life had my attention. So they said I couldn't afford to eat pistachios in any form whatsoever. I agreed with them based on my experience with that. I concurred that I was allergic to this and I was having an abnormal reaction. I swore off forever. I'm never eating them again. I'm okay with that. I end up in Montreal. It's a cool day. I walk down the street, and you ever see those guys roasting those things? And they're, they're chestnuts, and they're roasting some pistachios. My friend said, you've never had heated pistachios. <laughs> the reason those was because the impurities wasn't cooked out of them. <laughs> and, 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 and these won't hurt you because they're heated. I bought a bag. <laughs> I go down the street comforted with the idea that the impurities were cooked out of these things and, and I had a, a bag of them and, and next thing I know I was in hospital they got my file over and said uh, Mr. Roberts weren't you in hospital three months ago yep <laughs> didn't we tell you then uh, you shouldn't eat this because you're allergic to them yeah didn't you tell us that you weren't going to eat them again yeah so what happened? Well, you know, I just thought maybe it was three months and I thought it was a good idea. Okay, Mr. Roberts, could you confirm with us that you're not going to eat them again? Not a problem. I'm never going to eat them again. Six months go by. I'm, uh, where, where am I? I think I'm in Dallas. And I walked by and I noticed the pistachios didn't have the red stuff on them. The red dye was off of these pistachios. I've never seen them without red dye. My brain said, that's what I'm allergic to is the red dye. I bought a bag of pistachios, ate them, ended up in the hospital. <clears throat> you know the look I'm getting? <laughs> you know how irritated I'm feeling? Because <laughs> the look I'm getting? They're not even really saying anything. They said, we've explained this to to you a couple times, right? I said, yeah. <laughs> and have your experience been different with this? No. Is it getting better? No, it's getting worse. Do you understand now? I surrender. I have acceptance. I surrender. I've hit bottom. I'm going to Pistachios Anonymous. I'm going to go get help. I go, I show up to my first meeting. They said, just don't need them. 
Oh my God, I didn't know that. <laughs> Don't eat them. What a concept. I'm just, you know, just think it through. Wow, that sounds good. If anybody offers you them, just tell them that there wouldn't be enough for everybody and you better not do it. Even though you like the effect produced by pistachios because you like the effect of your throat closing to a certain point, right? <laughs> then, then after that, you know, just before passing out, but that's another story, right? Some of you understand what I'm talking about. So, so I go a year and I end up in Belize. I'm walking along the beach, I'm working on, on a set and I, I go walking along and, and I see this ice cream sale. It's hot, man. It is like hot. I walk in and I see these certificates on the wall for pistachio ice cream. World renowned. The best. They've won prizes on it in this location. It's ice cream. I'm allergic to nuts. I'm not allergic to ice cream. I have two scoops. I end up in the hospital. So, they come walking in, they look at the file, look at me, look at the file, look at me, look at the file, leave. And then two doctors come in, look at the file, look at me, look at the file, look at me, look at the file. Then another person comes in. So, we're going to do a survey. Is it a dietitian or a psychiatrist? <laughs> psychiatrist. How many people think I'm a little crazy? <laughs> yeah. You think there's something fun to see I'm talking to you, people that have sound reasoning around and think I'm nuts right this is what we sound like to normal people in regards to our addiction but mine's not a true story <laughs> the first time they told me I was allergic to I've never ate them again and then when I've thought about eating them again I remember what happened to me and the truth about them and I've never bought them my wife says maybe it was the amount you ate and I said I don't care <laughs> but I said it's kind of really funny that you got say that after I signed the insurance paper not before <laughs> we, and she has pistachios there all the time now at our place she never used to buy them just in case you have a moment honey <laughs> house is looking good <laughs> so, so, so what happens I see the pistachios there I know the truth about them even though I love them I, I never ate them so they talk about here, so on page 23, they talk about here, we know while the, on page 20, we know while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that once he takes alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens both in a bodily and mentally sense, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. Why? Because of the allergy. We kind of covered that, right? The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. Anybody's story confirm this. That once you start, it's almost impossible to stop. Yeah. And it takes a severe situation to get your attention and <coughs> to bring you back into recovery. Anybody? Yeah. And then you're going to do it and then something happens here where it's not sufficient enough to keep you here and then you find yourself back doing that again. Right? So we shall tell you what the second symptom is in alcoholism. So the first symptom is the allergy. I can't spell allergy. So what's the second symptom then? Obsession. Insanity. Okay. So we've got the obsession. How many people hear that as the second symptom? Come on. Yeah. you got to participate. Tell on yourself. How many people say yes? Yep. Obsession. What else do we hear as the second symptom? Inability to stop. Inability to stop is the first oh. symptom. Oh, no, no, it's the, the sec, it's the second symptom once we start. Are you talking about once we drink or before we drink? Oh, uh, once we drink. Once we drink. So that would be the allergy. 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 I was trying to make, maybe meant it different, right? Cause, so that's the allergy. We see that refers to drinking and then the inability to control my drinking once I start. So what's the second symptom that they admit to as being powerless over alcohol? We admit we're powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. What's the second? What? Mental obsession. Mental obsession. Again, over here, right? What else? Is that the answer we're going for? How many people say yes? How many people not get involved because you feel it's an entrapment? Call <laughs> 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 you guys. Is like, we're on to you, man. <laughs> okay. So let's go, second symptom, and then we're going to go to a quarter after, and then we'll give you some 
something to think about up there and swear at me a bit, and then we can come back here and carry on. Okay. So, they talk about, if I never took the first drink, I'd never sit in motion the terrible cycle, right? They talked about that in the doctor's opinion. This is repeated over and over, right? They go through a well-known stage of a spree. Anybody ever go through a well-known stage of a spree here? Coming to with a firm resolution not to drink again. They're over-remorseful. Like, the, 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 you mean it. You pass a lie detector test. I can't believe I've done this again. We come to in the worst situations. Anybody? Just kind of like pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. Your chin's on the floor. Your lips kind of right down like with it. It's kind of like, ah, I can't believe it. And the self-loathing. Anybody ever been there? And then the second thought is, living a dream, ma. <laughs> living a dream. Look at me now. No, sorry. Uh, uh, I have these moments. Okay. Acceptance. Yeah. Well, nothing you could do about it. Might as well enjoy it. Might as well get rid of the mother's teeth now. Okay. Okay. So. These observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting this terrible cycle in motion. True or false? If I never took that first drink, remember the first time you said I was going to change my life? How many people remember the first time they said that? I was 15. 15. I finally got sober when I was 27 through the efforts of other people carrying this message to me. So from 15 to 27, you know how many opportunities I had? How many union jobs I had? How many situations where it became the top of the field? Look at how fan Douglas Aircraft told you about that job. Youngest guy to ever get in a union. In the Army, at Princess Patricia Canadian Light Infantry, top of my field. Going over across to go to Germany and Cyprus for a two year stint. Top of my field. What happened? Drink happened. <coughs> Marriages, relationships, opportunities, on and on and on. Nicest person you ever wanted to meet sober. Click, 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 click. Something happened. Who are you? Where did you come from? Stay away from us. Don't phone. Have family reunions. Don't tell Tony. Don't tell Tony we're getting together. And my mom and sister would, co would be a part of those people conspiring against me because nobody really liked me and I was misunderstood. Don't tell them there's a family reunion. Tell them after. Why? Because I show up in blackout. I don't know that's my cousin I'm hitting on. And I think it's funny pissing out of the second world window with the neighbor waving at us saying Happy New Year's. Like when I do stuff, I think it's funny. Nobody around me thinks it's funny. Right? Like, I come to in situations, it's kind of like, oh my God. Like, anybody ever come to out of blackouts here? Yeah. In the middle of something you don't know you're in, trying to figure out what you're in, and then you're out of it again? Yeah. I've come to, this one time it was funny, I come to driving down the street. If I never took this drink, these things wouldn't be happening to me, but I never know. I'm driving my bike, and I don't know I'm on my bike. I feel this tap on my shoulder. I hear this voice saying, turn left here. Turn left here. Where the hell am I? And who are the hell are you? I'm having a moment like I'm on a motorcycle going down a road. I don't know where I'm coming from. I don't know where I'm going. And I don't know who's with me. That's all I remember. Then I come to in the basement. She's going, shh. My parents live upstairs. I'm living here for a little while because I'm going through a rough time. And then I look down. I see she's pregnant. Beautiful blonde. I think, wow, this is nice. Beautiful. I think, I'm doing good. I look down. She's like seven months pregnant. I go, and I'm trying to really see if I'm seeing what I'm seeing. You ever been on that drug? You're kind of like, like am I, is this really happening? And she goes, what? I said, I just want to know one thing. She goes, what's that? Said, How long have we been dating? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Very important question because I've had long periods of time where I thought it was a week. They tell me it was three months. Of years, like I went to my sister once. I said, Hey, happy 21st birthday. Long pause. She says, I'm a year younger than you. I said, Yeah, happy 21st birthday. She says, I'm turning 23. Like, nothing. Now everybody knows the state I'm in, so everybody just stays away from me. No more invitations, no more nothing. Why? Because if I never t stopped taking a drink at 15, you think my story would look different by the time I was 27? So the problem is, I kept on doing something against my own will, acts against my own will. And I didn't know why I was doing it. And it kept on getting worse and worse and worse. Like my, my story is inches and moments. How I'm not, I had a second when I, was, I went for some outside <laughs> help when I was seven years sober. 
And the psychiatrist, after listening to my story, his, my file was like this. He says, by everything known to me, you shouldn't be in the condition you're in. You should be either dead, eating pablum, somewhere being fed, or doing life in a penitentiary. He says, whatever you were doing before you came to me, go back to it. He says, I've never seen anybody live the life that you live or come from the place you come from in the condition you're in. Something has happened beyond our ability to, to get you there and maintain. He says, go back to it. And what we was talking about is go back to AA and the life I had here, right? So they talk about here, these observations will be academic and pointless so our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting a terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind. Whoa. How many people would have came up with that sitting with your buddies in the bar? Well, it seems like what you suffer from, Tony, is a phenomenon of craving. No wonder you can't control the amount you drink, and all the methamphetamine in the world can't <coughs> allow you to control the amount you drink. That you have a normal reaction different from us. It looks like you suffer from a phenomenon of craving. Oh, my God, Fred, I'm glad you told me that. I had no idea how the phenomenon of craving. There you go, Fred, order another beer. Anybody ever tell you that sitting at a table drinking in a bar somewhere? I kind of noticed I think you may have a phenomenon of craving. <laughs> you can't control the amount you drink. And because you can't control the amount you drink, you're prone to doing really stupid stuff. Oh, thanks for that. How many people would have came up with that idea on their own? That's why they did what they did because of the allergy. How many people would have came up with the idea is the reason I keep on drinking again because there's something that centers in my mind that I can't see, feel, and touch. That the main problem centers in my mind rather than my body. Makes sense. We all agreed that if I kept on eating pistachios with that experience that I had is secondary that I'm allergic to it. There's something the matter with me psychologically. So we took that same experience with my using and drinking. There's something the matter with me psychologically. I don't know what that is yet. So they're going to explain it from their point of view and their experience. And they go through here down at the bottom. And then we'll take a break. And then you, you could really formulate a, a, a rebuttal. And after the break, come back and we can go in again. So they said... They asked the newcomer why he kept on relapsing. And they kind of go like this. They said, once in a while he may tell the truth. And the truth, the strange to say, is he has usually no more idea why he took the first drink than you have. Some drinkers have excuses which they feel are satisfied part of the time. Anybody feel mm -hmm. satisfied with their excuse why they took that drink? You know why we come up with excuses? That means I'm not beyond human aid. I got loaded because of situations. I got situational sobriety. As long as the situations are right, I'll remain sober. Why did you drink again? The situations weren't right. But in their hearts, they really don't know why they do it. Once this malady has a real hold, what's a malady? Sickness. And where is this malady taking place? In the mind, right? Has a real hold. They're a baffled lot. Why are they baffled? The sick yeah. mind can't fix the sick mind. Well, they're baffled that they can't stay sober based on their experience. Anybody, we talked on the way up here. I understand when you were talking, was, it's like you're trying to make sense of something that doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. We come back in here and go, well, that didn't go as planned. Like we were on fire and with the smoke still going. And we think that wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> right? We're giving you, that's a five cards, you know, two cards, that's a ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember, like, we're nuts. I remember this guy was sharing once, he was talking about pissing, pissing the bed, and I kind of went, oh, that's disgusting. And my, my sponsor gave me a lesson. He says, but defecating in your pants is fully acceptable, right? <laughs> so, anyways, centers in the mind. So the, the, there is the obsession that somehow, someday, they'll beat the game. Explain what they're talking about when we come back. You give your idea what they're talking about, then we'll show you what they're talking about. Okay, so uh, before the break, we talked about the second of uh, um, the second symptom. Most of us talk, thought it was the obsession. So they just gave us some information. Anybody want to change their answer? Phenomenon of craving. <clears throat> okay. So the first symptom is the phenomenon of craving. That's what makes you alcoholic, right? The allergy, right? And from it comes the phenomenon of craving. So that means when I put it into my system, I trigger the phenomenon of craving. That makes it virtually impossible for me to stop. Anybody need that explained? No. Anybody get thirstier here when they drink or use? Yeah. Anybody want more? Yeah. So we covered that. That's no longer the problem, right? 
The problem is I keep returning back to that in spite of my experience oh, with that. Yes. The bottom mm -hmm. yes. So my, my, lost the power of choice. Okay, so let's go over it again. That's where we go over it again. So on, on page 23, they say the main problem the alcoholic centers in the mind, right? We all agree to that? Hold on. We got it now. You don't get 15 answers. If the first four was wrong, probably the next 15 will be wrong also. <laughs> but we could give you four more guesses. I always like people to point out as an example of what I'm talking about. I know what going to think about the next hour. Now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why I caught a meeting. <laughs> okay. So, squirrel. Okay, so then they go through here. They talk about once in a while they may tell the truth. Right? Why they keep relapsing. The truth is they have really no idea. Then they say, once this malady, what's a malady? Sickness. sickness. What's the second symptom? A sickness that centers where? The mind. In the mind. So the second symptom is, is this malady that centers in the mind. The first symptom is an allergy that centers in the body. Two different parts of the illness. Similarly, hope a state of mind and body. We've covered the body being the allergy. Now they're saying, hey, you've got a sickness in your mind. How many people like that idea? No, we don't like that idea. In fact, I, I'll prove you wrong this time. Okay, so they're a baffled lot. They go on to describe, so now they start a new conversation about the sickness that centers in the mind, and they're going to expand on this idea, which is the second symptom in alcoholism. And then they talk about here the obsession. Right? There's the obsession. Somehow, someday, they'll beat the game. What game? That's what most people think, but they're using the word in a different term right now. Remember they talked about earlier, if I never took a drink, so I, I'm, I'm okay with the idea that if I never took a drink, I never trigger the allergy, right? right? So I'm not obsessed with eating pistachios anymore. I'm not obsessed with getting in the idea of getting in the rink with, with Tyson anymore. I, can't, I know I can't take the first one because it sets in motion terrible cycle. Does that kind of make sense? So they're saying it's not the point that I eat it anymore. There's the point that there's something in my mind says it's okay to do it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Would that call a sickness or a malady to centers in the mind? So why are they baffled? Because they keep on drinking. There's the obsession. They'll beat the game by what? Not taking the first drink. When you listen to people share this week, listen to how many people are obsessed with the idea of keeping themselves sober based on their own experience. I'm doing this. I'm doing that this time. But is that obsessed with self? Yes. Trying to fix self? Yes. That's like using one ply paper. It looks good on the roll, but the application of it is pretty shitty. shitty. <laughs> it doesn't work well. And who knows that for sure? Only you. You're alone in there. And all you hear coming from the bathroom is crap, shit. And you try to fold it and fold it and fold it, ply it more. Let's apply more self to self. It looks good, but what happens is the top stays firm while the bottom slides. <laughs> it's not working out no matter how you do it, does it? And that's kind of like what they're getting at here. So we're obsessed with the fact of fixing ourselves, but we can't fix ourselves based on this problem. So they talk about everybody around us hopes that they will, will rise from our lethargy and exert our self-will. In doing what? Not taking the first one. Just don't take the first one, you'll be okay. Your problem's after you pick up. Your powerlessness is after you use. Anybody, any of this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Just don't do the first one, you'll be okay. If you're capable of doing that, do you have the second symptom in alcoholism? No. That means you just have the first symptom. You know you can't drink. And AA is full of people that know they can't drink and can keep themselves sober on that basis. Well, AA was designed for people who suffer from the second symptom and makes you a real alcoholic. What makes you say that? So here we go. The tragic truth. So they talk, how true, or they talk about here. This session is somehow, someday they'll beat the game, but they often suspect they're down for the count. How true this is, few realize. In a vague way, their family friends sent that these drinkers are ab abnormal. But everybody awaits the day when he'll rise. The sufferer will arise from a lethargy and exert his power will. Not taking the first drink. Right? The tragic truth is that if a man be a real alcoholic, now they're using a new word in regards to the illness. If a man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. What happy day is that? Keeping themselves sober based on their own experience. Right? Because they started a new conversation. Now the happy day is not coming. How many people has relapsed here more than a couple times? 
How many people around you thought it was going to be different, hoping it was going to be different? How many of you hoped that it would be different? I hope it was going to be different each and every time. Remember, I relapsed after 11 years, like in and out, in and out, in and out. I, got three, I did 360 meetings in 90 days, got a three-month chip. <clears throat> I'm out here since 85 trying to change my life. I mean, 87, trying to change my life. 89, I finally get 12-stepped into this thing. I just did 360 meetings in 90 days. I'm in four 12 and 12 studies. I got a three-month chip. I'm never using again. I'm exerting myself. I'm not even thinking about using. There's nothing appealing about using whatsoever in my life. I'm not funny when I drink. There's nothing funny about my life and my story. I, nobody wants me around. The only place that wants me at this time is my brother, and I'm living on a mattress in the front. The bikes are lined up. The windows are kicked out. The sheets are gray. He's the only one that will have anything to do with me. And his wife would hear, I hear from the vent, is your brother going to be okay? Yeah, he'll be okay. Just give him a bit. He'd invite me out to his friend's place. I have a couple of years because my liver was at such a state that it was, I was getting drunk over off of two or three beers. Right? My liver wasn't producing, like breaking it down anymore. I go to his friend's place trying to act nice and natural. His <clears> kids, <throat> the barbecue, everything's nice. and beautiful sunny day. His friend in the kitchen couldn't even tell you what they looked like. He goes to me, who's tougher between you and your brother? All I remember, he's lying on the floor next. The kids are screaming, everybody's screaming, I don't know what happened. And I'm not even really that drunk. And my brother goes, what the hell is going on? He says, let's get out of here. And that's the last time they ever brought me out anywhere socially. Mm, right? But I don't know that, right? I think everything's okay. So they talk about the tragic truth that if men be a real alcoholic, the happy day will not arrive. He has lost Control. At a certain point in every drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop, not control, stop. What's the conversation about not taking the first drink? They started a new conversation now, right? There's the obsession that based on my story, I won't do it again. Most of you people here, if you did a survey in meetings, no, no one's ever going to relapse again. You ever notice that? Every time, I'm not going to do it again. Well, what happened the last time? I didn't mean it then. This time, I mean it. Look what I'm doing to keep me sober. What's the obsession? I'm fixing me with me. I'm stuck on Band-Aids and Band-Aids stuck on me. You ever remember that commercial? <laughs> Look, I'm going to stay sober. I got a Band-Aid. <laughs> right? It's like it's not working. So they kind of get in here. And they talk about at a certain point in every drinking of every, he passes in the state of the most powerful desire to stop drinking is absolutely of no avail. This tragic situation has already arrived in practically Every case long before it is suspected. By the time we telling you about the symptom, you've already exhibited way long ago. You're not admitting that I'm, I've become an alcoholic in AA. You're admitting to this fact that I am an alcoholic and it's been way back then. I'm a result of step one. Step one's not a result of me. That's two different approaches. Most people think step one is a result of them. So they try to change them. But if you're a result of step one, you're in trouble. Two different approaches, right? Because if I produce step one, then all I need to do is change me, and then I'm no longer alcoholic. But if I'm a result of an illness that I can't fix, change, or alter, now I'm in trouble. Would, not, would that not be the case? Who, who's more who? The person that, who is as a result of something or a person that's created something? Well, the person that's a result of something. Because if I'm a result of something, I can't fix it. It means it's already been in place. By the time I become aware of it, it's kind of like, oh, no. Anybody have oh, no sobriety here? Oh, no. I can't believe this. Oh, no. So that's what they're kind of saying here, right? So they talk about the fact is that most alcoholics, for reason the other script, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring in our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and the humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against that first drink. That's pretty hardcore, eh, when you think about that? So now we see what makes these people powerless over alcohol. We see what they're admitting to. What they're admitting to is the two symptoms of alcoholism. One, when drinking, they can't control the amounts they drink because of the allergy. Two, they can't stay stop drinking or not stop themselves from picking up drinking because of the malady that centers in the mind. They call this thing a malady. And then as they, they're going to build on those ideas, right? 
And so they, as they go through here, they start explaining the problem, the solution. And as they go through and they get into more about alcoholism, why would they talk about more about alcoholism if they've already explained the problem in great detail? They've already told you about the allergy. They've already told you about the problem that centers in the mind. They've already told you that the solution is a psychic change or spiritual experience. They already told you if you're willing to do a course of action that you'll get this thing. They've already explained an example of it in Bill's story and the doctor's opinion. Why would they want to talk more about alcoholism? Carry the message. Because you started thinking since they first told you about it. <laughs> 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 we start thinking, well, that's not true. Well, let's explain it better, right? And so here, here's, here's the question over lunch. So hopefully we answered the two questions. Now we know what the problem is. And we know why we keep on relapsing. <coughs> so now we're going to talk about the obsession, one of the m most misunderstood <clears throat> statements in AA because back of it, in the doctor's opinion, that they talk about the message has to have depth and weight. Most of us hear things that make sense, but we don't really investigate what it means because we think it covers all aspects. But when you look at the book, it's covered in great in detail, different than the way we explain it, right? We think the obsession is a part of the first step, and it isn't a part of the first step. It's not a part of the second step either. So... How many people's brain just went, eh. let's read something, and then we'll get into it. Uh, more about alcohol. Most of us have un been unwilling to admit we were alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from their fellows. True or false? True. I don't like to believe these things, especially about the malady part, that I have an illness beyond my mental ability to stop myself from doing I've lost a choice in what I'm about to do. I'm almost kind of offended about that idea unless I look at my history and I realize this has been happening long before I suspected it, that I've been acting against my own will for years. Years of my inability to not pick up. That explains my in and out for 11 years because of the malady. It's not because I didn't want to get sober or stay sober. It's because I suffer from an illness beyond my ability to see, feel, and touch when it's happening. Just like Bill's story. It makes sense. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we're real alcoholics, meaning I'm beyond human aid. I'm obsessed with the idea that I could fix me based on me if I just manage well. If I just go to the right meetings, do the right things, right? Be nice. They'll be okay. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers has been char uh, characterized by countless, veins, countless attempts to prove we could drink like other people. So, these people who are trying to drink like other people, have they done step one? They don't even, they really have a problem, do they? Because they think they're still in that stage of, if I could just drink with impunity. I'm not like this. See, I can get away with drinking 10 or 15 times before something happens, but every time something happens, I'm drinking. So I have a real hard understanding. Look, I got three months before. I got a year before. I got five months before, I got two weeks before. They told us we can get periods of sobriety based on ourselves. That's abstinence, that's not recovery. A lot of people mistaken abstinence for recovery. Most people in the fellowship of AA has experienced abstinence. They haven't experienced recovery, right? To recover from something means you have a different experience than the one you've always had. Our experience has always been the same come in, I'm not going to do that again, look at everything I'm doing not to do it again, oh my God, I did it again, right? Because we have an experience, we've been to the airport, but we haven't been on the plane. We've been to AA, but I haven't experienced what's offered in AA, but I don't know that because I haven't experienced it, right? So they talk about it here. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking career had been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people, drink with impunity, Right? The, so the doctor, the idea that somehow, someday, he, he will control and enjoy his drinking is a great obsession of every abnormal drinker. What is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker? I could control and enjoy my drinking. Have these people done step one who are still obsessed with the idea of controlling and enjoy your drinking? No. Have they done step one? No. They haven't done step one. 
So if you're obsessing with the idea of still being able to control and enjoy your drinking, you haven't done step one yet. How many people's brain just went, eh? What's the great obsession? To be okay. To be okay. So, right? So I haven't done step one yet. There's a lot of people in AA that haven't done step one yet because they don't understand. They say, oh, I haven't thought about drinking. The obsession is left. You don't understand step one because the obsession should leave once you do step one. The reason you have an obsession still because you haven't done step one. So it didn't say that I didn't think about it. Right? When I walk in a grocery store, I see some pistachios. Based on truth, I don't pursue it. Right? I still think about it. I see them sitting in the cupboard. I go, hmm. The truth is, every time I go for it, I love pistachios. But I can no longer f afford the effect it has on me. The consequences are too dear. Based on truth, I stop myself from pursuing it. Right? So I know the <coughs> truth about my situation. Now, in alcoholism, that doesn't mean it's able to keep me sober. Why? Because... I have a malady that centers in my mind. That's beyond my ability to see, feel, and touch when it's happening. It's a signal. It's two different things. One I could see, the obsession I could see and do something about. This other thing that happens in my mind, I have no control or power over. Once it happens, it happens. It's like the difference between talking about diarrhea and having diarrhea. One you could talk about and do something about because you're not experiencing it. When, when you're experiencing it, there's nothing you can do about it when it's happening. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that. All the willpower in the world ain't stopping you from about what's to happen. <laughs> it may sound funny, but that's like alcoholism, right? It's like afterwards you think, well, my stomach isn't turning anymore. I feel kind of all right. It's been four hours since I went. Maybe I can go on this marathon. Remember that old Imodium commercial? The, the guy, the donkey outfit, and the guy in the back end of the donkey goes to the guy in front of the donkey. You have taken the homodium, right? <laughs> like, like, it's very apparent to the guy in the back, <laughs> hanging on to the guy in front who had the dysentery problem, that he has a solution to his problem before he participates in the thing. Does that, that's common sense. So here, they talk about here, we'll leave with that idea. The great obsession, right? And then we're going to talk about the solution afterwards. We're going to have lunch. How long does lunch go for? I don't know. So we'll be back here at 1? Uh, 2, 2, maybe a little bit of break. Okay, 2? Two? 2, yeah. 2? Okay, everybody. And then, uh... okay, I'm an alcoholic. My name's Tony. A great lunch. That was awesome. Okay, so we're going to get right into this. Then we're going to kind of pick up speed. But this is the most important area. That's why they spend almost five chapters getting us ready to make a decision with the doctor's opinion. A lot of people just skim right over this stuff and they don't really have a full understanding of it. And in the book earlier, they talk about until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. Meaning the person who's afflicted with this illness, if you don't understand what you're up against, your approach to the application of a solution of this thing won't work. Right? You need to understand what you're up against. You need to understand the severity of the situation. And the more you understand the severity of the situation, the more it'll perpetuate you or move you into step two. Why I say most people really haven't done step one because they're really slow moving into the rest of the steps, right? Because if you understood what you're up against or people who you, was dealing with you understood what you're up against, they wouldn't tell you wait three months before starting this course of action. Because remember in Bill's story, when he got separated from alcohol for the last time, it was imperative that his friend took him through this course of action right away. Because if he didn't get this thing, what was Bill's fate? What has been his fate? Yeah. Yeah, well, he kept on drinking regardless. Like a lot of people were under the impression that I, to drink is to die. Well, they talk about a spiritual death, but they also talk about an, 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 a level of, uh, uh, of an experience of 10 or 15 years. Yeah, and no people who've been drinking 10 or 15 years? Like right. literal hell. Like, I mean, we could, we're, a lot of us could last a long time in misery. Any, anybody object to that? We adapt, like we, we could stay in situations that would be totally unacceptable to other people. We'd have people come and visit us and go, oh my God, and you go, what? <laughs> 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 what happened? <laughs> right? We just, we, we, we become 
okay with unacceptable situations because we can't change what we're doing, so we change the situation or the situation changes to accommodate what we do. Like, I don't think there's a person here that said, my last place that I ended up with, I looked so forward to ending up there. That was my dream from junior kindergarten, was to get to a place where I didn't know whether I was going to puke or let it go both ends. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, my biggest hope was I could make it to the bathroom. I don't think that's the goals and aspirations of any young man, right? You know, just the inability to keep control of your bowels and your situation of puking green bio and like ruin every relationship you've ever been into and your future just looks totally dismal. I mean, how many people ended up there? Yeah. And was that your hopes and dreams and asked for? That was your best effort. So obviously there's something going on here beyond my capability of understanding because that wasn't my hopes and dreams for myself. And I'd get up and try to create a different life, but I'd end up back in the situation again. So when I talk about more about alcoholism, that means they're going to talk more on a topic they've already been talking about. Yes, no? We're going to talk more about alcoholism. So what did we learn about alcoholism so far? It's twofold. So far. Right? There's only two symptoms to being an alcoholic. So far. How many people are arguing a bit? How many people notice that we argue about stuff that we're not talking about yet? Yeah, but. Yeah, let's talk. We're not talking later, we're talking about now. We're at the blueprint of building a foundation, an idea. The way you understand it now will determine how you apply it later. So, so far they use the mind and the body, right? In regards to the body, how did they describe the symptom? The allergy. Are we all con confirmed that's what the book was talking about? Where did we get that idea from? From the doctor's opinion. It wasn't our idea. So now we have the same understanding as the doctor and the first 100 men and women, because they all agree with the problem and the solution. So I become a part of the collective. I'm not singular anymore. It's not my understanding. It's their understanding that I deem to be true for myself. Right? So I become a part of the collective. This is our experience. It's not my experience anymore. I become a part of, yes, I have this problem too. Right? And I got the idea from them who got the idea from the doctor, and here's the examples they give. So it's not my idea. Right? So I had to get the same understanding as the doctor. But he also talked about that these people, that something kept on happening. Once there's a desire, they use it as a desire of the mind. But when we get to page 23, they say the main problem the alcoholic centers in is mind rather than his body. I don't know what you mean by that. And so they describe that as the malady. Is that my idea or their idea? Their idea, and so it kind of makes sense. Now I can see why I haven't been able to keep myself sober, why I keep on relapsing, how my first experience with the problem way back then wasn't enough to deter, change, or alter my course of action. And it's always gotten worse, never better. So can we kind of agree to that? Is that our understanding or their understanding? So now I become a part of the collective again. Right? So the more I understand this, the more I'm changing my views to adopt to their views and their understanding. So when we talk about more about alcoholism, we talk about here, right, that in regards to the obsession, the idea that somehow someday we'll control and enjoy our drinking is a great obsession of every abnormal drinker. So that would that refer to the problem with the body or the mind? Think about it again. Right? I'm admitting that I don't have a problem with the body. It's an association. The obsession is an association with the body. That I can control and enjoy my drinking. Because if I could control and enjoy my drinking, then I don't have the allergy. allergy. So when I use the obsession here, it's in regards to controlling and enjoying my drinking. Am I saying that or the book saying that? Book, book. book saying that. So that's the great obsession. So they say, let's go into this more, right? So they talk about here the idea that somehow, someday we'll control and enjoy our drink is a great obsession of every other. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. The persistence of what is illusion? The obsession. The obsession. The obsession. The obsession. That we can control and enjoy. They're very specific now about controlling and enjoying our drinking. The obsession is that I don't have the allergy, and there's got to be a way I could drink without consequence, right? Drink with impunity. Anybody like that here? So they're using the word very specifically in regards to a person. Have they done step one or haven't done step one? Haven't, haven't done step one yet. That's why they call <coughs> abnormal drinkers, right? So 
So the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity to your death, meaning a lot of people won't necessarily mean to seek help for this problem. You know a lot of people who are able to drink still keep their jobs, but they drink all the time? Yeah. Right? Because there's no consequences associated <coughs> sufficient enough for them to seek help. They're able to somewhat manage or maintain or control. But then, invariably, things get worse, never better, right? We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. So, to fully concede to means, to concede means what? Well, it means I've, I've looked at the information that they're giving me. I concede this to be true. So, if I didn't understand that and I just surrendered in step one, would I be understanding what the problem is? That's why they use the word concede, not surrender. I need to understand to concede to some means to I hold true. Yes, it's true. I looked at the evidence and everything being presented. I concede this to be true. I concede. I submit. Yes, this is true. Does that kind of make sense? That's yeah. what, and to learn means I didn't learn from my drinking. I learned to hear what the problem is. So a lot of people say, I admit I was an alcoholic out there. No, you may have been suffering from alcoholism out there, but you learned what alcoholism was in here. We learned. What are we learning? That people who are alcoholic have a problem with the mind and the body. And this is what it looks like. Does that kind of make sense? So they talk about here, if we follow that line of thinking, this is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or maybe presently maybe has to be smashed. What has to be smashed? Which is the obsession that I can safely drink, right? Now, once I learn I have an allergy, that when I put alcohol into my system, it triggers the phenomenon of craving, right? Which puts me through that spree that causes pain, suffering, and humiliation each and every time, most of the time, that I can't safely drink because of the allergy. That every time I put alcohol into my system, if I'm on this, I'm going to trigger the allergy. I can never safely drink again. So once I concede that, do I still have an obsession to do it? So the thought comes, hey, man, it would be nice to have a drink. I could base, yeah, it's just a thought. Like, you know what would be really nice? You should see the neighbor's wife. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty nice. I know she's married, but I've never met the husband. I've never seen him around. I'm obsessed with the idea. If you've seen her in a bathing suit, like I've seen her in a bathing suit, this is before I'm married, honey. So, <laughs> so it's like, wow, she's really hot. I'm obsessed with anybody ever been obsessed with the idea of a woman here and pursue that and all that other stuff. Then the husband comes home, sergeant of the RCMP or sergeant at arms of some organization. <laughs> to pursue that idea would be insanity. So based on the truth of her situation, I am no longer obsessed with the idea. I may fantasize about the idea, but I'm no longer involving her in it. Anybody? Oh, yeah. Right? So based on truth, I know I can no longer safely drink. So the obsession is gone in regards to the idea that I can safely drink. Right? I conceded that I have this problem. Now, that doesn't mean I can stay sober. What it means is, when I think about the idea of drink, I know I can't. So anybody ever refuse a drink here? Yeah. yeah. Anybody ever want to drink and know they can't drink? Yeah. They do that based on truth. That smashes the idea. So now we have a problem. So now they said, we, as we go through these pages, from page 30, 31, 32, talks about the allergy. <laughs> and having to concede to this thing. When we get to page 33, it confirms this, that they're talking about people not fully understanding the allergy, that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. They're using these pages to talk about the allergy. And they sum it up by saying, if we're planning to stop, there must be no reservations of any kind, no lurking notion that someday we'll be immune to alcohol. That idea has to be smashed. Who does the smashing? We do based on our experience and truth, right? But that enough is not enough to keep us sober. What that does is get your attention. That says that's the first symptom in alcohol that makes you alcoholic. If you don't have the allergy, can you be an alcoholic? No. Were you an alcoholic before you drank? Yes. You have to drink to be an alcoholic. I know that I find that kind of surprising. <laughs> but you have to drink to be, you find out if you're alcoholic. You have to trigger the allergy. You have to trigger the allergy. If I never drink, I can never trigger the 
allergy and I would never get in trouble. So if I never took a drink my entire life, how would I know I'm alcoholic? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. That's the only thing that makes me alcoholic. Now what makes me a real alcoholic, what type of alcoholic I am, is an entirely different question. So they talk about, as we go in here, they talk about if we're planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservations of any kind. No lurking notion that someday we'll be immune to alcohol, meaning that I'll be able to drink with impunity. How will I know if I'm one of those people I look back on my drinking history? Have I been able to drink with impunity? Without consequence. How many people here have been able to drink without consequence? I'm not talking about the one time back in 1972 <laughs> <laughs> when you got arrested. <laughs> right? Like, we're funny people. We're the only group of people. Like, anybody ever been arrested here at a party? You're handcuffed in the back of a vehicle. You're the only one really unaware of your situation. You're handcuffed. Everybody's watching you leave and you're saying, Yee I'll be back. And they'll say, no, I won't. <laughs> no, you won't. Like, we're not quite right when it comes to... Anyways, so we get into this. Young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think they can stop as he did. He stopped on the basis of his knowledge that it was causing him trouble for 30 years. What they talk about is out came the carpet slippers and he was dead in a short period of time. Because he couldn't make the admission that he was alcoholic because he was able to stop not fully understanding the allergy. So as time goes on, you ever hear our, wor our relapses get worse, never better? Yeah. Why do they get worse? Because the allergy keeps on happening. And what It's not in the book, but they explained it to me. When you're allergic to something, you get more allergic as time goes on. And so what happens has to do with our genes, uh, a cell in our body. So our cell splits into two, right? And that cell splits. Right? It keeps on splitting as time goes on. So my mom's more allergic to strawberries now than she was when she first got diagnosed with it. As time goes on, she can't even be around it. So it keeps on happening. So what happens in our body is when we start again or we get into relapse, it's like we never stopped. So if I stopped here. So if, I, if something was to happen, I found myself a drink in hand. At the level I was at, that, I'd be dead in a short period of time. Like that guy out came to... Carpet slippers, even though he was able to control and kind of manage his drinking back then and able to stop on his own resources, he got to a place where the progression kept on happening. And it's a really good story if you want to look at it. He took a drink based on the idea that he would be able to enjoy himself because he's retired now, not making the admission of being an alcoholic, not understanding the allergy. That's what they're saying here, right? He thought his long-term sobriety would enable him to drink because he's never really done step one. He thought step one was the consequences associated with drinking. Right now that I'm able to, got my life in order, I could drink without consequences. He's never really, has he done step one? No. no. So they talk about here, uh, this man, um, um, they think they can stop as he did on their own willpower. How many people are hoping to stop on their own willpower here? Through their own experience. That's what they're talking about. We doubt if many of them can because none of them, will really want to make sense. How many people really wanted to stop here? Nope. How many people just didn't want the consequences? Yep. How many people wanted to find a way, there's gotta be a way I could drink without consequence. If I could just not end up in the hospital, the neighbor's wife, stabbed, <laughs> shot at, puking or defecating in my own pants, that, then it'd be a good night. Anybody? <laughs> or is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, that's how people don't wanna admit it, right? We're having fun now, whoops. At least buy the underwear by the... Anyway. <laughs> you never know. Okay. Okay, and then now, not one of them because we really want to, and hardly one of them because of the particular mental twist already acquired. So the mental twist, is it in the body, the mind, or the obsession? The mind. The malady. So now they're calling it a twist. Twist that happens in our mind, and they're saying that it has been happening a long time ago, but we weren't able to recognize it because nobody explained it to us. So this thing has been happening. So those of us who've been relapsing, when I said, why do you continue to relapse? If you look at the back of your papers, how many put, people put there, because I suffer from a malady, a particular mental twist that leads me back to drinking each and every time. How many people put a situation there that happened because her, him, this or that, or I wanted to? Look at the back of your paper if you can't remember your answer. Oh, here we have fun. Hey, now I'm getting a look. Don't go with my, go with my back of my paper. <laughs> uh, 
So we see that they already the mental twist that proceeds. So now they kind of get into this thing. And then they talk about page 35. Now they're going to talk about why we can't stay stopped on the knowledge of, our, of the allergy or step one. Why we cannot stay stopped drinking based on the knowledge of hitting bottom, surrendering, acceptance and all. That in itself is not enough to keep us sober. How many people were hoping? How many people heard the reason I went back out drinking is because I stopped going to meetings? Yeah. Is that true or false statement? False. False statement. But we like to think if I go to meetings, that'll keep me sober, then I can be my own solution because who's obsessed with the idea of being their own solution? <laughs> we are all are. That's the second obsession that has to be smashed. There's two obsessions that has to be smashed. One that I can control and enjoy my drinking. We learn this idea has to be smashed. And the other one is that I could be my own solution. That also has to be smashed. Two humbling exercises in humility. It could come by two ways. One through learning and one through life events. Where does humility most, most works for us? Through life events. <laughs> oh, that hurt it. <laughs> Holy shit. That, that didn't go as planned. <laughs> or watch this. <laughs> right? So anyway, so they talk about the mind here. So 35 which reiterates from page 22 to 23, they're going to say, here, let's talk about the main problem the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. Because if I never took a drink, I never have the consequences associated with this. So this is really no longer my problem. Right? Yep. So now they say, say, so let's get into this now. So we shall s describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse in the drinking. Well, what does precede mean? A week, month, precede. What does precede mean? Before. Just before. That means somewhere here, something happens in the mind that takes the drink that triggers the allergy. It doesn't happen over here. It's been happening. It happens just beforehand. Something happens because I've been, we already agreed, I've been able to keep myself sober on different occasions based on truth, right? I can't drink. No, I don't want one. I want one, but I don't want one. Anybody been there? I want one, but I don't want one. I really, really want one, but I better not take one. Because if I take one, I know what happens, right? We're able to keep ourselves on some basis of truth, but we really don't understand what we're up against. So they say here, so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse in the drinking. For obviously, what does obviously mean? For obviously. For sure. Yeah, to everybody else, obviously, for us, is really? <laughs> really and obviously the same thing? Obviously, this is the crutch of the problem. We go, what? So what sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experimentation of the first drink? What sort of thinking? Insane thinking. Well, the malady, so they call it here, and so they get into our first friend, as we call Fred, and as we go through here, you notice what they'll never use again in regards to an association with the problem? They'll never use this word again. Obsession. What word, huh? Obsession. Obsession. They'll never use that word again because we already admitted we have a problem. The obsession refers to people that don't think they have a problem. They haven't done step one yet. Once you've done step one, you're no longer dealing with the obsession, you're dealing with... The thought process that precedes the first drink, which is the insanity, the blank spot. They call it a phenomena, right? There's something that parallels with our sound thinking. And they talk about this on page 37. After describing this guy who puts an ounce of whiskey in his milk, he knew that if he was to take another drink, all would be gone. How many people here knew if you took another drink, you're over? It's over. Yeah. This guy knew that. And he knew he would lose everything if he took another drink. He ends up in a place he's been many times before. Everything is going good. There's no thought of drinking whatsoever. There's no obsession. There's no thought. He knows he can't drink again. There's nothing. He orders a milk. And suddenly the thought would be a good idea to have a shot of whiskey, end up back in the puzzle factory and lose everything I own. And boy, it's going to be one hell of a night. That's the truth, right? But he doesn't see that. It'd be nice to order an ounce of whiskey and put it in my milk. As an observer, do you think that's kind of crazy? Based on his story? But as a participant, do you understand that kind of thinking? Anybody have the suddenly here? Anybody ever leave treatment or going to treatment, leave detox, go in the hospital, leaving jail, going to jail? Leave, anybody find the right moment? The hell, it sounds like a drink would be a good idea right now. 
and you've tried recovery before. Yeah. A couple times you've, you, you've been a total shit show. Yeah. And there's nobody as thrilled about you as you are with you when it comes to your drinking. Yeah. And you did it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know what? You think that's funny? I'm going to do it again. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Oh, my God. Right? That's kind of like makes you go, oh, my God, wait a minute. You mean I'm going to do it again? Yeah. Means relapse is coming. Means when I actually do step one, what I'm admitting to is I'm going to relapse again. One hundred percent. So, what's the promise of step one? And I'm going to drink again. I'm going to drink again. That's the promise of step one, and step one never changes. It never changes. That is step one. That is alcoholism. How many people feel good about their step one now? Awesome. How many people felt good about the other step one? I've done it. I feel good. <laughs> I just you ever hear? I like these guys coming to train. I just did step one. I feel so good. That's, I want to do your step one, right? Because when I do this step one, that's not good news. And how many people like that idea? Right? So they talk about here. They talk about here. So they talk. You may think this in a screen case to us is not far fetched. For this kind of thinking has been characteristic of every single one of us. Not some of us. Every single one of us has this, this thing. And it's been happening long before I suspected it was a thing or even a problem. It's been eating my lunch long before I thought it was even going on. People have been going on to me, what are you doing? You drinking again? Anybody have that question? And you look at them, what do you mean? Why wouldn't I be drinking again? <laughs> Anyways, we have sometimes reflected more than Jib did upon the consequences. Anybody ever reflect upon the consequences? You hear it, think it through. You ever hear that great piece of advice? Think it through. Play the tape through. We think this is going to get painful. I better get a bigger glass. That's what think it through means to us, right? So we warn everybody around us, hey, you know, I'm about to take a drink, and as long as you don't put me in public places or situations, everything should be fine. But if you leave me unsupervised out there, you know we're going to involve the police and ambulance or some form of incarceration by the time the night's over. Anybody have that kind of story here, or is it just me? Yeah, so, but there, there was always, not sometimes, there was always that curious mental phenomena, phenomenon that paralleled with our sound thinking. So phenomenon, what does that mean? More than one event, more than one way it disguises a phenomena is singular, right? So they talk about the, solution, the three phenomena, right? Phenomenon, phenomenon. So they talk about it disguises itself in a whole bunch of different ways, but in, invariably I find myself using again. And I'm always surprised that I'm doing it, right? So they talk about here, the sound reasoning one out, right? The, the insane idea one out. And so as they go through here, and then they talk about 39, but the actual or potential alcoholic with hardly an exception will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. That means regardless of your story, you're going to end up drinking again. Anybody have that here? Anybody have a full knowledge of themselves? They talk about that guy that left treatment. He said he has such a profound inner workings of his mind that relapse was unthinkable. Anybody here ever think relapse was unthinkable? Never going to happen again. But nevertheless, he was loaded again. Why? Because he didn't understand step one and he's never really done it. Well, he's done step one through his understanding, but he didn't do step one through their understanding. When you do step one through their understanding, you're getting that oh oh feeling now. Remember that guy that went in there and he asked the doctor to tell him the truth? The doctor says, hey, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. What means chronic? Repeat offender. Any repeat offenders here? He says, I've never seen one case like yours ever recover. The guy felt like the gates of hell slammed in on him, right? Like that's bad news. That you're going to continue to do what you're doing regardless. That you're going to get bits of sobriety. You're going to renew your wife's hope, everybody's hope. Then you're going to do it again. He says, is there any exceptions to this? The doctor says, yes, every once in a while, since the beginning of time, there's been these things called a vital spiritual experience. Miracle. Yeah, so uh, he, says, he says, to me, these occurrences are phenomena, but they seem to take place. And when they take place in people like you, these people are able to recreate their lives. So he kind of goes on. 
here and they talk about this other guy here, Fred, right? He says, Fred kind of goes, and this is what we all talk about. I rather appreciate your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink. Again, there's a in case you didn't understand what the problem was before, we're going to tell you again. It precedes the first drink. You can't see it coming. It's not, didn't happen last week. It's been happening all along, but your inability to detect it is the problem. You haven't experienced recovery. You've experienced abstinence. So you're, you're, what you're thinking is what recovery is has actually been abstinence because the, the problem hasn't been rectified or fixed itself or removed. It continues. Because you can't see, feel, and touch it, you become a victim to it. Be it a couple of days, a couple of months, or a couple of years sober, there comes a time when we're without defense against the first drink. Anybody been like that here? So it's baffling now. It's kind of like, holy shit, I'm up against something that I can't see, feel, and touch, but I see what it looks like in my life, and I see what it looks like based on what you're telling me. Okay. You know what? There's got to be something I could do about this, right? And they talk about, as they go through here, they talk about Fred, and they kind of go through it here, and then what's really, really cool is page 42, and this is worth reading because it's going to go into our next point here about the solution. So we've looked at the problem in great detail, right? And we kind of seeing now, by the time you fully understand this and you're kind of looking at your life in regards to this, you should be having a kind of impending doom feeling. Yeah. Looking at the truth, if your history has been relapse, what is the likelihood it's going to happen again outside of this solution that they're talking about? 100%. How many people like that step one? See, we don't understand step one because you bring up in a meeting topics, you bring up step one, and not everybody likes that. They didn't. Then you talk about relapse being 100% guaranteed, everybody gets offended. That's the same topic as step one. What are we admitting to in step one? That we're powerless over something that we can't fix, change, or see happening on our own. That's what it means to be powerless. Knowledge of that, does it change it? No. Doesn't change it. But it puts you in a position of looking for a solution to that problem. That's the only thing admitting does is, hey, I have this problem. What's the solution to it? Because not admitting it, does it change it? No. Does admitting changing it? No. So that means I need to find something that creates change from this thing that I'm suffering from. Because if step one never changes, that means there must be something as an alternate that I could apply to my life that keeps me from the fate of this thing happening again. So they talk about this guy here that he thought relapse was unthinkable based on his knowledge. And we get a lot of that in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like I've been doing studies now um, 29 years, like I said. And, and based on my own experience and all the people I work with, this is the biggest problem in this area, step one. They don't really understand what they're up against. Because who likes to admit complete defeat? Nobody. Nobody, right? And we don't surrender. What surrender means to us is I'll ignore, postpone, or evade. This is what surrender means to me. Oh, man, that looks like a big bill. <laughs> I surrender you to the unknown. <laughs> right? And what happens is life is preparing another bill. There's another notice coming in the mail, right? So they talk about here. He says he talks about his condition after knowing he never would relapse again. He says, he says they had said that I would raise a defense that... They had said that though I had raised the defense, able to keep myself sober, it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. Well, that just happened and more. For what I had learned about alcoholism didn't even occur to me. I knew from that moment I had an alcoholic mind. So what determines to have an alcoholic mind? Now they're getting into new conversations here. What is an alcoholic mind? You hear everybody say, oh, I'm an alcoholic. I did that because I have an alcoholic mind. That's an incorrect statement. Because a lot of people do stupid stuff who are not alcoholic. You know anybody here who's not alcoholic who's lost a job? You know anybody here that's alcoholic who, who's not alcoholic who's lost a divorce, <laughs> jobs, life, unmanageability, doing life in penitentiaries? There's a lot of people experience life in a lot of different ways who are not alcoholic. So what is an alcoholic mind? You hear that all the time, right? I have an alcoholic mind, right? Or alcoholic behavior. Or special, alcoholic behavior. Special thinking. Special thinking. Special thinking. So, so here they say, here, this guy said, I saw from that, I saw that willpower, self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. 
right? And he talked about, he saw, he, I knew from that moment I had an alcoholic mind. What determines having an alcoholic mind? Well, this malady uh, pertaining to alcohol. The malady, the inability to keep myself sober on that situation. So if I have an alcoholic mind, what is the likelihood of me drinking again? So something has to take place where in my mind to create a shift where I no longer have an alcoholic mind. So this is where I have a lot of fun, right? So if I go through this process and have the psychic change of spiritual experience, do I still have an alcoholic mind? How many people say yes? How many people say no? How many people not getting involved? <laughs> not con- so, if I have an alcoholic mind, I'm going to drink? 100%. 100%. So, a change has to happen in my mind. mind that this problem no longer exists. Yes? No? Yeah. yeah. So, that means I need a solution that creates a shift in here that takes away this problem. I need a psychic change or spiritual experience. Who was the first person that mentioned that? How many people came up with that on their own? The doctor. The doctor. And the doctor, he explained this thing. It says, until a psychic change happens, what, what are these people's fate? Is it too far jumping up to ask you a question about? So step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Yep. We have that spiritual experience and have now have a power to create than ourselves in our life, i.e. done the step three. Am I wrong in stating that I don't feel powerless over the first drink? Yeah, you're, I have that power yeah, in my life? Yeah, you're wrong. Okay. Okay. Right. And, and I'll show you because that's the thinking that we've... Yeah. I, I don't like using the word wrong, but we look at it incorrectly. Right, and so when when we do these building blocks, if you follow along with the book, say this thing is put together like it's just whoa. When we see what it's being said, and for a lot of us guys like me and you and you and you and most of us in here, we need to look at things differently. We need to find out why it is I keep doing what I'm doing and why I haven't created the change or have felt the change that they talk about on the level to keep me sober because I can't afford too many more relapses because people who are relapsing nowadays aren't coming back. Like a, a lot of my buddies and sponsors are dropping like flies. Guys have been sober a while, out one night, just doing a little bump, not here anymore. Like gone. Hooked up. I got a buddy right now on a little motion. It's been an emotional week. He's hooked up, a sponsor him 19 years struggling. He had six years. He got into some stuff, did a little bump. His girlfriend was in the shower. She was in there longer than she was drunk. She came out and he's on the floor. He's been there like he, they didn't know how long. They suspected 10, 15 minutes and he's in. So they were trying to resuscitate him the other day. They put him in a coma and all that other stuff. He was like, he's been around 19 years. What he doesn't understand was he's up. What is up against? He's never really done step one. He's done a form of step one, but he's never really done step one. Because he's never really done step one, he never got motivated into looking what the solution is in step two. Because he had his own ideas of what step three is, he never really understood what he was up against. Does that kind of make sense? So let's look at this thing here. He talked about, I saw willpower and self-knowledge would not help me in those strange mental blank spots because of the malady, right? So now it's kind of explained. I've never been able to understand people that said a problem had them hopelessly defeated. Anybody else here? Anybody ever watch somebody relapse and go, what's the matter with you? (laughs) Come on, come on. Anybody ever ask you, what are you doing? How come you're doing that? You hadn't had enough? So understand. I knew then it was a crushing blow. Two of this is cool. Two members of Alcoholics Anonymous came to see me. They grinned, which I did not like so much. Anybody, you know, we get that grin. Hey, hey, how you doing, right? And asked me if I thought myself alcoholic and if I were really licked this time. In that term, what does that mean, really licked this time? Defeated. Defeated. That means my best efforts is going to get me loaded. That everything within my own resources... <laughs> To this far is going to get me loaded. Everything I've done this far has got me loaded. Are you done? So you being licked this time, now you'll be able to hear what I'm saying. Because if you're thinking as I'm talking, you're not licked. The ego is taking over. Anybody have that problem here? People's trying to save your life and you're arguing with them in your head. Shut up. <laughs> okay. So what happens here? They talk about, then is really, really cool here. 
they talked about their grin and what I did not like so much. And if they thought myself an alcoholic, if I were really licked this time, I had to concede both propositions. Again, to concede means to weigh the evidence. They use that word a lot, eh? To concede? To concede to something, you need to understand what's being presented. Yeah, I concede to this proposition. I see what's happening here. I understand why I'm defeated based on these ideas. Right? So they grinned, right? And then they, they tell, then they piled heaps of evidence to the fact that an alcoholic mentally, uh, such as I had exhibited in Washington, was a hopeless condition. So what would they be heaping? What effects would, they, what would they be talking about, heaping on him, the effects? Hmm? So, well, I could, could read that again. They piled on me heaps of evidence to the effect that a, an alcoholic mentally, such as I had exhibited in Washington, was a hopeless condition. They cited cases out of their own experience by the dozens. This process snuffed out the last flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself. What are we doing here right now? So I tried treatment, I tried steps, I tried meetings. Yeah, so what the, yeah, they're kind of piling on that this here malady has you hooked. You can't see, feel, and touch it. That you're in a collision course with another drink 100%. They, and they talked about their own experience, how many times they tried to get sober, how many times they got loaded, how many times I did this, I did that, I was going to do, and I promised, and I would have passed the lie detector test. Anybody here? So when they size out of this and they realize that once I have this condition, this puts me in a place of beyond human aid. Now, if I'm beyond human aid, and I should be really feeling panically because now it's not a matter of if, if it's a matter of when. My fate's coming, tick tock, tick tock. Right? That kind of puts you in a different position when you understand step one is that. When you understand, most people understand I'll be okay. Because look, I'm going to treatment, I'm doing meetings, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm in charge of my destiny. Here we go again. Is like anybody ever been on a roller coaster here? If you didn't like roller coasters, the first time around would be really terrifying, right? And then you get arrested at the bottom. You know how to rest at the bottom? You're supposed to get off the roller coaster? We don't know that. We go, oh my God, that was terrifying. I never want to do that again. And then you hear click. Click, 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 click. You go, what's that sound? <laughs> That's step one, <laughs> representing itself. Right? Okay, that, you find that funny later. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then they outline the spiritual answer they have found in the program of action, which a hundred of them have followed. What step is that? Then they outline the spiritual answer they have found. Then they outline the spiritual answer they have found. What step is that? How many people say 12? How many people say 12? Come on, get involved. This is a workshop. See what you're thinking about. Spiritual step, sure, 12. So that's step 12? What is it? What's the question again? So then they outline the spiritual... Then they outline the spiritual answer and program of action which a hundred of them have followed. We're having fun here, eh? Okay, look, we're going to practice something together, right? This will probably save your life down the road. And remember, you heard it here first. At first, it's a little uncomfortable, but you'll find it really useful when talking to your sponsor and make conversations a lot shorter. Ready? It's going to be profound. I don't no. <laughs> I know. But you can practice that in front of your mirror and watch. <laughs> Nothing will happen. <laughs> I wouldn't do it here because you never know what happens. But it's really amazing. Like, it's like, can I have five more answers to five more guesses? We're all like that, right? Like, I don't know. I can't admit that. Right? Okay, so what step is that? I don't know. Hey, there we go. It's actually step two. Step two. They're practicing step 12. Wow. They're carrying a message to a person who's afflicted with alcoholism. They're carrying this message, which is a solution to their dilemma. Right? What's the solution to step one? Step two. It explains what the solution is. Right? Remember when Ebby was sitting with Bill? Ebby was talking about, we understand a step 12, but he was talking to Bill about step two was the solution to his problem that he hadn't contained yet. 
Remember that conversation? So now we're having fun. When did we start? Two. Two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. So now, now we're having fun. Okay. So now he's talked to him about the problem. Which is step one. One. Right? Yeah. So in that condition, we know what our fate is 100%. Right? So Ebby's talking to Bill. Bill kind of looked and said there was no more power than in him than there was in me at that time. But there was something he was inwardly changed. There was something different about him. He seemed to have a solution to the dilemma that's killing me. So he was interested. But his thinking kept on getting in the way. Remember when Ebby was talking, his thinking was kind of, eh, nobody has that problem here. Somebody's trying to help you and you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. So he says, he says what he found was a spiritual answer. He called them religious ideas that he put into practice that created a chance sufficient enough for him to recover. It, the evidence was, was there. At that moment, he kind of was alarmed. He says, were all these other people right after all? Because he's seen sitting across the table was this miracle at two months sober. He couldn't argue with the evidence that was being presented. So his friend said, this is the things I did to experience this. Right? And, this, and Bill says, well, it was only a matter of being willing to do what his friend did. Right? Remember that conversation? That I might build what I saw in my friend if I did what he did. So what Ebby was talking to him, what was the experience that he had in 12, through the course of action he did in 2, that other people presented to him. Right? So when we look at the course of action, came to believe that the power of greater ourselves could restore us to... Sanity, I don't know what they mean by it. So if I suffer from insanity, what would be the solution? Sanity. Sanity, that means I have to undergo a shift in my thinking where I'm no longer afflicted with the problem anymore. Who's that song, Blow a Leak or something? <laughs> so, uh, too much information. <laughs> Leave your holding your head. <laughs> Nobody's head has ever exploded as a result of going through this thus far. <laughs> this might be a proof. So it's, sim it's so simple, isn't it? When you think about it. Like <clears throat> so they're saying this is the solution to this, but I don't know what this is yet. So they've got to explain the outline of program of action that they took to create this change. Right? And they said, as a result of this course of action, they've undergone a psychic change of spiritual experience. When we get to step 10, they say the problem has been removed. <clears throat> what problem has been removed? The this problem that centers in my mind. So I no longer have an alcoholic mind as the result of this course of action. I've had a shift of spiritual experience. In order to maintain that, I need to find a recipe that I need to incorporate in my life to save me from me. I need witness protection. <clears throat> Because there's somebody trying to kill me and it's been me. <laughs> right? So I need a new identity, spiritual experience, a psychic change. I need to undergo a profound alteration in my thinking attitude about life because there's somebody out to kill me and I don't know what he looks like. And that person's in my head. My head's got a contract down on my ass. And so my sponsor kind of said, we're putting you in the witness protection. <laughs> That's what step two is. Are you ready to sign up? That's step three. The identity starts in step four. And I go through a process of creating a shift sufficient enough where I'm no longer that person. doesn't mean I don't think about being that person. I'm no longer that person. Does that kind of make sense? And they said, as long as I pursue a spiritual answer for this, and I continue to go to the second half of how it works, talks about the principles we have set down are, what's that? Guys, right. Guys to progress. I can claim progress now. Before, it was always stagnation. It was always going back to the same shithole I was getting away from. Anybody ever have, why is this always happening to me? Yeah. I can't believe this is happening again. Well, why not? You're the only one that can't believe it. <laughs> Everybody else who knows it's just a matter of time. There they go again. Broken GPS. If your GPS is not working, that means, so as we go through this, which is really cool, they talk about here, which a lot of people don't understand, they talk about, we have two alternatives. Meaning, they've explained the situation, the solution. I need to undergo a psychic change of spiritual experience. I need to access some form of power. It becomes personal to me. It creates this change in my psyche, which they explain in the back of the book. So I'm, I'm seeing all this information, and I see the examples of it by everybody who went around me. I said, this thing is obtainable, because look at that whack job. Yeah. Look at that guy. I can't believe the way he used to be, and he's in the condition he is in now. Man, if it works for a nut bar like that, I mean, I'm a shoo-in. 
I bet you a couple people thought that looking at me and said, oh, my God, look at that guy. If it's working for him, you feel better, right, about your story after mine? <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah. <laughs> I keep drinking. You can have my story, too. <laughs> so that's what I love about it, right? You can have one or the other. It's the yet factor, <laughs> right? The nip of the ringer, right? So, so I understand what this is being presented, and I understand it has to come as a result of a course of action. Me, I, I need things to explain to me different. I'm like something the matter with the way I process things. I don't know if anybody's like that here. Here's what it looks like. If you're driving along the road, and depending how hammered you are, you get a flat tire. Do you notice there's something fundamentally wrong with your vehicle? Some of us try to ignore it. Then you get to a place where there's actually sparks flying from the tire. Anybody ever try that? And you can no longer postpone or evade the situation, you have a problem. Right? Other than everybody driving by pointing to the fact there's sparks flying from your car. This is kind of like our life. Everybody's going by and going, hey, what the hell? You're like, <laughs> right? The car's like that. <laughs> so you pull over, you look at the tire. You realize the tire's been gone for a while. You're down to the rim. So you assess the situation. You realize you can't go farther. To continue would mean disaster. So you admit that. You accept it. You hold hands, do the serenity prayer around the car. You turn it over and let it go. And you get back in the car and start driving again. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make any kind of sense? No. How many times do we hear that in regards to treating our illness? Just don't do it. Surrender, let it go, turn it over. It don't work for people like us because we're not quite right. That works for people who are able to function at a level beyond anything we could ever understand. Remember I was talking about, <laughs> yeah, remember I was talking about my wife putting cellophane over there? We're the only group of people offended by stuff like that. Yeah. What? <laughs> Intervention. So the way we look at things is fundamentally different, right? So they're saying, so when I look at that car, I realize that problem never changes by knowing it, acknowledging it, Fix it. Ah, so now I need a solution to that problem. But if I didn't know what it was, the common understanding would be I need a new tire, right? Does that change it? I need to know what specific tire I need for this specific car. You might need a rim. Well, let's go with the whole tire and rim thing <laughs> because we could get really carried away, right? <laughs> well, the nuts might be seized and might. You know, <laughs> Maybe the ground it's on is off. You won't be able to get the jack under it. Like, you see how we can go? Uh, you just throw a match in the car anyways and steal a new one. It wasn't yours anyways, right? <laughs> get a new, steal a new car. <laughs> okay, so, so anyways, <laughs> I love you guys. We're great. Eh? Focus, focus. Okay, so you know you need a new tire. Does that change anything? No. You need to go to the glove compartment box and you open the glove and it shows you where the spare tire is. And everything you need. Ah. <laughs> Wait a minute. So if you didn't know where the spare tire was and it was a newer car and there was a spare tire in it. Is that better? No, uh, there's like one of those torque nuts there to take off the bolt. We don't have that special. We're not there yet. Okay. But I like your enthusiasm. Okay, so that's, uh, and that's the way we are. Well, you know, there might have this problem, so why even look? <laughs> you know, there might be a certain kind of torque nut in there. Did you see what kind of would? No, but we don't need to. We're having a conversation around something we have nothing, no knowledge of, anyways. But let's talk. Does that kind of make sense? So I need to get the manual. The manual will say, hey, you know what? The tire's in here. Here's all the things you need to change the tire. They have pictures on how to change the tire. They have a course of action to bring about a change for this tire and enable you to have the problem removed that you can continue on with your life, right? So now you have the problem. It's really evident, and some people may have explained it to you, and some of the challenges around that, right? Thank you very much for your input. And then the turn around, and then now you have the solution. Yeah. which would be step one and two, three. two. In step two, it tells you the course of action you need to take is that as a result of this course of action, you'll have a new tire. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, that means 
my friend promised when these things were done, I'd have the elements of a new way of living that answered all my problems. That means this is the problem area for us. You mean I have to do it? No. Can I just have it? Yes. Okay. Can I talk about it at the next meeting? Yes. How do you know what it looks like? Because I heard him talk about it. So I know what it looks like. I can share his experience as my experience at the next meeting. And we do that. We're just chameleons. It's just the way we're designed. It's kind of like it is like an airport. Not everybody's going somewhere. Some people just like sitting there because of the entertainment or the, who knows why they're there. So what happens is if, I went, if we all went to the airport in Kelowna here for 90 days, an hour at a time, does it mean we're going anywhere? Would we meet people who are going somewhere? Yes. Would we meet people who are coming back from somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Would we meet people who are living exciting lives? Yes. Would we meet people who are kind of depressed and going on vacation as a result of their life? Yeah, sure. yeah we meet all these different people. The difference is they're experiencing something that I haven't experienced yet. So this guy comes back. Here's us. We meet three people who have been to Cuba, a certain area. The first time we think that's a very interesting trip. <clears throat> Wow, that's right, and you're so enriched with what they have to say. Then the next person you talk to, he says, I hear it's really nice there. And you engage in their conversation. The third person says, yeah, yeah, when you go there, you got to go to the store around the corner. You see the difference in conversation? By the time I talk to the third meeting or 90 days, I'm talking like I have this experience that I got it all under control based on the people I've been talking about at the airport. And somebody goes, oh, have you been on the plane yet? Been on the plane. You have an itinerary. What's an itinerary? Your travel plan. Do you know where you're going? What it looks like? Where you're starting from? Do you need one of those? <laughs> this is our itinerary. It's, it talks about where we're at, where we want to go, and how to get there. Remember we talked about the travel agency? You see all these pictures on there? It says, wow, that looks really nice. And if you're living in a, in a basement suite somewhere on the streets and you see the possibility of having this kind of exist or going on this kind of trip, if you're in depression, it's kind of, you mean I could go on a trip like this and I could enjoy this kind of life if I'm willing to do certain things and get a passport, do all these things necessary to get on a plane to go enjoy life beyond anything I could ever imagine? And the people around you say, yeah, we experience this on a daily basis. And what got us there was this manual. And what keeps us there is this manual. So when we go on that trip, we're at that trip and there's nothing that we bring with us. We're at peace, contentment, and ease with everything that's happening. We're not consumed with self and the possibilities of the endless pain of tomorrow and all yesterday's. I had no new peace and new freedom. So you're saying I could get this out of this? Yeah, but you need to go through this course of action to get that. So you mean in, in order for me to experience me getting back on the road, I have to change this tire? But knowing that isn't enough? Right? I have the tire. I have God. No, you need an experience with God. A lot of people have God. That's why the next chapter, we agnostics, is dedicated to three people. The atheist, the agnostic, and true believer. All three of them have the same problem. Pretty hard to believe, right? Because we get taught here, find God. So everybody bypasses the first two steps and go right to God. What do you do? I'm looking for God. He's not lost. Right? What are you looking for? I don't know, but when I find it, I guess I'll know. So we don't even know where we're looking for. We don't know where we're starting. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what it looks like when we get there. <sighs> what the hell? Right? And so why aren't we getting this? Because we're surrounded by a bunch of people who are confused about the same facts. 11 years, nobody 12-stepped me. So when they 12-stepped me the way I'm 12-stepping you guys, a lot of it was like, whoa. Like this was holy smokes. And these guys were excited about their sobriety. And they were excited about where they were. And they said, this is what got them there. And that's where we are now. We're just starting this thing. And the enthusiasm I have is this because the guys who went before me made it very possible that I could experience something on a level beyond anything I could ever imagine. And the question was experience. I used to get the two mixed up, right? And, and you know, I say things weird because I understand it that way. Most of us have had sexual experiences alone. <laughs> and we call that thrilling. And then somebody talks about the possibility of actually involving another person. That sounds exciting, right? But we have an experience. It sounds exciting. And then once you experience it, no further explanations necessary. We've gone from somewhat thrilling, your first experience with you, to you'll be amazed before you're halfway through. <laughs> 
you will not regret the past in which you shut the door. <laughs> like you'll be, no further explanation will be necessary. Does that kind of, and that's kind of like most of us have the one experience of, of applying self to self, but really not experience this thing on a different level. Here in step two, they're saying you need to apply it on a different level, but we need to explain it to you. Most people are trying to get it without the explanation. They're bypassing it, right? So when I take the manual, I go through the manual, I have the experience of being able to change the tire. It's not comfortable at first, but the result of doing it allows me to, uh, new freedom and new happiness. And that way, when life happens, I'm able to... What Does that kind of make sense? So when we get into this thing, we agnostics. We're going to have a couple questions here. And then, and then we're going to kind of move on. So we agnostics is a summary of the problem and the solution. They're saying here, we're going to explain the solution on a little more um, uh, deeper level as we understand it. We're going to explain our solution to you as we understand it. It's not your understanding of our solution. We tell people now figure out what the solution is. It doesn't say that in step two, does it? This came to believe that a power grants out to restore us to sanity. I don't know what you mean by that. We're telling people, go figure it out. You need to have God. It doesn't say that, does it? It says we have a specific solution for this specific problem, but we need to explain to you what this specific solution is to this problem. Then the pursuit of that will make a lot more sense. You'll understand, and with the longevity is this, these three steps here will lead to long-term Sobriety, long-term, happy, contented sobriety. Because these three steps never change. When they turn into principles, you understand the basis of it. And a lot of people really, it is the ability to assess and take new action, spiritual action. So step one is, what's the problem? Step two is, what's the solution? Spiritual solution to this problem. And that never changes in life, right? Here, we're telling you what the problem is. Later, you get to assess what the problem is and apply the necessary spiritual tools to it to create a shift and change in attitude and outlook. Right? Finding the solution necessary. They talk about that in the promises. Bill talked about how an element of living that answered all my problems. But here, unless this problem gets resolved in step one, what is the likelihood of me experiencing anything else? Zero. Zero. So the most important thing that happens that happened for me as a new person is a psychic change of spiritual experience. The second thing that needs to happen is to learn how to practice these principles in all my affairs. Most old timers are trying to teach the new people how to live this thing instead of experiencing it. If you don't experience it, you're not going to be here long enough to live it. It's not a behavioral modification thing. Your behavior will change as a result of this course of action. I am incapable of changing myself. You hear people say, change everything. If I could change everything, I wouldn't need to come here. I've been trying to change everything all my life. <laughs> the only thing I've ever been able to really change is court dates and sobriety dates. <laughs> and locations given the right thing. Right? So there's some questions here. There's three questions in step one. How many people knew that to qualify to what type of alcoholic you were? So during the break, we're going to go for a smoke break. Write down what you think without polling the audience. What's the answer? You need to find out for you, based on what we're talking about here. There's three questions, only three questions in step one. How many people knew that? <laughs> yeah. See the bolts on the tire. <laughs> so there's three questions in step one. During the break, write down what you think those three questions are. Okay, the three questions in step one. What do you got? I got, uh, what's my problem? Why is it happening? And what's the solution? Okay, so when you say, what's my problem? Nobody understands what you're talking about. Anybody understand what he's talking about? So people say that. So you have to wonder. You understand what you mean, but nobody else understands what they mean. Does that kind of make sense? So. My problem. Hmm? So that that would be. So what are the three questions in step one? What would be the three questions? What would be the first question to determine I'm an alcoholic? What happens when you drink? What happens when I drink doesn't determine when I'm, if I'm yeah, an alcoholic. An if I have an allergy, they explain what an allergy is. So when we go to we agnostics, where we at? <laughs> It talks about here, and then we're going to pick up a bit of speed here, not, not the kind you're thinking. 
So we're going to break it down now, okay? So, what was the purpose of the first what, three chapters in the doctor's opinion? What's the purpose of those chapters? The lay out the problem and the solution. Yeah. So each chapter tells you what the previous chapter was for. So if you had a book and you're looking at it, do you have a book? What does the first chapter say? First, first uh, paragraph, and we agnostics. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something about alcoholism. What was the purpose of the preceding chapters? <laughs> to learn something about alcoholism. Holy shit, who knew? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what did Bill mean when he wrote that? So, so, who, 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 who's responsible for him? <laughs> oh, I am. We'll talk after. Okay, so, we hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Have they done that? Yes. Very clear. Right now, you should know what type of alcoholic you are. So, what's the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic? Allergy. Allergy. I said allergy. I write small. If you can't see it, that's what it is, allergy. So what's the second thing that determines whether you're a real alcoholic or not? Obsession. Who said obsession? I did. Okay. Um, where does it say that? It, it doesn't. But we hear that because we like the idea of obsession because we could do something about the obsession. The obsession is in association with what? That I could control and enjoy my drinking. There's got to be a way I could drink with impunity. Have these people done step one who are still obsessing with the idea they can get away with drinking? No. no. So once you do step one, we realize that we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crutch of the problem. And they describe the crutch of the problem as being a malady that centers in his mind. And this is what it looks like, right? Suddenly, a thought crossed my mind. Insidious insanity, blank spot. What was I thinking? I wasn't thinking. As I crossed the threshold to the dining room. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind it would be nice to have a couple highballers before dinner and then go find a methamphetamine dealer. Right? If you look at that story it's pretty well. He leaves the bar. There's only one reason you're leaving the bar back then. Right? They weren't on speed dial. You had to go find them somewhere. Anyways. <laughs> then he found a taxi cab driver that kept him going for a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a good drinker you know you need something to help you if you're going for a couple days. So anyways that's another story. So they talk about the malady that we found out on page 23. So they talk about here, ready? First question. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. What symptom is that? Powerlessness. So, so right away, again, we, we hear the, the generic answers. We all say that, but it doesn't say nothing. Powerlessness. It, the, the meaning behind it isn't presented in that statement. So when they say in, on the board, we admitted we're powerless over alcohol, I don't know what they mean by that. So what I mean is I, I, I kind of go with the assessment of what people are talking about in, in the group meeting, as what they, and whoever makes the most sense is what I go with. But when it comes to the book, malady. right? The what? Malady. The malady. If I cannot quit, the answer is here. Right? If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit, what does quit mean for us? About three weeks, right? Yeah. Come, stop, quit. When you quit something, you quit. <coughs> Not starting again. And when you continue to start again, then you find you cannot quit. Because you have a... Mal uh, Go sit outside. <laughs> no. Malady. Malady. Right? There are the only two questions to determine whether you're alcoholic or not. There are no other questions. The phenomenon of craving developing? Isn't that part of it? Yep. And that's what? Allergy. Allergy. Yeah. So here, yeah. here, Allergy. they branch off different ideas explaining the same thing. It all right. stems from here. What's the first symptom that makes us different than other people is the allergy. They describe this phenomenon of craving, these allergic types, all describing the same thing, right? But the base is when you boil it down to its common denominator, it's the allergy, allergy that makes us different than other people. Who says this? Me or the doctor's opinion? The doctor's opinion. And that's where they say that's what makes them powerless over alcohol, that when they put it in their system, they can't control the amount they drink 90% of the time. 
The second question is, which is the first question here, I don't know if you've noticed that, the is the malady. If I can't stay stopped, now I've got a problem. Remember, they so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse in the drink. Obviously, this is the crutch of the problem. Why does he start again? He really doesn't know why. Once this malady has a real hold, they're baffled a lot. Why are they baffled? Because they keep drinking in spite of their story. In spite of everything they have. Anybody baffled here? Yeah. Right? So, so the first question is the malady. Do I have this thing? Yes or no? Maybe we'll call back in a couple weeks. Go work on your story. We'll be here when you get back. Go drink like a gentleman. Go drink like a gentleman. Yeah, what, what does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> that means I allow her to get dressed first? I don't know. <laughs> what does that mean? I drink, I'll drink like a gentleman. <laughs> by, by all means, you get dressed first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here, if you always know and you find you cannot quit entirely, or when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take. What symptom is that? Allergy. 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 So, can you have the malady without the allergy? No. No. So, say if I, my wife comes home, I have a long day, I'm going to have a couple of glasses of wine. I say to her, I bet you can. She's not going to be obsessed about something, you know. She wants a couple, because it brings about a sense of ease and comfort for her doesn't cause her harm. I do not want pistachios anymore, right? So we see that the only thing that makes me an alcoholic is here. What makes me a real alcoholic beyond the human aid is the malady. So the third question in step one is, ready? If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Wow. What that means is, can I stay sober on my own resources, yes or no? Do I need spiritual help? There's an answer in the book. Can the reader stay sober based on the non-spiritual answer? So they talk about here, when we talk about two alternatives, most of us don't know, I didn't know what that meant, but when they talk about back here on page 25, they're, they're talking about the solution, and it's, it, and it's, it's really, it, it's, the wording is quite interesting. If you're a serious alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle-of-the-road solution. We're in a position where life has become impossible. If we had passed into the region which there was no return through human aid, we had just two alternatives. It's not a choice. It's an alternative. You know the difference between an, a choice and an alternative is? A choice is you walk into a grocery store, I could pick this, this, or this. An alternative means it's predetermined. Remember, I am a result of what step? One, by the time I figure out I have a problem, I'm way over here. It started way over here. I'm a result of step one. Step one's not a result of me, right? So I can't change this fate because I'm along this line. The only thing that's going to save it, me from this fate, is a different alternative. I need a different route. And then as a result of being on this route, I have a different alternative. I'm not on the same path anymore. What that looks like is... When you drive here, you have two routes to get here, right? You can take the lower or the Coquihalla. My GPS is always punched in for the base when I go through with my bike or whatever. I, I take the lower road. It's a nice road. But if it's led to my demise each and every time, I need to find an alternative route if I'm going to be successful. Yes or no? <clears throat> but I have no alternative route because that's the only way. I don't know about the Coquihalla, Right? So I go down this path each and every time because it's driving me. I'm being driven by this thing that's already existed way back then. By the time I realize it, it's too late. I'm the guy after I drink going, why am I doing this? I'm not supposed to be doing this. Anybody like that here? Oh, yeah. This is the story. This is repeated over and over and over. So I need an alternative route. That means as I'm in hope, somebody says, why don't you punch in your GPS to over here? I'm trying to punch in my GPS, and it won't punch in. So they're saying, well, you know what you do? Just take this course of action from 2 to 12. And as you start going along this route, you'll have a different alternative than the route you're on. As a result of this, what that looks like is, so I'm going down. My GPS is saying, turn left, right? The Coquihalla is right, or the other way, whatever. Is it the other way around? Who knows? Okay, the other way around. So left, right. So get the idea. As I start on the Coquihalla, what's my GPS doing? Turn around. Turn around. Recalculating. Yeah. Recalculating. Recal. And that's step one. Because it doesn't know we're on a new route yet. I'm still under the affliction of my illness. 
and I'm still in confliction with me, and they talk about that in the next step. They said, we're now at step three. What do we mean by that and what do we do? They explain the condition that we're in, why we can't trust ourselves or look for our own guidance to fix ourselves because our GPS is broken. But we're saying as a result of these new coordinates in it or reprogramming, you'll have a new GPS. So as I keep going, somewhere along the line, my GPS will now pick the new route. You ever notice that? It won't calculate, but when I get back down toward that area, it'll start going recalculating, recalculating, right? But if I stay away from that coordinates, what is the likelihood that I'll stay off the lower road? Good. Really good. So my GPS is now recalibrated to keep me on this route. Does that kind of make sense? As long as I do, and that's what they're talking, two alternatives. So as I move through the steps, step three, this is a good one. So they say, that here in we agnostics, they say uh, here they say I only have two alternatives, which is steps one and two. Step one means I'm going to lead to my demise. Step two says this is a solution to this problem, right? But knowing that doesn't change nothing. So when we're in we agnostics, they talk about here. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an experience which only a spiritual experience will conquer. There's nothing else that will save you from you except a spiritual experience. And they're saying kind of like cheer up. So they talked about here, to one who feels, um, if that be the case, you may be suffering from a knowledge which only a spiritual experience will conquer. That means there's nothing else. Unless I experience this, what's my fate? What's the promise in step one? 100%. Maybe or 100%. 100%. 100%. So they're saying here, which will conquer. To one who feels atheist or agnostic, such an experience, what ex experience are they talking about? It seems impossible. What experience? Spiritual experience or psychic change. Because I don't know what they're talking about. I'm like Bill at this stage. I have my own preconceived ideas of what I think the solution is. They're saying, hey, let us explain it to you more clearly and more in depth. Get an understanding of what we're talking about. Then you could choose your own conception of what we're talking about. Does that kind of make sense? The difference, in order to choose your own conception, you need to understand what we're talking about first to formulate your own ideas and what we're presenting. I've been in the trades for a long time. I still call it a square head and a star head. And people around me go, Phillips, <laughs> Robinson, hand me the square head. Small, square, or medium, not one, two, and three. I still do that. But I understand what those things are. How I choose my conceptions, that's what I call them, but I know what it is. is that, and that's like the solution. I know what the solution is. How I perceive it is entirely up to me. Remember in Bill's story, he talks about after Abby explains, he says, the czar of the heavens, creative intelligence. What, the wording of the labeling of it was secondary. The most important part, did I believe that I could get access to this power that created the change in his life that could create change in my life? What I want to call it is secondary, but do I understand that it was the course of action that created this change and enabled him to access this power? Lack of power was his dilemma. So they talked about here, wow, this is fun. To one who feels atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems almost impossible, but to continue as he is means disaster. Is that a good thing, disaster? <laughs> Especially if he's the alcohol, alcoholic of the hopeless variety. Now they're again describing one symptom of the hopeless variety. The malady. They're adding more, a lot of words to describe this. Malady of the hopeless variety. What determines a person of the hopeless variety? How many people would like to know if you're of the hopeless variety? How many people try to get sober here more than twice on their own and relapsed? How many people who try to get sober in AA and relapsed? Welcome to the club. <laughs> Give you a warm, fuzzy feeling? <laughs> Beyond human aid. I know I didn't like this either. Okay, so then they talk about here. So, of the, to be doomed to an alcoholic death, what step is that? One. Step one, right? Or to live upon a spiritual base is not always easy. What step is that? Two. Right? Step two. Two is the solution. Right? So they're explaining this in great detail, the problem and the solution. But it isn't so difficult. Then they talk about here from mere code of, of being nicer, walk, working on my triggers, acceptance, surrender. <coughs> All this stuff was sufficient enough to give us an answer to our problem. Then they would have worked a long time ago. We wouldn't have experienced relapse again. We, we find that such codes and philosophies doesn't save us. It doesn't save us. All that fluff and all that working on my behaviors, old ideas... And, it doesn't save us from ourselves. Unless we experience this change, we're doomed. Anybody here become a nicer person and drink again? No. Hmm? 
No. <laughs> you just stay at a prick the whole time. <laughs> no, it's, but you know, the whole idea, we do try to become nicer people. How many people? I guess so I'm going to be nicer. I'm going to work to be a better person. I'm working on my behaviors. I'm watching out for old behaviors, triggers. I become so focused on me. I'm working on me. What are you doing? I'm working on this. I'm working on that. What's our first obsession? Ah, so I love the idea of working on me. Got anything else I could do in regards to me? Because I love me. Can we talk about me? When I'm done with me, what do you think about me? Never mind. I'll fill in the blanks. We love us. When people talk to us, we're thinking what we're going to say before they're even finished talking. We get the but, 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 but. Can I talk about page 62? Where are we? <laughs> I'll teach you if we're talking out of turn. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> no, just joking. So, <laughs> I'll hear about this on the way home. He's going he's gonna to pull me into the room again. You. <laughs> I love Renee. Probably one of the busiest guys I know in AA next to me. Okay. Lead by example, right? So, they start getting into this thing. If you're agnostic or atheist, now you got a problem because you have your own understanding. They said, they said well, let's, let's explain this thing. So, we, need, we know we need to get the spiritual or psychic change, right? Yeah. We know what we want to achieve because we understand what that means. Where do we get what they mean by the understanding of a psychic change or spiritual experience? In the back of the book, yeah, in the back of the book, they explain the spiritual appendix. So I say, this is what it looks like when I'm going there. This is what it looks like when I arrive there. I should be experiencing this. This is the whole idea. Unless I experience this, I'm doomed to an alcoholic death. I better know what it looks like. I better know the difference between a hand grenade and a baseball. Right? I know. I need to know the difference between a life jacket and a sink. Because my life, need to depend, I need to know the difference between a parachute and a backpack. <laughs> you get comfort leaving the plane with a backpack until it comes time to using it. <laughs> There's only three, life, only three parachutes on the plane and four people. You feel so good about yourself as you jump. The other guy said, don't worry, buddy. He took my backpack. Okay. <laughs> so they talk about here, they say, all these things of us trying to change us, a mere code of, and better philosophies, such codes and morals didn't save us. Right? So we talk at great lengths. Anybody been to a topic meeting? Let's talk about how we're fixing us with us. Let's talk about these. Let's talk. How do you feel? Well, if you're crazy, how do you think you're going to feel? You're not going to feel quite right, are you? Most of us don't talk about what's really going on. We talk about what we hope was going on. Because if you really talk about what was going on, you'd be like, I thought about killing myself about ten times on the way here. The idea of coming here and looking at you people for one more time almost makes me sick. But I have nowhere else to go. So, hi, good to see you. Can I share? <laughs> I've never been happier. I'm experiencing serenity, peace, and happiness. I'm at home weaving a rope, and I really don't like anybody I, I meet. And I've thought about, after I'm done killing you, if I live, I'm going to kill you. And once I'm done with you, I've gone over the bridge three times and then I prayed to God that I don't stop and leave my shoes on the edge I said dear God don't run my car into the railing today nobody thinks like that here get to the meeting hello I'm sober I'm happy three o'clock in the morning what do you think about I don't know but it's important <laughs> I gotta figure it out. What are you figuring out? I don't know. But I need to figure it out just in case it happens. Because I need to be prepared. What are you being prepared for? Well, I'm thinking there might be a nuclear war with Trump involved, and I gotta think where am I gonna keep my sleeping bag and my clothes and my supplies? What? Anybody get consumed here with shit's not even happening? Okay, having fun. Lack of power. <laughs> That was our dilemma. Why is it our dilemma? And the way they use it in that term, lack of power. So they said, came to believe that a power could restore us to sanity, right? They're, just, they're talking about an, an, a frequency, an, an energy or something. They haven't defined it as God yet. Have you noticed that? They're saying, let us explain what this solution is. So a lot of different places around the world will explain the, the, the charge or the electricity different. And they have different, but they all do the same thing, right? Some people call it electric, electricity, some people call it power, some people call it hydro, some, but the basis of it is all the same. 
right? You go to any country and you hold up a light, a light with a plug and you go, they'll go, right? It's a universal language. It kind of speaks for itself. And that's what they're trying to say. We're going to explain it in a way that we all understand. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Made a decision to turn our will and life over to the care of God as we understood him, not you understood him. How many people's minds just went, eee! Yeah. Because we get told that. We don't understand the basis. What it says, you could choose your own conception of what that means, but you can't choose what it means. You need to understand what we're talking about as the solution to this problem. If you don't understand what the solution is, then your own conceptions is going to lead you astray. Right? Because remember, your ideas have you sitting where you are. Is it your solution that you're pursuing or is it our solution that you're pursuing? If you want our, if you want what we have and are willing to get in any lengths to get, then you better understand what we're talking about. If you don't understand what we're talking about, then when it came to step one, who explained that to you? Did it say, oh, let us explain to you step one, and then you choose your own conceptions of what that means to you? <laughs> Did it do that? In regards to the solution, the psychic change of spiritual experience and the course of action necessary to bring about this result, did it say you could do it the way you want? When do you choose your own idea of how to do this? Where has it said to come up with your own ideas how to do this yet? Yeah, but we hear that. Okay, we hear. I'll take it from here. <laughs> I, got this. I got this. What are you doing? I'm working on this thing. What are you working? I don't know, but it seems like everybody's working on it. What are you doing? I'm looking for God. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Everybody else seems busy looking for him. And when I find him, it seems like I'll never drink again, so I'm looking for God. Does anybody? So the true believer shouldn't be getting drunk, should he? Because he already has God. So then why does he have the same problem as the atheist and the agnostic? Why are they all having the same problem? What is their problem? What is all three of them experiencing? Isn't that interesting? You ever stop to think about that? Dilemma. <laughs> yeah, lack of powers. They didn't get access to this thing on a personal level to create the change in their psyche. They're all suffering from the same illness, even though their understanding and their religious teachings are different. They use that story in the back. The guy that says, says these spiritual experiences, they talked about over here, if you want to look it up later, with this guy, he talks about on page 27, he says the this, 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 this solution is a, a phenomenon. The guy says, well, I've been a good church member, and he was almost comforted in the idea that he was a church member. Like myself, I was comforted in the idea that I was a church member. At the different times I tried to get sober, I've been I'm involved in the church. I mean, like when it came to this idea, I didn't know what they were talking about. My own understanding was killing me. It was killing me as it was killing Bill. Bill couldn't get past his thinking, but he had to see what his friend was talking about and seeing it was obtainable. It's just a matter of willing to do what he did to get what he's got, to get this power. And they say, lack of power is my dilemma. We had to find a power greater than ourselves, which we could live. And it had to be a power greater, obviously. Longest sentence in the book, obviously. Another obviously. You know, it's like throwing that word around a lot. Hey, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Did you want me to leave now? Obviously. <laughs> okay. But where and how were we to find this power? Most people go, I better go think about that. They go to the room, where am I going to find this thing? Stop, read the book. It tells you. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. His main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. It didn't say find God. Find this power. How we our more religious members define it as a God <coughs> consciousness. But our more religious members and the people who access this power is having the same experience. God don't care what you call them as long as you call them. I don't think, in my opinion, God understands English. He understands willingness. He understands frequency. He understands this thing that happens from inside. Like when you hear a baby cry a certain way, and you, there's a way a baby cries that will get your attention where you'll go investigate, and there's another way where you'll walk by and realize they're okay. You ever notice that? Yeah. Same like a wounded animal. You hear a certain, there's a certain frequency that taps you in there. You ever talk to somebody and you realize they're in pain? And you feel it in here, you're tapped in, in in a certain way that it's kind of, you really can't put your finger, but there's something at work here. 
And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about this power. So they're saying, let us explain it to you from our perspective here. Because they talk in the back of the book, the spiritual appendix. They say, all our members, not some of our members, all have tapped into an inner resource of strength. Inner resource? Inner? What the hell are you talking about? I thought God was out there. See, when it came to this, what, what stopped me from pursuing this was, I didn't know it was stopping me because of my religious teachings. See, I grew up when the charismatic movement was happening in a Roman Catholic church back in Montreal. What that looks like is for a guy like me who has never been really wanted by anybody and reinforced by that over and over by my family and friends and all that other stuff. My mom, every time she got drunk, says, nobody wants you. And look what I've done to maintain you. Nobody wants you. Your grandparent, nobody wants you, but I kept you because I love you. You grew up with that reinforcement. You already know people don't like you, so you don't even get involved. It's about survival technique. And that's the way I grew up, survival. I moved from one group of people to another as a group, as a pack, and we all looked after each other. We never depended on each other, but we looked after each other. When it came down to push and shove, I'd have to leave you behind for my own survival. That's the way I was raised. I, I, had, I didn't have that human connection that they talked about because at eight and a half years old, my mom, she came, I just got, I finished getting shit kicked by three adults. Cracked ribs, black eye, fat lip. And I came to in my bed and I heard my mom and I ran down the stairs and I grabbed her coat. She had a big fur coat with her wig and she, the other people she was with and those three, those two heroin addicts. I said, look what they did to me. My mom pushed me back, says you probably deserved it. I shut off. I remember that moment where I realized I can't depend on nobody but myself. Mm-hmm. And the next person I ever came close to depending on was when I met my dad. I started building that relationship and then again, when it came to the court, I let my guard down and I depended on him and he didn't show up and it cost me three months. That reinforced in me, I cannot trust nobody or nobody or nothing. I'll walk with you, I'll sit with you, I'll have coffee with you, I'll do anything for you, but I can't trust you. I don't know if anybody has that, but I didn't know I had that. So now you're talking about this God thing. Well, now this is a whole different topic because when I was nine, ten I was in a stream gate called the Demons in Toronto and Parkdale. There's three of all the guys. All of us ended up in the same care facilities. But I was in the street gang called the Demons, and what we had was jean jackets, and they were cut off. We had swastikas and peace signs on it. And back then, they'd call, I didn't know that. Peace signs were determined as a broken cross. And the name of our street gang was called the Demons that we had between the junkyard and the slaughter factory in Lansdowne and Dundas. And that was our turf. And then the, the older kids were over there that uh, tried to get home. And it was just like nuts. It was just like the way we lived, right? And if I can get home before the older kids got a hold of me, but in a pack, we'd protect each other. We're all the misfits of all the neighborhood. And so I went to visit my family. They were charismatic. They took a vote. They thought I was demonically possessed. I already know they don't like me. I already know they don't want me there, but I need to be there because my mom's there and I'm on a weekend pass or a week pass from the facility I'm living in. So I go to this place in Timmins and they take well, and they take me to a charismatic meeting. You know, the, they're, they're, they're rocking the place and I'm sitting there with my vest on, my cousin, tough little mother, spit on you. I used to do, the stuff I used to do was just unbelievable. I, I was emotionally not well. <laughs> At a young age, right? And I hear this guy talking. I go, oh, my God, the guy sounds like me. He sounds like he's talking to me. So I go up, and there's all these adults standing there, and I'm a kid. I'm eight and a half years old. When I think about it, I'm standing there, and I'm watching them go down the line, right? And he's doing the – Benny Hill was the guy. Benny Hinn? Everybody's falling forward. I mean backwards. You ever see that? Yeah. I fell forward. Yeah. I don't remember anything that happened. I came to up the hallway, wondering what happened. I came to grabbing this guy's leg. I came to, I stood up as a kid. When you think of eight and a half, I was a big kid, probably eight and a half years old, bewildered what just happened. And I asked this guy, I said, the first thing out of my mouth was, do you have the Ten Commandments? He put me in the back because they didn't know how to deal with me, what was happening. They took me and sat me in a hall somewhere away from everybody. He gave me the Bible and left. Then he came back and says, you better watch it. Because if you don't watch yourself, you're going to be even worse off this time than you were the last time because you'll be even more demonically depressed, the, um, uh, 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 demonically kind of possessed seven more times. 
They used to say it used to multiply. And I thought, oh my God, I couldn't afford seven more of these things. <laughs> but I didn't know that, and it created a fear inside of me. And then I went back home, not home, but I went to my aunts and all that stuff, and they said, and they're all looking at me weird. And we burnt my jacket, and there was a whole thing that happened, and it was a whole religious ceremony and all that stuff. And then they're all looking at me like, uh, and they're silent. They're looking at me. I'm kind of like, what? My aunt goes, did you go uh, look in the mirror? I said, no. I went and looked in the mirror, and it looked like somebody took a pin and stabbed all my pores under my eyes and my neck. It was like all my blood vessels were all broken in my neck and in my eyes. That's a pretty profound spiritual experience. And there was nobody to help me cultivate that, right? And what my, my first experience was with this power was, was I'm going to be worse off anyways. And so they took another vote and figured I didn't do a good enough job the first time. And they re-brought me back to this facility and had a private meeting with me and laying hands on me and all that other stuff. Now I'm thinking, now I know you didn't like me the first time. But when you took a second vote, <laughs> that's the first vote, didn't take. And now, and I have that. Now I come in here, and what I'm realizing, I have to have a spiritual experience. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute, because now I know I'm way worse than I used to be. I am, I am on a state, a level beyond comprehension. I have to have this thing. I don't know. I've talked myself out of it before I even started because I'm not understanding what they're talking about. Can you see how that would work? And we all have that kind of idea. So as I started went through this, said lack of power is our dilemma. And they started to explain that thing. And as they went through here, they started talking to the believer, the true believer, and, and the, the agnostic. And they talked about, you know, do I understand this power that happens from within? And so when you kind of go to, when you break it down to say the basis of this thing is being willing to be, be willing that there is a power greater than ourselves. Nothing more is required to make our beginning to build this wonderful uh, spiritual structure. And it happens from within. So I know I needed to get this power to have this experience, but where and how was I to start this experience? I know where I need to go. I know what I need to get there, but where am I starting from? Nobody ever explained that to me. So nobody ever explained that step two, where this thing starts from, because we know what it looks like when I get there, when I start, when I end up in Cuba as a result of these results or, or, or talking to these travel agents. I know where I'm going. I know how to get there, but where am I starting from? It's very important that every time a GPS works correctly, it needs to know one thing. Where your starting point is. You can punch in where you're going. It can give you... But unless you know where you're starting from, you have no route to get there. Most of us don't have no route to get there. We're trying to get to a location that we don't know where we're starting from. Because this is not explained correctly. Well, for me anyway. So if you go to page 54 and 55... They talk about stuff in here that's really mind-blowing, right? They talk about it at the simplest form, right? So what they're saying is, they get into this, and a lot of people take this, and they kind of go on 53. They say, God either is or isn't. What's our decision to be? But they don't finish reading the conversation. They're saying, arrived at this point, we're going to have a problem. They said, well, relax. Let us explain it to you again. It's not a black and white decision. Well, some of us take that idea and say, well, you need to make a decision. God either is or isn't. Well, wait a minute. That's not what it's saying. It says, arrived at this point, we may have a problem. Let's explain it a little better in a way that might be more comprehensible, like more understandable. So they go through this thing, and then on the next page, on 54, they talk about this entity that has been driving us. We have been being governed by our power, our own power, our own understanding, our own belief system, and it's not been working. Lack of power is our dilemma. And they talk about, are we not a sum result of everything we've thought about or felt about? Did not these feelings drive us or determine the existence of our, right, determine our existence? Did not my belief system have me right where I am? Everything I believe took action on and, and been driven by, am I not a sum result of all my belief systems? And my own power and govern, like my own power. Am I not? So when I see, hey, I've been governed by something all along. And it's been leading to my demise. And so they start saying, here, let's look at this differently. Like a feeling for a friend. They said this power originates from within. But let's get you an idea of what it looks like. Because you've always had it. 
but you may have been unaware of it. We're going to explain it in a way where it's ta- palatable and tangible for you. They say, so when they talk about here in 55, they talk about actually we're fooling ourselves for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. May be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or another it was there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and a miraculous demonstration of that power in the human lives is fact as old as man himself. So when my sponsor took me through this, he brought me back to page 54. And he said, these governing feelings and ideas, aren't you a sum result of all those things? And I said, yeah. He says, this God thing has always been with you. I said, well, how? He says, remember that time when when you were ODing and you called out to God and and something shifted? Remember that time when you were lying there and and it's kind of like something told you to roll over? Don't fall asleep on your back. Remember that time where you're kind of, you're at your darkest hour and you cried out to God and somebody showed up. You remember that time? So he asked me to go back over my life and mark down these times that explanations are far beyond anything I could tie to it. The time I was nearly killed when I was a kid, but something was governing me. The time I had that experience with that religious thing, and something was governing Those feelings inside that wanted better for me than I was experiencing. Every time those 11 years, I'd have those moments of something inside saying there's something different. The time I was driving... It, it, it was kind of funny, and I said, God works in strange ways. I'm on bail, and I'm on, I'm on observation, and, and uh, it was kind of like I was looking at some pretty heavy stuff. And I'm coming off the Gardner Expressway, and, and, I, and I had a 26er between my legs. I'm smoking a coker, and I have something in the trunk. I have something under the thing. I have methamphetamine. I have mushrooms. I'm a walking pharmaceutical store. Like, when I go, I go, I have fun. Like I go, like I don't know where I end up. I don't know where I come to. I end up in situations like, like not even I know I was there. I wake up in a lot of situations of people explaining me stuff, and I'm going, "Hey, I just got here myself, man." <laughs> like, you know. So I, I don't know where I was. I was kind of, I guess I was on a couple day run. I'm coming off the Gardner Expressway. I'm, po- I'm smoking this coker, and I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of just trying to get my head straight so I could see because the lines are going blurred. And there's a road check. I put the joint in the ashtray and I said, God, if you get me out of this, fast. Get me out of there. I'll cut my hair. I'll go back to the Baptist church. I'll go to a choir. I mean, that's it. I'll, I will stop everything. Any negotiators here? <laughs> I sat up in that seat and I know what I'm doing. I'm on bail. I mean, there's enough stuff there that, like, I'm hooked. I, I've been on a three-day drunk. Like, I'm, I'm done. And what was in the car, like, I'm done. I'm already looking at penitentiary time. What was in there was enough to have me done. And what the funny part was, if you went to the back of my car, it would be easy, does it, live and let live, but for the grace of God. <laughs> On the back of my car, right? The guy waved me through. Oh, wow. I picked up the joint and said, God, that was close. <laughs> That's my idea of spirituality. But I realized something was working beyond my life, these inches and moments of, of things that could went seriously wrong. And I realized there was always something governing me, right? And then they tell me this thing is within me and it's always been there. And that's the starting point is deep down within, right? And it's blocked by all these things. And I don't know what these things are because I've only been able to tap into this thing every once in a while, that thing that gave me comfort in the darkness, those things at my lowest point in time where I was able, it kind of was, a, was a, a flashlight in the darkness. When I talked about all those times of my, I used to be able to shut off and go to this place and I realized this place was always there to try well, want wanted better for me than I was experiencing. You know, I was just saying last night, I was saying beatings I used to incur from my stepfather. He was just out of the Second World War. He was a, a, a Nazi German soldier. He worked under the SS. When he used to get drunk, he used to talk about the killings in, in, in the barns of shooting women and children and all that shit. And he would sit there. And I was terrified of this man. He was an atheist. And when I was a kid, he sat me on, I remember, I still remember that moment because it, it was traumatizing. He sat me out on the porch in Toronto. It was an electrical storm. I was probably four, six years old. I was wearing, I remember this, everything. And I was sitting there and I was looking at this man for guidance. And the electrical storm was lightning and it was hot. And it was like, the, 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 it was like I was scared terrified and he said to me he says you know what that is he says god's mad at you he said that's why that's happening and i just barely never thought but then i remember what i did after that. i went under my bed and i was begging god not to be mad at me anymore right that was my idea of god 
my idea was God to have to have another exorcism. My idea, God was I was beyond reproach. I was beyond help. I was beyond anything that you guys had to offer. Now you're saying this stuff's available to me? Not to me. Yeah. You don't know me. You don't know where I come from. You don't know my life. You don't know my parents. You don't know what I've done. I'm beyond anything you guys got to approach. What works for you won't work for me because I always got I got confirmation that I'm demonically possessed. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Nobody wants anything to do with me. What are you going to do for me? you lying, motherfuckers. Excuse me. <laughs> but, but that was in my head. And I'm sitting there smiling, eh? I know you're lying. Because everybody's ever lied to me. And nobody's been ever honest to me. And never, now you're telling me you're going to help me? Right? So when I got to this place, the guys who I looked at, for the first time I felt comfortable enough that I could depend on what they were saying through their example. I knew that their lives depend on carrying this message to me. And that they were there to help me without me realizing it. And I started on this thing that realized this thing has always been with me. And I said, okay, God. I said, I don't know who you are or what you are, but I'm ready, man. You show me. You show me this thing that they say everything's available here. You said you were willing to look after me and help me with this thing. Hook me up. That's the way I talked to God or the power back then. I said, come on, bring it on. Let's see what you got. I don't know if you, normal people talk to God that way. Well, I was talking to God that way. What I had to lose. Everything was already gone. I'm picking green biome, cut my own hair. They want me to go for a assess- uh, psych assessment. I'm unemployable. Nobody wants anything to do with me. I got federal and provincial charges. My life's over. I'm not going to live that much longer. I already buried my brother. Buried my brother at 32. Like I was, I wasn't at that time, but I mean, like I, my life was over. So what did I have? Let's okay, show me. Let, let's rock this thing, right? So I, I started from that point that this thing was within me. And when I look back, I realized there was always something governing me inside. Each and every one of us has this beacon, this life force, this thing inside of us that wants us to move on. Like, we're a weird bunch of people. You ever hear people, I didn't have the balls to kill myself. You're not supposed to. (laughs) We're the only group of people. Sorry to hear that. Oh, jeez. Like, like what? (laughs) My wife heard us talking like that once. She goes, what do you mean? She says, you're not supposed to have that to kill yourself. Like the body, like her purpose is to live. Like, like it will shut organs down so we live. There's everything, there's nothing natural about killing yourself. There's nothing. And we think, oh, I didn't have the jam to do it. You're not supposed to. <laughs> you ever have that? When I stood on that balcony at 15 and I was going to jump something inside, approached me without me realizing that it created a shift in my thinking where I didn't do it. And it was in the form of a resentment. It may sound kind of weird, but it approached me in such a way where I stepped back from that balcony because I didn't want to prove all those people wrong. I mean, right. So I had a starting point, and I realized this thing has always been there. I said, okay, I'm ready to start. I'm ready to start this thing. So now when we come back, we're going to look at three, four, and five, right? And then uh, we'll get dinner, and then after dinner, we're going to do six and seven, eight and nine, and tomorrow we're going to do ten and eleven. But you think if you had problems with some of the things we've been talking about, wait till you see when I talk about the fourth now and six and seven. It's good. So do a lot of meditation, have a couple <laughs> cigarettes, <laughs> read that prayer, have an open mind, because I'm going to talk in a way that probably a lot of you haven't heard it, and you'll be able to argue about it for weeks after I'm gone. And in about 10 years from now, you go, oh, I see what he's talking about now. But anyways, let's break. Personal to me with this power, right? Based on... The experience of those that went before me in the roadmap that was being presented to me as the access code to this thing. It's not my program, it's their program, right? Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, what's our lack, what's our problem? Lack of power. So as we feel new power flow, and they're saying, as I get access to this power, what happens after that is, as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoy peace of mind. So what came first, the peace of mind or access to the power? Access to the power. Access to the power. Where am, how am I to find this power that's going to give me relief for me to create this change necessary to save me from myself? Right. Yeah, but that's what this book is about. It tells me it's inside, but it tells me this is the roadmap, this is the GPS to get there where I can make it personal to me based on their experience. Remember that commercial, tried, tested, and true? Yeah. That's the, it's like a GM commercial. God. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, as, we felt, as we enjoyed peace, as we discovered we could face life successfully, wouldn't that be a nice thing, eh? Not crippled by ourselves and our own thinking and emotional deformities. How many people would like that? 
Hey, how many people are your biggest problems when you're alone? Anybody ever notice that? There's nothing happening but you. And the Stephen King movie has started. And you're sitting in the front row of your mind going, whoa. <laughs> and there's nothing happening. And somebody says, hey, you're creating your problem. You say, no, no, I need to see the ending of this movie. <laughs> Anyways, you'll find that funny on the way home too. Okay. As we discovered we could face life success, as we became conscious of his presence, so that's saying it moves from here into this location of where this thing lies that makes us human, deep down within. As we became conscious of this thing that lies within, we move past our thinking. We're no longer our thinking, which is huge for a lot of us. Well, we can't change that. Yeah, what you do is you bypass it. Right? You're not changing it. You're no longer involved with it. Yeah, you're conscious. You're, you're, you're part of a different story. It's like you have two TVs. You got one over here is broken. It stays on and channel doesn't work right. And then you have another one that over here works right. Instead of being over here trying to fix something you can't fix, you get more concentrated on this one you can enjoy. The TV's still there. He goes, Psst, you want to come work on me today? You go, yeah, I'm kind of enjoying my day. It'd be nice to really have a really shitty old look on me. Let me go over and try to fix me with me. I'd like to do some more one-ply. <laughs> like my buddy says, I don't care how good the soap smells. Never leave the washroom smelling your hands. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> my recovery is good. Okay, so here we were reborn. We're stuff, and I didn't like that I, because it smacked of old ideas. But I worked through most of that, and we agnostics, where I had the idea that I'm pursuing their solution to have their experience. And the access to this thing is called power. And once I work through, we now I'm okay with God, creative intelligence. I call it a frequency. It all means the same thing to me. What that means to me is I have one of those old radio stations that don't work right. Right? And, I'm, and, and, and you ever listen to one of those old radios? They sound good. You get a little music. It sounds fantastic. And then it starts being out of tune. It gets so irritable that you have to shut it off. But you can't shut it off because that's your mind. Right here they're saying you're tapped into the same frequency, the same energy, but you're reallocating it over here to a better frequency. And when you tune it into a better frequency, you're going to enjoy the trip a lot more. And you won't be so concentrated on the radio. Everything you need is in the radio already. But the power and the frequency, you need to tune it in better. Does that kind of make sense? And when you tune it in better, you get tapped into the main tower that you connect with that frequency or that power. And when you get tapped into that, you get to enjoy the benefits of having a radio or tuned into this frequency. And that's what they're kind of talking about here. A lot of people think this is the step three promises. It is not the step three promises. It is the promises as a result of doing the course of action. They're the result of having done the work and going back. If I was able to experience this in step three, why would I need to do the rest of the work? We're all about not doing the work and having the experience. Anybody like that here? Can I, have, can I try a bit and if I like it, I'll be back tomorrow for the rest of it? No. It doesn't work like that. What it works like is if you see what we have and you'd like to experience it, you need to do what we do because it doesn't really make sense. That way it talks about unless you have this experience, you'll never make sense, right? So they talk about here's the question with step three and the archway. Let's go here. Ready? They talk about we were now at step three. Many of us said to our makers, we understood, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, thy victory over them, and bear witness to those that help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always, without will, before taking a step, making sure we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. So, i just done step three. Am I capable of experiencing everything in step three that they're talking about there? Yes? Nobody getting involved? Are you capable? Yeah. Are you capable? Am I, by doing this prayer, by doing step three, am I capable of experiencing everything that they're talking about here in this prayer? Absolutely. At this stage of the game? I would say not at that stage. No, so that's what we're kind of saying, right? So we're getting, what this is, is a summary of the whole course of action. 
Right? This is a summary that is completed when we get the step 12 confirmed step 3. Right? If I was able to achieve step 3 and step 3, then I wouldn't need to do the rest of the steps. If I was capable of turning my will and over the direction and care of God and have that experience in step 3, why would I need to do the rest of the steps? If I was able to live under the care and direction of a loving God and be governed by this power, why would I need to do the rest of the steps? So a lot of people misunderstand step three. Step three changes once you do the principles, but you need to have the spiritual experience in order to have the complete understanding of step three. Right now is the decision. So what the decision is, in order to have this new experience, I'm making a decision to do what? Yeah, which is the rest of the work. What's my will in my life? I don't know. My thinking and my actions. Well, that was heavy. Right? What's the bondage of self? Self seeking. I don't know. Really, we don't know. Really. <laughs> I don't know what they are. I have a, the odd glance of it, but mostly I don't really know what. Because if I really knew, I wouldn't even do the rest of the work, right? Yeah. So, step three is an idea that if I pursue the rest of the steps, I can bring that about. What makes you say that? Well, this says that on the next page. It says here, the wording is quite optional. I mean, page six. The wording is quite optional so long as we express the idea. Hey, you know what? I don't know who or what you are, but I'm open to it. I know you're there. I'm open to a new experience. All my religious teaching, all my background is killing me. I need a new experience. I'm open. That's how I talked. That's how I did step three. Hey, I did it their way, but my heart to heart with God was, hey, hook me up, man. Show me what you got. Right? Because I, I was in bad shape when I got so I, And then they talk about the wording is quite off. So long as I expressed the idea, that idea was the willingness that this change could happen. I had the radio on. The radio is on, and now I need to find the station. And they talk about here, next we lunged out on a vigorous course of action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning. What confirms, how do I know when I've done step three? When you've got no fear about step four. Well, you're going to have fear. That doesn't, it's just, you're going to have fear. But you were close. When I start, when I start step four. <clears throat> that confirms step three. Where did I get step three from? From one and two. Here's a problem. Here's a solution. What do I want? What alternative do I want? Do I want spiritual help? Or do I want to go on to the bitter end? Spiritual help. Yeah. So knowing that makes you feel better, right? It's like she says, hey, yeah, I'll go out with a date with you. You're thinking what the end of the night looks like. You haven't picked her up yet. Still a one-sided relationship, right? You don't have the experience that those that went before you have. So now, those that went before you said they've experienced something about this power. So I need to get this experience where power becomes personal to me that I could access. So I could, in those moments, I could save me from me in 11. So I prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact. Well, I need to make a conscious contact in order to improve something. Don't I? I need to have a relationship in order to improve on it. Improve on it. Like the, the moments that you had that you were saved already, like the moments you were, the moments that See, you were talking about. Yeah, so those moments I didn't know how to develop and, and maintain because I had all the blocks. So when those things came, I had this... It was a profound back. experience. And I could sit here for the next three weeks talking about experiences that I had beyond comprehension. But what happens is they talk about the things with inside of me would block me off from the resentments, the fears, the harms, my, my, my instinctual base of going through life. Because I learned at a young age, I cannot depend on this thing inside. This thing inside is going to kill me. There's no way I'm going to survive in this world. And the people I lived with trusting this thing because this thing if I allow it to come to the server is going to eat me alive and how that came to about was may kind of sound weird but it kind of and it reinforced this by, by my efforts to live on it because I had nobody to explain things to me because I didn't trust nobody I didn't let nobody close enough to be intimate with right and on that basis of saying here you know what I'm going to trust you with my life I, I, I don't know how to do that I never did never I learned that if I can't trust my own parents and they left me out to hang then there's nobody I can trust. I don't know, that's pretty deep stuff, and I didn't even know that was there. Like, that, that happened years later. So what that looks like for me is one time I was getting sober, we were talking about these emotional things, 
I got a job and I'm doing great. I bought a new leather jacket and I'm feeling good about it. Like I'm different from the street. I'm different. I'm not moving the product. I'm not hooked up with the people anymore. I'm trying to really recreate my life and and I'm hooked up with a girl and all that stuff. Everything's going really well. And I was on the, on uh, on, um, on Dixie Road and it's it's eight lanes of highway, right? Four lanes going this way, four lanes going that way. And I'm sitting there and there's an injured seagull on the road. I don't know what compelled me. But I wanted the bus driver to stop, right? I got him to stop, and I ran out onto the road, and I threw my jacket on this seagull, and I comforted in the seagull and all that other stuff, and all I thought was the well-being of this, this bird. It may sound crazy, but I was consumed with the compassion I had for this bird. And I didn't care what anybody thought, of, and I kind of came alive inside when that was happening. And so I phoned the SPCA. Because it was Friday night, and I was going to go to the sober dance downtown. I was going to meet some girl. I want to go home, get ready and all this, but I got this bird. It's shitting in my leather jacket, mm -hmm. but I don't care. Because the feeling I had from saving this thing was pretty wild. It was almost like maybe <coughs> saving myself. Who knows, right? So I took the time to do that. So the guy says, it will be half an hour before we show up. So two police showed up, asked me what I was doing with the bird. Two big guys. I already have a problem with these kind of people. <laughs> and then I realized how I kind of looked hanging onto this seagull with it sticking out of my leather jacket. <laughs> and for a moment, I kind of seen what I looked like holding this. I became aware of my surroundings, right? And my vulnerability in that moment that I placed myself in. And he says, I said, well, the SPC is coming. He says, why don't you just ring its neck? Now I felt embarrassed for my... That moment I had of showing compassion, I felt embarrassed because it's been a long time since I allowed myself to do that, right? Because of an environment where I come from, all that. Long story. I, look, I said, why don't you do it? And I shut off again. I had a moment, and it shut off again. And so what, how, how that looks like is that I ended up going back drinking shortly afterwards, and I'm, I'm sitting down by Lake Ontario, and there's a seagull in the water with a broken oh, his wing. He's stuck in the stuff. My buddy goes, oh, the poor bird. And I said, yeah, you know how you deal with this? I walked in, I grabbed it by the neck, and I just snapped it like that, and I threw it in the garbage. I said, that's how you deal with that shit. That's pretty way out of whack than what was actually happening in here. It was never safe to be here. And so when you talk about this stuff, when you talk about all this stuff, why wasn't I able to maintain that stuff? Because it wasn't the, the, the lack of power to st keep access to it. Because my instincts, what I didn't know, were overriding me. In something internally was saying, watch yourself. Don't move fast. Where I grew up, it was kind of don't move fast. Don't ask too many questions. Be talked when you're talking to I don't know if anybody grew up like that, but the people I grew up with don't make any sudden moves if you come and drink in the bar we're drinking. It. And if you see your friend running, you just start running. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, what's going on? Nothing. Just wait for the bus. <laughs> okay, okay. Just being cool. <laughs> Nuts. Okay. So they talk about here, we had to get down to cause and conditions. Right? Our liquor was but a symptom. And then they talk about here on page 64, what's really cool is, is I need to learn this new mechanism of being able to assess my situation. I need a new way of looking at my life other than the way I'm looking at it. I need to learn how to take inventory, like a commercial inventory or, or a business inventory. They have a way of taking stock to see they're successful and the things or the products that they're using or not using are causing the problem. They have a way of seeing the things that are causing their demise or their downfall. They can't fool themselves about value. They have a way of standing back and taking stock in what they have and seeing if it's valuable or not, or I need to get rid of this if I'm going to be successful. They're saying they're going to teach me this recipe that I could use against my own life, that I could build it instead of work toward my demise. I'm going to see the flaws within myself that's causing me my problems. That's pretty cool when you kind of look. I didn't think it was cool at the time, but it became really cool. So they talk about here's the first time where they kind of mention what my real problem is. And this is the first time they kind of go, hey, you know what? You thought all that other stuff was your problem, but we were trying to tell you in a nice way that's just a symptom. That's a symptom to an underlying problem. And what we have is the only way to fix this other problem is through this aid here is the spiritual tools. And they talk about here, when the spiritual malady is, they talk about from it, I said, resentment is the number one offender, destroys more alcoholics than anything. From it stems all forms of spiritual disease. For we have been not only mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady 
It was overcome. We straightened out mentally and physically in dealing with resentment. We said on my paper. So we see when I straight get the spiritual straightened out, then I straighten out mentally. And then I straighten out physically, emotionally. Me, I'm always trying to straighten out emotionally, then mentally, then spiritually. I start from the outside and work in. Anybody like that? I'll get this, I'll get that, I'll make feeling blah, blah, blah. Here they're saying, no, we're going to start from the inside out, which is another different concept. We're going to rearrange you from the inside out. All these things that are governing you, making your decisions, eating your lunch, creating you to do the things that you're doing, having you separated from life, all these talks and all these ideas that have you disconnected with everything and everybody. But yet there was something else inside of me that wanted different than I was experiencing and I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to become the person I wanted because lack of power was my dilemma. What I learned in the church was a lot of times what people try to do is present something they're not. And what happens is their internal battle cripples them from, it's called spiritual warfare, which is a whole different thing here. Right, so what happens is you try to go forward into life, but you're not spiritually or equipped strong enough to handle the daily battles of what's happening. And what happens is those battles consume you instead of you consuming those battles because we're spiritually unequipped to deal with life. And when I, talk, when I think about that, I think about the energy. Most of my energy is dark and turns on me. Most of my energy is it comes from a real dark place. So when I used to have visions, when they talk about the spiritual thing here, was a, like a tower, but the tower went into the ground. And as I started going into the depths of my soul and of my life, and as I started, it started getting darker and darker as I walked down those staircases, and it was kind of looking into the soul of my life. And there was these dungeons, and they're all dark, and they're all locked. And there was all that black soot coming off the walls with the water running down. And the farther I went into the dungeon, the darker it got, and the, the smaller the pastors got. In every room I went into, there was people screaming. It was from my past and moments and situations that were unbearable. So I'd lock the door, and I'd always try to go into those places alone on a non-spiritual basis, and they would cripple me. They would cripple me emotionally, and I wouldn't be able to survive it. So those, all those 11 years in and out, one guy says, write your life story. By the time I started writing my life story, I went in unequipped. I, I didn't go in spiritually prepared for what was about to happen to me. And I'd unlock these things inside. And I couldn't close the doors once the animals got out, once the demon, or whatever you want to call it, once these things got out inside of my, my past and my existence, I couldn't close the door again. And I was all consuming with the bondages of self. I don't know if anybody has that problem here. But when I show up, it's not pretty. When the ghost of my Christmas past show up and starts eating my lunch, I can't close the door and that bit of morass and self-pity and all that other stuff. So here they're saying we're going to approach this on a different basis. We're going to approach this on a spiritual approach. For the first time, you're going to start getting your experience with these spiritual ideas. And what we're going to do is use the third step prayer as we start looking at your resentments. And as you go make a list of these resentments of people, places, and things, whatever come to mind, as you get attachment to it, you're going to apply that prayer. And as you apply the prayer, you start getting relief from these things that used to eat your lunch. You say, hey, there's something here. I start having my experience with this power that these other people talked about that was available to me. And I start having an experience from the third step on. I start to see that, hey, if I'm willing to do this thing, even though it doesn't make sense, I could have what they're talking about. I start getting relief from self. And so the whole exercise in the fourth step in regards is broken up into three areas is the first part is learning how to master resentment. I never knew how to master resentment. Through the recipe, I was able to master resentment and create a shift in my mind through application of prayer and seeking power. From within, I was able to regroup with inside of myself by applying these prayers. And as I went along, I started seeing I got relief from it. And it was pretty remarkable, right? And then it showed me how to deal with myself, which mastering resentment. Then it showed me how to deal with the people I was resentful at, which was really remarkable because I had some deep-seated resentment, deep, that was eating my lunch from me. And I learned how to look at them differently. And I had to learn to look at them the same way I looked at myself, that they were spiritually sick too. And the things that I did to people wasn't personal. It was just that I was spiritually ill. So when I seen my own deficiencies and my own inability to treat and do <coughs> right to the, by people, I was able to look at the people that did wrong to me and look at them differently. And so when they crop up within my mind, I was able to create a shift in how I look at it through prayer and the application of these things. I was able to get a freedom. So as I started doing this, for the first time in my life, I became an observer of my thinking instead of a participant, which is really cool. 
because before I was always a participant. It was all consuming and all powerful. Here, I started stepping back from it, and I was able to look at my thinking and said, this isn't working. I don't like the way it makes me feel. I started getting separation from the emotion or the attachment that these things had on me and the bondage and difficulties. And I was able to have the surround sound and turn down the sound. And I was able to look it on the screen and say, I just don't want this as part of my story anymore. I don't want this eating my lunch. I need to be free of this. And as I applied those prayers, I got more and more separation from it. And then it got to a place where I was able to look at it and go, yeah, this ain't working anymore. Right, and and the other stuff is talks about when they came to mind. I was able to regroup and learn. So I learned the third step prayer for me. I learned the prayer on page sixty seven for them. The resentment prayers for them. There's a prayer for me. There's a third step prayer. The prayer on page sixty seven is for people, places, and things around me. Then they get into fear, and this is pretty wild because this reiterates that I'm starting my relationship with this power, and I'm, it's becoming personal to me. If I'm following this thing, I'm starting to get access to this power. I see the benefit of doing it. I see that this is pretty cool. It's like when I had a drink, nobody needed to explain the necessary of taking another drink here. Did anybody need to explain to you a drink after you took it? I got it from here. Uh -huh. Once you have that experience, and that's the same with the fourth, in, especially with the fear part. And we'll get into that shortly here, and I'm going to rock and roll, and we'll get into six and seven. And eight, nine tonight, right? And we're going to look back on these things and the application. It's going to be really cool because we're going to pick up speed. Most of this stuff really had to get the basis of why I need to pursue this. Because if I don't pursue it, what's my fate? Yeah. yeah. So I see that what I'm making here is a conscious decision to align myself with this power. I'm not surrendering. Like, this is my thing. I'm not surrendering to it. It's not punishing me. Right? It's like the Second World War. What happened, the states didn't want to get involved, but addiction was running rampant. Right? The, the Germans were, were just creating havoc, and they didn't want to get involved. And they seen what addiction was doing to, like if you look at it that way. But of themselves, they were powerless to do anything about it. And then they got, bombard, they got bombed, and they had to get involved. But they realized they couldn't beat this thing on its own. When they assessed it in step one, they realized to pursue it would lead to their own demise. And the only way to do it was to join alliances with something greater than them, right? In order to overcome this thing that was all-consuming and all-powerful. And the only way to beat it, so they joined alliances with it. They created an alliance to overcome the problem. So in step one, I see this problem is killing me and I can't do nothing about it. But there's an alliance. If I'm willing to join an alliance with this power, they'll work toward my betterment, that I'll overcome this illness. It'll correct in me this thing that's... Does that, does that kind of make sense? That's why it says we thought well before taking a step. What I'm doing, I signed up. I'm enlisted. I'm not drafted. I enlist. Right? I see the benefit of joining this force. I see the of creating a relationship. It's not a it's not a shotgun marriage. I see my life is way better with this power than without it. I see my life is way better with the idea of having what these people have that went before me. And saying, would I want? Of course I would. It was only a matter of being willing. So when you have that kind of relationship, it's based on want. It's pretty wild when you think about that, right? What would you rather be in a relationship? With somebody you want to be in a relationship or someone you have to be? Someone you want to be. Want to be. You, would you rather marry someone you have to or someone you want to? Want, want. And that's kind of like this. So how you start this relationship will determine what it looks like. So steps one and two and three is like the dating Nothing really happens that could change at any moment. Anybody? Right. Step four, it's a little more serious. So four, five, six, and seven is the engagement. Eight, nine, ten, eleven is the marriage. Right? So we're just getting into, this is more serious here. I need to keep moving on this relationship, but I need to have this experience that they talk about as a power. So you guys probably want to smoke before the, than what I'm experiencing. Has got it. How many people has had that voice? Yeah. Where does that come from? <clears throat> you ever have something go to you? Part of you go to you. What's the matter with you? Yeah. You ever wonder who's asking that question? Yeah. <laughs> and then you're talking. What's the matter? I don't know. <laughs> you're having a conversation with you about you on a matter you know nothing of. It's kind of weird, isn't it? That this thing. What is this thing questioning you about? You're even surprised on it's. 
when you're <coughs> questioning you about the things you're doing, that's got to be pretty bad. When, when you're asking you, what's the matter with you? Like you're talking to yourself in a different person. You ever look in the mirror? What the hell? <laughs> and you're having a conversation. You ever wonder who's that person that's having a conversation? So, what's, this, what's our lack of power? What's this light's dilemma? Lack of power. What means to get this, this lamp working correctly if we're in the dark and we need guidance to navigate through this place? Power, right? And it has to be a specific power to make that work, right? Can you do me a favor? Take that light and plug it into the window for me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Plug it into the chair. Plug it into the desk. Plug it into the rock. Plug it into the doorknob. Because you understand what makes that work, that stuff sounds ludicrous, right? But if you didn't know, you would, if you were in another country and you never experienced that, you'd take the lamp, walk over to the window, and be trying to plug it in somewhere, and everybody would laugh at you. You ever been on a job where say, hey, you want to go get me a bucket of steam? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah? Green yeah. Pipe stretcher. Yeah. Pipe stretcher. A, a sky hook. Yeah. And you're like, yes, I'm boss. <laughs> you want to be a keener because you don't know what they're talking about, right? So here they're being very specific. So when I went, if we came in and said, hey, can you do me a favor, plug that in? Where would you plug that lamp in? You plug it into the outlet. Right, and you'd see if there was a connection there, and if the connection wasn't working, you'd check the bulb. Right, you'd go through a sequence of events to make sure there was power allocated to this source for, for what it was intended to. And that's like us. We're intended to live by a certain life force. Right, you ever, and that's what they were talking on 54, 55 that we miss, and they're trying to say, You've experienced it. So, could you imagine you ever walk into a room and it's a kid's party and everybody's feeling really good? You ever feel the, wow, or you see somebody you haven't seen in a long time, you love them, you ever feel that energy and all that? You ever go through pictures and you look at it and it brings up that emotion, that feeling, and it kind of something down within, but then you turn it over and there's a picture that brings up a lot of pain, agony. It's just an <clears throat> event. Where does that happen? Do you grab your head when that happens? Or do you kind of something in here shifts? What the hell is happening in here that creates a shift within inside of me that gets my attention? <clears throat> Power, energy, my life force, right? It's something that's something that, that happens beyond our comprehension, but we need it. We need that time. We need that, that connection. We need that life force because without it, it leads to our own demise. We create loneliness because we miss that connection. When we get that connection, regardless how it is, how many people were really thrilled on the idea when you came to AIM, people were happy to see you? Nope. Really? I was really happy. I was stoked, man. Somebody was happy to see you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. good to see you, man. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You'd go, really? Yeah. But you came back to the meeting to see if they meant it, right? What keeps you coming back? Because there's something that happens here that kind of connects us yeah. beyond our capability. One of the greatest acts that I have in the fellowship of AA, and this may sound really weird, and this has to do with that power, and it connected inside of me, which beyond my comprehension, at the time, but having looked back on it, you know, and the promises will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. I look back on these moments, having experienced what I experienced, and all the freedom that I have, and I look back at these moments that were pivoting, like life changing in, in, in my life without realizing it. When I went to that Queensway Saturday night group and I was in, in a uh, psychosis, right? There was people calling my name, my things, things crawling along the ground, and I, was, and I walked by this meeting and said, AA meeting. I went down into the meeting to go hide from these things that were following me because I was walking across the bridges going, Tony, Tony. And people were hiding behind the tree. I don't know if you've ever been there. You're not having fun anymore. This is a little too much of what I was hoping for, right? So I went into the meeting and, I, and Harry was at the door. He says, good to see you. And he meant it. He, and he looked at He wanted me to look at him. He was a small little guy like this. And he, and he meant it. I said to him, I said, if they're following me, don't tell them I'm over here. And I went stood against the door. And I got, I'm leather, biker boots, hair, like I'm like, but I don't know him. That's because there's serious stuff going on here. Harry came up to me after, and, and the guy was an atheist. He was like, he had a lot of problems, but what he did show, was show me compassion that nobody else was showing me, and that disturbed me. And he got right in my space. 
he got like right here. Nobody was getting in my space. And it was just a little guy like this. He says, good to see you. And they're looking at, and I'm like, Rrr. and he's like, Hi, good puppy. <laughs> right? and like he, he's not intimidated at all because he's seen me as a wounded animal because he experienced that through the stuff he went through because he was ostracized and dismissed from life and nobody wanted nothing to do with him because Harry was a barber who was married and he realized that he, his sexuality wasn't oriented to, to what he was living and he came out of the closet and was living a different life. And back then he was ostracized and dismissed by everybody who was an alcoholic dying of alcoholism, came to AA and he found comfort here. Even though he was an atheist and hooked on Valium, he found acceptance here. He found companionship here. He ended up getting killed by somebody in A, but I mean, the whole idea was that, that's how far we go in A is, is dependent on us. So, what happens is there's this guy in a meeting, and I'm listening. It's very careful what we got to be very careful what we say because there are people listening. <laughs> There was a couple guys who at one meeting I was at, I was listening to the speaker, and I finally found, wow, I was identifying with this guy. It was the first time I ever really heard my story, and he talked about a level of despair and the things that he was doing and the things that he was getting, and he found freedom of that, and I was like, wow, finally. And these two guys in front of me said, what an animal. What a piece of shit that guy is. Can't believe it. And I heard them talking like that about him. I said, I can't imagine what you think about me. Right? Isolated. The only friend I had in that place was Harry. A huge group. There was like 150 of that group, Queensway, Saturday Negro. And my other friends were all rounders, in and out, and guys who couldn't stay sober, guys that nobody in AA wanted anything to do with. These were my friends. They were, most of them were all dead today. Right? So what happened was I was at another meeting, and I was watching this guy get a one-year cake, and I was amazed with the idea, and he was standing on podium, and the place was packed. This guy took me to go hear his story. I'm trying to listen to this guy. Because he came from a lifestyle and all this, and this guy goes, this guy don't even know, he goes to me, he goes, you don't want to mess with that guy. He's a golden gloves boxer. You better watch yourself around him. Yeah? <laughs> this guy never did nothing to me. I don't like him. I'm not even listening to him anymore. Every time I see me smiling, I'm good to see you. Yeah? In my head, Yeah? Nuts, yeah? Every time he's in a meeting, I'm gunning him off. I thought, anytime you want to go, man, I'll go. I'll show you. I'll show you some good street fighting. Take care of that boxing for you. I'm going like this. He's not smiling. He's like, oh, good to see you, Tony. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Bondage, pain, the inability to see how I'm causing myself unbelievable separation from everybody around me. I don't like this guy. So I'm at this meeting. I'm reading the traditions. I'm, I'm detoxing at the... At, in the meeting, I don't know if anybody's had that experience. And the anxiety that nobody explained to me what detoxification looks like and the anxiety and the torment and all. So I'm at the podium trying to read the traditions and it clicked in what the tradition, traditions meant. And as I was standing there, I was thinking about my girlfriend at the time who was dying out on the streets of Toronto. And I was sitting there trying to get so, and I had an anxiety attack at the podium. There was about 150 people, and I couldn't read anymore, and I started having a panic attack that I'd never really experienced before. And I ran outside, and I sat outside, and I was kind of hyperventilating and all this stuff, right? I'm sitting there. Nobody came out because of the condition I was, but this, I felt this guy sit beside me, and he put his arm around me. He says, man, it's going to be okay. I've been there, man. <coughs> we, we can get through this. Guess who the guy was? The boxer. Amadeo. Hmm? Amadeo. Amadeo yeah. No, it was the boxer, oh. right? <laughs> and so what was really wild about that thing is that was the only guy that showed me compassion. On, you know, and like, and, and it kind of, because nobody was doing that. So that kind of stuck with me when I thought of me. I always thought of the compassion of that guy. And the second thing was when I was out of the boat, he was the first guy in the water to pull me out. So you never know who it is in AA is going to be the guy that helps save your life. So we're all in this together. That's what I'm kind of getting at here. So be careful. Be careful of the stones you're throwing here because it is a glass house, right? And the glass that lands, it's usually on yourself. And what you do is create separation. So when we go through the fourth step here and they talk about this thing, they talk about all the things I can't see leading up to the 100 forms of self-delusion, the pain, the agony, the attachment to my life. I am my story. I can't separate myself from my story. I'm stuck in my own thinking. I'm a slave to how I think, how I feel, and I can't get past it. 
like I am my thinking and my feelings and I'm in that bondage and the difficulties and I can't find escape and so what happens I create diversions and diversions usually caused by some emotional shift by something I'm doing to, to create a detachment from my story which causes more pain, more agony and more. Anybody here? Gambling, sex, fighting, arguing, all creates a diversion. Resentment creates a diversion from what? From me and how I'm feeling right now. Anybody conflict oriented here? <laughs> conflict oriented people tell you what they're expressing is I'm in pain and I don't know how to deal with it. I'm looking for a way to find relief from me. Right? And so those who have gone through this get to see it. So when they talk about here, when we get to the fear part of this thing, we looked at the resentment, learning how to master resentments. I kind of see where they stem from, from my instincts and my response to that. That kind of applying these prayers, I'm getting some relief. And then when I get to this thing, here they talk about here, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, but when we back up, we says, notice the word fear bracket alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, the employer, my wife. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion, trans the circumstances what brought us misfortune, but didn't we we felt we didn't not, we didn't deserve, but did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? And if my sponsor said, Why are you mad at this guy? I wouldn't be able I'd say what they did, I didn't know why, but when I finished the resentment, I knew why because of my instincts and the threat to one of those things and my response to life. Then when I got to the fear part here and I started making a list of the fear. What a lot of people say is, why do I have the fear? Because I'm selfish and considerate. That's not why you have the fear. The book doesn't talk about that. The fear talks about you're either God-reliant or self-reliant, right? And when you look at it on paper, you see it's because of one of my basic instincts that makes <coughs> my unmanageability. This is why I have this fear. It's a fight-or-flight instinct that's happening here. I don't know. There's actually three instincts involved in that, that chain of events. We know the fight and flight because that's been our story, but there's also a pause, the ability to assess the danger being presented or the perceived threat and taking appropriate actions to divert the crisis being presented. Pause. We don't know what pause means, right? Don't make any sudden moves, you know what I mean? By the time we realize something, we're in full flight from reality and we're on the run. Anybody? We're in fight mode. Most of us get in fight mode before anything ever happens. We, we build ourselves up, and by the time any, any, any people, who, they call it anger management. <laughs> Anybody have anger issues? It's fear issues. It's not anger issues. It's fear issues. What you're doing is producing an enzymes of fight or flight. So my whole life was riddled with this enzyme of an, 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 um, anxiety. And what happens is when I get too much of it, my body would try to empty itself to fight or flight, vomiting, dysentery, and all that other stuff, right? So it's an instinct so I could survive me, and I didn't know that. So when I got to this point, it was really cool because they give me a recipe, and they're suggesting here that this relationship with this power has started, and it's become personal to me. And they talk about something here that I'll carry for you. You ever hear people talking about what God's will for me is? Bring it up with topics all the time. Well, if you read the book, it tells you exactly what God's will for you is. Anybody want to give me a hint what that is? On, no good. We'll move on. Okay. <laughs> a couple of people. Look at you got me the last four times. I'm not getting involved this time. Okay. So they talk about we revert our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. And then they talk about perhaps there's a better way. Trust in God rather than our finite self. Then they get down. We never apologize. And then they get down to the recipe once we get all this stuff. And it's the recipe we need to learn. And it's kind of, this, it's the process in steps one, two, and three. They've been trying to teach us this since the beginning. But here they really lay hold on it because they give you the recipe on how to do it where you didn't have the recipe before. And let's see if we can figure this out. So they, they talk about instead we let him demonstrate through us what he can do through us. So suggesting again, where's it coming from? I need to get power going through that cord to get it. So it's accessible, that it creates what it's supposed to do. It goes through us. It's not outside of me. It's already in there, and I'm creating this, this field. So if I covered crap all over this light and plugged it in, how well would that light work? It would be working, but I wouldn't be able to see it working. Right? And if I started cleaning all the crap out of it, the more crap I cleaned off the top of it, the more it would illuminate. 
You ever see some people that walk in a room and their energy is just like, whoa. They're illuminating. They're, they're lit up. They're kind of like, wow. You ever see somebody come in here dragging her butt on the ground? Low frequency. Pit bull mentality. <laughs> anyway, how are you? Good. Never been happier. Turning it over. Letting it go. <laughs> Surrendering. Raving a rope. Buying my gun. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. That means I'm practicing these prayers. It's creating a shift within inside of me. I don't understand it, but I see it seems to be doing something. It's like that drink, that toke, that pill. I don't know what it's doing, but it creates something where I'm kind of comfortable in my own skin. So I don't need it explained anymore. I know when I access it, it'll create this. And then it gets to a point where it's not creating it anymore. Now I have a problem. When it no longer subsides or takes away the pain, the agony, or, or the, the fertility of life, now I have a problem. When I'm sitting there in my cups, looking at my life and the stuff ain't working anymore. I don't know if you've ever been there, but that's a problem. Now when everything's becoming real, live, and it's in stereo, and it's in your head, and you're talking to yourself. And you ever been there? You're deciphering paintings and they're... Anybody? <laughs> okay, so it was just me. <laughs> I got a notice once on my door. That's <laughs> funny. So, not that I'm nuts, but I, I went through a bad stretch of time in my life. <laughs> Mostly misunderstood. And so, the girls down the hall never knew me to drink, but they knew me to... Uh, they came and visited me one day. I was on a run, and, and I was telling her what the painting was telling me. And she started crying when she was looking at me. I thought I was being profound. I didn't realize she was looking at me saying, oh my God, like I'm in deep trouble. And I'm like in a state, I'm talking to the painting and I'm talking to the receiver on the radio. And I think, I said, do you think you can play this for me? If you would have asked me what was going on, I think I'm perfectly okay. The next day I got a notice on my door for excessive noise. The landlord said, next time you have a party, can you keep it down? I said, I was alone. I got an excessive noise, so I thought, how would I handle this thing? So I said, the reason I got this excessive noise complaint was my speakers are too far apart. So I'll take my speakers and put them beside me while I sit here drinking party. Makes perfectly good sense at the same volume. Anybody catching on that? So the police showed up to come to arrest me from my apartment. They came in, took a look around, they sat me in the car. And now I'm, I don't know if you've ever been in and out of alcoholic psychosis where you're laughing and crying you're explaining something and you're talking to yourself and you ever been kind of there you're having fun yeah. the cop looks at me and tells me to get out of the car <laughs> 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 he says says it's the end of my shift i don't want to deal with this <laughs> i said he says take your stuff and go with you <laughs> like i just like okay like, i'm on bail like i'm nuts right so, so uh, like, uh, like when I think back, I say, oh, my God, was there a God looking after me? I went to go set trial. i got to say this. Anybody ever been to court here? No. <laughs> so in Toronto, like, they got City Hall, and it's, it's for gang-related and drug-related charges, right? You go to City Hall. And what happens is you got to see a crown, and they set date. So what happens is... I knew I was going to go Monday. It was August 31st. I remember that 1985, and I had this go set date. And so I went to go set the date, or that was before something around that time. So I was setting date. And so I said, okay, Friday night I had to go Monday. So Friday night I said, okay, I'll, I'll go to bed tonight. And then I stayed up and I said, okay, I'll go to bed Saturday. And I stayed up and I said, well, Sunday I might as well stay up because i got to go to court anyways. Anybody done that? I drank right up to the court. And left an empty on the ground. The neighbors, uh, two girls, they looked like Dolly Parton. They walked me down the hall. I'm walking down the hall. I got the boots on, the gold and all that other stuff. I go sit in the front row. I go stand at the front row like this. The guys move, give us the seat. The crown's calling everybody up to who has lawyers. You ever notice that? I look at my time and realize it's getting quarter to ten. The bar's open a quarter to ten. So they call it a little recess. I stand up. The crown's here looking at his papers, and they got the desk here like this. I stand up inside the crown. He's like this, but like this. I said, hey. I said, uh, I don't got time to be going through all this shit. <laughs> I said, you want to do me a favor? And I took my file. I took it to the top, and I put it on top. I said, you want to call me up? I'm just here to set a date. The liquor store is opening in 10 minutes, uh -huh. and I'm starting to sober up, and I don't really mean to be here. Are we cool? 
He just looked at me, horrified. Hand to God. I can't believe I did that. When I look back on that, that's my mentality. Like, I'm like, and what's your problem? I don't care who you are. Like, that, that's a little like, so and you're going to 12-step me? Let's go through the steps. <laughs> like, I'm nuts. Right? So the guy called me. When I think about that, he says, Tony, I got upset I did. I thanked him very much. I think I even tapped him on the back and I left. <laughs> when I think about that, it's like, what the hell? Like, I mean, you ever been embarrassed for yourself when you look back on your life and go, oh, my God, what was I thinking? Okay, so back to here. Squirrel. So he says, instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and to direct our attention to what he would have us be uh, once we commence to outgrow fear. And if... if if you didn't have somebody to explain it to you, you'd miss it right through there. There's the most important um, sequence of events that happened there, which is the recipe to this whole thing. <coughs> that recipe is the whole thing what this whole thing is built on. Anybody know what that recipe is that they just gave us? Okay. Is that what I just read? Oh, I heard. That's to be direct. So you want to read the whole thing again right there? We asked him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow the fear. Anybody see the prayer there? Anybody see you're in conversation with God? You notice it's not as long as the prayer on page 67 in regards to resentment? You notice, it, wait, hold on, you notice it's not as long as the third step prayer? It means... You seem to be a little more in tune to something. That means if you're working with somebody and you never worked with that person before and you're in the furniture business, you'd really have to explain what you're doing all the time to get this person to work with you, right? Once you're in sync with that person, you kind of look at them, they look, and you know what to do. Say, hey, can you do me a favor? And you're both in sync with each other and you work both in harmony. That's what it's kind of saying here. You've experienced the relief of the resentments. You understand where the fears are stemming from because you see they're created out of self. You see they're based on self-reliant. You also see it's because I'm spiritually deficient. I mean, I have lack of power to create change. So I'm instinctual based, right, which is causing all my problems. So here you see for the first time that actually fear precedes resentment. But they couldn't show us that, right? It was an evil corroding threat. I'm instinctual based. I'm always on alarm. I'm always kind of wondering. I'm always in impending doom of the future, the past, the things being found out. I'm in constant stress and turmoil. Anybody? That's a fear-based life. Right? And when I'm like that, I can't stand it for very long because I produce enzymes with inside of me that make me sick. Anybody ever dry heave here from thinking too much? Anybody have stomach acid mm -hmm. anybody have dysentery What's that? diarrhea yeah. from thinking too much can't eat can't sleep yeah. stomach problems mm -hmm. fear is the base of that your instinct there's something wrong I don't know what it is but you better be ready fight or flight right there's no pause so here they're saying hey you learned the recipe to acknowledge there's something going on here. Stop, back up. Right? When I see this thing that's going on based on instinct, then it asks me to do what? Instead, we ask him to remove our fear. In order to remove something, what's the first thing you need to do before it can be removed? You need to acknowledge it's there. Wow, that's new for us. To pause, to be in tune to my energy that realizes there's a shift that's causing me my demise. Right? I see the attachment. When I create energy, when I create fear, anybody have anxiety here? Anybody ever experience shortness of breath? You notice when you're thinking you don't breathe too well? You ever, you ever notice that? You ever notice you're capable of thinking right through a whole meeting? How many people are here right now? <laughs> what? So that's all fear based, based on the unmanageability. So here they're saying, I see there's an energy shift based on fear, based on my security, my ambitions. My, like when I went downstairs, my brain said, hey, my social instinct. Well, on the sheets that, that you handed out there, on the fear, you see the instincts. There's social ambition, security, and it says that they make up self. And these are the things that create my problem. So what happens is when, when, if I don't watch it, they start talking to me. And if I listen to it, it creates more problems. So 
This is what my brain does. So I'm a little tired, a little off. I sit down, right? Nobody's sitting in the table that we usually sit, right? And my brain said, see, nobody's happy with what you're doing. <laughs> Actually, they're surprised you're still here. <laughs> Anybody have that kind of voice? All my instincts are going to whack here. Now, I could listen to that. If I listen to that, how well would this meeting be going now? So what I acknowledge, whoa, 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 this is not the energy I want to attach to here, right? So I step back, pray, and I realize, hey, you know what? I'm off in this area. My ambitions with my daughter is a little off. My security in regards to her safety is a little off. I'm more concerned about their welfare right now because they're moving into the new place. And as a father, all my instincts are at an alarming high alert, right? I want to go in there. So what I need to do is I need to calm myself to bring myself back to the present, right? And that's where, remember I asked you earlier, what's God's will for me? It's in here. So they talk about here, perhaps there's a better way we think so. For now, for we are now. When's now? We are now. For we are now, not later. Now. This is a now recipe for relief, not a later recipe. The 12th step happens as the result. But this course of action starts bringing about relief now. How many people, when they went to the liquor store, says, well, you know, you take the drink today and next week you'll feel it. But it's just, you, how many people want relief now? This is the now. This is, I could get relief now if they talk about it. In the resentments, they talk about to the precise extent that we permit these things. Why they t didn't say that before is because we didn't have domain over our thinking because lack of power is our dilemma. We're instinctual based, resentment driven, fear, anxiety. So now they're saying, hey, we have a respite. We could tap in when I walk into the darkness. All you got to do is access that light. Once the light's in, then it's on a dimmer switch, right? Because now we know where it is. I understand it's there. But some days it's a little lower than other days. And when that light's low, that dimmer switch is low, I'm more prone to walking into things and causing problems. You, ever, you know what I mean? You ever walk in a room that's not well lit? And that's kind of like our lives. We're more instinctual. But when that light's well lit, I can see where everything is and take appropriate action to avoid shift or change and so that's what they're talking about here we trust infinite god rather than our finite selves we are in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we would do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him does he enable us to match calamity with serenity what do you mean i'm still gonna have calamity what's calamity huh noise Where's the noise? In my head. In my head. Anybody remember what problem they had this time last year at the same time? <laughs> Actually, you have a summary of it, but you don't exactly know what it is. Right? The moment of living that moment. So in the living of the moment here, what derives us or takes us away from this moment? Power. Or attachment. Right? So if I was at peace with the past... Would I spend any time there? And if I went back, there would be good memories of things that I'd kind of reflect on. But most, and if I was okay with where I was going with my life, would I have much concern with the future? No. So if I was at peace with those two places, where would I spend most of my time? Now. now. <clears throat> so that's how you tell if you're at peace with yourself or not. Because if you go to a meeting and it takes you half an hour to show up, no, you're physically there, but it takes you half an hour to show up. Would you say you're at peace with yourself? No, no. So what happens is this becomes a spiritual monitoring place. It's kind of really weird. And you watch this when you go to a meeting. You sit down and you realize you get confronted with all, all the challenges that are unresolved within your life in that meeting. And what you're trying to do is get present. And it takes you sometimes two or three speakers to get present. Do you ever notice that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you can go home meeting and not even know who's read how it works. You ever been in those meetings? Yeah, and sometimes you leave a meeting in worse condition than when you went. Because a lot of us go to problem-oriented meetings. And you're drawing off of that energy. And what happens? You leave that energy ugh, worse than you. Know, I, so how was the meeting? I don't know. I didn't feel like killing myself before I went. <laughs> right? and then I, but you go to a meeting that's solution-based. How does that meeting feel? 
You don't even have to share. You just draw for that energy. You ever feel that? You go to me and say, wow, that was like something. That was like, oh, I don't know what was happening there, but I'm kind of connected. I have that moment where I was actually there for a couple minutes and everything seemed all right. Maybe there's a possibility of a different life than I, than I thought before I came in here. What created that shift? That energy saying, hey, man, there's something here. So that's why they're very specific about things. If you want what we have, then you need to understand and do it the way we did it. Your own conception of that. This, a lot of this is my experience with this, but the basis of, of it is the same. Right? In order for me to have freedom, I need to be present. In order to be present, I need to be free of the attachment of things. That's what the fourth step talks about. What's in the way of me and accessing this power is all the things I still carry. Would we agree or disagree? So we get down to causes and conditions. How many people carry a lot of stuff here from their past? It eats our lunch for us, right? So here they're saying there's a different way. So this is saying now where I used to experience anxiety and all that. If I just pause and do the serenity prayer in that moment. If I just pause and take a big breath. God help me. Whoever you are, help me. That was my prayer before. God, whoever you are. Because the first time I actually got clean was out here with nothing. And I was on a constant state of anxiety and psychosis. Constant. So the only thing they'll say, I do these prayers, I do, and it didn't, but I started getting relief. This one time, like, oh, oh, like, oh so e that I got to a place and I said, why does prayer work? I'm going to try not doing it and try fixing this myself. It got so painful, I convinced myself of the need to do prayer. <laughs> <laughs> why does it, it's a phenomenon I don't, we don't know why it's something beyond comprehension but it has the ability wine is like taking two colors and placing them together in a glass of water and it changes the, the colors of those two colors you ever see that we think we're doing it but all we do is put two elements together that creates that change so what we're doing is putting two elements together and the byproduct of it is change all we're, we're not creating light what we're doing is putting that together with the source and that creates the light does that kind of make sense? So here they're saying, we're just getting you back in touch with the life force that, that, that is your gift from birth and back into the potential that you've always had. That loneliness that you've always had is a separation from this thing that's always been trying to get your attention. So imagine if you could live in this thing, how you'd feel. You ever get charged and say, shit, if I could bottle this? You ever have that moment? It's like, whoo, yeah. You're, you're like, you, you get goosebumps running through your head. Like, you ever, like, or is it just me? Oh, yeah. You think, wow, if I could be like this all the time. You can't be. But you can have moments of it. The reason we can't have it all the time because we forget why it needs to motivate us. So they talk about that here. Then they talk about relationships. So the recipe is acknowledge. Prayer. Why prayer? It stops my connection to that problem. My energy tied to that problem. It stops it. I resort it back within me because I can't contain the energy. I redirect it. I don't know if anybody... <laughs> And the, uh, uh, anybody know Steven Seagal? Yeah. He talks about redirecting energy. He doesn't fight the gamble. He steps out of the way of the energy. He keeps the energy moving. What we try to do is contain energy. And when you contain energy, energy, it turns on yourself. Right? You ever try to contain? You ever feel the explosion in here? <laughs> and, you're, and you're just like, ah! That's misdirected energy. You're trying to contain something that should be redirected. So we learn how to master resentment. We take that energy that used to turn on us and we work it toward our betterment. We take the fear that used to cripple us, we bypass it, apply prayer to it, and we concentrate what's in front of us. It may sound kind of weird, but sometimes it's as simple as God give me strength to do the next right thing. And you're standing at home, you look at your house, and you haven't done dishes in three weeks, and your laundry is piled to the ceiling. And you wonder, I wonder what God's will for me is. Try the laundry. <laughs> no, it can't be that simple. It's not working. Well, then try the dishes too. I got a sponsor. He's doing the dishes, doing his laundry, swearing at me, and praying. That guy's an asshole. <laughs> Same way as to talk about, oh, try this stupid thing. It doesn't seem to work. And then the next thing you find, the next couple of days, I see him a couple of days, how you doing? Oh, man, good. House is clean. Dishes are done. Did the laundry. I'm feeling good. Helping some newcomers. I don't know what it was. When I was horizontal, looking at the dishes and the laundry, I kind of felt really bad about everything. <laughs> Anybody? I ordered pizza, and I left the box on the floor with the Chinese food, right? Like, anyway, so... So then they talk about relationships here, which is absolutely mind-boggling. 
because I misunderstood what they were talking about. And I, I thought they were talking about in there was a list of all the things I've done. And they talk about we're not the arbitrary of anyone in sex conduct. What I'm looking for is the same thing I look for in we agnostics is the things that was causing me guilt, pain, and remorse and shame. So when I made a list of those things, it was personal to me. Right? And a lot of my conduct was directed by other people's ideas and how I grew up and all that other stuff. Like my, I had a real warped sense of, of, of engaged in things that caused me discomfort, pain, and agony, but I, didn't, I couldn't have the power to shift that. And this area was really troublesome because where I grew up and the people I grew up with and all that other stuff, it, it created a discomfort with inside of myself that I couldn't shake. So when I went through this thing, what I was able to do was, was come up with the right idea that was right for me and that I was okay to live with. And I was able to be honest with other people. And this is the kind of the area that took the longest to really look at and work on and the connection with another human being. So at the end of this, what I got was uh, an idea of how I wanted my relationships to look. And that's changed over my sobriety. Right? When I got 16 years sober, it was a lot different than what it looked like in my first couple of years. So as I grew in spiritually and understanding, I became less instinctual based. So does my ideas and my conduct and how I treated people changed, right? I didn't use those things on a consistent basis to create self-esteem, self-worth within myself at the expense of other people, right? Like you know, I came in here, I thought I had an anger and sex problem. What I had was a fear and self-esteem problem. I didn't know that. And my, my ideas of what relationships were and all that was warped because where I was raised with men and all men were men, the food in the fridge, roof over your head, what's your problem? That doesn't sustain a relationship. Really. <laughs> I remember I was like at that seven-year point when I went for some outside help. I'm living with this. I said, what's the matter with you, man? Why are you always poking the tagger? I said, you like, what's, what's, what's your problem, man? Like I'm talking a lot of different terminology, obviously. And she goes, who wants to live with a tanker? I kind of went, good point. Because <laughs> I was instinctual based. Like I was like, you ever see a grill of us? That's how I communicate. Throw the table over, smash the wall, smash the dishes, threaten. But I think best relationship I've ever been in. So I ended up going for outside help in this area. Uh, a tongue to violence was relationship based with the outside help. I failed the first course, passed the second one. Pretty hard to fail a course that they give you information on, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different story. So I kind of went through this thing, and I did my fifth, which, which is pretty wild, so I have an idea. 90% of, of the stuff shifted for me, and, and it's just kind of the way it was. And then it tells you the purpose of the fourth step. I finished it. I see that there's things blocking me. By the time I finish this exercise on 71, it says, we hope. Who's the we? It's those that put this together, right? We hope you, the participant, are convinced that now, convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. What are these self-wills that have blocked me off from him? My attachment to resentment. My attachment to fear. fear my attachment to my, yeah, like on and on and on. Like there's a, like some of us have some problems, right? Most of us didn't in therapy before we got here. You ever notice that? <laughs> so, that's what, so we're hoping you're convinced now that you could create a shift with inside yourself sufficient enough to be comfortable somewhat within your own skin. And these things that you're still hanging on to, you have a recipe to apply to your life where they talk about here to the precise extent that we permit these. That means now I have access to power that's internal, that if I'm willing to practice this thing, anybody ever take boxing and martial arts here? You get in a rink with a first degree or second degree black belt at a white belt level, you're going to experience some humility. There's the fight before you get in the rink, and then there's the fight in the rink, and then there's the fight after the rink, what you would have done with them if you were watching better. I don't know if anybody, anybody ever had their ass handed to them on a silver platter here? Everybody has, right? You think what you would have done to the guy given another chance, but you're not looking for that other chance right anytime soon. <laughs> Anybody? So they're saying here, now you have a recipe to combat yourself for the first time. You have a place where you can find a neutral 
position within yourself as an observer instead of participant. You can find enough freedom where you have moments that the day's not looking too bad. You have precise moments that I could fall asleep now. Now I'm going to do my fifth step. And for me, that's where the connection happened. And I don't know how to explain it. And if you would have seen my fourth step, you'd, you'd, you'd kind of ask, how did you stay sober doing that? When you look, because what I did was I got a general base. Remember, I came in as a Neanderthal, knuckle dragon Neanderthal. My English language, my interpretation, my whole sense of everything was warped. Before I did this course of action, what we need to ask people is, what do you think this means? We don't ask people that. We think we all have the same understanding. I've sat in those 12 and 12 meetings for years. Then when I was at the Wine and Snivel uh, men's meeting, it was all rounders in Vancouver. And this is where I, uh, my sponsor picked me up, um, uh, Chuck. It was step eight, and I was listening to everybody talk about their list of people they owed amends to. And I was kind of like, this is, at this time, I'm probably nine years in and out. Ten years, going into the ten-year mark. And everybody shared, and I said, it came to me, I said, holy God. I said, I never did nothing to nobody that didn't have a coven tool. <laughs> I said, I've got to list a few people I still got to get even with, but there's really don't got much going on. That was my belief system, right? Because I didn't understand what you meant by this stuff. Like when I grew up, was you, you crossed the line, woman, man, or child, you took your lumps, you stood up, and you carried on, and nobody made you pay anymore, right? You took your beating or whatever it was. You took the backhand, you stepped out of line, and you told the line. And you did that with everybody, and that was done with you, right? So now, and the only people to get even with is the people that crossed you, because you don't carry stuff. The only thing you carry is those are the people that still need to pay for what they did. That's a whacked out mentality. So when you guys are sharing about that, I'm not hearing a thing that you're saying, because it's way outside of my scope of living. But when I went through this, I went, whoa, whoa, unbelievable. And then when it got to the harms part, harms others, there's a list that they say we get from our four. And a lot of people say it's not in there. But guys like me, I had to write down everything about my past. <coughs> anything associated came to my mind with sex. Anything. If, they, if it came to mind, I wrote it down. Pornography, back of the bus, this, that, that. I wrote everything down so I could get freedom from those things I was still carrying. There's some form of guilt, shame, and remorse attached to that. And so when I, when I went through it, I was able to, to, to get rid of a lot of that stuff. And it was age, association, or, or situation, and all that other stuff, right? Or drunk and all that other. And then when it came to the harms part, well, that was really interesting. Because I started going through my harms to people, places, and things. That was a longer list than the resentments. And I didn't realize how much of that stuff I really carried. Right? Even that bird it may sound weird. And all these guys and people I hurt because really I never wanted to hurt people. I always wanted to be a gentle, I was kind of like a gentle giant. And, and what I did was I, I was always the advocate for other people. I never fought for myself. I never thought worthy of sticking up for myself. But I would defend you to the, to the core. When I went to school, I picked, I picked all my friends and a lot of guys the people I protected. People who had emotional and mental problems. People who were handicapped. They became my friends. I walked with them in the schoolyard. I'd fight for you, but I wouldn't fight for myself. It was kind of weird like that. The whole thing I found out in the fourth step, the fourth step was about me and what makes me tick and how I operate and what I was up against and my challenges and how I respond to life. That's what my fourth step was. When I did the fifth, I found peace with that. Right? And when at the end of the fifth step, it was kind of like they talk about here this archway. It gave me the idea in four when I began, and when I finished my five, I had access to going through this archway. That means what happens is I have an instinctual based life over here. I tap into this inner resource here. I tap into, I don't know, what, whatever, that six and whatever, this thing inside, and I pass through a dimension with inside of myself, and I tap into the spiritual realm, and I pass into the freedom where I no longer have attachment to this. Doesn't mean it isn't there, but it's no longer eating my lunch have a new freedom and new happiness. And it's really hard to explain, but once you experience you kind of go, wow, I match calamity with serenity. Regardless of what's happening in my life, I can sit quietly in the eye of the storm and find peace, right? And then we'll talk about that when we come back from the smoke break as I look at eight and nine. <laughs> the way after we're done here. So listen, 
here's where we're going to, you think you guys had a bit of, anybody have conflicting information for what they thought? And try, anybody have some stuff to kind of take away from here? And kind of, we're going to relook at that again, look at the book and kind of investigate this a little deeper. I know some guys were talking about the idea around step one, around the, sen, around the power thing, because a lot of us are hearing new ideas for the first time. We've heard a lot of different stuff. When challenged, it doesn't make much sense, right? Like me plugging that light into that window and using the window as a power, it doesn't make sense. It needs to be personal to me. They're very specific. That's why they say, as we understand him. Your own conception of that means, you, like Renee call it Jesus Christ, but that's his conception. It's none of my business what he thinks. Buddha, and whatever, Jehovah. I call it a frequency. But the basis of that is, do you need to tune your radio into this frequency so you can get sound out of it sufficient enough to lead you out from where you are? That's it, the new experience. So when they talk about here, which was really cool, back on 62, it talks about being walking through an arch, which we walk a free man. Right? They talked about that in 62, this archway over here as a concept. Here on page 75... They talk about it as an experience, right? I've just finished my fifth, and they're talking about going home and reviewing it. They talk re returning, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour. Just the concept of being quiet for an hour and being able to achieve that is pretty wild at this time, right? When was the last time anybody experienced quiet for an hour? <laughs> no, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean quiet like quietly talking to myself for an hour or quiet okay sir so taking this book down well we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better meaning this power this entity this energy whatever you want to call it. you're okay with the term God because your own conception what you call that is entirely up to you but the basis of the same is the same experience this is the first 100 men and women that they talked about the spiritual appendix in the back of the book it's the same for all of us where does this originate from it's the same for all of us within so carefully reviewing the first five proposals we ask if we have omitted anything for we are building an arch through which we walk a free man now they're saying I have the recipe for this arch. What does that mean? I have the recipe of being able to acknowledge there's a shift in my energy or an attachment to something, to step back from it, pray, redirect my energy, or ask for a different, different shift in how I look at things. The ability to do that, because usually well, we've seen how we used to be, right? So we're going to look at 6 and 7 because a lot of people love the way I look at 6 and 7. This causes a lot of disturbance because you hear, you hear people go, Nobody understands 6 and 7. You ever hear people say that? It means this, it means that. Well, I always tell people, read what it says. Most of us read what we think it says based on other people's teachings. Or other people has expanded on it because they don't understand what it says. Or what it's talking about. Remember they talked about here, and this is a lot of my own spin and my own experience with this stuff. What makes sense to me when you look at step 11 and where we're at in this process. Back when they started, what's our first obsession? Self. Self. They just say self, right? And exerting self will to fix self. Me fixing me with me. Anybody ever have that problem here? We already passed the idea that that don't work. So they're saying, but there is something that can work that cr create a shift in me that is in me. It's a byproduct of something, right? I'm not creating the shift. I don't create the light. But when I put the elements together, it creates light. So here they talk about... Here, we talk about if we have omitted anything for return to build, um, have we skipped the, on the cement to put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? We know what that looks like. If we can answer to our satisfaction, if we can answer to our satisfaction, then we look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. What's indispensable? Willingness. willingness. Are we now ready to let God, who? God, remove from us all these things which we have admitted are objectionable. What are all these things we have admitted are objectionable? Just did our five. Defects. We just started our four. Huh? Our defects of character. Does it say defects of character? No. Just... So, no, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing the challenge is, what are the things we admitted are objectionable? Self. The... So, so let's back up. 
Meow. Let's back it. So if you want to know what something's saying, back up to what the source of the information started from. So they told us that what's our problem at this stage of the game? We suffer from spiritual malady. And what blocks us off from these things are the things that we carry, right? Manifestation of a spiritual malady, spiritual sickness. What's the first thing they said demonstrates spiritual sickness? Resentments. Resentments. Fears. 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 Conduct. Harm. Anybody carry those things? Of course. So when you've done your five, anybody realize you still have some of these things? Yeah. You're still attached to these things, these resentments I have in the conduct, would they be objectionable? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, were you thrilled with them or what? We see that these things were derivative of my spiritual condition. These things have caused my demise. These things are the things that's eating my lunch. They're killing me. Right? I need to be free of these things, but I see I can't be free of them. That's why they said I'm reconfirming step three here that I can't create the change within myself so first enough to be freedom, but I know God could and what a fewer sought. So am I ready to have God have all these things that I'm still hanging on to? You'll see what I mean by that. Because if we think it's it, it, a lot of us think it's my salvage is dishonesty and inconsideration. But that's the derivative of my spiritual condition. Right? They're not the things I'm hanging on to because those show me what I am hanging on to. Why are you selfish? Because I get this from her. Why are you doing this? Because I need this to survive. Why are you still doing this? Because my social instinct's not working. My ambition, my attachment. Why are you still angry with those people? Because of what they did to me. They're objectionable. I went through that list, right? And as we go through this, so can they talk about here the things I still hang on to. And, and I see that I don't want none of these resentments or this pain or the fear or the conduct. I want it all to be gone because I see the destructiveness of, of the nature of it. I see what I look like on a non-spiritual basis. That's what my four says. My four doesn't say what I used to be like. It says what I am like. Based on what? Based on a non-spiritual basis. Right? Those vehicles, the selfishness, the inconsideration, and the dishonesty, they need to be attached to something for me to see them. That's my response to an instinct. Why were you selfish? Because I was afraid I was going to lose something and not get something. My social. See, my instincts out of whack. The vehicles, the selfishness, the inconsideration, and the attachment of the people. That thing is not the problem. It's only the vehicle. It's the attachment. It's the threat, right? So when they talk about here, let's look at it. They talk about... Are we not ready to have God remove all these things which we have admitted are objectionable? Can he now take them all, every one? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. What the hell would I be hanging on to? How many people did a fifth here? Okay, when you've done your fifth, how much stuff are you still hanging on to? Huh? Lots. Huh? Lots. Lots. But you know what they are now, and you see how it eats your lunch. So you know what? This thing with my dad, when I found out he nearly killed me when I was an infant and, I, and it put me in the hospital causing a rupture and I was black and blue and it caused tremors. And I'd eat my lunch because I want to get even with him. What my mom did and the people did and all that other stuff, even though I was able to understand forgiveness toward them and pray for them, I still carried some deep stuff. I mean, some really deep stuff, right? So I seen these things were still eating my lunch. Not all the time, but they'd come up every once in a while. They'd resurface. And I kind of went, wow, there's a lot of stuff here. Police. There's still, every time I've seen a cop for years, I get an anxiety. I'm not even doing nothing wrong. Getting anxiety. Work. Anticipate groups of people. Oh, see, my attachment to these ideas and these things are still causing me problems. But I'm willing that God should have all of them. But some of the things I hung on to because I was justified to hang on to them. Anybody? Yeah, because yeah, i got to get even with them. And I'll talk to you about that in the 8 and 9. It's pretty amazing stuff, but I know what they are. So they talk about here, if we still cling to something, we'll not let go. That pain, the attachment, you notice that anything we're, is still the pain attached to it? It's their story that we're attached to it. It's eating our lunch. I can't separate myself from it because of the injustice or the, the pain that's still associated with that episode. You notice when you think about it, you're still in that moment of living in it. But now you get some, resent, some, some 
distance from it. You're able to separate emotionally from it a lot faster because of the prayers and all that, but it's still there. Right? And if you find yourself, that's where they talk about 10 and 11 later. When ready, we said something like this. Oh, sir, if we will not let go to something, we ask God to help us be willing. That translates to, you know what, I still know I'm, I'm, I'm still sorry I'm carrying this. I'm still sorry I'm doing this. But I'm willing that you take it and give me something better in this place. As soon as you give me something better in this place, I'll be able to let go of this. Give me the ability to be free of this thing. That's kind of pretty good, even though I know I'm still hanging on to it. But I'm willing that you should take it, right? So that when ready, we said something like this. My creator, I'm now willing you should have all of me. Good and bad. Whoa. Good and bad. I thought it was just defects of character we're working on here. Why does it say good and bad? It actually says good and bad. you notice that? Yeah, because I don't know what's good and bad. Good <coughs> and bad. So... When you look at that, when people talk about six and seven, what do they talk about? The bad. They've deceived themselves into believing when they're doing good. When I'm not stealing that, look, oh, when you talk about, well, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Your Honor. <laughs> no, the, no, okay, right? So. What happens is, they say, look how good I'm doing. I never did this for a week. When you're bad, concentrate on bad things, who are you concentrated on? Who are you concentrated on? When you think, talking about how great you're doing, who are you concentrating on? You ever see a coin? How many sides to a coin? Two. Either, either side you concentrate on, you're still concentrating on the coin. You're still concentrating on you. Right? So, this is saying, stop concentrating on you, because you can't fix you. And we'll get into that. So if I can't fix me, that's the way it says good and bad, because I suffer from a subtle form of delusion. Anybody ever apologize to somebody here for trying to do them a favor? <coughs> I don't know why you're mad at me. I was just trying to help you out. I didn't know you needed the whole, all the money. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Anyway, I was going to tell you a couple other jokes. Okay, let's go with this. <laughs> so, one reader says, My creator is now willing you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness. Hmm. What stands in the way of my usefulness? Every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness. When does that happen? Now. Now. Every single defect that stands in the way of my usefulness. When? Now. Who determines that? Does it say self? Here's a list of things I want you to work on, God. When you find a time, I'd like you to take care of this. Take care of this. Not this so much, because I kind of enjoy this. This, this, and this. Anybody? It's saying here, it, 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 the formula, it says here, it says, it's really cool when you re read this, right? says, I pray you remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness. Now, it stands in the way of my usefulness. What's God's will for me? To live in uh, now. now. But if I'm not present, can I be living in a now? So if I'm attached to a defect of character, which is an instinct, because one of my instincts are being threatened, and I'm acting selfish, inconsiderate, and dishonest, it's not the selfish, inconsiderate, and dishonest that's causing me problems. It's my spiritual condition attached to one of my instincts trying to fix me with me. That lets me know when I have a problem with my tooth, what's the symptom, the first symptom you might have a problem with your tooth? Pain. You're, oh, there's something wrong. Is that the problem or is that the symptom? Character defect is a symptom of the problem. It isn't a problem. So I have to get down to cause and conditions. What's causing this thing to happen? And then I have to treat that and not the pain. Anybody ever treat the pain of a toothache and think the toothache's gone away? You know what happens after you ignore a tooth problem? It's called an abscess. That's recovery. You know what happens when you ignore a problem? <laughs> it becomes an abscess. Okay, sir. So, ready? What stands in my usefulness? To you and my fellows, grant me strength. 
What am I praying for here? That's it. Power to carry. Grant me strength. What's my problem? Lack of power. If I'm stuck in the, the, the dilemma of lack of power, then who's going to show up? My fourth step. This is what I look like in my fourth step on a non-spiritual basis. That, my fourth step shows me what my life looks like when I'm trying to run it. It's not how I used to be. This is the way I am. People say, well, my old behavior. It's not an old behavior if you're still doing it. <laughs> it's a behavior associated with a person that's not spiritually well this is your go to when you're not spiritually well you show up what does you look like this is what you look like in the fourth step when Tony starts showing up this is what it looks like this is what I become it's in the fourth step what saves me from the fourth step is my spiritual connection somebody say what makes you say that Glad you asked. Here we go. So if we kind of read further, it's really interesting here. They talk about, they talk, it seems like we're talking a lot longer, a lot of stuff going on here, right? So they said, as I go out from here to do your bidding, amen. We have now completed step seven. Completed. What is completed? Finish. Step seven. We didn't complete step six. We've completed step Seven, as willingness to know what my part is in all this thing. It gave me the recipe. I'm only praying for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out, to go from here and do thy bidding, to be in the present, to be free of those things I'm still hanging on to. If I'm still hanging on to them, I'm still stuck in six. My six is associated with my past. Step seven is associated with my future. And who's in charge of my future? Not who's in charge of right now? Me. And how I direct myself. Because I need to ask. To have free will. I see the benefit of living by these principles. If I don't live the principles. Then I pay the price. And I can't afford to pay the price anymore. right? Because I know a disobedience to these principles. Will lead to my own demise. Because what I need is a daily reprieve. From the fate of step one. Because the promise of step one is I'm going to return to the trough. I'm going to be a dog that returns to its vomit. I can't help it. And the only thing that saves me from that fate is the path that was led before me. You know what they talk about? Rarely have we seen a person feel who's thoroughly followed our path. You know where they get that saying from? The Second World War, the people that used to walk through the landmine would put a path together. And they say, if you put your footsteps and my footsteps, you'll make it through this mine. You'll get through this. And that's what they're saying here. It doesn't have to make sense. But if you're willing to do this, once you experience it, you look back and go, whoa, this is amazing. Not somewhat thrilling. This is amazing. Your story will absolutely <coughs> blow your socks off. You'll sit there in a moment of amazement within your own life, in a moment beyond anything you could ever comprehend. But you need to experience that to understand what we're talking about. And once you experience that, no further explanation is necessary. You always know what you're moving toward and what you're trying to achieve. And it goes to greater and greater heights. So when they talk about this, they talk about what I'm talking about here. It says, now if we need more, now we need more action. Right? Without which we find that faith without works is dead. Let's look at steps eight and nine. We have a list of all persons we had harmed to whom we're willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. We now go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past, which, which uh, were the past. We attempted to sweep away the debris which we have accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will. <coughs> to live on self-will. So what created all that pain and agony in the past? Self-will directed on me based on my instincts trying to create security, contentment, and happiness at the expense of everybody around me. I become instinctual animal-based. There's a kind of fight or flight. And there's a lot of wreckage behind me. And I don't understand why I'm doing Now when I look at my four, I see uh, the way I operated here is because my spiritual depleted. And I was more instinctual based than spiritual based. That makes sense. And these people that said they were spiritually based no longer had this level of wreckage in their life. So if I'm going to get freedom for me, I need to find a spiritual answer to the dilemma called me. And when I tap into this, this source, then there's less of me that shows up. So I'm clearing away the effort of my effort to live on self-will. Right? 
which had accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. So the four step shows me what I'm like on a non-spiritual basis. I am not thrilled with the information I'm finding. A drastic self-appraisal. I go, I feel like shit. My sponsor said you should based on the stuff you've been doing. You should feel like shit. When I did my fifth step, I was sweating. The humiliation. But I knew I had to do it because my life was on the line. I talked about stuff I was swore I'd never talk to anybody about. And I went through it 100 miles an hour. He didn't stop me and go, well, you're kind of inconsiderate here and selfish here. Can you see the child within showing up here? <coughs> that wasn't the point of the exercise. In the fifth step, it shows you the point of exercise. The willingness to show humility. Fearlessness. And you ever see those things? If I could exhibit those things, they tell me I'm on my way. That's the point of the exercise, is the humility of the need to do this because my life is dependent on it and I need to get access to this source. That's a whole different approach to this, right? A lot of people finish the four step and a lot of treatment people and people who've been through treatment start on a behavioral modification course here. They start working on themselves. Look at this behavior, look at that behavior, see how it's tied to this, see how it's tied to that. That's the way they were taught. But when you look at this, it says I acted that way because I was spiritually sick. So in order not to act that way anymore, I need to get spiritually well. And when I'm spiritually well, am I acting that way? No. No. So my acts that where they talk about, I'm praying only for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry them. I'm praying for power. Because when I'm spiritually right, does my life look right? But if I'm working on me, who am I working on? The problem. It says being convinced any life run on self-will or run on your thinking or you on the effort of trying to fix you leads to our own demise. And they're kind of saying that here, right? So I'm convinced now. Am I convinced that God can remove whatever self-will has been blocking me over the life force from within? So now I'm on a different basis because I'm tapped into this energy field that I was separated from. And it's more at peace and more at ease. I comprehend the word serenity. No, be, I can be comfortable within my own skin. The first time I did this, and did the, I slept like, I could, like I've never slept before in my life. And when I got up, I had this intuitiveness inside. I don't know how to explain it. It was my sixth sense. It was that voice that showed up again and said, like, kind of like, how you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. It's been a while. Can we work on starting to rebuild your life? You're tired of being an animal. Are you really willing to do something different? And now as I go through this, I have my list, my eight. And what's really important, what a lot of people do, is by the time I get to my step eight, my mind has shifted in how I look at these people, places, and things. The amend with inside of myself has already taken place. I'm at peace with this stuff. And if some of the six and seven still attached to it, I play for the willingness that I don't bring that up or associate that when I go do my nine. Right? I'm going there to clear my wreckage of the streets so I can find freedom, regardless of what they did. And I tell the people I went and approached, like my stepfather, that guy, he was the most meanest man I ever met in my life, but I made amends for the stuff I did to him because I tormented him. I grew up as a kid. If I can make you lose your temper, I win. Regardless of the consequences. I'll take the busted nose, but I win. You lost it. <laughs> like, like nuts. I don't know. Like teachers, every, the whole society... I, I was like that. I threatened everybody. Like, so when I came to my eight, my, my eights were done. In order to successfully do nine, what would you have to do to successfully do nine? How do you know when you start on nines? What would give you a indi good indication to do your nine? Well, it kind of talks about preparation there. But this is what another thing that a lot of people say, I can't do 10. You ever hear this? I can't do 10 because I haven't done 9. You ever, anybody ever hear you say that? Can't do, you got to go from step 8. Actually, when you do your 8, you got your list. You should be in 10 and 11, 12 while you do your 9s. If you're not in 10, 11, and 12, you can't do your 9 successfully because you're relying on self. And self will allow you to get through those spots because in 10, they talk about when these things crop up, for something to crop up means it already exists. And it's my attachment to these people, places, and things. Right? And so what happens when I become spiritually depleted, my old idea on how these people used to be and how they are come back to the surface. Anybody ever do that? Everybody? My dad. 
Every once in a while, I think of what he did to me because I found out what he did to me when I was 22. I was loaded and I was trying to get sober. I asked, I phoned my mom, I'm crying. I said, What's the matter? Because I felt I knew I was an animal. Like, there was something fundamentally wrong with me. I couldn't, couldn't really explain. And, and it was kind of like because I, I left my daughter with her mom and I thought the best thing I could do for these people is get out of their life because what I did was I was kind of having a couple of beers and my daughter was standing at the table. She wouldn't listen. And the third time I went to mention it, I found my hand in the air and I was going to whack her right off her feet. And I went, oh, my God. And how do you explain that to people in a when you already know they don't like you and you know how they feel about that other guy? How are you going to tell anybody? I never told nobody what I did was left. I said, the best thing I could do for these people is to leave them alone. That was my go-to with everything. I never felt welcomed or wanted anywhere. They'd do um, New Year's. I'd go sit in my car just so you wouldn't have the uncomfortability of wishing me a happy New Year's. That's what I was thinking. That's a level of separation. But inside, I just kind of like the love of AA. And so when it came to this stuff, when it came to my dad, I had to learn how to love him carrying this thing. And I said to him once, I said, I know what you did. And I, I said, I forgive you for it. I said it in the letter and I said, we don't have to live that way because I appreciate you in my life and I appreciate what God did for you. And I appreciate having known you, I got introduced to AA. It took a long time to do that letter. See, what happened is my dad in a blackout, my sister just died and I phoned my, backing up, I phoned my mom and I'm loaded and I'm crying. I said, there's something wrong with me. I've looked at these four steps. I've looked at my life and there's something fundamentally wrong with me. The way I think, the way I react, the way I look at it. I said, you know, the hallucinate when I was a kid and all that other stuff. And, and it was like I used to have this. My mom used to give me Valiums was out when I was a kid so I could sleep. Because in my room every once in a while I have this hallucination of this monster. It was purple and it'd lift the lid off the top of the house and it'd start smashing me, well, and I'd be in my bed crawling against the side, screaming for my mom to come in. I'm like four and three years old when this is happening. Purple. And it was wild, and I'd have this reoccurring every once in a while. And I think that's a pretty whacked out thing for a kid to have. And I'd wake up in closets, and you couldn't <laughs> hold me in any kind of way, and I'd go in a blackout and all that other stuff. And I had, like, a rupture on the inside that I had to get fixed when I was nine. Like, I suffered a lot of trauma, and I couldn't put my finger on what the trauma was. And so when I phoned my mom and I asked her, she carried this guilt. And this was in, in this process that I had to learn how to forgive her and stuff, like forgive this whole process that I carried in six. My mom started crying. She says, your sister just died. We lived in Sudbury on the other side of the trash. Your dad came home and he was in a blackout. He asked me to perform something for him because he, he thought he was entitled to sex. You were crying in the crib. And I said, I had to take care of you first. She says, that's all I remember. I came to on the floor and I, she said I heard no noise coming from your crib she said I went to the crib and she said you were black and blue from your head to your toes he beat the living crap out of me and it caused me a death experience just thinking that a human being can do that is far beyond anything I could and it cost me a lot of years of my life and I knew that truth and I used to think about blowing his head off Every time I got loaded, I left the army. I'd think and fantasize. I knew how he got home. I was a sniper kind of uh, marksman in, in my field. Not hard. I used to fantasize about this idea. A couple times I came back drunk and I said, you know, I want to take him on now. I carried this idea. Never told nobody. Nobody told anything. So now this man is a member of AA and also he left me standing in that courtroom. So when it came to doing my four or my five, I had to look at him like a sick individual that he couldn't help doing what was he was doing based on the story he had. Because, see, his mom left him at the bootleggers when he was born. And the people down the street took him in. Right? And he's native. And he grew up hating everybody and everything. He, uh, like, his story is horrific. When I look at my he had a life track, life uh, evangelist and all that. He was he, sober. He was probably one of the most craziest sober people I ever met in my life. I used to have a set of shoes at the front door, a set of shoes at the back door. He never experienced this on a level that, that we experience here. But he did. He was sober. So what happens was, and he was a good man in the community, and he died before his 40th birthday. I mean, uh, 40th uh, year of sobriety. So what the significance of that is, that he had throat cancer, and I went and visited him on a constant basis. This one time he said something, I wasn't spiritually fit, and he said something to me, and I turned to him and I said, you want to try me now? I said, I'm not a kid, and I realized what I did. I went, oh, my God, because that voice and that 
thing would reoccur every once in a while. When I was spiritually fit, I was able to pray and keep it away from me. That moment, I turned to him and I said, you want to try me now? And he's sitting there with cancer dying. And I realized what I did. And what I did was something that may not make sense to you. But I got down beside my father and I, and I hung him and I asked him for forgiveness for the way I was acting there. And my inability to be free of the things that I was still carrying. That was a really pivoting moment for me because I love my dad. Because of him, my life took on a whole me new meaning. I knew that if I didn't meet my dad, I would have died an alcoholic death. That he got sober to intervene in my life to give me the life that I have today. So when you can kind of look at life like that, it's pretty wild. So when my dad passed away and I was doing my lines with him, it was a long living amend. Years. Because he was a mean son of a bitch. Sober. He was just something the matter with him. Like he wasn't fundamentally right in his head. But I knew that about him and I was able to pray and change us. Like we're fishing. He's dying in cancer. He's got another year to live. We're out on one. I, I pay money to go fishing with my dad. Anybody? You think it's a nice fantasy. Every, I'm going to go fishing with my dad. Isn't this wonderful? 50 years old and I'm going to go fish with my dad. What a dream. The dream of my lifetime. I get on a plane. I fly to Toronto. I drive eight hours to where the cabin is. I get out on the boat with him. He can't talk because he's dying, right? So I go, hey, this fishing rod don't work well. Can I have one of those good fishing rods? You got four fishing rods there. He goes, no. I said, this one sucks. He goes, yeah. I said, let me use that one. He says, I said, how come? He goes, And I thought, you miserable bastard. <laughs> I said, you do realize I paid money to come here for this experience to fish with you. And he went. And then the other part of me said, well, you do realize you'll be dead this time next year and I'll have all your fishing gear. <laughs> See, I thought that, but I didn't do it. But I took that moment, to and he made it horrific, but I didn't allow that to change my moment with him. Does that kind of make sense? Because of my attachment, I was able to pray, redirect that energy, and I just loved him. And the week he died, I spent two weeks with him administering medication to him privately. Me and him, privately. I've been in other situations with other people where other things have turned out different. I was private with him. And as I talked to him, I talked to him about what he did and the impact he had on my life back then and how many years it took me to, to get to a place where I am. And I'm talking to him because he can't talk back. He's in a coma. And I said, I'm asking God for the strength to love you in a way that you weren't able to love me. Because I said, normally I'd put a pillow over your head and nobody would know but me and you. I'd make you pay for the demise that you caused me because you need me right now. You need me as much as I needed you when I was an infant and I was helpless lying there. And what the difference between me and you is I have a gift and I have the grace to allow to love you in spite of what you did to me. Mm -hmm. I was pretty wild and I spoke at his memorial and I thanked him for the experience of having known him. Being a better man for having known him. Because he passed the gift of AA to me even though I didn't know what that gift was. It took 11 years before a member of AA carried this message to me. And that's what I did in 8 and 9. I found peace in that. But I still carried the 6. Because those memories and those things would come back and I'd have to pray to put them back in order. Does that kind of make sense? But it got right size that when he needed me the most, I was able to show up and be the son that I would never have ever been without Alcoholics Anonymous. That's deep stuff when you kind of look at That's what's available here. I'm not capable of that shift. Because I've made every person pay who's ever done anything to me. From a young age, I, years anticipating, calculating, can I take them now? Can I take them now? And I waited, and I waited. People, those three people that beat the living crap out of me, 16, two of them were in a room at my mom's place talking to me, and my, my, the, my mom's boyfriend said, hey, let Tony give you a ride. And she says, what, that little bastard? And I went to the door, and I locked it, and I turned around. I said, yeah, this little bastard. So remember what you did? And my mom, and they were all horrified because I was like eight and a half years old when that happened. I said, let's, let's make the odds even now. There's three of you and one of me. I'm 16 years old, right? And I locked the door. My mom stood up, and she went to defend him. I said, you sit down. Mind your own business. I said, you weren't there to defend me in the past, and you're not going to defend them now. And I said, if I were you, I wouldn't get in my way. That's deep-seated <laughs> resentment, eh? 
That's the way I used to govern. But now, when I do this thing, have a peace and a love with my mom is beyond anything you could ever imagine. Where did I get that stuff? I got that from the four. I found peace with me through connecting with a power that I didn't understand, doing a recipe that didn't make any sense. Because this stuff used to eat my lunch, right? And what happens in 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 is... Now I get to see how God shows up in my life. And where you really see God show up is in the ninth step. This is what determines your sobriety for the rest of your life. Honest to God. That's my experience. So two fast stories and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of break and we'll get into 10, 11 tomorrow. So as I'm doing these things, a lot of when I backed up, people in AA would tell me, you need to pray and ask God for whatever because the contract on page 6 to 3 talks about he'll provide everything I need if I'm willing to keep close to him, perform his work well. In the beginning, it was help me. I need help with this and this. People say, God, don't provide jobs. God provides me with everything I need. So I went to my brother one day. Remember I told you about the bikes. I'm newly sober. I can't get sober. I'm not some socially unacceptable. They want me to go for assessment. I came back from a meeting after talking to my sponsor. Rent's due next week. I'm not on welfare. I stopped doing things. I stopped doing organized. So I'm trying to live a whole new life. I've found God. Anyway, so I'm going nuts. So my brother goes, you know, rent's due next week. I said, it's okay. God just got this. He goes, oh, my God. He turns around, walks back into the house. And I believe God had this, right? So that night, I, I looked in the paper, which I've never done. I got a job. That I started the next day. I worked a week in construction, and I got paid the following Friday. I had enough for rent and car insurance. Saturday, I went to, went to work and got fired for threatening the foreman. Oh. But he provided all that I needed. <laughs> it may sound kind of weird, but I got what I needed. You know what I mean? And then other times, I've, I've kind of like, I don't know what's going to happen, whatever. And playing for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry it out, six and seven, praying for strength. And sometimes it's kind of like, you know, God, I need some direction here. When I was getting to DTs, I prayed, help me. I was going over the bridge. The Tires squeaking, and I said, God, everything stopped. I went home, went to bed, and it went away. Got up the next day, wee, 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 and it started again, but I got relief from it. So one time I walked downstairs. My brother said, hey, can you do me a favor and go get my videos? I'll tell you how long ago that was, and return them for me. I said, oh, are you kidding? I said, I'm trying to find a job. Like, I really need to get work. Like, let, And then my, I phoned my sponsor, let him know my woes. He says, God's got you. Do you believe God's got you? I said, yeah, but I don't see how. I've been thinking all week, and I can't figure out how God's going to do this. Anybody ever do that? Ask God for something, try to figure out the whole week how he's going to do it? <laughs> I return the videos. I walk downstairs. The phone rings. As I'm walking, I answer the phone. Hey, is, is your brother there? And I said, no, he's not here. He says, well, this is LNS. Say, we're looking for welders. He says, you wouldn't happen to be a carpenter, would you? I said, yeah, I am. Why? He says, can you start tomorrow? <laughs> Union job, LNS, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? I started a job that I didn't even apply for. Got it from a situation where I was trying to help somebody else, right? Then I got into a car accident, like, as a result of a lot of different things. Because it seems like my life goes to crap when I take over. I don't know if anybody's experienced that. <laughs> I'm so thankful to God for everything in the beginning. And then I start, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm counting my paychecks. I'm not living in the moment anymore. Everything's, and then something would happen. I don't know if God does it. But God says, oh, you're doing great here. Let me step back. Yeah. Let me see how good you're doing. And then I show up. Yeah. And then shh. Catastrophe happens. My first sponsor got me a button. It says, S happens. You ever see those buttons? Everywhere I went, stuff was happening all the time because of my energy, right? So it, it was kind of, as I was going through my nines, I seen how God was showing up in all these different ways, these coincidences, this power, these opportunities. My needs were being met beyond anything I could ever imagine. So I went back to uh, Montreal to go visit these people that I know that didn't like me or want me or want anything to do with me, but I had to go back and make amends because I'd crash weddings and Christmas parties. I'd show up in blackouts and do horrific things while I was there. And it got to a point where they would have family reunions or weddings and say, don't tell Tony. Don't tell him where we're getting together. Don't tell him where the events are. And everybody was okay with that. So now I'm going back to Montreal. I'm taking the bus from here to Montreal because I can't take a plane because I still have warrants for this other stuff. But I need to make peace with my family. So they told me when you get on the bus back then is don't sit in the back, sit up front. You know what happens in the back of the bus. And they said, every time you get to a bus depot, ask over the PA if there's any friends of Bill W. Right? And that way you can have a mini meeting in between stops. 
I take a bus from here all the way there. I'm listening to tapes, you know, cassette tapes, to give you a rough idea. I'm reading the grapevine. I'm reading my big book. I'm talking to God. And as it got closer to the place, I started going to God. You said you would look after me. I have those talks with God back then, right? I said, you said you'd look after me. You have a promise on page 63. You're not fulfilling your end of it. I'm not finding this funny at all. I said, you're dropping your ball. I'm talking to God like this. I'm on the last part of the, the journey from, from it was uh, North Bay to Quebec, the last part of the bus trip. I'm getting closer to Quebec, and the anxiety is coming higher in me. And I'm talking to God now. I'm getting more like you're letting me down. I can't believe it. You said blah, 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 blah. And like I'm kind of ranting inside of myself. Anybody ever do that? And I'm screaming, this lady goes, you okay? Like she gives me a she goes, you okay? And I said, yeah, I said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. You ever see boxers that got almost knocked out? Yeah, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm good. So I say, I'm good. She goes, she goes uh, I said, uh, yeah, I'm going to go visit these people. I haven't seen them in a long time. I think it's been 10 or 15 years at this time. And I haven't seen them. Last time I seen them, it was pretty horrific. I'm going to go back to clear up some stuff in my past. She says, you know, I had to do the same thing. She says, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous for the last 20 years. I went, ha, ha, ha. Funny guy. See, when I learned through this process, God was there all the time, but I couldn't see him because I was too entrapped in myself. Provide all that I need. Here's a lady. What are the odds? A lady of Alcoholics Anonymous, 20 years sober, sitting with me at the last journey of, of that ride. It's ironic. Yeah. See, in that moment, what carries me in all my other dark moments. And so now with this moment and all that seeking power, it kind of kind of goes, wow, there's something to this. And so as I go through this, more, more weird stuff happens, stuff that I can't put my finger on. It's stuff beyond anything I could ever imagine. So in 11, I'm asking in my morning meditation, what amends do you want me to take care of? I'm praying for direction from him on what I need to take care of. People are showing up. Things are starting to happen beyond my comprehension. So we talk about here when I had to go turn myself in, I was about a year and a half sober. And the people in my home group said I had to go do it. I'm two years out here. I'm a year and a half actually sober. And I'm going to go turn myself in. And, and I got a lawyer prepared. And everybody got ready for me. I'm looking at penitentiary time. And it was kind of like I'm going to go face this thing because it's eating my lunch for me. And I just can't afford for this not to happen. So I go to Toronto. I turn myself in. I got a lawyer. And they're denying me on bail on everything. Right, and so what happens is I'm going to back to city hall. Uh, they, they give me bail on some charges and deny me another charges. While I was in jail, I never felt more freer. People was asking me what I was doing in jail. They're going, "What are you doing here?" It says you're like a big bulb, light bulb in this place, man. I was and I was in the drug cells at that time and sit in the in the dawn. I don't know if anybody had the pleasure of being there in the holding cells, right? So I'm going back and forth to City Hall to give me bail. And, all, and while I'm praying, I'm praying for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. I'm not praying for knowledge of my will for him and the power for him to carry that out. I'm not praying for things. I'm praying about things. And while I was in there, I was 12-stepping guys, praying for the strength. I said, if this is your will for me, give me the faith to allow me to live it. And what happens, I ended up getting bail. And I came out here to sign on my own reconnaissance, which was unheard of with the John Howard Society. I was supposed to check in once a week. Physically, because of the association and all that stuff, the people who were going to give me bail, the gang association, wanted to give testimony why they didn't want me on the streets anymore, why they wanted to deny me bail. I got bail. Not only that, I was allowed to come back and live in B.C. to set trial date. I went back to set trial date, and I sat with my lawyer. I happened to meet a lawyer because a guy that I met to go see my sister when I did this gave me a card. He died shortly afterwards, but I passed, passed with him. And it was like God's operator saying, here, give him the card. He gave me the card. I phoned this lawyer. This lawyer was coming, the chief prosecutor for the Toronto area. He was in with everybody. He heard my case. It was a charter of rights case, and he told the judge and everybody about it. When I went back to trial, I went in. The, the, uh, the gang squad and, and the drug division was involved. There was about 10 cops there to give testimony because we're under surveillance for about six months for the stuff that we're involved in. They wanted to give testimony on my case to present the uh, of the conviction. My lawyer said, come in here right now. I went in. He said, plead guilty. I said, I plead guilty. He says, now go. I said, what? He says, this, you got a $500 fine for failing to appear. All of the charges have been dropped based on the charter of rights and the entrapment and everything that happened. 
the same lawyer with that situation before I went out there in 80, in 86, when I came out here in 87, says I was looking at penitentiary time because I was going to take fall for the whole group of people I was involved in. I was a fall guy for everybody. And that was the best sentence he could give me was two years plus a day. This lawyer says, I don't know what you've been doing. He says, I've never seen anything like this in my life. He says, you must be kissing angels. He says, I don't know what's going on with you, but you better hang on to it. The lawyer, there's something that happened because what the people told me was, you're serving a power greater than any power you'll stand before. These people don't determine your life. God does. Trust God, clean house, and help others. And we'll get together tomorrow for 11. Okay, Sunday morning. This is going to be the spiritual part of it. Uh, I'm an alcoholic. My name's Tony. We're going to do a couple summary. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of information. Eh? A whole lot of stuff. Like 29 years experience and application with this thing. So if you're kind of new, you pick up on, as you go along. You'll kind of go, oh yeah, oh yeah. So the sheets are designed that you go right from the start. You read three pages and you see what you get out of the book and then the sheets are designed to show you what they're hoping you get out of the book which is usually two conversations and here's a hint if it asks you a question the answer is in the book if you can't find it on the page it's located on right then you're looking for the wrong answer most of us are looking for the answer we think it says and we go through the book until we find our answer that's not the way it works you kind of go through uh, this is the answer that goes with this and sometimes it'll ask you a question on what you just wrote, do you understand the basis of it? So, I'm going to do, I was, I was kind of meditating this morning how to kind of look at this thing. We're kind of looking at 10 and 11. This is my kind of, a lot of people get upset with the way I do the steps, right? This is my experience through the book. This is the way I do the big book studies in Vancouver. This is the way I teach this. Because it, it seems to lead toward more, less self-reliance and more spiritual-based recovery. Right, because remember we talked about <clears throat> earlier in the book, it warned us, or kind of didn't warn us, it told us one of our biggest problems is self-reliance. Right? And we don't really know we're in it most of the time until usually pain is associated with the idea of me running my show. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that, but when you're in charge, it becomes very evident really fast that things don't go well and people don't treat you right and the world isn't doing blah, blah, blah. <coughs> And then you start turning on everybody around you, and then you start turning on yourself. I don't know if anybody ever experienced that. Anybody experienced the opposite of a resentment here? You know what the opposite <laughs> of a resentment is? Self-pity. Right? And so the, the steps are designed in such a way when we kind of go through this. I'll give you a fast overview of how I, I, I do this process now. And the process is always bringing you back to source. Right? It always brings you back to the moment. And we talked about the source being where? Within. And the book's very specific about that, but a lot of you, if, if you've been through a lot of treatment centers, and there's nothing wrong with that stuff, but they give you an overall view of your life, and you kind of come to your own analysis of what your problem is, and then you seek what kind of help you need. About maybe 10% of the people that go through treatment are real alcoholics, right, that need a spiritual answer for their problem. A big percent of them just could do behavior modification, stay away from the first drink, apply a bit of prayer, a bit of spiritual, but they're very still self-reliant, right? They don't need it at the depth. So it's like a person that don't know how to swim. How, how much do you think they'll hang on to a life jacket compared to a person that knows how to swim somewhat? Yeah, so that's like the difference in recovery. I'm never going to learn how to swim sufficient enough to be able to sustain my own life without that life jacket. But it's no longer a life jacket. It's just a part of, of what I wear, and it keeps me buoyant, and it keeps everything good. Every once in a while, I think I watch everybody swimming without one, and I think I can leave it on shore today. And I find out really fast that I don't, still don't know how to swim. <laughs> when I get, I'm good till the water gets about here, right? <laughs> I, I, you know, you can always tell a room, full, a pool full of alcoholics that can't swim. They're okay with the water up to here, but you hear a whisper, "Don't make waves," <laughs> and that's kind of like our recovery, right? So when I went through this, step one time, it gave you the problem from their understanding. Because I didn't understand what the problem was. I knew, but I was afflicted by it, right? It was like something serious. Then they gave us the solution to that problem, right? Which is spiritual nature. Then they asked us to make a decision which way we wanted to go on that. Is that kind of yes, no? Yes. Right? So all this here we see is all information. There's no change in these first three steps. 
if you're under the impression there's change in these three steps, then the rest of the steps have no purpose. A lot of us like to believe there's step, like there's steps, in, there's change in the first three steps. Then we delude ourselves into believing I got something by doing nothing. Because it could give you a really good feeling when you pray and there's hope. You ever notice that? There's like three, three guys are in a boat after a shipwreck. They've been out in the ocean for four or five days and the food's gone. Their lips are starting to crack. Life looks hopeless. And then somebody says, you know, what do we need? We need somebody to see us to save us, right? That, that's kind of like we see the, our predicament. I need somebody to save me from my fate that, that awaits me. Then you see another boat. How would you feel seeing that boat? Excited. Yeah, we're saved. We're saved. Less the alcoholic and addict talking to each other. We go, yay, yay, right? The normal person says, they don't know we're here yet. <laughs> I think they're in the distance. <laughs> we're not in the boat yet, right? So let's make a decision to get to the boat or get them to notice us and go through a course of action to get us to the boat. That's why they use that analysis. Well, after shipwreck, right? Abandon. They use words like that to move from one vessel or one direction into another direction. It actually takes work to do that. A lot of us stay on the Titanic thinking we're on a different vessel, right? Because I'm on a different floor, the view's different. Like I've come to a meeting and I think alcoholism has stayed at the door because I've come to a meeting. My old life is back there. I've started a new life because I'm in a meeting. That's still prolonging the inevitable because if I don't have this psychic change or spiritual experience, what's my fate? How many people has relapsed here? Right? So it's really hard to well, look at everything I did, and this was the result of it. So that's so like like I didn't like this, but it's the truth. All I did was shift floors on the Titanic. I got a better room, a better room, my life improved, but I was still on the Titanic. Right? And I wasn't able to see my predicament because I fully didn't understand what was going on. Right? And so in order to save us, I had to actually take and get on a vessel and go to another boat. And that's what kind of like the steps are. It brings me to a different vessel, right? And then a part of me with addiction will go, hey, I left my watch over there. Mm -hmm. I'll get back in the boat without realizing, go back to the Titanic to save my watch. But anyways, <laughs> so we find out here. And then four, I find out, once I make this decision to live by spiritual principles that I learned in step two, I learned all the things about me what my life looks like on a non-spiritual basis. So I, got, I swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about myself. All the stuff that I carry, all the boulders, all the rocks, all the pain, all the association. And it's pretty hard to see it when you're associated with it, but if you ever owned a car or if you ever damaged somebody's car, if you ever had an ex that scratched up your car, Right when you're in the house, you don't think about it. You go outside and you see the big scratch mark along the car. You go, ah, the accident re re rearranges you back to the problem, right? And so that's what a lot of our lives are like at a subconscious level. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening that we can't see, feel, and touch. But by the time we get the memo, the decision is already made. You ever notice you always come to in thought? You don't go into thought? You're already engaged in it, that anger, that resentment, that old situation, reliving, refeeling, rehashing old situation, that you're in the movie when you become aware of it. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Anybody ever drive for blocks and realize you don't know what the lights were for the last? You ever watch a TV show, the commercial comes on, you forget what you're watching? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's this thing. So we, we have a lot, lot of absence from the moment because of the trapment of the things we're still attached to. So every single thing that comes up in my fourth, that's why they say, just make a list of whatever comes to mind. Because we want to analyze it before we put the list down. We want to associate it with something in the past that this is why it is. And they never ask you to figure out why you have these things. I said, make a list. And as you make this huge list, all these things come to the surface. Like boiling. <coughs> it's like kind of boiling gold, right? You don't see the impurities until you add heat to it. And then all the impurities will come to the top. And that's what we're kind of doing here. When you sit in meditation... It's amazing when we talked about different things this week and how many people's minds went to different places. Oh, yeah, different times. Right, different times, different places, and you're in that moment again. And the world's happening around you, and there you are in that moment. Or you're projecting into the future, projecting into the past, the inability to say here. You created argument. Anybody? Anybody argue with some of the information? I know it's hard to believe, but anybody argue with any of the information to have kind of reservations or became the critic or became the defendant of your own information? bucking against the information you're hearing? 
Anybody feel their energy shifting this weekend in different locations? When you got here, did you feel the resistance to what was happening? Yeah, you're kind of way back here, and then as the weekend went on, you're going, oh, it's safe, let's get them around. And you became, Whoo. right? And then you hear something, ah, no, no, <laughs> no. So it all attaches to here at a subconscious level. They, they kind of made that, that kind of um, clarification when they were talking on page 62. Right? Did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? Right? And then they made that clarification of the idea of that in page 54. They, they talked about, did not these feelings, after all, determine our existence? And so they give you examples of these feelings for a friend or stuff like that. So you notice when you look at a picture, that picture is in the present. But it could bring you back to a moment in the past and be a good or bad. It will bring up all that stuff. Where is that stuff? That stuff is there. It's attached. We're still attached to it in some form or another, and it presents itself all the time. So for us, a normal person will have about that much. For us, we have the whole wall full. And this stuff's eating our lunch for us all the time. So when we do our fourth, 90% of that stuff subsides because we, we have a way of dealing. We learn how to master resentment. We learn how to outgrow fear. We have the right idea for our future sex conduct. When the resentment's come to mind or these resentments against other people we do the application of the prayers and assessment in what we learned in the four that's the purpose of it it's the mechanics of learning a new inventory process into assessing me to a better life to remove the things in me that caused my failure right so i know what those things are now because my inventory is me it's what i look like we all use the same inventory but your business may be different than mine does that kind of make sense so I don't fool myself about value anymore and I don't make excuses for these things. I have a clear understanding where they come from, why I have them, and why I still carry them. So when I did my fifth, a big part of that stuff went. And then when, by the time I got to my fifth step, what I had was more clarity, not only of myself, but the best, the whole purpose of this thing was, what was the whole purpose of this exercise from here to here? What's the purpose of the exercise? To get my connection. Yeah. <laughs> Boom, high five. Somebody high five that guy. <laughs> Got a book yesterday. He's running a meeting today. That's awesome. <laughs> I told you not to give him the book till he left. <laughs> He's reading passage. That don't look hard. <laughs> Today, we got a facilitator for next year, people. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's awesome, man. When he first got here, he was looking at us all, don't even look at me. <laughs> Today, he's like, hey, spirituality. <laughs> That's the beauty of this thing, man. I love you. That's great. <laughs> hey? Sponsoring tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, surprisingly, from the new guy. <laughs> All the old people was like, I'm not too sure. <laughs> yes, to get your own connection. It's important to get your own connection, the source from within. That's why in We Agnostics it says, it's only there it can be found, not anywhere else. So it takes away from that idea, it could be whatever you want. Your conception could be whatever you want, but it has to be connected to power. It has to be connected to the power source. You can plug whatever you want in there, but you need connection to the power. That's what they're talking about. That this, this. So I have this, this beacon or this safety or refuge within inside of myself. Remember in the fourth where they talk about matching calamity with serenity. I need to find safe haven within myself to be able to shield myself from the world and all the things that happen to it. Right? It's like that. Remember that that poem I remember reading for years. Never got it. The guy taught, it was written in eighteen. 36 or some go hastily about the haste and the noise. Mm -hmm. Me, sure huh? uh, yeah, and I'm reading it. I think, I'm thinking, what noise? What noise would be happening in 1813? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, th I'm thinking, like, I'm new. I'm thinking, what noise? And my sponsor goes, The noise in your mind. I said, Oh, you mean the band and the riot and the concert going on? Yeah, the, the, the noise. I said, Fine, peace. So we have this connection, and then in six and seven. We see the things that we're still hanging on to. But they don't become as clear as when you start going along in your sobriety. They become more clear. Oh, my, this thing's coming up again. Hmm, there's attachment to that. Isn't that funny? 
I'm great with my mom, my brother, my sister until they remind me of something. And then I remember the pain, right? And then, or all the, uh, make, you ever talk about all the people you forgive? You haven't forgiven them. <laughs> you ever hear people, I like to talk about forgiveness and this person for this and that person for that. And, or, 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 yeah, there's still attachment to it. And it's funny, and I was a year sober before I realized that. Like, I was married, and I said, there's still attachment. I talk about forgiveness, but yet there's still energy tied to it, right? And I thought, isn't that interesting what they talk about in six, this, this, this one of these things that I'm bringing forward? Because <laughs> I'm trying to have a new experience here, but there's an attachment. See, there's these events that happened in my past. They're just events. The only thing that, that causes them problems today is some emotional attachment, you know, it's like getting your chain or something caught on something. You re don't realize how thin that thread is, but it seems to cause a lot of problems, right? Until you, and that's what we are emotionally to a lot of this stuff. And some days you're unaware of it because you're not in that area of your life or that or, or your consciousness. So, like an example, my wife, uh, and this goes with nine, ten, and eleven. This is the whole process going through, and you see how eleven and then twelve. So as we go through this. So this event, the, the recipe, I've learned all the way through this. So the steps turn into, what's that thing? Principles. What are the principles? Step one now becomes, what is the problem? But this time you assess what the problem is. Right? Then step two is, what is the spiritual solution to this problem? Right? Step three is, am I going to take action on this? Am I going to take spiritual action on this to make... Uh, uh, a spiritual solution come about, or am I going to take action on this to make something happen? Nobody like that in here, right? It's like, God obviously brought this to my attention to take care of this. I'll take it from here, right, Renee? <laughs> and we do that, don't we? How many people? Yeah, if there's a problem, I'll take it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it to turn out that way, <laughs> right? And here we're saying we're going to bring God into it. That's what my sponsor always tells me. He says, oh, how's it going? Tell so good. He says, um, where's God in this? I said, what do you mean where God is, is, is in this? So I realized there's a lot of areas in my life where they talk about 11, so through prayer and meditation, where they ask me if you look at the mechanics of that, it says all through the day. How many times during the day do I stop, pause, or stop, drop, and roll? <laughs> you call it, right? I'm on fire. <laughs> right? Stop. Pause, pray, and redirect. Hmm, 29 years sober, I would say I'm at a good 30%. That's, that's being honest. Because why I said the other 70%, I'm still thinking of the odd thing of the past that resurfaces. Or I'm 40% in the future or taking care of problems in the present that have nothing to do with what's happening. So if I'm in those areas, who's sitting up front? Who's, who's powering my bus? Ooh, I am. See, we get the other, who's driving your bus? We're the drivers of our bus. Oh, yeah. We drive the bus. God powers it. God gave us free will. We get to punch in the GPS where we're going now. We have the coordinates for a spiritual answer. right? So back in step three, I didn't know what was going on. But I know God is kind of taking, or this power, this source, if I'm connected to it, my life is going to be far better than anything I could ever imagine, plan, or design on my own. Because I see what my life looks like left to my own devices. Does that kind of make sense? And it's like being married. I've seen the benefit of being married to the woman I'm with. She's, she's the most amazing person I ever met in my life. I couldn't see my life without her. And when I'm in harmony with my wife, our relationship is fantastic. When I start thinking I'm entitled to more of the money than, than's coming in, or I should be doing what I want to do when I want to do it, how do you think our relationship goes? If I just talk to her in the morning, good morning, honey, and then expect a little something at night without doing nothing during the day or nothing all week, how do you think that relationship, how long that relationship going to last? So if it's just a one-sided relationship, it's not going to be very beneficial. But when I get in harmony with my wife, we were just connected in a way that goes... And that's kind of like this relationship with the power of greater than It becomes personal to me. It's a marriage. And it's kind of like, I know when I'm not connected. 
Because when the symptoms come up, where we talk about, which we classify as a problem, and we try to work on a problem, that's like me having a, um, a pain in my tooth and just taking Tylenol for my tooth. That doesn't fix the problem. It matters. So the selfishness and consideration and dishonesty is not the problem. There's an underlying surface to that. That means one of my instincts are being interfered with. We talk about self-esteem. Will anybody talk about self-esteem here? Why do I have self-esteem problems? Well, because it's usually associated with my social instinct or my ambitions or my security and a perceived threat to one of those things or mind reading. Anybody do mind reading here? But it connects to one of my instincts that I learned about in the fourth step that creates the unmanageability. So that's a little light that comes up on the dash saying there's an underlying problem. Servicing needed. You ever drive a car and the light comes on? When those defects of character arise, selfishness and consideration, we don't really see it because it causes discomfort. We have to step back and say, oh, there's a problem here. Hmm, not, a little, not happy with the wife today. Didn't give me the recognition. I'm not happy with the boss. He doesn't appreciate me. But the problem's not with them. Now I need to back up further. What I learned in my fourth, uh, it's here, my social instinct. There's a fear about the ambitions. There's a fear and security. I have a problem over here. I didn't recognize that. I ignored it. And it's showing up over here. Because most of us are putting pro fires out over here. And there's no problem here. The problem's over there. And the four-step inventory that I learned to take into 10 and 11 teaches me how to correct this thing before it becomes a problem again, right? And so that's why we talk about when we get to step 10, it talks about continue. And a lot of people get, mm, this is a good one. You could do this on your own. All the action steps say action in front of it. And then there's preparation steps and transition steps, right? These are preparation steps of information. No change or action is required in those. Right? Four, is it an action step? Five, is it an action step? Six, is it an action step? No. Preparation step. Step seven, is it an action step? Preparation step. Eight. Right? Make a list. Do assessment nine. Ten. It's a preparation step because you're continuing to do something you've already been doing. It's getting you ready for the next preparation step. You're already doing these things as suggested in step 10 because you learned them how to do it in 4, 5, 6, and 7. Well, what makes you say that? Glad you asked. Okay, so here we go. So what we talk about here is when we get to this page, they, they talk about 786... They talk about the purpose of this, and we'd miss it because what's our first obsession? No, Self. We're always doing this. I don't know why. It's just a part of the thing we need to be aware of. And, and the indicators are these lights that come up on a dash. We need to be able to see the lights because we can't see the underlying stuff. We can't see it. I don't know why that is. We just are not aware of it. So by the time we get the memo, we got to say, where's the memo coming from? Where's this thing coming from? We got to get back down into what's happening at a subconscious level. What part of instinct, what part of self. Then we see it's connected to our spiritual condition. So life becomes like this. When I'm spiritually right, my problems become less. Right? I'm more present, more enjoying, more energy. You notice when like, the clouds, wow, man, what a day. Huh? You ever have those days? You're connected, you're in a moment, you're watching your feet click on the ground. It's like, woo, probably just got paid. You're going to go meet a chick. Yeah. Way before I was married, honey. <laughs> got to get, but you know what I mean? These circumstances make you present and it's like everything not a care in the world. You ever have those moments? You notice the, the, the uh, whatever, you notice everything, just in tune there, how green everything is. And then when you're not spiritually well, Right? Self starts showing up, and as you become spiritually depleted, what else starts happening? Worry, anxiety, anticipation, impending doom, calamity, self talk, problem solving with stuff that's not even happening, being prepared, rehashing things from the past that has nothing to do with the future, taking thing, care of things in the. <clears throat> right? So, what happens is, that tells me I'm starting to be spiritually unfit and I'm becoming more instinctual based. Right? 
And so I need to be able to see those cues because my cell phone tell me that. Cell phone go, hey, you're becoming instinctual obey. It's time to back up, relax, and pray. My mind's not designed that way. When I become spiritually unfit, my mind and instincts are designed to think and take care of things more. I become more problematic. Anybody ever experienced that stuff? So they talk about here, they talk about which is really cool, and I'm just going to go through this really fast. You can go through it yourself. Remember what I said earlier. This is what I learned after 29 years of doing this. I never learned this process when I first did it. What I learned when I first did it was it, it was a behavioral modification, self-analysis, self-fixing process. I learned that when you seen there was a problem, then you bring God into it, and then you talk to another human being. Right? So that's what I learned. And most of us learn that, right? Just go through the day, focus on you, and when, there's a, when you think there's a problem, then pray about it. Well, what we consider a problem, what is a problem, is two different things. What most people consider a problem is there's a little fire outside their house. We don't consider that a problem. We consider when my house is on fire, that's a problem. Or I broke my shoelace, the, 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 you know, depending on the severity of the situation, right? We're, we're, the, we're, we're the type of people that trip over molehills and start digging off mountains, right? Like, we're just kind of funny people. Okay. So they talk about the promises, right? And the best part about the promises is that they're all internal. They're not external. You will know a new freedom, a new freedom and a new happiness. You will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. You're neutral with this stuff. When, 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 it, when it resurfaces, there's no attachment to it. It's just a story, right? It's like a rerun on TV. You know what you're suspecting. There's no big, ah, as it was the first time, right? The, the, the thrill is coming. Like, and then there comes a time where I don't even want to watch the movie anymore, but I'll discuss it with you if you need reference to it. See how my past can benefit others. It's pretty cool, right? It's the same thing, right? And then they talk about the main part. You'll suddenly realize. To suddenly realize means that I've been living in it. I su- I'll suddenly realize that God has been doing for me what I couldn't do for me. All of- that means way back here, something started to happen, or the first time I said, God, help, or to the universe, there's got to be something different. Something started happening without me realizing it. And here you are sitting in a meeting, right, with a big book, doing facilitating next year. <laughs> right? Four days of sobriety. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> but, you know. but that's the way it works, right? The, the chain of events start coming into sequence beyond our capable ability of seeing it and when we see it we go whoa that's wild and here we we started talking about in step two things beyond anything we could ever imagine it gives us a, a, a scope of something that we really don't recognize of how <laughs> profound it is that what they're making a claim to in step two the doctor made a claim to that he talked about and this is the way these guys explained it to me and i was kind of going well i get goosebumps thinking about that conversation back then that I had, and I thought they were nuts. So tell me you're going to think I'm nuts. But I never forgot the conversation. 29 years later, I know what they told me back then is true, every part of it. Even though I couldn't understand it then, I don't fully understand it now, but I, I cling to it because my life depends on it. It's pretty wild. And I'll get into a couple of those stories, right? So they talk about, well, suddenly realize that God is doing this. So in step two, they tell us something that we don't really make a lot of pause to think about. A change in our psyche sufficient enough for us to recover from the illness that's killing us. A total rearrangement in our thinking. Science hasn't been able to do that on the level we need to recreate people's lives. They've tried shock treatment. They've tried lobotomy. they tried medication to subside. But never to recreate it on the level that they talk about where the doctor witnesses something's happened to these people beyond our understanding. To me, these occurrences are a phenomena, but they've been happening. We don't know how to explain it. It's outside of our, our realm of expertise. We can't explain it, but they're happening. There's the evidence of this thing. Alcoholics Anonymous is the evidence of this thing, that something happens beyond our capable, a total psychic change. When you think about the ability to tap into something that rearranges your whole thinking process, that's pretty wild when you think about that, allowing you to recover from an illness that's killing you. And, and this side of it is kind of like, we don't even, it just kind of goes zzz by the screen. We don't realize the severity of it. It's like, if you didn't know, like you hear that, that uh, uh, tsunami horn going off, you never heard it before, you kind of go, ah, not a big deal. 
There must be a malfunction with it. But it's letting you know, man, there's something coming beyond understanding. I don't know if you've ever seen a tsunami hit an island. But if you've seen a tsunami hit an island and you heard that bell going off, you like when I go to these islands, I know where's the high ground. I don't know. My brain's always like, I want to know how to get out of here. Like, like walking in a room and everybody know where the exits are. You look like that crowd. <laughs> Take turns sitting up against the wall. Right? <laughs> you know, where's the exit? Lock the door. Listen for footprints and, and footsteps. Anyways, so we'll suddenly realize that God's doing for us what we could not do. For, are these astronomical the promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us. Sometimes quickly. Sometimes slowly. They'll always materialize if we work for them. Practicing these principles. The more I practice these principles, become God-reliant or energy-reliant or uh, energy-source-based, um, uh, whatever you want to look at it, more f- tuned into the frequency of self, right? Because we have frequencies within inside of ourselves now, on energy. You ever notice when you're not feeling well, you're at a really low frequency inside of yourself? It's like, whoa, like just, uh. You ever notice that? And then when you're feeling really good, like you're charged, it's like your whole being just becomes energized. And your frequency inside is just like really, really cool. So that's what I call, I call God's spirit or that frequency of, that makes us human, right? I try to watch the gauging of the energy. You ever notice when you have a problem, the anxiety starts or when you're pissed off, it's like the explosion starts to build, the fight or flight. We're creating all this stuff by what we focus or attach to. Right? If I started talking a nice story about, you know, this thing, everybody, oh, yeah. And then if I started talking about a story that resonated anger and pain. You ever watch the news? Yeah. You know, before you watch the news, you're kind of doing all right. Halfway through the news, my wife goes, you got to stop watching that. <laughs> you know, you're screaming at the TV. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I get Tourette's going on halfway through the month. She goes, why do you do that to yourself? Because I want to know what's going on. <laughs> Anyways, I try not to do it to myself. Okay, so this thought, this thought brings us to step 10, that we could build and continue to develop these things that we've been experiencing all along here. We got tasters of it. It kind of is like, yeah, you know what? I could see... The benefit of having more of this. Does that kind of make sense? Because if I don't develop this thing, I'm going back to where I came from. It will happen automatically. So I need to find freedom, happiness, peace, and a way of life beyond anything I could ever imagine. And you listen to most people who've been sober a while that have this. They talk the life they've been given here is far greater than anything they could ever expect it. Right? Far beyond anything they could ever. So they get kind of like the story or the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this thought system was suggest we continue. Continue to mean what? Continue. If you're getting, a, if you're going to a friend's place you've never been before, and he says, "Look, take this one." I'm calling to Renee's place. GPS. Continue. My GPS says continue along, and then when I when it's going to give me a new instruction, it'll say prepare to turn right. Right. So this is saying continue. So that means continue to develop the spiritual connection that I've had all the way along. Right? Continue to look at my eight, continue to look at my nine, continue to watch for the things that I'm still attached to when they resurface that I'll pray for. Right? So, why? Because the steps don't talk about go back and do step six, go back and do step seven. It's like learning how to drive. Right? At first, you say, this is a signal, this is a thing that you learn all the gate, everything, right? And it's awkward, right? And then whoever teaches it, signal, oh yeah, step six, signal, step five. And then after you kind of put it together and you see the purpose of putting all those things together is to drive effectively safe and with purpose, right? And it's kind of like, and not to gate, not to concentrate on the, the mechanics of what you're doing, but to enjoy what you're doing. Somewhere along the line, we think the steps are the purpose or the mechanics, uh, um, the design. The steps are not the experience, they're the vehicle. The experience is on the way up here, the mountains, the road, the people, the scenery, the cigar, my speaker tape, no, <laughs> just, I'm just joking. <laughs> speaker tapes that Renee gave me and stuff like that. I'm enjoying everything, but if I'm concentrating on the mechanics of it, am I gonna be enjoying the ride? 
Am I going to be enjoying a trip? The person say, hey, did you see this, this glacier or the water coming off the rocks there? Did you see the snow? Did you see the deer? No. Why didn't you? Because I was concentrating on the steps. That's not the purpose of the steps. A lot of people talk about the steps are it. The steps are not it. The, the steps are not the experience. Everybody talks like the steps are the experience. The experience is not the steps. What you get from doing the steps is the experience. If I don't get this, the steps won't help me. If I just do the mechanics without the experience, it's, it's just like that poster going through puberty. I thought it wasn't the experience, <laughs> right? And then when I you know, find a mate, it's the experience. The kid, wow, I see the benefit of marriage and all that other stuff. Being alone and being, like, it's kind of like that, right? So here, they talk, continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. Where would this new mistake be taking place? First in myself, because we'll realize that most of the stuff that resurface all the time is still attached to my six. When I see a cop, nothing happening that day with the cop. Why would I feel that way about those police? Something attached to my past. My mom says this little something in a tone, right? My wife says a little something in a way that I feel a little snooty. Somebody doesn't look at me the right way. Is it because of stuff that's happening today? Or is it stuff that's still... So I kind of go, oh, why, why am I reacting? What's going on here? Right? Okay, so that's what they talk about. Set right any new mistakes as we go along. Because I already have a way of looking at this stuff. But if I don't stay spiritually fit, I'll go back to looking at things the way I used to. But I need my new attitude and my new way and my new relationship to stay to stay uh, uh, moving forward, right? So then they talk about here, we vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. That means I should be doing 10 and 11, right? As I clean up the past, I vigorously commence this way of living. As I'm cleaning up the past and doing my eights and nine, I'm doing my nines, I'll a lot of those old emotions connected with those people will resurface. That's why they talk about when these things crop up. Right? I'm still dealing with yesterday's stuff today. And I'm to correct it spiritually or mentally or emotionally today to be able to deal with them effectively. I have the mechanics. I'm doing that over here. Because I have the prayers. I'm learning how to master resentment. I'm learning how to outgrow fear. Outgrow fear doesn't mean I'm eliminated it. I'm living, like, to outgrow something means I have the ability to see past it. Right? You hear people say, oh, we don't have two emotions in the same house. Yes, we do. <coughs> right? I can have enough fear that used to cripple me. But through the application of these principles and accessing the source or power or spirit, whatever you want to call it, when I have the experience with it, I have the ability to move past that fear that used to cripple me. And sometimes just getting up off my chair to go do something is progress. Right? Where before my life used to cripple me, now, you know what? I'm going to get out of bed. I'm going to go to that meeting. I'm not going to be stagnant or crippled by my thinking and my emotions. I'm going to ask God for the right thing. My sponsor used to say in early sobriety, I'd be crippled by my life, right? And, and it's, you know, I never cleaned up. He says, stand up. So I said, what for? He says, just stand up. So I stand up. He says, now lean forward. Keep your feet straight and lean forward. I mean, he said, keep leaning, keep leaning. He says, I said, well, sorry. He says, what happened? I said, my foot moved by leaning forward too much. He says, good. Keep leaning forward and bring that stuff to a meeting. <laughs> I said, so, if you have a problem, just stand up. Keep your head moving forward till your feet engage, and then just keep going to a meeting, okay? You, 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 you bring that to us, and we'll help you reattach it, okay? That's our job. When we see you coming in, we'll see. <laughs> here we have another one. Okay. So here, here's the point. We have entered the world of the spirit. We have entered the world of the spirit. So they're telling us the whole purpose of this thing as a solution was to get connected with source power, right? That there was something beyond us or bigger than us. And then they talk about here becoming connected to that. And here this says we've entered the world of the spirit. Later on they talk about there's a fellowship of the spirit and then there's the fourth dimension, the energy source that creates life. This is my understanding. And when I'm connected to that, all remarkable things start to happen. That's what happened with Bill when he was in the hospital and Ebby showed up at his house. When Ebby was in the, in the courthouse and those two guys showed up to help him. 
Every one of us had somebody show up in our life to kind of give us direction that has us sitting here today. When you showed up here, there's people that came interested in you and your development. That's what I'm talking about. When you got connected to that source or that moment with inside of yourself, the rest of the world connected to allow you to be here. That's pretty cool, right? I read that. Yeah, you read that right on. Some guys have never even read that. For two days with the book. This guy says, anybody looking for a sponsor? <laughs> no, that's awesome, though. That, that's enthusiasm because when I got shown what was in here, my first five years, you could ask Alex or anybody that knew me, but I walked around with this book. Hey, do you know what's in here? They go, yes, we do, Tony. Remember, we kept the coffee on before you even got here. <laughs> hey, did you know it said this? Hey, did you know? Because I realized what was being available here was kind of like, Holy, so this is the lottery to life. This is, it talks about when mining, we have tapped into a dividend, which is an unlimited resource, right? So they talk about here, we've entered the world of our spirit. Our next function, what does that mean? Our next function, new instruction, right? Isn't it? Our next function? So they're giving us, what's our next function here? Our next function is growing understanding and effectiveness of what? <coughs> Of, no, of the world of the spirit. What connects me to everything and everybody. We've entered the world of the spirit. We're connected on an energy level. And when you start kind of looking, I've never seen that for years, right? We've entered the world of the spirit. So that gives me one idea. So this is my kind of, it's like, wow, because we are connected. In a way, you ever think about somebody and they phone you? Yeah. Weird stuff. You ever notice like some weird stuff when you're present and... and like this weird stuff. You hear everybody talks about this weird stuff happening. I was just down in there. I was doing my eights. And this person I haven't seen forever. Ask God, you know, when you're willing for me to see them, Then they show up. I needed a job. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. The phone rang. I didn't know whether uh, this person showed up. I didn't I found a 20. <laughs> and we like to think, but we start saying, hey, there's God's fingerprints all over this stuff all the time. And that's where eights come in, right? So our next one is growing understanding and effectiveness. Then they go over to 85. It's easy to lit up on a spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. <coughs> We're headed for trouble if we do. That's why they say that in 10. Rest on our laurels. They're talking about laurels mean resting on our no, not seeing any further necessity of moving forward. That's why a lot of people talk about 10 and not 11. They like that. I've achieved what I've hoped to achieve. I'm feeling better. My life's better. Everything's better. Thank you. Right? They stop doing service or they don't do no service. They don't. They take their, their ball and they go home again. And then they come back again. Here they're saying, no, 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 no. You got everything that you're kind of looking for. The problem's removed. You've been restored to sanity. You have a connection. Your life's going good. But this will not sustain you. Right? This is the transition. You're at, the, you're at the, the, the rest stop. Wow, it's beautiful here. Everything's fantastic. You can't stay here. You need to keep on going to your, your destination or your purpose. Right? You need to keep moving. But I like it here. I like to make this my homestead. No, you need to move forward because this won't sustain you. That's what's kind of staying here, right? It talks about we're headed for trouble if we do. For alcohol is a stubble fall. We're not cured of alcoholism. What we have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our... Spiritual condition. They give all the information to get connected. This is all connection steps. Get connected. Now I need a development. Right? This tells me how to avoid the accident, how to get rid of the accident, and how to get rid of things. But it doesn't teach me how to build on what my defense is. like having a driver's license and then taking a defensive driving course. Two different courses altogether. Right? When I take the defensive driving course, it, I become a better, more efficient driver. I watch for things and I enjoy life, and it's kind of like that, or building a trade. So what it becomes is, is an apprenticeship, a spiritual apprenticeship. So what I did here in the first 10 steps is I have taken a course, the Conestoga College course on how to do construction. I got everything I need to be effective in this trade. But I'm only a first-year apprentice or six-year apprentice in this new trade. Now I need to go develop that trade, which is the next four years or three years. And now, 29 years later, is kind of becoming like a master craftsman. But I still need to do all the bases to enjoy all the finishing trims in my house and everything that's going. And now I'm building new structures in other places that we'll get into that. And that's what it kind of talks about here. 
It talks about, I don't know how to develop the spiritual. This is all about connection. It's not about development. I don't know if you kind of noticed that. I know some people are arguing already. Okay, so it says, every day is a day we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. I don't know what that is yet. I have an idea, but I really don't know what that is yet. Right? So, they're saying, every day is a day I must carry God's will in all my care. How best can I serve thee? Thy will not mind me. Thou. These are thoughts that must go with us continuously. We can exercise our willpower along these lines all we wish. It's the proper use of will. So, much has already been said about receiving strength and inspiration and direct from him, from him who has all knowledge and power. True or false? I have all the information. Now I need to develop it. Right? And then here we go. This is what the whole thing boils down to. This one word. Anybody know what that word is? If. If. Conditional. If. The whole thing, the whole book brings me to this one point. This is the, you know what a pivoting point is? This is where everything got the thing standing. Right? Now I need to move it that way. But in order to start moving forward, because what's been holding me back is the weight of everything I've been carrying. So I get the pivoting point. I got this point here. Now it's going to go if I've got the structure or if I got this experience to this point, now I can start moving forward with it. All this stuff here is no longer weighing me down or holding me. But here's the qualifier. Who it's hot here. If we have carefully followed directions. Where's the directions? From 10 back. Is it not? Yes. 10 confirms everything I've learned and all the rest of the steps. Is there any new information in 10? Yes. There is some information. What they're saying now is, hey, I'm glad you're feeling good about what you're doing. You better move forward because what you've done is not enough to keep you sustained here. Even though you may think so, it's not enough. And be careful because you're going to start thinking about you again and not know it. You're going to think you, you know, still may got a pitch hitter. Bring him in when you think you need him. They says that won't be enough to sustain you. You need to have these things. So it talks about here, if we've carefully followed directions, right? We've begun to sense a flow of his spirit into us. This energy, this entity, whatever you want to call it, this they call it a spirit, they call it, I call it energy. I feel this life force within me now. I'm recharged, resourced, right? I begin to feel, now I begin to feel it. If I'm not feeling this or connected to this, I can't move forward. I understand it as something within me that I got from my fifth and sixth step. I, I, I could pinpoint it more. It, it makes sense to me, whatever, how it looks in your life may make sense to you. For me explaining it, it's that voice again. That talks to me. I don't know where it comes from or what it does, but it says things that's kind of in a singular. And but I know what it says. When it says you don't need to do that anymore, I know exactly what it's talking about. It doesn't need to explain it to me, but it's, it, it makes a, a small little statement of don't do that. Ask for help or so. It's really weird. It's like a voice. It's not up here, but it's I don't know where it comes from, and it's somewhere within inside of me. But it's distinct when I hear it. And now I get to hear it more because all this crap's out of the way. And it's more of a, a part of me. Like we call it the sixth sense. And let's see what they talk about here. We've careful followed We've begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we've become <laughs> God conscious. We have developed, not made, developed, right? This vital sixth sense. So now I understand what they're talking about. And I'm going to talk about some stuff here. And then... So the instructions on how to develop is in step 11. People argue that, but when was the last time you read step 11 on the board? Step 11 says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve, improve our conscious contact, praying, knowledge of his will. And uh, I would say that's a pretty good development step, wouldn't you? Step 10 says, continue to watch for you. Oh, I like step 10. <laughs> I like me. Can I talk about me? <laughs> we like step 10. Remember our first obsession. So they talk about here, when you go to page 88, and I'll give you an exercise to do after when you go home. They talk about here, we alcoholics are undisciplined. 
mentally and emotionally, we're undisciplined. Our mind dictates to us how we think and feel. So it acknowledges that because of the unmanageability, the thinking's attached to our instincts, which is creates self. Right? Is my social and my ambitions, my security, the things that the animals and humans are built on. I need to create security. I need to create this. My social ambitions. All these instincts is where the unmanageability comes from. When you're having any kind of problem, it's connected to one of my instincts being out of whack. You ever go in a meeting and hate everybody at the meeting? They never did nothing to you, but you already know they did do something to you? You know, what are you looking at? They're like, Good to see you. Yeah, sure it is. <laughs> we create our own problems. Anybody ever create their own problems here? And we think, oh, it's because I'm being selfish and inconsiderate. No, because one of your instincts, your social instincts out of whack and your ambitions is out of whack and your association with how you think about it is out of whack because you haven't brought a solution into it yet. And then when you see it, you need to be able to correct it. But if you don't know how to see it, and you're at step 10 is about always after the accident. You notice that? Who wants to go through life with always having accidents? If you're having to do step 10 every day, you're missing something. If you're in conflict with somebody every single day, except when you're new, you're always in conflict. You're in conflict with yourself, for God's sake. <laughs> you know? But if you've been sober a little bit and your whole life is conflict-oriented, would you say this person's missing something? If you're in conflict with yourself on a constant daily basis and you're just relentless on how you talk and talk to yourself and how you think, would you think you're missing something? Yeah. Right? See, we, we have our stage character, how we present to the world. But really, what really this is saying, how do you present you to you? How are you in your own space? How do you talk to you when nobody's looking? What are you allowing to ha happen up there? Because remember in the fourth it says, to the precise extent that we permit these, we give permission to ourselves to talk and think the way we do. Now, before we couldn't help it, now we could see it. But we're so used to participating in it, we're in an abusive relationship with ourselves. <laughs> we need counseling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's what this is kind of like couples counseling between me and me. So are we getting along today? I don't know. You dick. <laughs> right? If you took on a board and you put on the board everything you say to yourself and how you think, would you be, oh, that's mine. <laughs> would you be very happy with this? Or if, we wouldn't do this ever. If you put on the board what you thought of other people, <laughs> yeah, this is what it's saying. This is my cat litter box. I'm dumping in my own backyard. And then, then I'm expecting to have a picnic back there and not complain about all the landmines I'm stepping in all the time. Barefooted. I don't know if you've ever stepped in a landmine barefooted. It gets your attention. Right? And then you got to focus on what trying to clean this mess that has not, that you could have avoided. And that's what this is about. So, we're in discipline. So we let God discipline us in a simple way we have just outlined. What does just mean? That means step 11. They just outline our program of recovery. Step 11 is our daily design for living into today. And so here's what, so what you do is when you go home, well, you take a piece of paper, fold it in half. And on this side of the paper, you write down how they do step 11. I want to understand how they do step 11, right? And then that night or the night probably a week from now when you do the exercise, you'll probably have it done by tonight. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's enthusiasm. We think I'll get to it. You know, is it for my betterment? No, I'll get to it. So we talk about right here how they do step 11. And then at night, put, like, so tonight, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the abbreviation and then when I retire at night, did I do this during the day? Because in step 10, they told us a recipe, but I need to know how to develop it, and that's what step 11 is about. And part of step 11 here is the main exercise. I'll give you a hint. What it's about is in step 10, when these things happen, I need to find a way not to make them happen. But they're energy sourced, right? So I need to be in tune to my energy. I need to be in tune to my 
uh, whatever what other words people call it, my Zen or my uh, higher my higher power or my my energy, God or God God, right? But but this is the source we bring in. But this thing here they talk about is inside is our energy field that we all have with or without our connection to God. Right? Because when it's separate, like we feel separate, but we're not separate. That's a whole different topic. But when we're in tune to ourselves, we feel energy. You ever notice when you think about something not well, your energy becomes, and it's a fight or flight? You ever notice when you get into an argument with somebody, before you engage with them, you're already engaged emotionally? Right? So in step 11, they say it's step 10, you recognize this bomb went off. And then when you get into 11, that's why step 10 goes into 11. You ever notice that 10 goes into 11? And then they say, when we retire at night, we review our day. Right? That's the step 11. And so I asked, was I kind, loving, what could I have done better? Right? Or was I thinking about myself most of the time? That's why we don't like that step because it's all yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right? So when they say, what could we have done better? Meaning... That, so I have to go back to that moment I was in. Where was my energy and where was my connection before I engaged with this person, place, or thing? Ah, when I revisit that moment, my energy shifted as soon as I anticipated the conversation. As soon as I anticipated the conflict, my energy shifted and I was already engaged. And once I'm engaged, there's no stopping me. You ever notice that? That once we're engaged, there's no stopping me. So here they're saying... I'll give you one example, then we'll take a smoke break. Is that um, the way when I, um, when it came to finances, her reaction to it, I'd get crazy. I'd lose my shit. And it started happening a couple times. Then I realized when I looked at it, what could I have done differently? I went, this is what they mean. I realized when I sat down with her and I was anticipating this conversation, my energy was already changed when I sat down with her. And I was trying to ignore, fake it till you make it, what was happening. And inside, it was getting bigger and bigger and I'm just smiling at her. And then when I couldn't have it anymore, all that energy went toward her. And then I apologized once the energy subsided, right? diminished the energy with inside of myself I had a moment of clarity what I was doing I she was crying and I apologized right and then it happened again and then it happened again and I kind of went I don't think this is what they're talking about here so this is sober a long time before I realized what they were talking about here right in, in 11 because most people really don't give a lot of Credibility at 11 because it's about spiritual development. Step 10 is about self-development. Most people in a fellowship like self-modification. Everybody's working on themselves. I'm working on this defect. I'm working on that defect. I'm working on the child within. I'm working on a child without. I'm working on abandonment. I'm working on this. I'm working on that. I'm, I'm tired. I haven't even left my room yet. I'm tired. I got a lot of stuff to work on today. You're working on stuff that doesn't change anything. Here, they're talking about changing it at a, spirit, at a spiritual core level where there's no attachment to anything anymore, right? They're saying that I could experience this on a different level. So when I retired at night, what could I have done better is now I know that I'm going to have this conversation with my wife again. I sit down. I feel my energy starting to shift. I said, hold on a second. I'm just going to do a little prayer. I, and then I told her, I have a hard time in this area. So if we can go through it slowly... And if we could kind of take a break, if I feel my energy starting to shift again, because I don't like treating you the way I do, right? And I don't like acting the way I do. But I, it seems I can't help doing what I do sometimes because I get attached to the problem. My instincts get out of whack and I'm not spiritually in tune in the moment. So if I could get spiritually corrected as we go along, we could have better conversations. Now, my wife sends me texts. She goes, that'll be another 200 bucks. <laughs> And I'll go, ha, 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 back, right? And I'll say, I'll have it for you. I'll email or transfer it, right? Because she takes care of all the finances, right? And I think it's too much because I have to give what I, my portion. Anybody have a problem with giving their portion? Anybody like getting more than their portion? 
boy. <laughs> yeah, it was like uh, my buddy, went with my sponsor once, and I took the bigger piece of cake. He says, why do you take all the bigger piece of cake? I said, well, what would you do? He says, I'd give you the bigger piece of cake. I said, so what are you complaining about? Let's take a break. <laughs> okay. Some people miss it. He didn't talk about nine too much, right? So we just read in 10 is that we commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. So a lot of times we try to compartmentalize the steps. What the steps work into is an experience, right? And it stays current, right? It's not a specific thing. It's all the things in the toolbox that allow me to be effective in today. It's like being a carpenter. I have all these different tools and all these different things. And as I become more efficient in my trade, I collect other tools that are specialty tools to keep me connected. And then when I look at my job, it just becomes easier to do it as I become more effective in my trade. Right? And so I, I always call this a spiritual apprentice the first five years. Where you become really efficient spiritually in your trade is in step nine. What you see instead, if you learn to look for what's present in step nine, that will carry you for the rest of your sobriety. Most people mistaken the purpose of step nine because we still, first phase recovery is all about who? Us. All about me. You're right. <laughs> we have that. It is about, we tell you you're the most important person here, and you think that's true for the first five years, and then you realize you're not. You walk in, I'm the most important person here, and the other guy goes, I'm the most important person here, and you both get into a fight in the parking lot over here. So, <laughs> sorry, squirrel. Okay, so what happens is step nine is really about other people now. It's not about you anymore. It's about other people and giving them the opportunity to heal and be of maximum service, to fit ourselves to be of maximum service. People miss that word. It talks about our real purpose is to fit ourselves, meaning it has to take effort, purpose, design, preparation. I have to be prepared when I do my job to go to work. I get my work boots. I get my lunch. I make sure I have my tools. I have everything I need to do my job effectively. That's what step 11 is. I'm now no longer living too much in the future, too much in, I'm living in the moment today. God, give me what, as I review my day, what is it today you want me to do? I wait for an intuitive thought or action. I have my list, but it's not up to me to do the list. As that may sound weird. I'm praying in my 11s what I should do, and these intuitive thoughts or things will come to pass. It's like when it was time to go clean up my past <coughs> with my family, I went and did that. But I didn't realize at the time, it took a bit of, uh, of going through this, that when I went there to see them, they haven't seen me in, I think it was 15, 16 years, I started bringing healing back to them. When I walked into the house, they said, good to see you. Was it something we did? I was surprised by that, that, that statement because I thought they never liked me. Because my attachment and perceptions to self, right, the things I carried in six. And it was funny is that when I went back and made those amends and I had that experience with that lady on the bus, I was profound how I seen God show up in that moment with that lady on the bus there when I was questioning God because on page 63, there's a contract there that my sponsor and the guys that took me through a group like this said, there's a contract on page 63 between me and God. And God will always hold his part of the bargain, always. If I'm willing to do the minimal things, the return I'll get will be far greater. My job is to see God's fingerprints or God's in the moment. I don't know how to do that, right? So when that lady sat there, I kind of went, wow, how God showed up in that moment to carry me in the last part of the thing. And then I thought about the, the footprints in the sand. And I think of other things that people talked about that I never really got or understood. But I've heard and seen those poems and people talk about these things, right? There I had a moment with this thing. And then I got to have other moments as I went through my past. That guy had put his arm around me. That moment of compassion that I had from another human being that I've never felt for years. And that moment carried me. Why would that hug or that moment on that staircase have such a profound effect on me? Because it touched me in my heart and I didn't realize it at that moment. It disturbed me. Right? People's compassion and love. It disturbed me what happened in that bus. It was kind of like, what the hell? I still think, how does that happen? So then years later, you know, going along that line, um, um, uh, you know, the, uh, we'll have to go with my mom here. Um, I, I, uh, I, I think that was the most um, person who loved me the best she could, and I caused her the most damage. 
and uh, I remember I told you that, uh, that moment where she pushed me away and I shut off from her and everybody around me, right? And, and the lies, and I don't get in, got time to get into everything around that moment, but give you a rough idea, one day I was out of the army, I was in a blackout and something happened and I came to and I was in the parking lot and I had my mom, she was a little French woman, I had her by the throat and she was hanging on my arm. She was saying, the police, the police, I said, you'll be dead before you hit the ground. Then I realized what I was doing, I let her down, I was shocked that I was able to do that, but like I told you, where I grew up, nobody was exempt from retribution. You stepped over the line, woman, child, we got it, that's just the way I was raised and that's just the way it was. I was shocked that I did that and I pushed that feeling down inside and we never talked about it again, right? She jokes about it, we joking about it, I mean it was horrified that I would be that blacked out where I'd be able to do that. That's why there's people in penitentiaries today for inches and moments, those moments in blackouts, those moments of drinking, resentments and all that stuff. They do people to people and there's no re recall or recourse afterwards, right? That's deep-seated hate. One, one day I was sober for a little while and nobody taught me how to do this stuff and I was just sober and we're sit standing in the kitchen, I was in, in Toronto. And, and uh, she was doing the dishes, and I was cutting something with a big darling uh, scissors, right? And, and I said to her, and I can't believe I even said it, I said, you must really trust me to turn your back on me. And she kept on doing dishes. And I, I don't really talk about but that moment of, and I, didn't, I can't believe I said that. But I wanted her to recognize that I still, without even realizing, I still carried all this pain, and you better watch yourself. But I would give my life for my mom. That's kind of weird kind of thing, right? You touch my mom? Best you've never been born, right? You know, so that's a really you know bipolar relationship, right? I love you, but let me slap you around a bit first. <laughs> you know, it's kind of so. As the years went on, you know, I, I mended that relationship with my mom. The first, the first act of compassion was after I did that trial thing. She came, and, and we went to dinner, and, and I put my hand across the table and I touched her for the first time, in a, in a compassionate way between a, uh, a son and a mother. And I couldn't ever remember that moment of compassion where it was connected ever in my life mm. with that woman, right? And then as the years went on, it was her 80th birthday. And, and there's a lot of stuff, like I flew her to, to uh, Vancouver where I lived and stuff like that. Like, I, I, like I, just, I don't know, like there's something seriously wrong with me. <laughs> like, uh, I know it's hard to believe listening to me, but I mean, <laughs> like, uh, when I got into back up. We had a, our family pet and, and uh, Cookie, and she looked after him because I was uh, unable to look after him. And I brought him to a restaurant tavern. I went in to have a couple beers. And I got into a fight with two other guys. And I went through the picture window with them and split my back open with the glass and stuff like that. I forgot the dog was with me. The dog took off and got ran over. The back pelvis, it broke the pelvis. And I went to the hospital, but I was going to take a streetcar because it cost 20 bucks for the, right? And that's a case of beer. And so the cops drove me to go get stitches in my back because I split it in between. Like a long story, like I'm not right. I didn't feel nothing. They just said my whole back was wide open. I needed like 20 stitches to close it up, right? And I never felt nothing. So my mom told me what happened to the dog. I said the dog should have listened. Yeah. There was nothing, not a feeling. Not, that was a family. I love this dog. That dog was McCall. It was my best friend. And he even got to a place where it was unaffected by that, right? And I'm not proud of that. It's just where I got to. That was part of my story. So years later, after going through all this stuff, I started getting thought and I started getting okay with being tapped into my spirit, okay with being who I was regardless of what was happening around me. And I flew my mom out here, and I showed her how I was living and all that stuff, and she bought a little fridge magnet, right? And on the magnet, I went and drove her back, I came home, and on the magnet it says, paid in full. Mm. Was, was I apologized to her for all the stuff I did and all that, and, and <coughs> wrecking her apartments and blackouts and punching out her boyfriends and all that, like just the mayhem I caused in this woman's life who tried to love me the best she could and she didn't know no other way of doing it. She tried to protect me for the world and get me ready for the world as she understood it. She says, like that Johnny Cash song, right? She didn't call me Sue, but she got me ready for the world, right? You know, spit in my eye and I grit my teeth, right? Yeah. It's kind of like that, like the same woman that watched me in the bar getting punched out by three, by her taking my lumps by an alternate group. And she, she was in that bar, and she says, next time, she never interfered, never, and she said, next, next day, she said, next time, you'll be a little more prepared, and you won't let it happen again. She says, you need to watch yourself a little more better. And that, that was probably one of the worst beatings I had in my life. But she was the type of woman, she loved me enough to say, hey, you can't, you got to watch yourself where we're raised. So fast forward, I go to, uh, um, she turns 80. I have been sober a while, it's a couple years ago. And, and I phone, I said, Mom, what would you like for your birthday? 
anything you want. Our relationship's good now. Now, when she talks about the past, I don't talk about the past. When she talks about stuff, I listen to her, and I don't bring up none of my stuff. I don't bring up nothing to do with anything negative about our past. She goes, I did good by you guys. I said, yeah, Mommy did great. Considering where we come from, how we're still alive, we made it. We're survivors. My mom's story is horrific. When I stopped, it was I went through the four and I started looking at my story and I was able to look at her as they suggest on page 67. I started having compassion for her. Why I started having compassion for her? Because I started having compassion for me. Right? And I was allowing God into my life in a heart that started shifting things in a way that created a different perspective of my life. I needed a different perspective. And we agnostics, they talk about we needed to have a different perspective if we were going to be successful. All we have is our perspective on the way we look at things. They're saying, if I'm going to be successful in this life, I need to be able to stand back and look at it from a different angle. I need to see what other people are seeing or see what other people... So all my life I'm looking out this window, trying to see what the rest of you are seeing out of that window. Just saying, hey, Tony, stop. Just come over here for a second and look out this window. Wow. And that's what the steps say. Stop for a second. Just come over here for a second. Do this little stupid prayer that you don't understand. Ask this person that you don't like for help. (coughs) Show up. Be a part of a group that you know that don't like you. Just do it. What's your alternative? I'm going to go do it. Then you realize there are a bunch of people just like you. Been there, done that. So my mom says, I like to go in an Indy car and go 200 miles an hour. <laughs> With that stereo going. My mom, like my mom, she forgets she's 80. She still thinks there's a bit of, she still thinks she's 19, 20, right? Like a couple years prior, I have to say, a couple years prior, I went there and, and, and I said, uh, I was at the, they didn't have my car, the Chrysler 300 I was going to rent. So they were going to have me a, a, a BMW, the S, um, nice series, right? Or a brand new Mustang GT convertible. Nice. So I know what I want, but I'm thinking I got to pick up my wife and I got to pick up my mom. It's not about me. I want it to be about me. So I phoned my wife. I said, well, what do you think? Because I got to go to, I got to go to all these places. She says, Grab the Beamer. I phoned my mom. What do you think? Grab the Mustang. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so I, got, I got my mom in the Mustang, right? And, we're, and I got, she got turning up. She's got a baseball cap on, a little French wood. She's a big fur coat. Yeah. And the roof's off. I'm looking over at my mom and my heart's like this, right? And she's looking at me and she's smiling. She says, we did good. I said, yeah, we did good, mom. Oh, man, that woman saved my life so many times, eh? And I, did, I just couldn't see it because of my own pain, right? So I drove around in this Mustang and the roof's down, and we had a great time, eh? So I said to her, I said, uh, 80th birthday, what do you want for your birthday? She said, I, I said, I don't think the Indy car is going to work, Mom. <laughs> I said, you know, like, that's all I need is you to die in that car, even though you'll die happy. I mean, me carrying that thing for the rest of my life. And my sister just harassing the hell out of me. It's just beyond. So she says, I'd like to see all my family, all her sisters. She's 80, so she says they're all dying. I said, oh, I can do that. So I went there, I rented the nicest car they had, and I picked up my mom. And we drove for three days to all her family. Three days with my mom. We had a great time. And, and the wife and I were thinking about uh, working on toward having a kid, and every time I brought, my mom would bring that up. And she carried some pain in six and seven. And when I was able to see that she was still carrying pain from the past, I was able to treat her differently because I understood the pain, how I react when I carry pain. Right? So when we're in this car, she kept on saying, I hope you have a kid just like you. (laughs) First time she said it, I start praying. No problem. Second day, about the 15th time saying that, I started saying, hey, you know what? Just kind of relax on that, eh? And then I put third day, I pulled over on the side of the road. I said, hey, you know what, Mom? I said, uh, I said you know, I, I, if I didn't have all the trauma and all that stuff ever happened to any human being, I said, how do you think I would have turned out? She said, just the way you are now. I said, yeah, I'm a good human being. Was, I had some bad breaks and so I had some bad things happen to me, but that's not who I am anymore. I'm your son. Right? My mom she says, I'm proud of you. Right, and she, every place we went to with her sister and all that, because we were always the black sheep of the family. 
Right? We were the ones the whole family pointed at and stuff like that. That was the family that told my mom to get rid of me because of my bloodline and where I could, like out of wedlock, out of marriage and all that stuff. What my mom had to do to keep me. Now, when I look back, it, is, it mentioned with the sacrifice she did to, to ensure the love of me and her kid died. I said, I couldn't imagine if I was in that situation and if my first child died through circumstances of the life they were living, then their second child was nearly killed in regards to alcohol and drug abuse and, the, and all the stuff that went with that. I don't know how I would be if I had to carry that the rest of my life, right? So, you know, when, when she said that, I realized she was carrying pain in what she said. She says, remember that time you told me when I was 16 that you didn't need me anymore because your father was in your life. She brought that up as that mirror, that vehicle. She was using the pain of, I hope you have a son just like you, carrying this thing for 40 years. That one word, that one incident. And I looked at her and I said, it was wrong for me to say that. Right, and it created more healing in our relationship. That's pretty remarkable when you it was. And all I had to do was be willing to do a lot of the eleven stuff. When these things came up, I redirected. I didn't attach, and I prayed for a different perspective of what was happening. God saved me from the story. God saved me from acting out on past pain and attachment. God helped me clip these things that weigh me down. Help me be free of these things. Help me have a new experience with this woman that loves me. Right? Today I have that new experience, right? What made that possible is by being willing to do some things that don't make any sense on a consistent basis and allowing the rest of that for God to look after, right? And so another thing that kind of, when I went and visit these ladies, I went in my, my godmother. She's, she's uh, I think she's 85. She's in a home and she's like, she's like shaking. She's getting a bit of dementia and all that. She sees me. She lights up because she hasn't seen me since I made amends to them way back, right? And she lights up. She goes, Tony, Tony, come and sit on my knee. <laughs> She's this big. <laughs> I said, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> she goes, oh, come here. So she's shaking, right? And I haven't seen this woman in a long time, right? And I'm 50, I'm 55 years old. When, when I, no, 56. It was last summer, right? My mom's 80th birthday. I'm 56 years old. This woman raised me when, when I nearly got killed by my dad and all that my mom gave him. Me to my godmother, I know more of the story now really, because I got all the pictures as a baby and all of the snow suits and all that in Halliburry where my dad tried to come and get me with the gun. Like that, welcome to my story, right? And that's just in a general way. It really is in a general way. So she sat me down, I sat down with her, she goes, I want to ask your forgiveness. So you want to ask my forgiveness? She says, Yeah, I had to give you back to your mom. She says, I couldn't afford to feed you and my twins. She says, I was pregnant with twins. She says, I had to make a decision. I had to give you back. She carried my life, the guilt of my life on her for 55 years. Going to her grave, she was asking me for forgiveness of something she was carrying. So it's not about me anymore. And you know what? I wouldn't have went there again because of what I thought they thought about me. I would have robbed myself because of the stuff I was still hanging on to in 6 and 7 that I wouldn't acknowledge. I robbed myself of a lot of life. I talked myself out of happiness because of preconceived ideas based on past events that robbed me from today. Right? And not only robs me, it robs everybody around me. So when I left that place, that woman was in harmony and she was at peace from something she was carrying. How many times do I do this to other people because I don't want to go do an amend? I don't want to give them a call. I want to hang on to this anger. I want to hang on to this story, right? And so as I go through these things, I, got, I get to see how God shows up and to be an instrument of something greater than me, to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and the people around me, let go of the story, right? And allow God to work in ways that, that are mind-blowing. So I ended up uh, um, going a couple... Um, things that just it's today I just I, I, every once in a while I, tr I find myself trying to think how did that happen <clears throat> anybody ever get those how it's like something happens beyond it's like so uh, I ended up um, going out with this uh, girl in, in sobriety she didn't drink or use and wasn't an AA or NA I thought perfect but she was about as crazy as they came that was the ones cutting the buttons off my shirt and stuff like that and scratching my neck and all that stuff with my second year cake talking about how much I loved her Anyways, 
So we had, a, we had a kid together because, you know, as I was moving her, I thought it would be a good idea, to, you know, a sending off party, and, and that resulted in a kid. So um, one last time, hurrah, hurrah, anybody, you know, we're funny that way, right? I really don't want nothing to do with you, but can I have one more selfish shot? <laughs> I'd like to bless you with me. <laughs> so anyways, moving on. So we had a kid together, and, and she would take my child and disappear with her. And I'm sober, right? So it was one time she disappeared and I couldn't find her. Like, I just couldn't locate her. She went uh, um, to one, one, anyways, without getting into it. And so I, I said, my sponsor said, why don't you pray about it? In all things, pray. And step 11 says, pray. When these things come up, pause, pray, ask God. So my prayer was, God, I know you got this. You promised you'd look after me in ways beyond my comprehension. And all good things will come under your time. So when that emotion would come up, I'd acknowledge it in 11. I'd pause. Many times during the day when agitated, I'd pause, redirect my perspective on the situation. This is how it seems to be happening, but God has this. God will make it happen when it's ready to happen. And I had to believe that. I said, when you're ready, you allow her back in my life. And this prayer went on for a year and a half, probably two years. When that emotion comes up about being separated from your child and all that other stuff and and kind of like the regrets and stuff. And I have to redirect and put that back in the compartment because that isn't the truth anymore. I I know truth with this thing. So we have, I I call these things, it's called spiritual speed wobbles. I don't know how else to explain it, but the closest thing I I understand it to be now is, you know, when you're overly hungry and you haven't eaten and you're kind of shaky and stuff like that. I get those when it comes to these great events that are about to happen without me realizing they're happening. So in my meditation said something, you know, why don't you go to uh, um, a metro town? I never go to metro town. I don't like people. I really don't. Like big groups of people, I really don't like packs of people, right? So, okay, I'm going to metro town. I live in Burnaby. I'm driving to metro town. I'm almost in metro town. Something says, forget metro town. I'm starting to feel crazy. You know, you ever get that? Just You don't know what it is. You're just crazy. Something said, then something said, pray, something says, just go home and go back to bed and start your day over again. That's the best medicine, friend. If you're crazy and you got to a place where you've done everything you can, go back to bed. Get some sleep. <laughs> Get up and start over. Reboot your day, right? I used to do that a lot when, when I was new. Where you going? I'm going to bed. <laughs> I've been thinking all day and I'm tired. <laughs> go to bed, reboot, disconnect, right? So I turned down. This street of haven't been on is four lanes, four lanes, four lanes, two lanes over there, four, two lanes over here, four lanes over there. And there's this kid, this big, in diapers, can't talk, blonde hair, probably three years old. And I, thought, and I looked, there's no, there's no adults around. That would be a little alarming, right? And so I pulled my car over and I, and I said, hey, get away from the stop sign. I, I get on, I mean, the crosswalk. I get on the phone, I start phoning the police. I said, hey, there's this kid unattended here. She, they said, what is she doing? I said, she's standing at the crosswalk smiling at me. Uh-huh. And she's seen me. She goes, she goes, she kind of went like this and started walking. She walked from here to probably just past the window is a laneway. And then she started going down a laneway. I stayed, I stayed back. She's stopping, turning around, smiling at me. And she kind of like walking, just a diaper, just a diaper on, that's it, right? And probably walked from here to where we go for the, for the uh, mess hall downstairs. The police are on their way. The kid stops at the gate. It's a six-foot gate. Hangs onto the gate. Looks at me. Smiles again. Walks into the backyard. Walks up the stairs. Walks into the back house. The people come out and say, oh, like because they were looking for her. And guess who the people were? It was my daughter's mother, sister, and godmother. I was like, again. (laughs) The cop shows up. Do you know these people? Uh, yeah. Where do you know from? Well, I, I last seen them two years ago. I haven't seen them since, and I've been looking for my daughter. She's upstairs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How do you explain that? Like, huh? Today, I still can't explain that. How? Like, that's like winning the $1.6 billion lottery. That's the odds of that happening. That that kid standing there waiting for me to smile at me to walk me to the gate to reconnect with my kid that's in the house with her mother, her twin sister, and her grandmother. No fucking way. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. But why not? If this thing can create a tire psychic change of spiritual experience enough tapped into the world of the spirit, why not? Look, we're all sitting here, aren't we? Should we be sitting here in the condition you're in after the life we've been living? Absolutely. Smiling at each other? <laughs> and nobody's getting called up for court? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's no doctors involved, no Thorazine. Like, I mean, it's not a bad, nobody's screaming from the rooms. Like, like that's pretty wild, eh? So, as we go along here, I'm cleaning up the past, I'm doing these things, and I'm starting to see God work in ways that are beyond anything I could ever imagine. So now when the dark times come and my perception's a little off and I can't see things working out the way I want, I can go back into that moment and say, you know, God's got this. All I need to worry about is my connection with God and God's got the rest of this. Because look at where I am, what I'm doing, and what I'm experiencing. There's no way I should be experiencing life at this level. There's no way I should be doing this at what I'm doing. What made this possible is my connection with a power greater than myself. So as, as we kind of go along here, you know, I kind of went, you know, does God take care of all my needs? And we, anybody ever wonder that? Like everything. Like the contract on page 63, you got to really study it. It's pretty well. I studied that thing for the first five years. I like contracts. I like agreements. I like looking at paperwork to make sure it's all done right because something wrong in that paperwork, that's a get out of jail free card. My whole life has been determined by pieces of paper. I've always read. I know how to read things in contracts and contracts and, and, and on and on and on. Insurance papers. I find a loophole in anything. I haven't found a loophole in here. Actually, there is a loophole in this thing. If you don't do it, you don't get it. <laughs> That's the loophole. <laughs> you get to the extent that you're willing to step back and allow God to do it and be an instrument of something that we don't understand. But once you experience it, no further explanation is necessary. Once I experience that thing, it's mind-boggling. I still don't understand it, but I can't deny the experience. Hand to God that happened. I still don't understand. It's boggling. Isn't it? Come on. Isn't it like how many people think, well, yeah, he's doing good now. Now we know he's full of shit. Yeah, right, not one honest person. <laughs> you, you don't need both hands up you're not getting arrested. <laughs> I get two votes on that. <laughs> so, so what happens is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I still have that look, right? So, <laughs> I love you, you're awesome. I, look, I, I, you know, over the next year, I'll, I'll be following up on some of you guys. Like, I like, with great anticipation on your development, especially after this weekend, right? And then come with you, that guy is nuts. <laughs> but you know what? I'm the right kind of crazy today. I'm enjoying this, right? I'm on the right side of crazy, and that's what the steps get us. I've been always on the wrong side of crazy, and I never enjoyed it, right? So today, I really enjoy my life for a guy in my mental condition. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at the, uh, my daughter, tears that I raised, that makes sure nobody, that's a whole different story there, and, and there's so many of these stories that is just mind-boggling. So I get a... I'm with Tirza, and uh, we're at the Alvar Levine concert, and, and we got box tickets, and I spent all my money on it, right? Because I get to be a dad with her that I didn't have the opportunity with my other two kids. My first kid that I talked about in Toronto, I didn't even you know, talk about her because it's just, it's just she went up for adoption, and, and she's not a part of my life, but I carry the pain with her. Remember I talked about, you know, uh, give, whacking her in the like giving her a slap and I removed myself from that situation where I tried to go back once and just give a rough idea. I went back once and tried to, to live, be a normal person, be a dad and all this other stuff, but I was incapable of those things. I'd be able to do it for a couple of days and then I would show up. So we moved, I thought maybe we'll move to a small town. We moved to a small town with this lady and, 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 and her child. I can't even say it's mine, her child, because I took no responsibility for it whatsoever. And, and uh, it was a newborn. Right, and so that's backing up the story before the second time I removed myself. So um, when I was trying to have visitations, that's what it was with when she was old enough. I was trying to have one day or a couple hour visitations at a time. I was even incapable of that. So we were, uh, and I don't do this to say that proud. I'm not proud of none of this, but it is kind of like an idea of where I come from and what I dealt with. And, and these are things that I like in six and seven when I look back and I've made right and I, and I find peace with that stuff. 
that I was sitting there and, and I was nuts. I wasn't using, and I was a couple of days, I didn't know what withdrawal, I never really experienced one. And I'm just nuts, I'm like, I'm howling crazy, like I am just nuts, Not anybody been there? I need something and there's nothing. So she, she uh, my, my, my sisters were there, um, uh, my three, three sisters were there with a couple of her friends that were playing Monopoly. And I walked up and I told them to all empty their pockets. So stand up, empty your pockets. They emptied their pockets. I grabbed their money and I went down and brought a 12, a 10 pack of big boys. They just came out then. And I was standing there calculating with my change, how much, what I can get for this amount. And then I bought a gram of hash. And I just leave me alone and I put the, the jukebox on top of the ghetto blast on top of the TV and I'm going to watch uh, Neil Young simulcast. And I'm rolling these things. I'm finding peace and serenity. And I got the beers lined up beside me. Just leave me alone. She comes out with the baby, eh? What are you doing? Because she knows she don't want me drinking. She knows she don't want me using. She knows when Tony shows up, it's not going to be good, eh? And I'm telling her, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. I'll be okay after I have a couple beers. I'm thinking I'm going to be okay after a couple beers. She knows I'm not going to be okay after a couple beers. Because after a couple beers, Tony shows up. When Tony shows up, the police show up. When the police show up, all hell breaks loose. It's either police ambulance or hell, that was one hell of a night, right? So, so she's like this. And so I don't know what I got up. And I was just crazy. I said, give my sister the baby. She said, no, I said, listen, give the sister the baby. I said, I'll hit you so hard. The baby was suspended in midair, and she'll get the baby anyway, so you make a choice. Put the baby in the crib, stay in there, leave me alone. So she put the baby in there, she came out, and I'm in the kitchen trying to get some stuff. She's going to go for the butcher knife. I just finished getting stabbed by my other girlfriend that didn't like my wife. My wife doesn't like my girlfriend. Like, I mean, these people are so... You know, inconsiderate and selfish. <laughs> so I got a glass broken my arm from the other one. Anyways, long story. So anyways, I wasn't about to be stabbed again. So what I ended up doing, I closed her hand in the drawer, grabbed her by the throat, threw her in the closet, shut the closet, and I told her to stay there. And I went and sat down to finish my beer and my, and my smoke. That's what I turned out to be. Right? And then she knocked on the door and she says, uh, she says can I come out? And I said, are you going to behave yourself? Mm -hmm. Right? You couldn't tell me anything, if anything wrong I was doing. I didn't even carry that stuff till I got into my five and realized it was like my four I was carrying. And when I went back to make amends to that lady and that kid, I sat with her and I apologized to her from the deep, the depths of my heart. And she found healing in that <laughs> stuff. And a part of that is her, her husband that they were in, they got introduced to AA through my example of what was happening and she found peace with our relationship and she died shortly afterward of pancreatic cancer, right? But the whole idea, how I robbed them and her family and everybody, like I was un, really unequipped to understand the damage I've caused to other people and when I really seen it, that's why I told you I went to a, a course at Seven Years Sober, Alternative Divine. This is a lifelong process. I'm not running for politician here. This is the best I could do based on me, based on the life I come from. Right? What Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me is something beyond anything you could ever imagine. Remember, I told you that story about the seagull? Right? Um, I think it was last year or the year before. I'm driving along Highway 10. Highway 10. Four lanes of highway in, uh, coming out of Cloverdale going into Surrey. Rush hour. There's a duck going across the road. This is little babies. I stopped my truck. The babies can't get up over the curb. I get out of the truck and I start walking toward the babies. I don't care who's looking at me. And I'm calm. The babies stop moving. There's a sewer grate right there. The mother's looking at me and there's two babies. I walked over and I just started praying and the babies didn't move. They allowed me to pick them up and I put them on the curb, both of them. I looked at them and I felt good and the mother went, wah, wah. I went, wah, wah. <laughs> 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 and they went off and I got into that truck and I felt like a million bucks yeah. and a part of my brain says, people were looking, I said, good, yeah. right? That's, that's the difference. I, I, I've come into that place of manhood that I've always dreamed to be, right? With my kids, my daughters, my friends, like it's just, it's amazing. When my daughters come to their dad, they know their dad's there. Mm -hmm. My daughter, when my 22 year old daughter comes, she goes right here. 
She goes, I love you, Dad. And she cries because of life. She says, I got you. And she goes, I know you do. And I just bought them beds, both of them beds. I get to be the father to them. I wasn't able to be to those other people. Their <coughs> mothers, I get to be the ex-partners, the father of their kids, and with, treat them with respect and honor, regardless of what they do. Well, the one daughter's mother has a lot of mental health problems. It's like without, without even getting into, I continue to teach my daughter to love and respect her mom, regardless of the mental health she suffers <coughs> and the effect she has on them. That's pretty wild when you can be that father. When I can put six and seven aside, six this pain I still carry, retell myself the truth of the perspective that this is my daughter's mother, and you got to live an example. Why what you say, how you treat her, and how you respond to her will teach your daughter how to respond and respect and teach other people. I'm proud of my kids, right? And so they both just got a place together. It's pretty wild, you know, with their boyfriend. Just got them beds and we got them dishes. My wife was over there. There's just the stepmother cleaning the house and getting everything ready, right? So one of the things is uh, my daughter, Tirza, was kind of like at the Avril Lavigne concert, like I was saying. And I was standing and I reached in my pocket and I kind of opened the change and I looked and I realized I was a dollar short, a loony short for the SkyTrain. Right? And another part of me went, I laughed and went, I wonder if God looks after all my needs. <laughs> like a little out of this. Like, uh, and then the other part says, that's stupid. It's just a loony. But it was, I needed that. The story was, I needed that loony to get me on the Sky Train. Without that loony, I'm not getting on the Sky Train, honestly. 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 I, see, I don't remember who I was dealing with here. Honestly. What's the matter? Go on the Sky Train, anyways. Right? It's okay, honey. Don't worry about the security man. <laughs> right? They little kid. So, I'm going to wonder if God looks after all men. And I laughed because it's not about the loony. It's about the story. It's not about I've recovered. It's about the story. The story of how many thousands of men and women who have recovered. Everybody thinks it's about the recovery. No, it's about the story. The story is what makes it remarkable. Right? So, the loony is not the story. What the story is, the thing surrounding the loony. So, I'm over here wondering questioning God based on something I read and people told me that God takes care of all my needs. I laughed at the idea. Yeah. Ludicrous. But that significance of that dollar would determine the road ahead of me. That's what kind of boils down. So I walk downstairs to the GM place. I've got to meet some friends. <clears throat> I could go to the machine and get some money. Who cares? But that's not the point, right? The point was I called God to task on something. And I questioned his his kind of loyalty or his promise to me back then right so i'm standing there and i don't know if you've ever been to gm place but the hallways are this wide right and you got all the snack bars there and all that so i'm standing out of the line of traffic going both ways with my daughter this lady is over by where the clock is and there's like 10 rows of people this lady's over there there's pay phones what made me notice her was her hand was in the air like this and she starts walking toward me, and I'm wondering who she, and she's saying something. And I'm kind of going, what the hell's going on here, right? And I'm kind of never, never paid no more, more attention to it, right? So this lady goes, she gets about for where the light post, she goes, excuse me, sir, excuse me, do you have a loony for this toonie? She says, I just need a loony for the telephone, and I'll, and I'll, give, you, and I'll give you this toonie for it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> What? Come on. Come on, exactly. Come on. Hand of God. Right? So, see how we deal, how limited we are to our thinking about this power and the source and this thing? So what step 11 is saying is the only drawback to our experience is our restriction in our own thinking. Well, why not? If this thing could create a, such a psychic change within my attitude and outlook in life, save me from myself and create a change within me sufficient enough to recover from a thing that's killing me, why not? Remember in page 62, they say, he's the father, we're his children? My kid needed a, a loony? I'd drive to the other end of Vancouver to give it to her if it meant changing or helping her out. What I wouldn't do for my kid? She's moving into my, her place. She never asked me for nothing. She got dishes there. My wife was cleaning for five. She got a new bed. She got, I'm going to go put locks in her. But she never asked me for none of that. When she was a kid getting ready for school, she never worried about having lunch 
or clothes. Or Those things were all ready for her. She never worried about what she had to do after she came home. She never had to worry about whether there was going to be a house there or not. She never had to worry about whether her dad was going to be here there or not. Now I'm a human power. So, why not? When I was in Toronto and they wouldn't give me bail, and then I got bail and they wouldn't leave me, let me leave the, the, the jurisdiction because I had to sign in once a week because of the nature of, uh, of the things we were up against, I needed a job. Welfare wasn't enough. I had to get enough to get on a plane back to, or a bus, that time, a plane back to Vancouver. I needed to get enough for a, an apartment and I need enough to pay for my car insurance for a car that was parked at a place. That's a lot of money. Wherefore, well, don't give you that kind of money. I'm in Toronto. I said, God, you said you're going to look after all my needs. God says, get a job. Where am I going to get a job? I talked to God like this. Where am I going to get a job? I've got my clothes, my running shoes. I've got no tools, no backpack, no nothing. I've got nothing. Where am I going to get a job? God says, forget about it. Just go to a meeting. Okay, I'm going to a meeting with all these problems. I'm thinking about how God's going to fix this stuff. <clears throat> I can't see how God's going to do it. I've thought about it all week. I haven't come up with an answer. I said, you know, there's got to be a way you're going to fix this. So I'm going to a meeting. I look in the directory. Over here at the club is where all the girls are going to be. Over here is a speaker meeting. Guess what meeting I want to go to? I want to go where there's a solution. <clears throat> I want to go where there's a power greater than myself. I want to go where there's comfort, ease. Right? I want to go find a girl. Everything's time to go there. I prayed about something says, you're going to the speaker meeting tonight. Go to the other meeting. And say, my man, I don't want to go to the other meeting. The voice says, I don't remember asking you. <laughs> That's how God talks to me. I was kind of, I'm telling you, it's kind of weird, right? So, like, I guess I could sound like a crazy person, but we all have these conversations, don't we? Yes. Something's trying to guide us. We're going, nah, I don't see anything beneficial about doing that. I see something really beneficial about over here because I see the outcome over here, over here based on self. Over here, this thing that's guiding me in 11... An intuitive thought. Intuitive thought means just go here. It doesn't say, and we'll tell you before you go. It says, we'll tell you when you get there. You'll see why. Right? So I said, okay. I go to this meeting. <coughs> I don't want to be at this meeting. Uh, look, at, look at this doorknob. I'm a couple years sober. Like, I'm nuts. But I don't know I'm nuts. I'm just getting comfortably kind of situated with my thinking. And my The guy's talking. He's a contractor. Talking about you just got a new contract. And how great his life is. I walk up to him and say, hey, you know what? I'm looking for a job. He says, you got any tools? I said, no. He says, do you have work boots? I said, no. I said, I'm actually on bail. <laughs> They're not letting me out of the province. <laughs> and I got a horrific amount of charges and I got to sign in once a week. So I'll need time off for that during the day so I can do it. But do you have a job? He looked at me and says, you kind of like, what? He says, give me your name and number. I left because now it's not in my hands, it's in God's hands. God's going to talk to him now. I don't need to talk to him anymore. He phones me, he says, I don't know what the hell's coming over, can you start tomorrow? Wow. I worked for this guy, remember, whatever. And then his story was, he was a part of the same story I come from, and he was an ex of the same background who had recreated his life, and, and he was doing the same for him, me, what was done for him. He was sober for a while, and I got enough money to, guess what? They said, you, you know, these people have seen the difference in me. They've seen the new story. They've seen a different person than what was on the file. And the guy, the lady and the guy who I was signing in with once a week says, you know what, Tony? They said, you can go back to BC and just phone us once a month and come back when trial is. I said, thank you. And I got enough money to go on a plane to go back to Vancouver, to get a room in a house with one of the guys I was living in, to get insurance for my car, to get working out there. That is wild stuff when you start thinking about that. Now, 12-step work. So the healing comes by allowing God to work in my life beyond my ability to understand, but just trust. When I start going to make these amends, the amends is for these people to see a different creation or a different 
story than the one that you used to be. They get to see something working in your life. That way, if there's something going on in their life, they get to have healing. And if they know somebody needs help, they know who to direct them to. You become a demonstration of something greater than you. You become the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. You represent the story of the miracle that could come here. You're not the miracle. We're a part of this miracle. And when we stand before these people and we're making our peace, regardless of where they're, they're at, because they're going to be attached to their pain and their defects and their stuff, when you understand they're coming from a place of pain, you're able to, when these things crumb up, I'm able to do step 11 in the moment and ask God for strength in the moment to change the energy in regards to this situation. And the energy changes and the situation changes. And down the road, you'll find out things are different. Now, 12-step work, you know, to be of maximum service, to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people around to carry this message wherever and whatever you're doing. People will show up in situations show up to be of service. And that doesn't necessarily have to be in 12-step work. Just the kindness to other people is our debt back to society. Stopping a kind word, just <clears throat> renewing people's fate and humanity. Right, is, is a big thing for people like us, right? Because a lot of us get here pretty scathed, right? And so when you start being a kindness to other people, the children, my, my wife, she kind of, uh, um, I gotta tell this story, man. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> I get to travel around the world. I have no convictions that stop me from going into the States. I have no conviction stopping me from going into the States. That event that happened would have put me in a penitentiary. There is no criminal documentation associated with anything that happened back to that, that whole thing. It was thrown out of court. Right? All I have is a failing to appear. That's it. That isn't like my lawyer said. So... The record, my family, nobody wanted nothing to do. When I entered a room, I've had people come up to me when, when I was sober for a little while, said, you know, when you came into a room, your energy was like we were, you were just, the scary part about you is you were trying to be nice. You wanted to be a nice guy, and you're just soothing, like dripping, uh, Neanderthal, right? So we went to, uh, we had the opportunity to go to uh, um, Vietnam, <coughs> So we went to Vietnam and we're doing all this traveling and stuff. I'm meeting people. My wife says, you have to involve everybody everywhere you go. Because she's a type A personality. She's quiet. Now she's more open. I just attract happy people. She says, I don't know what it is. Everybody, everywhere I go, every is just a party all the time. Like it just turns into a, like this energy attraction from people all over the world, right? So we go to this, it's called a thousand stair temple, Buddhist temple. And so it's 500 stairs up, like the small stairs, right? And you have all the things. So we're doing with the tour guide. We go up to the top. We're standing there. This guy comes up. He's about this tall. He's from the monastery. He's a Buddhist uh, monk from Tibet. They're visiting the monastery. He comes up and goes, oh. He puts his hand on the small of my back and starts rubbing my stomach. Going, happy Buddha, happy Buddha. <laughs> I'm checking for my wallet because I'm still not. I'm still not like that. Everybody stopped and staring at me. This guy's just memorized with me. He leaves, walks away, and I, we're just, my wife, my wife, she goes, yeah, happy Buddha. And the tour guy goes, he sees something in you. He, he, these people are just amazed what happened. He says he sees your energy, your light. He says it's pretty well. And we're laughing about it. So my wife and I are standing beside each other. He comes back. He goes, picture, picture. So my wife goes to hug, like, go think he wants a picture of me and my wife. He comes in between me and my wife and has my wife the camera. <laughs> So I got, I got if, you, if we become friends on Facebook, I got the picture there, and, my, and the guy's all smiling, and he's rubbing my stomach, right? Like, come on. You know what I mean? Like, like, who does? I can't do that transformation. I can't experience this thing on that level. There's things that's happened that just is mind-boggling. Like, mind-boggling when I place my hand in the hand of God. So in 12-step work, like the people who came into my life were just the right people and the right circumstances when, the, when, when I became to a place of teachability. These people showed up and the circumstances happened. One, because I kept on showing up with the same group, allowing myself to be known and present. Regardless, of, I just kept on showing up and the people started loving me and they started teaching me kindness. They started teaching me their traditions. They started teaching me how to be somewhat human. Right? Like, I'm, I'm the guy go out to a really nice restaurant and the, and the shrimp is on the floor. I'll pick it up, wipe it, and eat it. 
I don't do that anymore. I make sure the shrimp don't hit the floor. <laughs> no, but, but you know, like just that Neanderthal kind of whole being. So on the 12 step work, um, you know, I've, I've had some amazing things. I was standing on a beach of uh, Belize once and, and uh, I was over by the pool and some said, go stand by the beach. And I just listened to it. There's nothing attached to it. And I said, I don't want to stand by the beach. And the thought says, go stand by the beach. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stand by the beach. Some says, go stand by the beach. I said, okay, I'll go stand by the beach. <laughs> I'm standing by the beach like this. I said, I said, like, is this good? Like, it's kind of weird that I have these conversations with God, okay? I get this intuitiveness. Anybody ever have the intuitiveness and they argue with it? I'm arguing with this, this thing. So I'm standing there. I says, is this spot good? I'm a little sarcastic. I don't know if you've noticed that yet. <laughs> so I'm standing there. <laughs> Ten minutes go by, and I was kind of like, okay, and I'm going to leave. I said, no, 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 just stay right there. Right, I had to stand right in that spot, not five feet forward, not five feet back. I'm standing there. I see this figure of a guy walking down the beach. His head's down. He's coming right at me. He gets startled because he's going to walk right into me. I'm standing there. I said, how you doing? He goes, oh, not good. I said, oh, yeah, what's going on? He says, I just got kicked out of my church. I just got out of jail. Nobody wants me. Nobody loves me. God's abandoned me. He says, I'm on this island, Belize. He says, I can't get over to the mainland. He says, my life is, is over. I said, well, God has me standing here to tell you he loves you. And nobody else determines that relationship but you. Right, and his head started lifting, and I said, those things from your past don't determine who you are. What you do from this moment on determines who you are and where you're going. And if you're willing to bring God with you, God sees you in the moment because he sent me to talk to you. He has me carrying his message to you to let you know he, he loves you regardless of what you think, feel, and your experience with him so far. He lit up. He lit up, and he realized the church wasn't his relationship, that he had this relationship, and he got reunited with that thing with inside of him. I don't even know if he was an alcoholic, more than likely, maybe. But he was a person in trouble, and he was lost, and God had me standing there just to show him that kindness and redirect him through my experience, right? So the last story before we close, and you guys have been good. I, like, I'm, like, I feel connected with all of you. It's like, it's really good. And hopefully when you go through the sheets and you go through things, you let me know, you know how you're doing. Let the people know around you what a good experience has been because this is really helpful to a lot of people, right? You know, when people start stop to start putting stumbling blocks in each other's recovery, there's something no matter with them. Don't listen to those people. Right, because this is a beautiful time when you, when we get to see like these small miracles that happen and shift in perspective, the idea, the possibility, the the freaked out of the unknown, and 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 just the questioning of like, is he crazy? And you know what the beautiful part about that is? Yeah. One day you're gonna go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> looks like I'm crazy too, <laughs> and you'll have your own experience, and you'll go. Wow, and you'll be amazed. You won't be thrilled. You'll be amazed of this thing called life. And the last story is, I, I go to Hawaii. We're on the, one on the beach, uh, Kona on the big beach. For some reason, we went there. I always go to Maui. Some said go to Kona. We went to Kona. So I'm going to go to, I look at the directory. It says 7 o'clock meeting, two miles. So I asked her, how far the meeting? They said two miles that way. Hawaii, two miles is 15 miles. So just so you know. So I said, okay, I'll walk. I started walking and walking. I get blistered. And I said, holy shit, this is a long two miles. And then I took a, a bus. I got off the bus. 7 o'clock, I just get there. I look there. No. And then I look at 7 a.m. <laughs> I get on the bus. I go all the way back. Right? I get home. I said, that's a... So I get on. Next morning, I get up and go to 7 a.m. meeting. I go, I go all the way back. I walk a bit because the buses aren't running for whatever reason. I, take a bit. I, get around, I get there. I'm sitting there. There's no meeting that day. It's a holiday. I get, I get on the bus, go all the way back. I get back to my room. I go, okay, God, this is not funny. I said, you know, I like to be hooked. I need, I need to be drawn in here. And like, how could I be of service today? How could I, could I be of help? And so I go get one of my cigars. And over here on, on the page, it's also on the thing. There's a picture of, of beautiful palm trees, beautiful green grass, the break waters. It's, I've had cigars over there. They're beautiful. Some said, you're not smoking a cigar there today. You're going over there. Go over there. 
Like, that's the voice. I interpreted it. Like, so I said, I don't want to go over there. I want to go over there. Some says, go smoke your cigarette. I said, that's the breakwater. The water's splashing up. It's noisy. It's you got to crawl all over the rocks to get out to the, to the corner there where the breakwater is. I don't want to go over there. And plus, it's a 15-minute walk to go over there. I could just go over there and have a cigar. Some says, go over there and have a cigar. Okay, I'll go over there and I'll enjoy my cigar. <laughs> All right, so I go over there. I sit down. I light a cigar. Then I notice, so like I'm here on the breakwater on, on, on the corner, and then from here to where the tree is over there, I notice there's a guy sitting on the break, like down, down the hill a bit over, and he's sitting on the breakwater like this, and he's talking to somebody, and his hands are in the air, and, he, and he's holding a beer, and he's going like this, and the beer's splashing a bit. Then he realizes he's doing that. He puts the beer back in the other hand. He's one of us. And then he starts to get Kayla. <laughs> and he's going. And then, and then he takes the beer, and he puts it in, and he comes walking back. His head's down. And he walks by me. and goes, hey. He sees me. He goes, hey, you want a snow cone? I says, where are you going to get a snow cone this time? He says, no, it's a beer. It's a beer, man. I said, no, I don't drink. He says, okay. So he walks over because I don't know why he doesn't have the beer over there. Kind of weird, right? How many people would leave the beer unattended over here? He has the beer over here and it comes over, grabs the beer. As he's walking by, he stops and goes, I don't know why I'm telling you this, man, but my life's a shithole. I said, oh, yeah. He says, my wife just left me. I live on the other side of the island. I came over here to get some peace. Right? It's an island. It's the same water all over the island. He drove all the way to the other side of the island to sit in that spot and leave his beer away from him that he had to... You see what's happening here? He don't see what's happening here. And he goes, I used to be a sober member of AA. I had, I had eight years. He says, I've been out now for about six months. He says, I'm over there talking to God. God don't love me. He's abandoned me. He wants nothing to do with me. My life's gone in a shithole. I said... I'd like to introduce myself. I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And God loves you. He sent me all the way here just to tell you that simple message. You're not alone. The only separation you have is you. And God looks after you, wants you, cares about you. And what your relationship from here on out is totally dependent on you. Right? Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. God loves you. He's watching you and he has you here safe and sound. What your relationship looks like from here on up is totally up to you. Thank you, Renee, for asking me. You guys have been awesome.